the vicinity of their homes, they are knocked down and beaten by their white fellow citizens without having offered any injury or insult as a cause, they are arrested and imprisoned upon false accusations, their money is extorted for their release, or they are condemned to imprisonment at hard labor, that many of their people are now in a condition of practical slavery, being compelled to serve their former owners without pay and to call them master. They express a hope that Congress may be led to give them an opportunity to verify these statements by suitable testimony, and also further hope that Congress will grant them the protection they need. 38. In 1866, January 10, a Negro convention at Augusta, Georgia, appealed to the Georgia legislature. The freedmen declared that during the period of the war the majority of them had remained silently at their homes, although they had known their power to rise and to fire your houses, burn your homes and railroads, and discommode you in a thousand ways. During the war, they had been forced into war service by the South. They had been compelled to throw up breastwork forts and fortifications and do the work of prisoners under the guns of the enemy, where, said they, many of us in common with yourselves were killed. But now, they declared that they could no longer remain indifferent when the state was passing laws which would bind them in future years. Against these laws, they would protest firmly and openly. Another address in the same year called attention to the treatment which the Negroes were receiving in all walks of life throughout the state. On the railroads they paid equal fare with others, but they did not get half the accommodation. They were cursed and kicked by the conductors their wives and sisters were blackguarded and insulted by the scrapings of the earth and if they spoke of their treatment they were frowned upon with contempt and replied to in bitter epithets 39. Major Martin R. Delaney, the most distinguished northern Negro in South Carolina, declared in a letter to President Johnson. What becomes necessary to secure and perpetuate the Union is simply the enfranchisement and recognition of political equality of the power that saved the nation from destruction a recognition of the political equality of the blacks with the whites in all their relations as American citizens. Point four zero. A correspondent of the Charleston Daily Courier writing from Sumter, South Carolina, reported November 4, 1866, an organized movement among Negroes to better their condition. They held a large assembly to deal with the problems of the hour, this being a meeting on a larger scale than that of many other such which had been held for that purpose in that section. During the four hours of this meeting the correspondent reported that there was not uttered a word about Negro suffrage and other political questions. The keynote of the meeting was to secure a fair and remunerative reward for labor. The contract system had proved to be unequal and unjust and they were advised to resort to the share system. The Black West protested to the admission of Colorado with white suffrage. On January 24, 1866, Senator Brown of Missouri said, I present a petition of certain citizens of Denver, in the territory of Colorado, showing that the state constitution, framed by a citizens' convention, and adopted by an almost insignificant majority of the legal voters of Colorado, preparatory to admission as a state, excludes all colored citizens of the territory of Colorado from the right of suffrage by the incorporation in that instrument of the words all white male citizens. The petitioners, therefore, beseech your honorable body not to admit the territory as a state until the word all white be erased from her constitution. Point 41. The most significant meeting took place in the North where a national convention met in Syracuse, New York, in October, 1864. Besides Frederick Douglass, it was attended by George L. Ruffin, who afterwards became the first Negro to sit on the bench of Massachusetts, George T. Downing of Rhode Island, Robert Hamilton of New York, William Howard Day of New Jersey, Jonathan C. Gibbs, who later became Secretary of State and Superintendent of Education in Florida, Peter H. Clark of Ohio, Henry Highland Garnett, the Negro preacher, Dr. Peter W. Ray of Brooklyn, and many other leaders of the Free Negroes. The resolution said, The weakness of our friends is strength to our foes. When the Anti-Slavery Standard, representing the American Anti-Slavery Society, denies that the society asks for the enfranchisement of colored men, and the Liberator apologizes for excluding the colored men of Louisiana from the ballot box, they injure us more vitally than all the ribald jests of the whole pro-slavery press. 
In the ranks of the Democratic Party, all the worst elements of American society fraternize, and we need not expect a single voice from that quarter for justice, mercy, or even decency. To it we are nothing, the slaveholders everything. How stands the case with the great Republican Party in question? We have already alluded to it as being largely under the influence of the prevailing contempt for the character and rights of the colored race. This is seen by the slowness of our government to employ the strong arm of the black man in the work of putting down the rebellion, and in its unwillingness, after thus employing him, to invest him with the same incitements to deeds of daring, as white soldiers, neither giving him the same pay, rations, and protection, nor any hope of rising in the service by meritorious conduct. It is also seen in the fact, that in neither of the plans emanating from this party for reconstructing the institutions of the southern states, are colored men, not even those who had fought for the country, recognized as having any political existence or rights whatever. Do you, then, ask us to state, in plain terms, just what we want of you, and just what we think we ought to receive at your hands? We answer, first of all, the complete abolition of the slavery of our race in the United States. We shall not stop to argue. We feel the terrible sting of this stupendous wrong, and that we cannot be free while our brothers are slaves. We want the elective franchise in all the states now in the Union, and the same in all such states as may come into the Union hereafter. We believe that the highest welfare of this great country will be found in erasing from its statute books all enactments discriminating in favor or against any class of its people, and by establishing one law for the white and colored people alike. Whatever prejudice and taste may be innocently allowed to do or to dictate in social and domestic relations, it is plain, that in the matter of government, the object of which is the protection and security of human rights, prejudice should be allowed no voice whatever. Your fathers laid down the principle, long ago, that universal suffrage is the best foundation of government. We believe as your fathers believed, and as they practiced, for, in eleven states out of the original thirteen, colored men exercised the right to vote at the time of the adoption of the federal constitution. Fellow citizens, let us entreat you, have faith in your own principles. If freedom is good for any, it is good for all. If you need the elective franchise, we need it even more. You are strong, we are weak, you are many, we are few, you are protected, we are exposed. Clothe us with this safeguard of our liberty, and give us an interest in the country to which, in common with you, we have given our lives and poured out our best blood. You cannot need special protection. Our degradation is not essential to your elevation, nor our peril essential to your safety. You are not likely to be outstripped in the race of improvement by persons of African descent, and hence you have no need of superior advantage, nor to burden them with disabilities of any kind. We may conquer southern armies by the sword, but it is another thing to conquer southern hate. Now what is the natural counterpoise against this southern malign hostility? This it is, give the elective franchise to every colored man of the south who is of sane mind and has arrived at the age of twenty-one years, and you have at once four millions of friends who will guard with their vigilance, and if need be, defend with their arms, the ark of federal liberty from the treason and pollution of her enemies. You are sure of enmity of the masters make sure of the friendship of the slaves, for, depend upon it, your government cannot afford to encounter the enmity of both. 42. And so at first Abraham Lincoln looked back towards some stable place in the relation of blacks and whites in the South on which men could begin to build a new edifice for freedom, and he gave only one word that had in it a ring of harshness. He was willing to accept almost any overture on the part of the South except that he would not return the Negroes to slavery, and if any law compelled the executive to do this, that executive would not be Abraham Lincoln. There can be no doubt that Abraham Lincoln never would have accepted the black codes. He began by looking backward and then turned with this forward-looking word. On the other hand, Andrew Johnson started looking forward, towards free land, and the interests of the suppressed laborers in the South, and then realizing that one half this laboring class was black, he turned his face towards reaction. He accepted the black codes, 
and thus he faced in the winter of 1865 the representatives of the people of the United States in the 39th Congress assembled. Symbolic Mother, we thy myriad sons. Pounding our stubborn hearts on freedom's bars. Clutching our birthright, fight with faces set. Still visioning the stars. Jesse Fawcett. 8. Transubstantiation of a Poor White How Andrew Johnson, unexpectedly raised to the presidency, was suddenly set between a democracy which included poor whites and black men, and an autocracy that included big business and slave barons, and how torn between impossible allegiances, he ended in forcing a hesitant nation to choose between the increased political power of a restored southern oligarchy and votes for Negroes. Like nemesis of Greek tragedy, the central problem of America after the Civil War, as before, was the black man, those four million souls whom the nation had used and degraded, and on whom the South had built an oligarchy similar to the colonial imperialism of today, erected on cheap colored labor and raising raw material for manufacture. If Northern industry before the war had secured a monopoly of the raw material raised in the South for its new manufactures, and if Northern and Western labor could have maintained their wage scale against slave competition, the North would not have touched the slave system. But this the South had frustrated. It had threatened labor with nationwide slave competition and had sent its cotton abroad to buy cheap manufactures, and had resisted the protective tariff demanded by the North. It was this specific situation that had given the voice of freedom a chance to be heard, freedom for newcome peasants who feared the competition of slave labor, peasants from Europe, New England and the poor white South, freedom for all men black and white through that dream of democracy in which the best of the nation still believed. The result was war because of the moral wrong, the economic disaster and the democratic contradiction of making human labor real estate, war, because the South was determined to make free white labor compete with black slaves, monopolize land and raw material in the hands of a political aristocracy, and extend the scope of that power, war, because the industrial North refused to surrender its raw material and one of its chief markets to Europe, war, because white American labor, while it refused to recognize black labor as equal and human, had to fight to maintain its own humanity and ideal of equality. The result of the war left four million human beings just as valuable for the production of cotton and sugar as they had been before the war but during the war, as laborers and soldiers, these Negroes had made it possible for the North to win, and without their actual and possible aid, the South would never have surrendered, and not least, these four million free men formed in the end the only possible moral justification for an otherwise sordid and selfish orgy of murder, arson, and theft. Now, early in 1865, the war is over. The North does not especially want free Negroes, it wants trade and wealth. The South does not want a particular interpretation of the Constitution. It wants cheap Negro labor and the political and social power based on it. Had there been no Negroes, there would have been no war. Had no Negroes survived the war, peace would have been difficult because of hatred, loss and bitter grief. But its logical path would have been straight. The South would have returned to its place in Congress with less than its former representation because of the growing North and West. These areas of growing manufacture and agriculture, railroad building and corporations, would have held the political power over the South until the South united with the new insurgency of the West or the old Eastern democratic ideals. Industrialization might even have brought a third party representing labor and raised the proletariat to dominance. Of this, in 1865 there were only vague signs, and in any case, the former Southern aristocracy would not easily have allied itself with immigrant labor, while the Southern poor whites would have needed long experience and teaching. Thus, the North in the absence of the Negro would have had a vast debt, a problem of charity, distress and relief, such reasonable amnesty as would prevent the old Southern leaders from returning immediately to power, the recognition of the reorganized states, and then work and forgetting. Let us have peace. But there was the black man looming like a dark ghost on the horizon. He was the child of force and greed, and the father of wealth and war. His labor was indispensable and the loss of it would have cost many times the cost of the war. If the Negro had been silent, his very presence would have announced his plight. 
he was not silent. He was an unusual evidence. He was writing petitions, making speeches, parading with returned soldiers, reciting his adventures as slave and freeman. Even dumb and still, he must be noticed. His poverty had to be relieved, and emancipation in his case had to mean poverty. If he had to work, he had to have land and tools. If his labor was in reality to be free labor, he had to have legal freedom and civil rights. His ignorance could only be removed by that very education which the law of the South had long denied him and the custom of the North had made exceedingly difficult. Thus civil status and legal freedom, food, clothes and tools, access to land and help to education, were the minimum demands of four million laborers, and these demands no man could ignore, northerner or southerner, abolitionist or copperhead, laborer or captain of industry. How did the nation face this paradox and dilemma? Led by Abraham Lincoln, the nation had looked back to the status before the war in order to find a path to which the new nation and the new condition of the freedmen could be guided. Only one forward step President Lincoln insisted upon and that was the real continued freedom of the emancipated slave, but the abolition democracy went beyond this because it was convinced that here was no logical stopping place, and it looked forward to civil and political rights, education, and land, as the only complete guarantee of freedom, in the face of a dominant South which hoped from the first, to abolish slavery only in name. In the North, a new and tremendous dictatorship of capital was arising. There was only one way to curb and direct what promised to become the greatest plutocratic government which the world had ever known. This way was first to implement public opinion by the weapon of universal suffrage a weapon which the nation already had in part, but which had been virtually impotent in the South because of slavery, and which was at least weakened in the North by the disfranchisement of an unending mass of foreign-born laborers. Once universal suffrage was achieved, the next step was to use it with such intelligence and power that it would function in the interest of the mass of working men. To accomplish this end there should have been in the country and represented in Congress a union between the champions of universal suffrage and the rights of the freedmen, together with the leaders of labor, the small landholders of the West, and logically, the poor whites of the South. Against these would have been arrayed the northern industrial oligarchy, and eventually, when they were readmitted to Congress, the representatives of the former southern oligarchy. This union of democratic forces never took place. On the contrary, they were torn apart by artificial lines of division. The old anti-Negro labor rivalry between white and black workers kept the labor elements after the war from ever really uniting in a demand to increase labor power by Negro suffrage and Negro economic stability. The West was seduced from a vision of peasant proprietors, recruited from a laboring class, into a vision of labor exploiting farmers and land speculation which tended to transform the Western farmers into a petty bourgeoisie fighting not to overcome but to share spoils with the large land speculators the monopolists of transportation, and the financiers. Wherever a liberal and democratic party started to differentiate itself from this group, the only alliance offered was the broken oligarchy of the South, with its determination to re-enslave Negro labor. The effective combination which ensued was both curious and contradictory. The masters of industry, the financiers, and monopolists, had in self-defense to join with abolition democracy in forcing universal suffrage on the South, or submit to the reassertion of the old land-slave feudalism with increased political power. Such a situation demanded an economic guardianship of freedmen, and the first step to this meant at least the beginning of a dictatorship by labor. This, however, had to be but temporary union and was bound to break up before long. The break was begun by the extraordinary corruption, graft and theft that became more and more evident in the country from 1868 on, as a result of the wild idea that industry and progress for the people of the United States were compatible with the selfish sequestration of profit for private individuals and powerful corporations. But those who revolted from the party of exploitation and high finance did not see allies in the dictatorship of labor in the South. Rather they were entirely misled by the complaint of property from the southern oligarchy. They failed to become a real party of economic reform and became a reaction of small property holders against corporations, of a petty bourgeoisie against a new economic monarchy. 
They immediately joined big business in coming to an understanding with the South in 1876, so that by force and fraud the South overthrew the dictatorship of the workers. But this was only the immediate cause. If there had been no widespread political corruption, North and South, there would still have arisen an absolute difference between those who were trying to conduct the new southern state governments in the interest of the mass of laborers, black and white, and those North and South who were determined to exploit labor, both in agriculture and industry, for the benefit of an oligarchy. Such an oligarchy was in effect back of the military dictatorship which supported these very southern labor governments, and which had to support them either as laborers or by developing among them a capitalist class. But as soon as there was understanding between the southern exploiter of labor and the northern exploiter, this military support would be withdrawn, and the labor governments, in spite of what they had accomplished for the education of the masses, and in spite of the movements against waste and graft which they had inaugurated, would fail. Under such circumstances, they had to fail, and in a large sense the immediate hope of American democracy failed with them. Let us now follow this development more in detail. In 1863 and 1864, Abraham Lincoln had made his tentative proposals for reconstructing the South. He had left many things unsaid. The loyal-minded, consisting of as few as one-tenth of the voters whom Lincoln proposed to regard as a state, must naturally, to survive, be supported by the United States Army, until a majority of the inhabitants acquiesced in the new arrangements. It was Lincoln's fond hope that this acquiescence might be swift and clear, but no one knew better than he that it might not. He was careful to say that Congress would certainly have voice as to the terms on which they would recognize the newly elected senators and representatives. This proposal met the general approval of the country, but Congress saw danger and enacted the Wade Davis Bill. This did not recognize Negro suffrage, and was not radically different from the Lincoln Plan, except that the final power and assent of Congress were more prominently set forth. Lincoln did not oppose it. He simply did not want his hands permanently tied. The bill failed, leaving Lincoln making a careful study of the situation, and promising another statement. He was going forward carefully, hoping for some liberal movement to show itself in the South, and delicately urging it. In the election of 1864, the country stood squarely back of him. The Northern democracy carried only New Jersey, Delaware, and Kentucky. But he died, and Andrew Johnson took his place. Thus, suddenly, April 15, 1865, Andrew Johnson found himself President of the United States, six days after Lee's surrender, and a month and a half after the 38th Congress had adjourned, March 3. It was the drear destiny of the poor white South that, deserting its economic class and itself, it became the instrument by which democracy in the nation was done to death, race provincialism deified, and the world delivered to plutocracy. The man who led the way with unconscious paradox and contradiction was Andrew Johnson. Lately the early life and character of Andrew Johnson have been abundantly studied. He was a fanatical hater of aristocracy. Through every public act of his runs one consistent, unifying thread of purpose the advancement of the power, prosperity and liberty of the masses at the expense of entrenched privilege. The slave-holding aristocracy he hated with a bitter, enduring hatred born of envy and ambition. If Johnson were a snake, said his rival, the well-born Esham G. Harris, he would lie in the grass to bite the heels of the rich men's children. The very thought of an aristocrat caused him to emit venom and lash about him in fury.1. His political methods were those of the barnstorming demagogue. Johnson's speeches were tissues of misstatement, misrepresentation and insulting personalities, directed to the passions and unreasoning impulses of the ignorant voters assaults upon aristocrats combined with vaunting of his own low origin and the dignity of manual labor.2. Yet a biographer says that Johnson was the only president who practiced what he preached, drawing no distinction between rich and poor, or high and low. Do not these facts furnish an explanation of Johnson's life? Do they not show why he had the courage to go up against caste and cheap aristocracy, why he dared to stand for the underdog, whether Catholic? Hebrew, foreigner, mechanic, or child, 
and to cling like death to the old flag and the Union? Gladly I would lay down my life, he wrote, if I could so engraft democracy into our general government that it would be permanent. 3. To all this there is one great qualification. Andrew Johnson could not include Negroes in any conceivable democracy. He tried to, but as a poor white, steeped in the limitations, prejudices, and ambitions of his social class, he could not, and this is the key to his career. Johnson sat in Congress from 1843 to 1853, and was senator from 1857 to 1862. He favored the annexation of Texas as a gateway for Negro emigration. He was against a high tariff, championed free western lands for white labor, and favored the annexation of Cuba for black slave labor. McConnell introduced a homestead bill into Congress in January, 1846. Johnson's bill came in March. He returned to Tennessee as governor, but induced the legislature to instruct members of Congress to vote for his bill. The bill finally passed the House but was defeated in the Senate, and this was repeated for several sessions. Meantime, Johnson found himself in curious company. He was linked on the one hand to the Free Soilers, and in 1851 went to New York to address a land reform association. On the other hand, the South called him socialistic and Whigfall of Texas dubbed him, the vilest of Republicans, the reddest of Reds, a sans culotte. For four years past he has been trying to please the North with his homestead and other bills for the abolitionists meanwhile looked askance because Johnson favored the bill for annexing Cuba. He voted against the Pacific Railroad, owned eight slaves and said at one time, you won't get rid of the Negro expect by holding him in slavery. 5. In the midst of such vacillation and contradiction, small wonder that Lane referred to Johnson's triumphant ignorance and exulting stupidity. Yet Johnson hewed doggedly to certain lines. In 1860, he was advocating his homestead bill again. It finally passed both House and Senate, but Buchanan vetoed it as unconstitutional. Johnson called the message monstrous and absurd. At last, in June, 1862, after the South had withdrawn from Congress, Johnson's bill was passed and Lincoln signed it. Yet it was this same Johnson who said in the 36th Congress that if the abolitionists freed the slaves and let them loose on the South, the non-slaveholder would join with the slave owner and extirpate them, and if one should be more ready to join than another it would be myself. Johnson early became a follower of Hinton Helper and used his figures. The impending crisis was Andrew Johnson's vade mecum his arsenal of facts 6. Johnson made two violent speeches against secession in 1860-61, with bitter personalities against Jefferson Davis, Judah Benjamin, and their fellows. He called them rebels and traitors, the galleries yelled and the presiding officers threatened to clear them. Johnson shouted. I would have them arrested, and if convicted, within the meaning and scope of the Constitution, by the eternal God, I would execute them, sir. Treason must be punished, its enormity and the extent and depth of the offense must be made known. Klingman of North Carolina said that Johnson's speech brought on the Civil War. Alexander Stevens said that it solidified the North. Letters came in to congratulate and to encourage the only Union senator from the South. Labor rallied to him. A Baltimore laborer wrote that the poor working man will no doubt be called on to fight the battles of the rich. From Memphis another wrote, it was labor that achieved our independence and the laborers are ready to maintain it. The New York Working Man's Association passed a resolution of thanks.7. Lincoln set about winning Tennessee, and as a step toward it, asked Andrew Johnson to go and act as military governor, and restore the state. Johnson resigned from the Senate and went to Tennessee early in March, 1862. He arrived in Nashville. March 12th, and took possession of the State House. His courage and sacrifice eventually redeemed the State and restored it to the Union. Several times Johnson spoke on slavery and the Negro. When he asked that plantations be divided in the South and lands opened in the West, he had in mind white men, who would thus become rich or at least richer. But for Negroes, he had nothing of the sort in mind, 
except the bare possibility that, if given freedom, they might continue to exist and not die out. Johnson said in January, 1864, at Nashville in reply to a question as to whether he was in favor of emancipation. As for the Negro I am for setting him free but at the same time I assert that this is a white man's government. If whites and blacks can't get along together arrangements must be made to colonize the blacks. In 1843, when I was candidate for governor, it was said, that fellow Johnson is a demagogue, is an abolitionist. Because I advocated a white basis for representation apportioning members of Congress according to the number of qualified voters, instead of embracing Negroes, they called me an abolitionist. What do we find today? Right goes forward, truth triumphs, justice is supreme, and slavery goes down. In fact, the Negroes are emancipated in Tennessee today, and the only remaining question for us to settle, as prudent and wise men, is in assigning the Negro his new relation. Now, what will that be? The Negro will be thrown upon society, governed by the same laws that govern communities, and be compelled to fall back upon his own resources, as all other human beings are. Political freedom means liberty to work, and at the same time enjoy the products of one's labor. If he can rise by his own energies, in the name of God, let him rise. In saying this, I do not argue that the Negro race is equal to the Anglo-Saxon. If the Negro is better fitted for the inferior condition of society, the laws of nature will assign him there. 8. As a reward for Johnson's services and to unite the sections Lincoln chose Johnson as his running mate in 1864. Before the campaign June 10, from the St. Cloud Hotel, Johnson gave his philosophy of reconstruction. One of the chief elements of this rebellion is the opposition of the slave aristocracy to being ruled by men who have risen from the ranks of the people. This aristocracy hated Mr. Lincoln because he was of humble origin, a rail splitter in early life. One of them, the private secretary of Howell Cobb, said to me one day, after a long conversation, we people of the South will not submit to be governed by a man who has come up from the ranks of the common people, as Abe Lincoln has. He uttered the essential feeling and spirit of this Southern rebellion. Now it has just occurred to me, if this aristocracy is so violently opposed to being governed by Mr. Lincoln, what in the name of conscience will it do with Lincoln and Johnson? I am for emancipation for two reasons, first, because it is right in itself, and second, because in the emancipation of the slaves, we break down an odious and dangerous aristocracy, I think that we are freeing more whites than blacks in Tennessee. I want to see slavery broken up, and when its barriers are torn down, I want to see industrious, thrifty immigrants pouring in from all parts of the country. Come on! We need your labor, your skill, your capital. Ah! These rebel leaders have a strong personal reason for holding out to save their necks from the halter. And these leaders must feel the power of the government. Treason must be made odious, and the traitor must be punished and impoverished. Their great plantations must be seized and divided into small farms, and sold to honest, industrious men. The day for protecting the lands and Negroes of these authors of rebellion is past. It is high time it was point nine. During the campaign he addressed a torchlight procession of thousands of Negroes and whites. He said, October, 1864. Who has not heard of the great estates of Mac Cockrell, situated near this city, estates whose acres are numbered by the thousand, whose slaves were once counted by the score? And of Mac Cockrell, their possessor, the great slave owner and, of course, the leading rebel, who lives in the very wantonness of wealth wrung from the sweat and toil and stolen wages of others, and who gave fabulous sums to aid Jeff Davis in overturning this government. Who has not heard of the princely estates of General W. D. Harding, who, by means of his property alone, outweighed and influence any other man in Tennessee, no matter what were that other's worth, or wisdom, or ability. Harding, too, early espoused the cause of treason and made it his boast that he had contributed, and directly induced others to contribute, millions of dollars in aid of that unholy cause. It is wrong that Mac Cockrell and W. D. Harding, by means of forced and unpaid labor, 
should have monopolized so large a share of the lands and wealth of Tennessee, and I say if their immense plantations were divided up and parceled out amongst a number of free, industrious, and honest farmers, it would give more good citizens to the commonwealth, increase the wages of our mechanics, enrich the markets of our city, enliven all the arteries of trade, improve society, and conduce to the greatness and glory of the state. The representatives of this corrupt, and if you will permit me almost to swear a little, this damnable aristocracy, taunt us with our desire to see justice done, and charge us with favoring Negro equality. Of all living men they should be the last to mouth that phrase, and, even when uttered in their hearing, it should cause their cheeks to tinge and burn with shame. Negro equality, indeed. Why, pass any day along the sidewalks of High Street where these aristocrats more particularly dwell these aristocrats, whose sons are now in the bands of gorillas and cutthroats who prowl and rob and murder around our city pass by their dwellings, I say, and you will see as many mulatto as negro children, the former bearing an unmistakable resemblance to their aristocratic owners. Thank God, the war has ended all this, a war that has freed more whites than blacks. Suppose the negro is set free and we have less cotton, we will raise more wool, hemp, flax, and silk. It is all an idea that the world can't get along without cotton. And, as is suggested by my friend behind me, whether we attain perfection in the raising of cotton or not, I think we ought to stimulate the cultivation of hemp, great and renewed laughter, for we ought to have more of it in a far better material, a stronger fiber, with which to make a stronger rope. For, not to be malicious or malignant, I am free to say that I believe many who were driven into this rebellion, are repentant, but I say of the leaders, the instigators, the conscious, intelligent traitors, they ought to be hung. Point ten. Looking at this vast crowd of colored people, continued the governor, and reflecting through what a storm of persecution and obloquy they are compelled to pass, I am almost induced to wish that, as in the days of old, a Moses might arise who should lead them safely to their promised land of freedom and happiness. You are our Moses shouted several voices, and the exclamation was caught up and cheered until the capital rung again. Well, then, replied the speaker, humble and unworthy as I am, if no other better shall be found, I will indeed be your Moses, and lead you through the Red Sea of war and bondage to a fairer future of liberty and peace. I speak now as one who feels the world his country, and all who love equal rights his friends. I speak, too, as a citizen of Tennessee. I am here on my own soil, and here I mean to stay and fight this great battle of truth and justice to a triumphant end. Rebellion and slavery shall, by God's good help, no longer pollute our state. Loyal men, whether white or black, shall alone control her destinies, and when this strife in which we are all engaged is past, I trust, I know, we shall have a better state of things, and shall all rejoice that honest labor reaps the fruit of its own industry and that every man has a fair chance in the race of life. 11. Winston interpreted the latter part of this speech as directed to the whites, when clearly he was speaking directly to the colored people, but he was afterward unwilling to live up to its promises. As a matter of fact, he favored emancipation in order to save the Union and to free the white man and no further. Damn the Negroes, he once said when charged with race equality. I am fighting those traitorous aristocrats, their masters. 12. Johnson appeared to take the oath of office as vice president so drunk he was taken into prolonged seclusion after a maudlin speech, his resignation was discussed. He was not a habitual drunkard, although he drank three or four glasses of Robertson's Canada whiskey some days. In 1848 Johnson writes that he had been on a kind of bust not a big drunk 13 both of Johnson's sons became drunkards and were cut off before they reached middle life. Yet Lincoln was right, oh, well, don't you bother about Andy Johnson's drinking. He made a bad slip the other day, but I have known Andy a great many years, and he ain't no drunkard. Johnson was deeply humiliated by the inauguration episode and perhaps here began his alienation from those who might have influenced him best. Charles A. Dana, Assistant Secretary of War, says that he met Vice President Johnson in Richmond. 
he took me aside and spoke with great earnestness about the necessity of not taking the Confederates back without some conditions or without some punishment. He insisted that their sins had been enormous, and that if they were let back into the Union without any punishment the effect would be very bad. He said they might be very dangerous in the future. The Vice President talked to me in this strain for fully twenty minutes, I should think an impassioned, earnest speech on the subject of punishing rebels. Point fourteen. His sudden induction as President was marked by modesty and genuine feeling. Carl Schurz says that the inaugural speech of Andrew Johnson, in 1865, was very pleasing to the liberals of the North, and made them believe that he was going to allow the Negro to have some part in the reconstruction of the states. For a month after coming to the presidency, Johnson indulged in speech-making, and his words were still so severe that the anti-slavery people became uneasy, feeling that Johnson would give his attention primarily to punishing the whites rather than protecting the Negroes. April 21, 1865 he said in an interview with some citizens of Indiana. They the rebel leaders must not only be punished, but their social power must be destroyed. And I say that, after making treason odious, every union man and the government should be remunerated out of the pockets of those who have inflicted this great suffering upon the country. This was exactly the thesis of Thaddeus Stevens enunciated in September of the same year. A number of Virginians visited Johnson in July and complained that they were seeking credits in the North and West, but could get no consideration while they remained under the ban of the government. The president replied, It was the wealthy men who dragooned the people into secession, I know how this thing was done. You rich men used the press and bullied your little men to force the state into secession. He spoke as a poor white for poor whites and the planters left in gloom. He kept on insisting upon punishment for the South, and not only personal punishment but economic punishment, so that many conservatives were afraid that they had elected to the presidency a radical who would seriously attack the South. This would have been true but for one thing, the Southern poor white had his attitude toward property and income seriously modified by the presence of the Negro. Even Abraham Lincoln was unable for a long time to conceive of free, poor, black citizens as voters in the United States. The problem of the Negroes, as he faced it, worried him and he made repeated efforts to see if in some way they could not be sent off to Africa or to foreign lands. Johnson had no such broad outlook. Negroes to him were just Negroes, and even as he expressed his radical ideas of helping the poor Southerners, he seldom envisaged Negroes as a part of the poor. Lincoln came to know Negroes personally. He came to recognize their manhood. He praised them generously as soldiers, and suggested that they be admitted to the ballot. Johnson, on the contrary, could never regard Negroes as men. He has all the narrowness and ignorance of a certain class of whites who have always looked upon the colored race as out of the pale of humanity. 15. The Northern press had been quite satisfied with Lincoln's attitude. He had served liberty in America well. Lincoln said Senator Doolittle, representing industry in the West, would have dealt with the rebels as an indulgent father deals with his erring children. Johnson would deal with them more like a stern and incorruptible judge. Thus in a moment has the scepter of power passed from the hand of flesh to the hand of iron. At a cabinet meeting with Mr. Lincoln on the last day of his life, Friday, April 14, Stanton submitted the draft of a plan for the restoration of governments in the South. The draft applied expressly to two states, but was intended as a model for others. The president suggested a revision, and the subject was postponed until Tuesday the 18th. Andrew Johnson became president, and on Sunday, April 16, Stanton read his draft to Sumner and other gentlemen. Sumner interrupted the reading with the inquiry. Whether any provision was made for enfranchising the colored men, saying, also, that unless the black man is given the right to vote his freedom is a mockery. Stanton deprecated the agitation of the subject, but Sumner insisted that the black man's right to vote was the essence the great essential. Stanton's draft, now confined to North Carolina, was considered in the cabinet May 9, when it appeared with a provision for suffrage in the election of members of a constitutional convention for the state. It included the loyal citizens of the United States. This paragraph, it appears, Stanton had accepted April 16, 
as an amendment from Sumner and Colfax. He admitted that it was intended to include Negroes as well as white men. Point 16. Stanton invited an expression of opinion, several members of the cabinet were absent. Stanton, Dennison, and Speed favored the inclusion, McCulloch, Wells, and Usher were against it. The president expressed no opinion, but Sumner was certain of the president's decision in favor of Negro suffrage. Sumner sought to keep close to Johnson. He and Chase had an interview with him a week after he had taken the oath of office. Johnson was reserved but sympathetic and they left light-hearted. A few days later, when the President and Senator Sumner were alone together, the President said, On this question that of suffrage there is no difference between us, you and I are alike. Sumner expressed his joy and gratitude that the President had taken this position, and that as a consequence there would thus be no division in the Union Party and the president replied, I mean to keep you all together. As he walked away that evening, Sumner felt that the battle of his own life was ended. Point 17. He wrote to Bright, May 1, 1865, encouragingly. Last evening, I had a long conversation with him Johnson, mainly on the rebel states and how they shall be tranquilized. Of course my theme is justice to the colored race. He accepted this idea completely and indeed went so far as to say that there is no difference between us. You understand that the question whether rebel states shall be treated as military provinces or territories is simply one of form, with a view to the great result. It is the result that I aim at. And I shall never stickle on any intermediate question if that is secured. He deprecates haste, is unwilling that states should be precipitated back, thinks there must be a period of probation, but that meanwhile all loyal people, without distinction of color, must be treated as citizens, and must take part in any proceedings for reorganization. He doubts at present the expediency of announcing this from Washington lest it should give a handle to party, but is willing it should be made known to the people in the rebel states. The Chief Justice started yesterday on a visit to North Carolina, South Carolina, Florida, and New Orleans, and will on his way touch the necessary strings so far as he can. I anticipate much from this journey. His opinions are fixed, and he is well informed with regard to those of the President. I would not be too sanguine, but I should not be surprised if we had this great question settled before the next meeting of Congress I mean by this that we had such expression of opinion and acts as will forever conclude it. My confidence is founded in part upon the essential justice of our aims and the necessity of the case. With the President as well disposed as he shows himself, and the Chief Justice as positive, we must prevail. Will not all this sanctify our war beyond any in history? The next day writing to Lieber, Sumner quoted Johnson as saying that Colored persons are to have the right to suffrage, that no state can be precipitated into the Union, that rebel states must go through a term of probation. All this he had said to me before. Ten days ago, the Chief Justice and myself visited him in the evening to speak of these things. I was charmed by his sympathy, which was entirely different from his predecessors. The Chief Justice is authorized to say wherever he is what the President desires, and to do everything he can to promote organization without distinction of color. The President desires that the movement should appear to proceed from the people. This is in conformity with his general ideas, but he thinks it will disarm the party at home. I told him that while I doubted if the work could be effectively done without federal authority, I regarded the modus operandi as an inferior question, and that I should be content, provided equality before the law was secured for all without distinction of color. I said during this winter that the rebel states could not come back, except on the footing of the Declaration of Independence, and the complete recognition of human rights. I feel more than ever confident that all this will be fulfilled. And then what a regenerated land! I had looked for a bitter contest on this question, but with the President on our side, it will be carried by simple avert poise. Chase wrote Johnson from South Carolina the same month. Suffrage to loyal blacks, I find that readiness and even desire for it is in proportion to the loyalty of those who express opinions. Nobody dissents, vehemently while those who have suffered from rebellion and rejoice with their whole hearts in the restoration of the national authority, 
are fast coming to the conclusion they will find their own surest safety in the proposed extension. All seem embarrassed about first steps. I do not entertain the slightest doubt that they would all welcome some simple recommendation from yourself, and would adopt readily any plan which you would suggest. I am anxious that you should have the lead in this work. It is my deliberate judgment that nothing will so strengthen you with the people or bring so much honor to your name throughout the world as some such short address as I suggested before leaving Washington. Just say to the people, reorganize your state governments. I will aid you in the enrollment of the loyal citizens, you will not expect me to discriminate among men equally loyal, once enrolled, vote for delegates to the convention to reform your state constitution. I will aid you in collecting and declaring their suffrages. Your convention and yourselves must do the rest, but you may count on the support of the national government in all things constitutionally expedient. 18. In April and May of 1866, Tennessee had confined the right to vote to whites. The Tennessee Senate refused a suffrage bill which allowed all blacks and whites of legal age to vote but excluded after 1,875 all who could not read. Sumner wanted Johnson to insist on Negro suffrage in Tennessee, but Johnson explained that if he were in Tennessee he would take a stand, but that he could not in Washington. Sumner remained in Washington half through May and saw the president almost daily, always seizing opportunity to present his views on Reconstruction, and insisting on suffrage for Negroes. Just before leaving Washington, Sumner had a final interview with the president. He found him cordial and apparently unchanged. Sumner apologized for repeating his views expressed before. Johnson said, with a smile, have I not always listened to you? Sumner, as he left, assured his friends and correspondents that the cause he had at heart was safe with Andrew Johnson. Point 19. Disturbing signs, however, began to occur. Carl Schurz wrote in May concerning the plans of Southern leaders in Mississippi, Georgia, and North Carolina. Thaddeus Stevens was alarmed at the president's recognition of the Pierpont government of Virginia. A caucus was, therefore, called at the National Hotel at Washington, May 12, to prevent the administration from going completely astray. Wade and Sumner said the president was in no danger, and that he was in favor of Negro suffrage. Sumner may have been oversanguine and read into Johnson's words more than Johnson intended, but it is certain that Sumner received a definite understanding that President Johnson stood for real emancipation and Negro suffrage. Here then was Andrew Johnson in 1865, born at the bottom of society, and during his early life a radical defender of the poor, the landless, and the exploited. In the heyday of his early political career, he railed against land monopoly in the South and after the Civil War, wanted the land of the monopolists divided among peasant proprietors. Suddenly, by the weird magic of history, he becomes military dictator of a nation. He becomes the man by whom the greatest moral and economic revolution that ever took place in the United States, and perhaps in modern times, was to be put into effect. He becomes the real emancipator of four millions of black slaves, who have suffered more than anything that he had experienced in his earlier days. They not only have no lands, they have not owned even their bodies, nor their clothes, nor their tools. They have been exploited down to the ownership of their own families, they have been poor by law, and ignorant by force. What more splendid opportunity could the champion of labor and the exploited have had to start a nation towards freedom? Johnson took over Lincoln's cabinet with an anti-abolitionist Whig a pro-slavery Democrat, and a liberal student of industry, among others. This cabinet lasted a little over a year when early in July, 1866, three members, Denison, Harlan and Speed, resigned, being unwilling to oppose Congress. In all their logical sequence, the Reconstruction policies now associated with Johnson's name were laid down by Seward, and his logic overwhelmed Johnson. As Stevens explained, Seward entered into him, and ever since they have been running down steep places into the sea. The cabinet met at Seward's house May 9, and on May 29, Johnson issued a proclamation of amnesty which showed the Seward influence. Indeed, nothing was left, apparently, of Johnson's liberalism, except the exclusion from amnesty, 
not simply of the leaders of the Confederacy, but of the rich those worth $20,000 or more. Seward opposed this, but it was the only thing that he yielded to Johnson's liberalism. He early convinced Johnson that Reconstruction was a matter for the President to settle and especially he opened the door to his thorough conversion when the power of further pardons was put into Johnson's hand. Seward, who had remained secretary after Lincoln's death, had used all the powers of his persuasive eloquence to satisfy President Johnson that all now to be done was simply to restore the Union by at once readmitting the states lately in rebellion to their full constitutional functions as regular states of the Union, and that then, being encouraged by this mark of confidence, the late master class in the South could be trusted with the recognition and protection of the emancipated slaves. That Mr. Seward urged such advice upon the President, there is good reason for believing. Not only was it common report, but it accorded also strikingly with Mr. Seward's singular turn of mind concerning the slavery question. As after the outbreak of the secession movement he peremptorily relegated the slavery question to the background in spite of its evident importance in the civil war and of the influence it would inevitably exercise upon the opinion and attitude of foreign nations, so he may have been forgetful of the national duty of honor to secure the rights of the freedmen and the safety of the Southern Union men in his impatient desire to restore the Union in point of form. Point 20. Johnson was transformed. From the champion of peasant labor, he saw himself as the restorer of national unity, and the benefactor and almsgiver to those very elements in the South which had formerly despised him. Of his real role as emancipator, and the one who was to give effective freedom to Negroes, he still had not the slightest idea. He could not conceive of Negroes as men. And equally, he had no adequate idea of the industrial transformation that was going on in the North. There were, of course, the inevitable scars of the war, the loss of a million men and $12 billion in property, eventual pensions and indirect losses, the revolution in southern agriculture, the universal lowering of ethical standards which always follows war. The West was uneasy on account of taxes, debt, and the money situation. In New York and Boston, men engaged in foreign commerce wanted speedy restoration of the South and a reduction in the tariff to increase their business. These complicated threads varied and changed as time went on. But when the 39th Congress met, the war business boom was still on, failures had disappeared, prices had increased. Wealth was being concentrated among the manufacturers, merchants, financiers, and speculators. There were great amounts of waiting capital and all of these interests wanted the war stopped, and the South restored. Sumner had not left Washington ten days before his hopes for a just reconstruction on the basis of Negro suffrage were killed by the President's proclamation. Johnson's plan of reconstruction included the abolition of slavery, the repudiation of war debts, the nullification of secession ordinances, and the appointment of provisional governors to help in the reconstruction of civil government. Only those white folks who could take the loyal oath would take part in this reconstruction. In other words, this was practically Lincoln's plan and it was also the Wade Davis plan, save that there was no open or expressed recognition of any power or function of Congress except as judging the legality of elections. Johnson did not eventually even admit, as Lincoln apparently had agreed, that Congress was final judge as to whether these states could hold legal elections. Congress had adjourned before Lee's surrender, and it was widely believed that had Lincoln lived, a special session would have been summoned. The Seward-Johnson Compromise proposed not to call Congress. In one way, the decision was shrewd. It gave the administration nine months to carry out its policy, and if the policy was successful, Congress would, when it met, be faced by a fait accompli, a nation at peace, a South restored with slavery abolished. What more could the nation want? On the other hand, the attempt was full of risk. Already the power of the executive had gone far beyond the dreams of living men. It must be curbed sooner or later. The military dictatorship which had carried on the war must, as soon as possible after the war, be tempered by democracy. The attempt to do even what the nation wanted without this was foolish. An attempt to override the will of the nation was suicidal, and yet that was precisely what Seward and Johnson eventually attempted. May 29th the declaration of amnesty was issued, and that same month, 
provisional governors were appointed for North Carolina and Mississippi. In June, Georgia, Texas, Alabama, and South Carolina were given governors, and in July, Florida. Thus, three months after the assassination of Lincoln, Reconstruction was in operation, the Union Party divided in opinion, the Northern Democrats encouraged, and the South particularly encouraged. The South thereupon turned its attention on Johnson and brought to bear a second influence next in power to Seward's and in the end exceeding it. Southern leaders descended upon the president, not simply the former slave barons but new representatives of the poor whites. In less than nine months after the proclamation of amnesty, 14,000 prominent persons are said to have received pardons from the president. No wonder the attitude of Johnson towards the South and the leaders of the rebellion was transformed. The very inferiority complex which made him hate the white planter concealed a secret admiration for his arrogance and address. Carl Schurz was coldly received when he returned from the southern trip which Johnson had urged upon him. Arrived at Washington, I reported myself at once at the White House. The president's private secretary, who seemed surprised to see me, announced me to the president, who sent out word that he was busy. When would it please the president to receive me? The private secretary could not tell, as the president's time was much occupied by urgent business. I left the anteroom, but called again the next morning. The president was still busy. I asked the private secretary to submit to the president that I had returned from a three months journey made at the president's personal request, that I thought it my duty respectfully to report myself back, and that I should be obliged to the president if he would let me know whether, and, if so, when, he would receive me to that end. The private secretary went in again and brought out the answer that the president would see me in an hour or so. At the appointed time, I was admitted. The president received me without a smile of welcome. His mien was sullen. I said that I had returned from the journey which I had made in obedience to his demand and was ready to give him, in addition to the communications I had already sent him, such further information as was in my possession. A moment's silence followed. Then he inquired about my health. I thanked him for the inquiry and hoped the president's health was good. He said it was. Another pause, which I brought to an end by saying that I wished to supplement the letters I had written to him from the South with an elaborate report giving my experiences and conclusions in a connected shape. The president looked up and said that I need not go to the trouble of writing out such a general report on his account. I replied that it would be no trouble at all but I considered it a duty. The president did not answer. The silence became awkward and I bowed myself out. President Johnson evidently wished to suppress my testimony as to the condition of things in the South. I resolved not to let him do so. I had conscientiously endeavored to see Southern conditions as they were. I had not permitted any political considerations or any preconceived opinions on my part, to obscure my perception and discernment in the slightest degree. I had told the truth as I learned it and understood it, with the severest accuracy, and I thought it due to the country that the truth be known. Among my friends in Washington there were different opinions as to how the striking change in President Johnson's attitude had been brought about. Some told me that during the summer the White House had been fairly besieged by Southern men and women of high social standing who had told the President that the only element of trouble in the South consisted in a lot of fanatical abolitionists who excited the Negroes with all sorts of dangerous notions, and that all would be well if he would only restore the Southern state governments as quickly as possible, according to his own plan as laid down in his North Carolina proclamation, and that he was a great man to whom they looked up as their savior. Now it was thought that Mr. Johnson, the plebeian who before the war had been treated with undisguised contempt by the slave-holding aristocracy, could not withstand the subtle flattery of the same aristocracy when they flocked around him as humble suppliants cajoling his vanity. Point 21. In fact, personally, Johnson liked the slaveholders. He admired their manners, he enjoyed their carriage and clothes. They were quite naturally his ideal of what a gentleman should be. He could not help being tremendously flattered when they noticed him and actually sued for his favor. As compared with Northerners, he found them free, natural and expansive, rather than cold, formal, and hypocritical. Johnson's change of mind during the last ten days of May, 
1865, was probably due to the flatteries of Southern leaders, to the notice taken of his intoxication in the Senate by Sumner and others, to the councils of Preston King and the Blairs who sheltered him after that unfortunate exhibition, and above all to Seward. Johnson's program swung swiftly into its stride. Already May 9, the laws of the United States had been put in operation in Virginia and the Alexandria government thus recognized. Johnson recognized the reconstruction already accomplished in Louisiana, Arkansas, and Tennessee. So that by midsummer all the seceded states had been reconstructed under the Johnson plan except Texas. During the autumn, summer, and winter of 1865, elections for delegates to constitutional conventions were ordered in Mississippi, Alabama, South Carolina, North Carolina, Georgia, and Florida, on the basis of white suffrage. Before Congress met, these conventions had all passed ordinances repealing the secession ordinances, or pronouncing them null and void. All except Mississippi and South Carolina had repudiated the Confederate debt. All had amended their constitutions abolishing slavery or recognizing its disappearance. State officers and representatives in Congress had been elected. Senators had also been chosen, except in Florida. All the states had adopted the Thirteenth Amendment, except Florida and Mississippi, North Carolina had adopted the amendment with reservations, Florida adopted the amendment with reservations December 18, and elected senators. Against this suddenly marshaled and quickly executed plan of Johnson and his advisers, there was at the time no organized opposition. Congress was unquestionably determined to have the last word in the matter but not decided as to what the word would be. The abolitionists wanted the freedom of the slaves guaranteed, and some of them saw Negro suffrage as the only method of accomplishing it, while still fewer recognized that a minimum of land and capital was absolutely necessary even to make the ballot effective. The majority of Northerners simply wanted to get rid of the question as quickly as possible. They were disposed to agree in the main with Johnson, but they were afraid that he was moving too fast, and that the South was returning to the Union without guarantees either so far as the freedmen were concerned, or with regard to the problem of debt, the tariff, and national finance. Charles Sumner, representing the abolition democracy, agitated the question all summer. He brought up the matter on the streets, at dinner, and in society. He wrote his views for the Atlantic Monthly and had it and his speeches distributed widely. On June 21, 1865, there was a public meeting in Philadelphia, on Negro suffrage, at which reports were read of reaction in the South. Sumner wrote to the members of Johnson's cabinet and urged them to change their course of action and not to follow the advice of Seward. But, although four members of the cabinet were sympathetic, they took no action, and Sumner wrote to Lieber on August 11, they were all courtiers, as if they were counselors of the king. Stevens, Davis, and Wade were in despair against an executive who had both military power and the power of patronage and was as yet unmoved by any unity of opinion in the North. Moreover, it did not seem wise to make as yet a fight on the basis of Negro suffrage. Too few Northern people agreed with it. Most public men and journalists gave no support to Sumner's demand for Negro suffrage. The governor of Indiana denounced it. The governor of Massachusetts was sure of the president's honesty of purpose, the editor of the New York Evening Post advised against any coercive action by Congress in the matter of suffrage, and the New York Times stood absolutely against it. Is there no way to arrest the insane course of the president in reorganization, asked Stevens, in the summer of 1865. If something is not done, wrote Sumner, the president will be crowned king before Congress meets. The abolitionists opened a campaign to convert the North to Negro suffrage, carrying on a propaganda with the money of industry and the logic of abolition democracy. The speeches of Sumner, Kelly, Phillips, and Douglas on Negro suffrage were printed and sent broadcast. Stearns wrote, I am distributing 10,000 copies to anti-slavery men in all the free states, but desiring to increase the number to 100,000 or more invite you to aid in its circulation 22 he raised $50,000 in the fall of 1865 to send out 100,000 newspapers and 50,000 pamphlets a week, and himself printed between 20,000 and 40,000 copies of Sumner's Worcester speech, 
October 12, 1865. Later the Schur's report and his newspaper articles formed strong documents. Yet the conversion of public opinion in the United States to Negro citizenship and suffrage was long and difficult. There were harassing questions that presented themselves to the majority of people in the North, could a government, by united and determined effort, raise the Negroes to full American citizenship? Of course it could, if they were men, but were they men? Even if they were men, was it good policy thus to raise a great new working, voting class? On this point there was less open argument, but it lay in the minds of businessmen, and influenced their outlook and action. Johnson sensed the trend toward Negro suffrage and taking a leaf from Lincoln's book, sought to stem it. But Johnson's mind was not like Lincoln's. Lincoln moved forward to Negro suffrage, Johnson, alarmed, retreated to it. August 15, he had wired to his nominee, Sharkey, provisional governor of Mississippi. If you could extend the elective franchise to all persons of color who can read the Constitution of the United States in English and write their names, and to all persons of color who own real estate valued at not less than $250, and pay taxes thereon, you would completely disarm the adversary and set an example the other states will follow. This you can do with perfect safety, and you thus place the southern states, in reference to free persons of color upon the same basis with the free states. I hope and trust your convention will do this, and, as a consequence, the radicals, who are wild upon Negro franchise, will be completely foiled in their attempt to keep the southern states from renewing their relations to the Union by not accepting their senators and representatives. Point 23. Blaine says that this advice was sent to other provisional governors, but nothing came of it chiefly because Johnson did not insist and his heart was not in the suggestion. Sumner's words showed that union between northern industrialists and abolition democracy had been growing during the summer. After the autumn elections, Sumner sent a long telegram to President Johnson. On the Saturday evening before Congress met, he was with him two hours. He found him changed in temper and purpose, no longer sympathetic, or even kindly, but harsh, petulant, and unreasonable. Near the end of the interview, there was a colloquy, in which the President reminded the Senator of murders in Massachusetts and assaults in Boston as an offset to outrages in the South visited on Negroes and white Union men, under the inspiration of political or race animosity. The two parted that evening not to meet again the Senator leaving with the painful conviction that the President's whole soul was set as a flint against the good cause and that by assassination of Abraham Lincoln, the rebellion had vaulted into the presidential chair 24. Meantime, the Massachusetts Republican Convention approved Negro suffrage as a condition of Reconstruction, and they were followed by Vermont, Iowa, and Minnesota. The other Republican conventions were not explicit, but the conviction grew in the North that state governments in the South, which would curb the political power of ex-Confederates and ensure the freedom of Negroes, could not be established without Negro suffrage. Sumner led in spreading this opinion, stressing naturally the rights of Negroes. He wrote to Mr. Bright, November 14. The President's experiment appears to be breaking down, but at what fearful cost! The rebels have once more been put on their legs, the freedmen and the unionists are down. This is very sad. I cannot be otherwise than unhappy as I think of it. Our session is uncertain. Nobody can tell certainly what pressure the President will bring to bear on Congress, and how Congress can stand it. I think that Congress will insist upon time this will be our first demand, and then generally upon adequate guarantees. There are unpleasant stories from Washington, but we must persevere to the end. Point 25. In October, Johnson began openly to argue against Negro suffrage. In an interview with George L. Stearns of Massachusetts, he reminded him that Negro suffrage could not have been argued in the North seven years before and that the South must have time to understand its new position. If I interfered with the vote in the rebel states, to dictate that no Negro shall vote, I might do the same for my own purpose in Pennsylvania. Our only safety lies in allowing each state to control the right of voting by its own laws, and we have the power to control the rebel states if they go wrong. My position here is different from what it would be if I were in Tennessee. 
there I should try to introduce Negro suffrage gradually, first, those who had served in the army, those who could read and write, and perhaps a property qualification for others, say $200 or $250. It would not do to let the Negro have universal suffrage now, it would breed a war of races. Point 26. He went on to develop this thesis which was a favorite one with him, that Negroes and poor whites naturally hated each other, and that the outrages in the South were chiefly of poor whites on Negroes, and Negroes on poor whites, and if suffrage was given the Negro, he would vote with the master and thus precipitate a race war in the South. That there was truth in this fear, the subsequent history of Reconstruction proved, but it did not turn out as Andrew Johnson anticipated. Johnson had little knowledge of Negroes, although he had owned a few slaves, he accepted most of the current Southern patterns. He believed that the Negro was lazy and could not survive freedom. He was afraid he might be tempted to lawlessness and insurrection. He spoke to certain colored folk May 11, 1865, according to the Philadelphia Press of May 20, and stated that he had to deplore the existence of an idea among them that they have nothing to do but to fall back upon the government for support in order that they may be taken care of in idleness and debauchery. October 10, 1865 he talked to the 1st Colored Regiment of the District of Columbia troops who had recently returned from the South. He congratulated them on serving with patience and endurance and exhorted them to be tranquil and peaceful now that the war was ended. Freedom is not a mere idea. Freedom is not simply the principle to live in idleness. Liberty does not mean merely to resort to the low saloons and other places of disreputable character. Freedom and liberty does not mean that people ought to live in licentiousness, but liberty means simply to be industrious and to be virtuous, to be upright in all our deals and relations with men. You must give evidence that you are competent for the rights that the government has guaranteed you. The institution of slavery is overthrown. But another part remains to be solved, and that is, can four millions of people, reared as they have been, with all the prejudices of the whites can they take their places in the community, and be made to work harmoniously and congruously in our system? This is a problem to be considered. Are the digestive powers of the American government sufficient to receive this element in a new shape, and digest it and make it work healthfully upon the system that has incorporated it? He then hinted at colonization of the Negro population. If it should be so that the two races cannot agree and live in peace and prosperity, and the laws of providence require that they should be separated in that event, looking to the far distant future, and trusting in God that it may never come if it should come, providence, that works mysteriously, but unerringly, and certainly, will point out the way, and the mode, and the manner by which these people are to be separated, and they are to be taken to their land of inheritance and promise, for such a one is before them. Hence we are making the experiment.27. Congress met in December, 1865, with the determination to control the reconstruction of the Union. And in this there is no question but that Congress was right. If the nation was going backward to the same status in which it was before the war, it was conceivable that this might be done by executive action. But there were two tremendous changes that made this unthinkable, one was the abolition of slavery and the other was the new political power which the emancipation of these slaves would confer upon the South. Moreover, there appeared from the South, demanding seats at the opening of Congress, the Vice President of the Confederacy, four Confederate generals, five Confederate colonels, six Confederate cabinet officers, and fifty-eight Confederate congressmen, none of whom was able to take the oath of allegiance. The case of Alex H. Stevens late Vice President of the Confederacy, was especially aggravating. Four months before he had been a prisoner at Fort Warren. Pardoned by the President, he waited not a moment to repent and return to Georgia, was elected to the United States Senate, and was now asking admission asking to govern the country he had been trying to destroy. Twenty-eight moreover one of the worst of the new black codes was passed in Mississippi in November. Thaddeus Stevens took immediate lead. He called in caucus 20 or 30 of his followers, December 1st, on December 2nd, the Republican caucus met, and Stevens submitted his plan. To claim the whole question of Reconstruction as the exclusive business of Congress. 
to regard the steps taken by the President as only provisional. Each House to postpone consideration of the admission of members from southern states. And that a joint committee of 15 be appointed to inquire into the condition of the former Confederate states. Without waiting even for the reception of the President's message, Stevens proposed in the House a resolution for a joint committee of 15 members of the House and Senate to inquire into the condition of the states which formed the so-called Confederate States of America, and report whether they or any of them are entitled to be represented in either House of Congress, with leave to report at any time by bill or otherwise, and until such report shall have been made and finally acted upon. By Congress, no member shall be received into either House from any of the said so-called Confederate States, and all papers relating to the representation of the said states shall be referred to the said committee without debate. 29. By vote of 129 to 35 with 18 not voting, the rules were suspended and this resolution passed. This was the first test of political strength in the new Congress. The Senate did not take up the matter until December 12. The joint resolution was changed to a concurrent resolution in order to make the approval of the President unnecessary. The section of the resolution concerning the reception of members and reference of all papers was objected to and the resolution was amended so as to direct the committee to inquire into the condition of the states which formed the so-called Confederate States of America, and report whether they, or any of them, are entitled to be represented in either House of Congress, with leave to report at any time by bill or otherwise 30. This amended form the House concurred in, but passed another House resolution to admit no Southern members, and to refer all motions and papers. Eventually, Stevens had his way, and after Johnson's speech of February 22, the Senate assented to excluding representatives from the South until both Houses agreed. Industry was uneasy at the Stevens plan. The New York Herald claimed it created lack of business confidence North and South. Such a lack of confidence, of course, would hinder economic development in the South, and to that extent limit New York's commercial prosperity. Commerce was especially alarmed lest Thaddeus Stevens should use his machine for carrying out his scheme of confiscation of Southern lands. Such wholesale confiscation, capital could not contemplate. Local harmony, law and order, the development of the vast industrial resources of the South, seemed wisest in New York. Johnson, in his message of December 4, began an extraordinary series of state papers which he could never have written all by himself. Johnson's state papers, including vetoes, were uniformly in good temper, conservative, historical and well considered. In the preparation of them he made use of every person on whom he could lay his hands. Bancroft wrote the first message to Congress, Jerry Black, the hero of ex part Milligan, wrote the Reconstruction veto, Seward, the precise scholar, supervised much that the President wrote, Stanton, the practical lawyer, wrote the bill to admit North Carolina and other states into the Union in 1865, the Attorney General, Wells, Secretary of the Navy, and other members of the Cabinet he frequently used.31. In his first message, he forecast the adoption of the Thirteenth Amendment, which, in fact, occurred December 18. He explained that because of this anticipated abolition of slavery, he had proceeded to begin reorganization of the states and admission to their full rights in the Union. He knew that this policy was attended with some risk but the risk must be taken. The relations of the general government towards the four millions of inhabitants whom the war has called into freedom has engaged my most serious consideration. On the propriety of attempting to make the freedmen electors by the proclamation of the executive, I took for my counsel the Constitution itself, the interpretation of that instrument by its authors and their contemporaries, and recent legislation by Congress. When, at the first movement towards independence, the Congress of the United States instructed the several states to institute governments of their own, they left each state to decide for itself the conditions for the enjoyment of the elective franchise. Moreover, a concession of the elective franchise to the freedmen, by act of the President of the United States, must have been extended to all colored men, wherever found, and so must have established a change of suffrage in the northern, middle and western states, not less than in the southern and southwestern. Such an act would have created a new class of voters, 
and would have been an assumption of power by the President which nothing in the Constitution or laws of the United States would have warranted. On the other hand, every danger of conflict is avoided when the settlement of the question is referred to the several states. They can, each for itself, decide on the measure, and whether it is to be adopted at once and absolutely, or introduced gradually and with conditions. In my judgment, the freedmen, if they show patience and manly virtues, will sooner obtain a participation in the elective franchise through the states than through the general government, even if it had power to intervene. When the tumult of emotions that have been raised by the suddenness of the social change shall have subsided, it may prove that they will receive the kindliest usage from some of those on whom they have heretofore most closely depended. But while I have no doubt that now, after the close of the war, it is not competent for the general government to extend the elective franchise in the several states, it is equally clear that good faith requires the security of the freedmen in their liberty and in their property, their right to labor, and their right to claim the just return of their labor. I cannot too strongly urge a dispassionate treatment of this subject, which should be carefully kept aloof from all party strife. We must equally avoid hasty assumptions of any natural impossibility for the two races to live side by side, in a state of mutual benefit and goodwill. The experiment involves us in no inconsistency, let us, then, go on and make that experiment in good faith, and not be too easily disheartened. The country is in need of labor, and the freedmen are in need of work, culture, and protection. And then came a characteristic turn of thought, while their right of voluntary migration and expatriation is not to be questioned, I would not advise their forced removal and colonization. Here President Johnson was clearly envisaging the extinction or voluntary removal of four million laborers in the South, and the settlement of the problem of their presence in the United States by replacing them with white labor. On the other hand, he seemed anxious to have them protected in their present new status and it was understood, both from the message and from other sources, that the President was in favor of continuing the Freedmen's Bureau. The temper of Congress was firm. What should be done in Reconstruction was a matter for deliberation, thought and care. It could not be settled by the Southern leaders who brought on the crisis, working alone in conjunction with the President and his Cabinet. On the other hand, what the nation wanted was by no means clear. There was among its millions no one mind. There was among its various groups no unanimity. The mind of Thaddeus Stevens evolved a course of action. This plan was to set up at least temporarily a cabinet form of responsible government in the United States, to put in power a camarilla of representatives of the various sections, groups, and parties, who, by deliberation and inquiry, would find out what action could command a majority in the House and in the Senate. This in itself was the beginning of a momentous change in our government, a change unfortunately never carried completely through, and the failure to carry it through has hampered the United States government ever since. The original idea of the Congress was a small, deliberative assembly in two houses which should think and argue matters through, and then have their decisions enforced by the executive, and coordinated and clarified by a Supreme Court. But Congress grew to unwieldy size, the executive grew in prestige and power, until during the Civil War, he became a dictator, while the Supreme Court was destined to assume powers which would at times threaten to stop the progress of the nation, almost without appeal. Moreover, the contingency of an executive, who far from being the servant of a congressional majority was antagonistic and even a contradictory source of authority and action, never occurred to the fathers. They did not intend to have the President a mere mouthpiece of Congress, and, for this reason, they gave him the message and the veto, but on the other hand, they never conceived that he should be in himself both executive and lawgiver and yet this he practically was during and after the Civil War, he exemplified at the time of Andrew Johnson a new and extraordinary situation in which the President of the United States in vital particulars was opposed to the overwhelming majority of the party. In Congress which had elected him, and refused in effect to do their will. This had to be remedied, and for this, the Committee of Fifteen, on the motion of Thaddeus Stevens, came into being in the 39th Congress. It was government on the English parliamentary model with two modifications, it was responsible to two houses instead of to one, which enormously delayed and complicated its functioning, 
and it contained representatives of the opposition party although this representation was often nullified through caucuses and subcommittees. It was the business of the Committee of Fifteen to see how the government of the United States was to be changed after the war, from its form before the war, and this involved, first, some change in the basis of popular representation, secondly, a clarification of the status of the Negro, and finally it brought a modification of the relation of the national government to state government, not simply in civil rights but even more in industry and labor. It was through the first and second that the majority, which eventually dominated the 39th Congress, gained its moral power. It was through the third that the moral power was implemented. Stevens was too astute a politician to stress first the moral foundation of his argument. In his first speech, as leader of the 39th Congress, he placed his main argument on representation, because he knew that that would appeal to the men sitting in front of him, and representing national wealth and industry. In December, 1865, when the 13th Amendment was adopted, a curious result followed, 29 representatives were added to the South. Since the adoption of the Constitution, the basis of congressional representation had been the free population, including free Negroes and three-fifths of the slaves. Stevens said that with this basis of representation unchanged, the 83 Southern members, with the Democrats, that will in the best times be elected from the North, will always give them a majority in Congress and in the Electoral College. They will at the very first election take possession of the White House and the halls of Congress. I need not depict the ruin that would follow. Assumption of the rebel debt or repudiation of the federal debt would be sure to follow. The oppression of the freedmen, the remendment of their state constitutions, and the re-establishment of slavery would be the inevitable result. That they would scorn and disregard their present constitutions, forced upon them in the midst of martial law, would be both natural and just. No one who has any regard for freedom of elections can look upon those governments, forced upon them in duress, with any favor. This was the cogent, clear argument of Thaddeus Stevens, the politician. But Thaddeus Stevens was never a mere politician. He cared nothing for constitutional subtleties nor even for political power. He was a stern believer in democracy, both in politics and in industry, and he made his second argument turn on the economic freedom of the slave. We have turned, or are about to turn, Loose four million slaves without a hut to shelter them or a cent in their pockets. The infernal laws of slavery have prevented them from acquiring an education, understanding the commonest laws of contract, or of managing the ordinary business life. This Congress is bound to provide for them until they can take care of themselves. If we do not furnish them with homesteads, and hedge them around with protective laws, if we leave them to the legislation of their late masters, we had better have left them in bondage. He then resolutely went further in a defense of pure democracy, although he knew that in this argument he was venturing far beyond the practical beliefs of his auditors. Governor Perry of South Carolina and other provisional governors and orators proclaim that this is the white man's government. Demagogues of all parties, even some high in authority, gravely shout, this is the white man's government. What is implied by this? That one race of men are to have the exclusive rights forever to rule this nation, and to exercise all acts of sovereignty, while all other races and nations and colors are to be their subjects, and have no voice in making the laws and choosing the rulers by whom they are to be governed. Our fathers repudiated the whole doctrine of the legal superiority of families or races, and proclaimed the equality of men before the law. Upon that they created a revolution and built the republic. They were prevented by slavery from perfecting the superstructure whose foundation they had thus broadly laid. For the sake of the Union they consented to wait, but never relinquished the idea of its final completion. The time to which they looked forward with anxiety has come. It is our duty to complete their work. If this republic is not now made to stand on their great principles, it has no honest foundation, and the father of all men will still shake it to its center. If we have not yet been sufficiently scourged for our national sin to teach us to do justice to all God's creatures, without distinction of race or color, we must expect the still more heavy vengeance of an offended father. This is not a white man's government, in the exclusive sense in which it is used. 
To say so is political blasphemy, for it violates the fundamental principles of our gospel of liberty. This is man's government, the government of all men alike, not that all men will have equal power and sway within it. Accidental circumstances, natural and acquired endowment and ability, will vary their fortunes. But equal rights to all the privileges of the government is innate in every immortal being, no matter what the shape or color of the tabernacle which it inhabits. Sir, this doctrine of a white man's government is as atrocious as the infamous sentiment that damned the late Chief Justice to everlasting fame, and, I fear, to everlasting fire.32. The ensuing debate in the House and Senate flamed over all creation, but it started with a note of moral triumph. The newly elected speaker declared. The fires of civil war have broken every fetter in the land and proved the funeral pyre of slavery. The chaplain of the Senate increased this moral afflatus with religious fervor, thankful that. The Statue of Freedom now looks down from our capital upon an entire nation of free men, and that we are permitted by the dispensation of thy providence, and the way being prepared, to give liberty to the captive, the opening of the prison to them that are bound, and to proclaim the acceptable year of our God. The chaplain of the house said. O oh God, we stand today on the soil of a nation which is, not alone by inference or report, but by the solemn announcement of the constituted authorities, declared free in every part and parcel of its territory. Blessed be thy name, O oh God, for thy wonderful ending of this terrible conflict. Congressional amendments of every sort poured into Congress concerning the national and confederate debt, the civil rights of freedmen, the establishment of republican government, the basis of representation, payment for slaves and the future powers of federal government and the states. Arguments swirled in a maelstrom of logic. No matter where it started, and how far afield in legal metaphysics it strayed, always it returned and had to return to two focal points, shall the South be rewarded for unsuccessful secession by increased political power, and, can the freed Negro be a part of American democracy? Thither all argument again and again returned, but it tried desperately to crowd out these real points by appealing to higher constitutional metaphysics. This constitutional argument was astonishing. Around and around it went in dizzy, silly dialectics. Here were grown, sensible men arguing about a written form of government adopted ninety years before, when men did not believe that slavery could outlive their generation in this country, or that civil war could possibly be its result when no man foresaw the Industrial Revolution or the rise of the Cotton Kingdom, and yet now, with incantation and abracadabra, the leaders of a nation tried to peer back into the magic crystal, and out of a bit of paper called the Constitution, find eternal end. Immutable law laid down for their guidance forever and ever, Amen. They knew perfectly well that no such omniscient law existed or ever had existed. Yet, in order to conceal the fact, they twisted and distorted and argued, these states are dead, but states can never die. These states have gone out of the Union, but states can never go out of the Union, and to prevent this we fought and won a war, but while we were fighting, these states were certainly not in the Union, else why did we fight? And how now may they come back? They are already back because they were never really out. Then what were we fighting for? For Union. But we had union and we have got union, only these constituent states are dead and we must bring them to life. But states never die. Then they have forfeited statehood and become territories. But statehood cannot be forfeited, conspirators within the states interfered, and now the interference has stopped. But as long as the interference lasted, there was surely no union. Oh, yes, only it did not function we need not now provide for its functioning again, for the Constitution already provides for that. Where was the Constitution during the war? But the war is ended, and now the Constitution prevails, unless the Constitution prevails, this is no nation, there is no president, we have no real Congress, since it does not represent the nation. But who represented the nation during the war? And by that token, who saved the nation and killed slavery? Shall the nation that saved the nation now surrender its power to rebels who fought to preserve slavery? There are no rebels. The South is loyal and slavery is dead. How can the loyalty of the South be guaranteed, 
and has the black slave been made really free? Freedom is a matter of state right. So was secession. Must we fight that battle over again? Yes, if you try to make monkeys equal to men. What caused the war but your own insistence that men were at once monkeys and real estate? Gentlemen, gentlemen, and fellow Americans, let us have peace. But what is peace? Is it slavery of all poor men, and increased political power for the slaveholders? Do you want to wreak vengeance on the conquered and the unfortunate? Do you want to reward rebellion by increased power to rebels? And so on, around and around, and up and down, day after day, week after week, with only here and there a keen, straight mind to cut the cobwebs and to say in effect with Seward through Johnson, damn the nigger, let us settle down to work and trade. Or to declare with Stevens and Sumner, make the slaves free with land, education, and the ballot, and then let the South return to its place. Or to say with Blaine and Conkling and Bingham, not in words but in action, guard property and industry, when their position is impregnable, let the South return, we will then hold it with black votes, until we capture it with white capital. After all this blather, the nation and its Congress found itself back to the two plain problems, the basis of representation in Congress and the status of the Negro. When it came to the Negro, the old dogmatism leaped to the fore and would not down. Chandler of New York regarded Farnsworth's demand for Negro equality as not only an attack on foreigners but an insult to white citizens. When the Constitution said people, it meant white people. And he stood for the purity of the white race. Fink declared that Ohio would never let Negroes vote with his consent. This is and of right ought to be a white man's government, said Boyer of Pennsylvania and he declared that 18 of the 25 states now represented in Congress would not let the Negro vote. Yet the argument for freedom and democracy loomed high and clear. Slavery, but a short time ago received as a God-given condition of men, has fallen under the banner of a purer morality, and come down with the curses of a Christian world. With the fall of slavery must also fall the things pertaining thereto. The master who yesterday had his heel upon the neck of his slave, today meets that slave upon the level of common equality. The Negro should be carefully considered in this question of reconstruction, for after all we are our brother's keeper and we must see that even-handed justice is meted out to the black man if possible. Woodbridge of Vermont declared. New social and political relations have been established. Four million people have been born in a day. The shackles have been stricken from four million chattels, and they have become in an hour living, thinking, moving, responsible beings, and citizens of these United States. And if Congress does not do something to provide for these people, if they do not prove equal to their duty, and come up to their work like men, the condition of the people will be worse than before. The South represented by the border states had to confine itself to constitutional metaphysics, or else blurt out, as some of its spokesmen did, a new defense of the old slavery. The West, on the other hand, had a real and disturbing argument and it was voiced by Voorhees in his dramatic attempt to drive a wedge between Johnson and the Republicans. He said, January 6, 1866. How long can the inequalities of our present revenue system be borne? How long will the poor and laborious pay tribute to the rich and the idle? We have two great interests in this country, one of which has prostrated the other. The past four years of suffering and war has been the opportune harvest of the manufacturer. The looms and machine shops of New England and the iron furnaces of Pennsylvania have been more prolific of wealth to their owners than the most dazzling gold mines of the earth. They are the results of class legislation, of a monopoly of trade established by law. It may be said that they indicate prosperity. Most certainly they do but it is the prosperity of one who obtains the property of his neighbor without any equivalent in return. The present law of tariff is being rapidly understood. It is no longer a deception, but rather a well-defined and clearly recognized outrage. The agricultural labor of the land is driven to the counters of the most gigantic monopoly ever before sanctioned by law. From its exorbitant demands there is no escape. The European manufacturer is forbidden our ports of trade for fear he might sell his goods at cheaper rates and thus relieve the burden of the consumer. 
we have declared by law that there is but one market in which our citizens shall go to make their purchases, and we have left it to the owners of the markets to fix their own prices.33. This was another unanswerable argument. But, having made it, what was Voorhees' remedy? His logical remedy would have been to unite the industrial democracy of the West with the abolition democracy of the East in order to fight oligarchy in northern industry and the attempt to re-establish agricultural oligarchy in the South. Yet this was farthest from his intention. His immediate effort was to embarrass and split the Republicans by forcing them to endorse or repudiate their own president and leader, his ultimate program, if he had one was to seek with Andrew Johnson to restore oligarchy in the South with a dominant planter class and serfdom for the emancipated Negroes. This was unthinkable, and it deprived the radical West of all moral sympathy and voting power which its economic revolt deserved. What was it the nation wanted? Charles Sumner told the nation what it ought to want, but there was no doubt but that it did not yet want this. Thaddeus Stevens knew what the nation ought to want, but as a practical politician his business was to see how much of this he could get enacted into actual law. There came before the 39th Congress some 140 different proposals to change the Constitution of the United States, including 45 on apportionment, 31 on civil and political rights, and 13 forbidding payment for slaves. Over half of these affected the status of the freedmen. Before the Committee of Fifteen could sift these and settle to its larger task of fixing the future basis of representation and the degree of national guardianship which Negro freedmen called for, there seemed to be two measures upon which public opinion in the North was so far crystallized that legislation might safely be attempted. These were, a permanent Freedmen's Bureau, and a bill to protect the civil rights of Negroes. On the first day of business of the 39th Congress, there were introduced into the Senate two bills on these subjects. The Civil Rights Bill was taken up December 13, but Sherman of Ohio reminded the Senate that there was scarcely a state in the Union that did not make distinctions on account of color, and wished, therefore, to postpone action until the 13th Amendment had been adopted. Salisbury of Maryland called it an insane effort to elevate the African race to the dignity of the white race and claimed that the Thirteenth Amendment would carry no such power as Sherman assumed. Trumbull of Illinois, on the contrary, declared that the second section of the Thirteenth Amendment as reported by his committee was drawn. For the very purpose of conferring upon Congress authority to see that the first section was carried out in good faith, and for none other, and I hold that under that second section Congress will have the authority, when the constitutional amendment is adopted not only to pass the bill of the senator from Massachusetts, but a bill that will be much more efficient to protect the freedman in his rights. We may, if deemed advisable, continue the Freedmen's Bureau, clothe it with additional powers, and if necessary back it up with a military force, to see that the rights of the men made free by the first clause of the constitutional amendment are protected. And, sir, when the constitutional amendment shall have been adopted, if the information from the South be that the men whose liberties are secured by it are deprived of the privilege to go and come when they please, to buy and sell when they please, to make contracts and enforce contracts, I give notice that, if no one else does, I shall introduce a bill and urge its passage through Congress that will secure to those men every one of these rights, they would not be freemen without them.34. Congress asked the President for the specific facts concerning the situation in the South. The President replied with the report of General Grant, containing the superficial results of a hasty, five-day trip, and disingenuously tried to suppress the report of Carl Schurz, undoubtedly the most thoroughgoing and careful inquiry into the situation just after the war that had been made. Sumner expressed his indignation and the evident need of a civil rights bill. When I think of what occurred yesterday in this chamber, when I call to mind the attempt to whitewash the unhappy condition of the rebel states, and to throw the mantle of official oblivion over sickening and heart-rending outrages, where human rights are sacrificed and rebel barbarism receives a new letter of license, I feel that I ought to speak of nothing else. I stood here years ago, in the days of Kansas, when a small community was surrendered to the machinations of slave masters. I now stand here again, when, alas! An immense region, with millions of people, has been surrendered to the machinations of slave masters. Sir, 
it is the duty of Congress to stress this fatal fury. Congress must dare to be brave, it must dare to be just.35. He claimed that the Civil Rights Bill aimed simply to carry out and maintain the proclamation of emancipation, by which this republic is solemnly pledged to maintain the emancipated slave in his freedom. Such is our pledge, and the executive government of the United States, including the military and naval authority thereof, will recognize and maintain the freedom of such persons. This pledge is without any limitation in space or time. It is as extended and as immortal as the republic itself. Does anybody call it vain words? I trust not. To that pledge we are solemnly bound. Wherever our flag floats as long as time endures we must see that it is sacredly observed. But the performance of that pledge cannot be entrusted to another, least of all, can it be entrusted to the old slave masters, embittered against their slaves. It must be performed by the national government. The power that gave freedom must see that this freedom is maintained. This is according to reason. It is also according to the examples of history. In the British West Indies we find this teaching. Three of England's greatest orators and statesmen, Burke, Canning, and Brougham, at successive periods, united in declaring, from the experience in the British West Indies, that whatever the slave masters undertook to do for their slaves was always errant trifling, and that, whatever might be its plausible form, it always wanted the executive principle. More recently the Emperor of Russia, when ordering emancipation, declared that all efforts of his predecessors in this direction had failed because they had been left to the spontaneous initiative of the proprietors. I might say much more on this head but this is enough. I assume that no such blunder will be made on our part, that we shall not leave to the old proprietors the maintenance of that freedom to which we are pledged, and thus break our own promises and sacrifice a race. But Congress was not yet ready for this high ground and Sumner's scheme was widely criticized. White Law Reed, in a letter to the Cincinnati Gazette, March 3, 1868, recalled the profound surprise and bitterness of feeling with which Sumner's remarks were received by senators. Republican journals and leaders within the inner circles of the party were hostile.36. The Republicans were, especially, afraid of any split with the president lest this bring the Democrats into power, Forney of the Philadelphia Press begged Sumner to yield for the sake of harmony within the great political army in which he had been a conscientious and courageous leader. Protests against President Johnson's policy were therefore slow in expression. The nation was weary of war and objected to military administration in the South. Capitalists wanted pacification of the Southern Territory to open a market closed for four years. They wanted any method which would bring the quickest results. Moreover, Republicans held some of the largest states of the North by narrow majorities. Any unpopular step might put the Democrats in power. Office holders did not want to break with Johnson and candidates for office were timid. Congress made in effect the first overture to the South and instead of forcing civil and possibly political rights, turned to take up the bill which proposed government guardianship and tutelage for the blacks. The Civil Rights Bill was postponed and the Freedmen's Bureau Bill, which Johnson's message seemed to accept, was substituted. This was introduced as an amendment to the Act of March 3, 1865, and contained the following propositions, 1, that the Bureau should continue in force until abolished by law, 2, that it should embrace the whole country wherever there were freedmen and refugees, 3 that bureau officials should have annual salaries of $500 to $1,200, 4, that the president should set apart for the use of freedmen and loyal refugees unoccupied lands in the South, to be allotted in parcels not exceeding 40 acres each, 5, that the titles granted in pursuance of General Sherman's orders of January 16, 1865, be made valid, 6, that the commissioner procure land and erect suitable buildings as asylums and schools for dependent freedmen and refugees, 7, that it be the duty of the president to extend military protection and jurisdiction over all cases where any of the civil rights or immunities belonging to white persons, including the rights to make and enforce contracts, to give evidence, to inherit, buy, sell and hold property, etc., are refused or denied by local law 
prejudice on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude, or where different punishments or penalties are inflicted than are prescribed for white persons committing like offenses, 8, that it be made a misdemeanor, punishable by a fine of $1,000 or imprisonment for one year or both, for anyone depriving another of the above rights on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. These last sections were to apply to those states or districts where ordinary judicial proceedings had been interfered with by War.37. The bill was opposed as establishing a permanent bureau instead of a wartime emergency institution. Its great power was criticized and it was declared that its expense would be enormous. There were special objections to the validation of land titles under Sherman's orders and to the section on civil rights. It was defended as being not necessarily permanent, as in accordance with our Indian policy, and as not being expensive, since it was manned by army officers. It passed the Senate in January, 1866, by a vote of 37 to 10. In the House, Thaddeus Stevens tried to strengthen the bill by the most thoroughgoing provisions for government guardianship yet proposed. These provisions directed that food, clothes, medical attention and transportation be furnished white refugees and black freedmen and their families, that public land be set aside in Florida, Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana and Arkansas, and also from forfeited estates, to the extent of 3 million acres of good land, and that this should be parceled out to loyal white refugees and black freedmen at a rental not to exceed 10 cents an acre, and that at the end of a certain period this land be sold to the applicants at a price not to exceed $2 an acre. The occupants of land, under Sherman's order, were confirmed in their possession, unless the former owner proved his title, and in that case, other land at the rate of 40 acres a farm should be given to the applicant. The Bureau was to erect buildings for asylums and schools, and provide a common school education for all white refugees and freedmen who applied. This thoroughgoing substitute unhappily was lost. The bill which finally passed the House, February 6, extended the power of the Freedmen's Bureau to freedmen throughout the whole United States and provided for food and clothing for the destitute, a distribution of public lands among freedmen and white refugees in parcels not exceeding 40 acres each at a nominal rent and with an eventual chance of purchasing. The land assigned by Sherman was to be held for three years and then, if restored, other lands secured by rent or purchase. School buildings and asylums were to be erected when Congress appropriated the money. Full civil rights were to be enforced, and punishment was provided for those thwarting the civil rights of Negroes. This bill encountered strong opposition, especially from the border states. Salisbury of Delaware deliberately reiterated his contention that Congress had no right to abolish slavery, even if three-fourths of the states assented. With minor changes the bill was accepted by the Senate, February 9, and thus the first great measure of Reconstruction went to the President. Southern slavery had now been definitely abolished by constitutional amendment, and government guardianship of the Negro with land and court protection was assured by a permanent Freedmen's Bureau. What was the answer of the South to this? Where were Southern brains and leadership? Why did so many hide, like tombs? Why did the South have to trust its guidance to a half-educated, poor white president and a New York corporation lawyer? Suppose a Southern leader had appeared at that time and had said frankly, We propose to make the Negro actually free in his right to work, his legal status, and his personal safety. We are going to allow him to get, on easy terms, homesteads, so as gradually to replace the plantation system with peasant proprietors, and we are going to provide him and our poor whites with elementary schools. And when in time, he is able to read and write and accumulate a minimum of property, then, and not until then, he can cast a vote and be represented in Congress. What was there so wild and revolutionary, so unthinkable, about a manly declaration of this sort? But a native of Alabama knew that this attitude was entirely lacking. I do not think that Congress should wait for the people of the South to make regulations by which, at some future time, the Negroes will be provided with homes, have their rights as freemen acknowledged, be given a participation in civil rights, and be made a part of the framework of the country. They will not do that, you need not wait for it. 
If Congress can constitutionally commence a system of educating and elevating the Negroes, let them do it, and not wait for the people of the South to do it.38. It is nonsense to say that the South knew nothing about the capabilities of the Negro race. Southerners knew Negroes far better than Northerners. There was not a single Negro slave owner who did not know dozens of Negroes just as capable of learning and efficiency as the mass of poor white people around and about, and some quite as capable as the average slaveholder. They had continually in the course of the history of slavery recognized such men. Here and there teachers and preachers to white folks as well as colored folks had arisen. Artisans and even artists had been recognized. Some of these colored folks were blood relatives of the white slaveholders, brothers and sisters, sons and daughters. They had sometimes been given land, transported to the north or to Europe, freed and encouraged. Of course, the southerners believed such persons to be exceptional but all that was asked of them at this time was to recognize the possibility of exceptions. To such a reasonable offer the nation could and would have responded. It could have paid for the Negroes' land and education. It could have contributed to relief and restoration of the South. Instead of that came a determination to re-establish slavery, murder, arson, and flogging, a dogmatic opposition to Negro education and decent legal status determination to have political power based on voteless Negroes, and no vote to any Negro under any circumstances. This showed the utter absence of common sense in the leadership of the South. Their attitude was expressed best, however, not by a Southerner but by William H. Seward, and it came in the shape of a veto to the Freedmen's Bureau Bill. If this veto had applied to a civil rights bill or to a bill providing for Negro suffrage, it would have been much more logical but to veto a bill for the guardianship of Negroes, even though that bill carried and had to carry a defense of civil rights, was reactionary to the last degree. The veto was a shrewd document, as was every argument written by that master of subtle logic. The president was made to say, I share with Congress the strongest desire to secure to the freedmen the full enjoyment of their freedom and property and their entire independence and equality in making contracts for their labor but he objected to the bill because it was unconstitutional, because the Bureau was permanent, because it did for the colored people what had never been done for white people, because it confiscated land, and because its cost would be prodigious. It was unconstitutional, because it extended jurisdiction all over the United States, and gave the Bureau judicial power in that jurisdiction. It was made permanent in spite of the fact that slavery had been abolished. Conceive a president born a poor white laborer, saying. Congress has never felt itself authorized to spend public money for renting homes for white people honestly toiling day and night, and it was never intended that freedmen should be fed, clothed, educated, and sheltered by the United States. The idea upon which slaves were assisted to freedom was that they become a self-sustaining population. The Bureau, he said, would be costly. During war times, we had already spent $5,876,272 for the relief of Negroes, and $2,047,297 for the relief of whites. For 1,866, the present Bureau needed $11,745,000. Now we are planning to spend money for land and education which will double this sum. The bill proposes to take away land from former owners without due process of law. Finally, comes this extraordinary economic philosophy for serfs. Undoubtedly, the freedman should be protected, but he should be protected by the civil authorities, especially by the exercise of all constitutional powers of the courts of the United States and of the states. His condition is not so bad. His labor is in demand and he can change his dwelling place if one community or state does not please him. The laws that regulate supply and demand will regulate his wages. The freedmen can protect themselves, and being free, they could be self-sustaining, capable of selecting their own employment, insisting on proper wages, and establishing and maintaining their own asylums and schools. It is earnestly hoped that, instead of wasting away, they will, by their own efforts, establish for themselves a condition of responsibility and prosperity. It is certain that they can attain that condition only through their own merits and exertions.
This was the answer of Andrew Johnson and William H. Seward to the Freedmen's Bureau Bill. Practically, it said that the Negroes do not need protection. They are free. Let them go to work, earn wages, and support their own schools. Their civil rights and political rights must depend entirely upon their former masters, and the United States has no constitutional authority to interfere to help them. As Stevens said later, the president himself favored confiscation of southern land for the poor when he was clothed and in his right mind 39. It was an astonishing pronouncement. It was the American assumption, of the possibility of labor's achieving wealth applied with a vengeance to landless slaves under caste conditions. The very strength of its logic was the weakness of its common sense. Yet, Andrew Johnson was the President of the United States. He was the leader of the Republican Party which had just won the war. He declared in the face of an astounding array of testimony to the contrary, that the South was peaceful and loyal, and the slaves really free. Congress did not believe the President or agree with him but some were not yet prepared to break with him. Six Republicans deserted their party and voted to uphold the veto. The result was that by a vote of 30 to 18, the attempt to override the president's veto failed. The rift made in the Republican Party was wide. On the one side stood abolition democracy in curious alliance with triumphant northern industry, both united in self-defense against Johnson and the South. This northern unity, Johnson and Seward intended to disrupt, and did so in part when the veto of the Freedmen's Bureau Bill was sustained. Seward followed this by an appeal for the quick resumption of peace and industry, and Johnson made an appeal to labor unrest and Western radicals. But here again, there was no natural union and this Seward knew. His defense, therefore, of Johnson's plan was intended to soothe both industry and abolition without stressing radicalism. Washington's birthday had been fixed upon by the president's friends for a grand demonstration. The New York alderman endorsed the president's conservative, liberal, enlightened, and Christian policy, with 100 guns salute on February 21st and 100 on February 22. Johnson was declared greater than an old hickory. He was on the highest pinnacle of the Mount of Fame, his feet were planted on the constitution of his country, he was a modern edition of Andrew Jackson bound in calf. Indeed, it was said by the radicals in reply to the Democratic fireworks that more powder was burned in honor of the veto by the Copperheads than they consumed during the four years of War 40. Seward said at Cooper Union. This, I think, is the difference between the President, who is a man of nerve, in the executive chair at Washington, and the nervous men who are in the House of Representatives. Both have got the Union restored not with slavery, but without it, not with secession, flagrant or latent, but without it, not with compromise, but without it, not with disloyal states, or representatives, but with loyal states and representatives, not with rebel debts, but without them, not with exemption from our own debts for suppressing the rebellion, but with equal liabilities upon the rebels and the loyal men, not with freedmen and refugees abandoned to suffering and persecution but with freedmen employed in productive, self-sustaining industry, with refugees under the protection of law and order. The man of nerve sees that it has come out right at last, and he accepts the situation. He does not forget that in this troublesome world of ours, the most to be secured by anybody is to have things come out right. Nobody can ever expect to have them brought out altogether in his own way. The nervous men, on the other hand, hesitate, delay, debate and agonize not because it has not come out right, but because they have not individually had their own way in bringing it to a happy termination. As to the Freedmen's Bureau Bill, he said. I have not given prominence in these remarks to the conflict of opinion between the President and Congress in reference to the Bureau for the Relief of Freedmen and Refugees. That conflict is, in its consequences, comparatively unimportant it would excite little interest and produce little division if it stood alone. It is because it has become the occasion for revealing the difference that I have already described that it has attained the importance which seems to surround it. He proceeded to point out that the present Freedmen's Bureau Bill had not expired and might not expire for another year and that, therefore, during the next year Congress might still prolong its existence. 
ought the President of the United States to be denounced in the house of his friends, for refusing in the absence of any necessity, to occupy or retain, and to exercise power greater than those which are exercised by any imperial magistrate in the world? Judge yet. I trust that this fault of declining imperial powers, too hastily tendered by a too confiding Congress, may be forgiven by a generous people. Point 41. This was an adroit defense, but Johnson could not let well enough alone. He was deprived of his mentor and assuming his vivid role of stump speaker, possibly with a few stimulants, he felt called upon this same Washington's birthday to reply to a committee which had waited upon him with resolutions. He was speaking after the Fourteenth Amendment in its first form had been reported to the House of Representatives and sent back to the Committee of Fifteen. With that as well as the vetoed Freedmen's Bureau Bill and the pending Civil Rights Bill in mind, he recited again his services to the Union during the war, he reminded his auditors that when rebellion manifested itself in the South, he stood by the government. He was for the Union with slavery, he was for the Union without slavery. In either alternative, he was for the government and the Constitution. Then he went on with the classic argument. You have been struggling for four years to put down a rebellion. You contended at the beginning of that struggle that a state had not a right to go out. And when you determine by the executive, by the military and by the public judgment, that these states cannot have any right to go out, this committee turns around and assumes that they are out, and that they shall not come in. I say that when the states that attempted to secede comply with the Constitution, and give sufficient evidence of loyalty, I shall extend to them the right hand of fellowship, and let peace and union be restored. I am opposed to the Devises and Toombses, the Slidells, and the long list of such. But when I perceive, on the other hand, men, still opposed to the union, I am free to say to you that I am still with the people. Suppose I should name to you those whom I look upon as being opposed to the fundamental principles of this government, and now laboring to destroy them. I say Thaddeus Stevens of Pennsylvania, I say Charles Sumner of Massachusetts, I say Wendell Phillips of Massachusetts. Finally, Johnson became melodramatic. Are they not satisfied with one martyr? Does not the blood of Lincoln appease the vengeance and wrath of the opponents of this government? Is their thirst still unslaked? Do they want more blood? Have they not honor and courage enough to effect the removal of the presidential obstacle otherwise than through the hands of the assassin? I am not afraid of assassins, etc., etc. 42. Small wonder that the New York Tribune and the Philadelphia Press reported that Johnson was drunk when he made his speech, but the main cause of his drunkenness was not necessarily whiskey, it was constitutional inability to understand men and movements. This was not time to straddle on the slavery question, that question has been settled. The crucial question now was, what will the South do when it comes back to Congress, what will it do to Negroes, and even more important in the minds of many, what will it do to the new industry? The latter question struck deepest, but the former voiced itself loudest. The masses of the loyal people must be as agreed to arise against this veto of a measure, intended as a bulwark against slavery and treason as they were on the night when the flag of the Union was first hauled down from Fort Sumter, said the Chicago Tribune. Point 43. Congress immediately hit back with a concurrent resolution not to admit Southern congressmen to either House until the status of the Southern states was settled. This had passed the House of Representatives after dilatory tactics February 20, but was not considered in the Senate until February 23, after Johnson's speech. It was passed after debate March 2, and thus Stevens' original resolution of December 4 was finally confirmed. Here evidently there was small ground for compromise. Either Johnson must bow to the will of the majority of his party in Congress, or, led by him, the South would be in the saddle in 1866. Many who had criticized Sumner in December, now were on his side. The President and the South, on the other hand, were greatly encouraged, despite the majority which the Republicans had in Congress, they could not override a presidential veto, with the reaction that Johnson and the South expected at the next election, the Republicans would lose power and the South, united with Northern and Western democracy, would rule. 
the Southerners resumed their drive to complete their black codes and their program of reducing the Negro to a servile caste. The President, drunk with his new feeling of power, showed his entire misapprehension of the nature of the forces working against him. Congress girded itself for battle, not mainly because the virtual re-enslavement of the Negro aroused them, but because this was the symptom of a reassertion of power on the part of the South which might affect the debt, the tariff, and the national banking system. The President and his supporters were going to insist upon the full political power of the South, unhampered by a Freedmen's Bureau or by Negro civil rights. Had it not been for the presence of the Negro, this attitude of the South could not have arisen. Never before in modern history has a conquered people treated their conqueror with such consummate arrogance. The South hid behind the darkness of the colored men and thumbed their noses at the nation. For the Negro, Andrew Johnson did less than nothing when once he realized that the chief beneficiary of labor and economic reform in the South would be freedmen. His inability to picture Negroes as men made him oppose efforts to give them land, oppose national efforts to educate them, and above all things, oppose their rights to vote. He even went so far as to change plans which he had thought out and announced before he faced the Negro problem. He once said that representation ought to be based on voters, but no sooner did he learn that Thaddeus Stevens advocated the same thing, than he became dumb on the subject, and had no advice to offer. He had advocated the confiscation of the land of the rich Southerners and penalties on wealth gained through slavery. When he realized that Negroes would be beneficiaries of any such action, he said not another word. He was a thick and thin advocate of universal suffrage in the hands of the laborer and common man, until he realized that some people actually thought that Negroes were men. He opposed monopoly on the New Jersey railroads, until Charles Sumner joined him. The Civil Rights Bill which was taken up next made Negroes citizens of the United States and punished any person who deprived them of civil rights under any state law. They shall have the same right in every state and territory in the United States to make and enforce contracts, to sue, be parties and give evidence, to inherit, purchase, lease, sell, hold, and convey real and personal property, and to full and equal benefit of all laws and proceedings for the security of person and property as is enjoyed by the white citizens, and shall be subject to like punishment, pains, and penalties, and to none other, any law, statute, ordinance, regulation, or custom. To the contrary notwithstanding. It gave to the district courts of the United States jurisdiction in crimes and offenses against the Act, gave the power of arrest to United States marshals and district attorneys, and provided fines and penalties. David Bingham, of Ohio, brought up a difficulty. He reminded Congress that the first eight amendments to the Constitution could not be enforced by the federal government since they were held to be limitations upon the federal power, and that, therefore, the power to punish offenses against life, liberty, and property was one of the reserved powers of the state. He, therefore, suggested a constitutional amendment which would punish all violations of the Bill of Rights by state officers. He reminded the House that even when property had been taken by the states without due process of the law, there was no remedy in the federal courts, and that this had been affirmed in a recent case in Maryland. His proposal went to the Committee of Fifteen. The Civil Rights Bill passed the Senate, was amended in the House, and was agreed to by both Houses, March 14, 1866. The debate on the Civil Rights Bill and the Freedmen's Bureau Bill made it clear that the emancipation of the slaves meant increased representation in Congress and in the Electoral College, whenever the southern states were readmitted, and that this increase in power would take place whether the Negroes were enfranchised or not. Moreover, the Civil Rights Act might be repealed the United States might be made to pay all OR a part of the Confederate debt, and Congress might repudiate the debt. The debate, therefore, on the Civil Rights Bill made the necessity of a constitutional amendment clear. On March 27, President Johnson vetoed the Civil Rights Bill with curious logic. He feared that under this bill Chinese, Indians, and Gypsies, as well as Negroes, might be made citizens. He declared that a citizen of the United States would not necessarily be a citizen of a state. He again questioned whether it was good policy to act on citizenship of Negroes, since 11 of the 36 states were unrepresented. 
4 million of them have just emerged from slavery into freedom. Can it be reasonably supposed that they possess the requisite qualifications to entitle them to all the privileges and equalities of citizens of the United States? One wonders what Andrew Johnson expected the Negroes to be. They were not to be citizens, they were not to be voters, and yet he repeatedly assured them that they were free. He went on with another strange argument, declaring that the bill discriminated against large numbers of intelligent, worthy, and patriotic foreigners, and in favor of the Negro to whom, after long years of bondage, the avenues of freedom and opportunity have just now been suddenly opened. Thus, he thought Negroes less familiar with the character of American institutions than foreigners. And yet foreigners must wait five years for naturalization and be of good moral character. He said that if Congress could give the equal civil rights enumerated to Negroes, it could also give them the right to vote and the right to hold office. He objected to state officers being liable to arrest for discriminating against Negroes. He objected to the interference of Congress with the judiciary, and assuming jurisdiction of subjects which had always been treated by state courts. Again, he returned to his astonishing economics. The white race and the black race of the South have hitherto lived together under the relation of master and slave capital owning labor. Now, suddenly, that relation is changed, and, as to ownership, capital, and labor are divorced. They stand now each master of itself. In this new relation, one being necessary to the other, there will be a new adjustment, which both are deeply interested in making harmonious. Each has equal power in settling the terms, and, if left to the laws that regulate capital and labor, it is confidently believed that they will satisfactorily work out the problem. Capital, it is true has more intelligence, but labor is never so ignorant as not to understand its own interests, not to know its own value, and not to see that capital must pay that value. This bill frustrates this adjustment. It intervenes between capital and labor, and attempts to settle questions of political economy through the agency of numerous officials, whose interest it will be to foment discord between the two races, for as the breach widens their employment will continue and when it is closed their occupation will terminate. He declared that this law establishes for the security of the colored race safeguards which go infinitely beyond any that the general government have ever provided for the white race, and, therefore, discriminates against the white race. He declared the bill a step toward concentrating all legislative power in the national government. A perfect equality of the white and colored races is attempted to be fixed by federal law in every state of the Union over the vast field of state jurisdiction covered by the enumerated rights. In no one of these can any state ever exercise any power of discrimination between the different races. He then fetched up his heavy artillery of social equality to stampede the prejudiced. In the exercise of state policy over matters exclusively affecting the people of each state, it has frequently been thought expedient to discriminate between the two races. By the statutes of some of the states, Northern as well as Southern, it is enacted, for instance, that white persons shall not intermarry with a Negro or a mulatto. While he did not believe that this particular bill would annul state laws in regard to marriage, nevertheless, if Congress had the power to provide that there should be no discrimination in the matters enumerated in the bill, then it could pass a law repealing the laws of the states in regard to marriage. He continued. Hitherto, Every subject embraced in the enumeration of rights contained in this bill has been considered as exclusively belonging to the states. They all relate to the internal police and economy of the respective states. If it be granted that Congress can repeal all state laws discriminating between whites and blacks in the subjects covered by this bill, why, it may be asked, may not Congress repeal, in the same way, all state laws discriminating between the two races, on the subject of suffrage and office? Speaking of the general effect of the bill, he declared it interfered with the municipal legislation of the states, with the relations existing exclusively between a state and its citizens, or between inhabitants of the same state and absorption and assumption of power by the general government which, if acquiesced in, must sap and destroy our federative system of limited powers, and break down the barriers which preserve the rights of the states. It is another step or rather stride, toward centralization and the concentration of all legislative powers in the national government. 
the president's veto of the civil rights bill offended the nation. Senator Stewart declared that the president had promised not to veto this bill and for that reason the senator had voted to sustain the veto of the Freedmen's Bureau bill. Senator Trumbull had publicly announced that the president would not veto the civil rights bill. Henry Ward Beecher had urged him to sign it. Even in the president's cabinet, none of the members, except Seward and Wells, agreed with Johnson. Sumner wrote. Nobody can yet see the end. Congress will not yield. The president is angry and brutal. Seward is the marplot. In the cabinet, on the question of the last veto, there were four against it to three for it, so even there, among his immediate advisers, the president is left in a minority. Stanton reviewed at length the bill, section by section, in the cabinet, and pronounced it an excellent and safe bill every way from beginning to end. But the veto message was already prepared, and an hour later was sent to Congress. Point 44. The time for the final test between Johnson and Congress had come. There ensued some sharp political maneuvering. Morgan, Wiley, and Stewart were won over to the majority, and Stockton, a Johnson man from New Jersey, was unseated on a technicality. Thus, on April 6 and 9, Congress overrode the veto. The Civil Rights Bill became law, and Johnson faced a Congress able to work its will. There was one other matter, besides amending the Constitution, on which Congress might take significant action. According to the current American creed, full protection of a citizen could only be accomplished by possession of the right to vote. This was not wholly true, even in the North, and with the ballot in the hands of white men. Nevertheless, it still retained a great element of truth for only with universal suffrage could the mass of workers begin that economic revolution which would eventually emancipate them. They would have to use their ballot at first in conjunction with the petty bourgeois, that is, in conjunction with the small property holder, who was being hard-pressed by the new concentrated capital of industry, in conjunction with the small western farmer, who was pushed to the wall by the railway and land monopoly. But armed with the ballot, this preliminary fight against the power of capital would clear the way for the final fight which would make democracy real among the workers. While the Committee of Fifteen was groping its way to action, there was a chance for Congress to express its real feeling on the ballot. There might be a question in the minds of constitutional hair-splitters as to how far Congress could coerce states in defining the right of suffrage. But Congress ruled directly the District of Columbia. Congress had the right to decide as to the political franchise in territories. Would it not be the first step toward a logical and consistent end for Congress to establish Negro suffrage in the district, and in all territories which were set up? Thus, among the first bills introduced in the 39th Congress were bills to give the Negro the right to vote in the District of Columbia, and this demand was supported by petitions and speeches, and especially well-written petitions from the educated Negroes of the district. In January, 1866, there came a notable petition from the colored people signed by John F. Cook, a wealthy octoroon of a free Negro family, and 25 other citizens. It did not come from freedmen or laborers, but from property holders of Negro descent, many of whom had been born free. Kelly of Pennsylvania read it in part to the House. We are intelligent enough to be industrious, to have accumulated property to build and sustain churches and institutions of learning. We are and have been educating our children without the aid of any school fund, and until recently had for many years been furnishing, unjustly as we deem, a portion of the means for the education of the white children of the district. We are intelligent enough to be amenable to the same laws and punishable alike with others for the infraction of said laws. We sustain as fair a character on the records of crime and statistics of pauperism as any other class in the community, while unequal laws are continually barring our way in the effort to reach and possess ourselves of the blessings attendant upon a life of industry and self-denial and of virtuous citizenship. Experience likewise teaches that that debasement is most humane which is most complete. The possession of only a partial liberty makes us more keenly sensible of the injustice of withholding those other rights which belong to a perfect manhood. Without the right of suffrage, we are without protection, and liable to combinations of outrage. Petty officers of the law, respecting the source of power, will naturally defer to the one having a vote, 
and the partiality thus shown will work much to the disadvantage of the colored citizens. Point 45. However, there were some special reasons for avoiding this ticklish subject. After all, Washington was the capital of the nation. It had long been a center of Southern society. To give the Negroes political freedom and partial control there, was a long step and a decisive one. The people of the district hastily organized a counterstroke, and presented to the Senate a communication from the mayor in which he asserted that a special vote had been taken December 21, to ascertain the opinion of the people of Washington on the question of Negro suffrage. He meant, of course, the white people, and the vote was overwhelming, 6,591 against Negro suffrage and 35 for it. The communication proceeded, in a fine climax of Southern rhetoric, to say that this unparalleled unanimity of sentiment which pervades all classes of this community in opposition to the extension of the right of suffrage to that class, engenders an earnest hope that Congress, in according to this expression of their wishes the respect and consideration they would as individual members yield to those whom they immediately represent, would abstain from the exercise of its absolute power and so avert an impending future apparently so objectionable to those over whom, by the fundamental law of the land, they have exclusive jurisdiction. A long argument ensued, which showed that Congress was not ready to declare itself on Negro suffrage, further action was postponed for another year, and a bill for Negro suffrage in the District of Columbia did not pass Congress until December, 1866, it became a law in January. 1867. Meantime, the Committee of Fifteen had met first December 26, 1865. Charles Sumner was considered too radical on the Negro question to be a member of it, and so the committee was headed by a conservative, Fessenden of Maine, who wished to stand by President Johnson, and was strongly, sometimes even bitterly, opposed to the radicalism of Sumner. Stevens, the great protagonist of curbing the political power of the South and completely emancipating the Negro, was the prime figure in the committee. Then, there were Bingham of Ohio, the more or less conscious defender of property, Conkling of New York, the sophisticated, exquisite corporation lawyer, and Boutwell of Massachusetts. There were three Democrats, of whom the most distinguished was Johnson of Maryland, the strongest border state representative in Congress handicapped by a legal mind, and the narrow-minded Rogers of New Jersey. A subcommittee of the Committee of Fifteen courteously waited on President Johnson, and he consented to do nothing more toward reconstruction for the present, in order to secure harmony of action. On December 26, at the first meeting of the committee, Stevens brought forward his proposal to base representation on voters. And singularly enough, later in this same month, Johnson in an interview with Senator Dixon of Connecticut said that if, however, amendments are to be made to the Constitution, changing the basis of representation and taxation, and he did not deem them at all necessary to the present time, he knew of none better than a simple proposition, embraced in a few lines, making in each state the number of qualified voters the basis of representation, and the value of property the basis of direct taxation. Such a proposition could be embraced in the following terms. Representatives shall be apportioned among the several states which may be included within this union according to the number of qualified voters in each state. Such amendment, the President also suggested, would remove from Congress all issues in reference to the political equality of the races. It would leave the states to determine absolutely the qualifications of their own voters with regard to color and thus the number of representatives to which they would be entitled in Congress would depend upon the number upon whom they conferred the right of suffrage. The President, in this connection, expressed the opinion that the agitation of the Negro franchise question in the District of Columbia at this time was a mere entering wedge to the agitation of the question throughout the states, and was ill-timed, uncalled for, and calculated to do great harm. He believed that it would engender enmity, contention, and strife between the two races, and lead to a war between them, which would result in great injury to both, and the certain extermination of the Negro population. Precedence, he thought, should be given to more important and urgent matters, legislation upon which was essential to the restoration of the Union, the peace of the country, and the prosperity of the people. 46. 
here, surely, was logic and understanding in plain sight. But not only did the president eventually drop this proposal, but even in committee, opposition appeared. Boutwell suggested at the third meeting of the committee, January 9, that he preferred to retain population as the basis of apportionment, with the provision that no state should make any distinctions in the exercise of the elective franchise on account of race or color. Boutwell was from Massachusetts, and New England, through Blaine, had protested vigorously against the Stevens proposition in the House the day before, January 8. It was a curious situation, which Blaine explained in part, and in part, he did not. New England had lost a good proportion of its male population by migration to the West, and it did not allow women to vote. New England, moreover, had a large immigrant population which she was using in her mills, and on which a part of her representation in Congress was based. She proposed to make this population still larger. She proposed, also, to reduce the voting power of this laboring population, not only by confining the vote to the native-born and naturalized, but also by a literacy qualification. Through Blaine, therefore, spoke the exploiting manufacturer, and voiced an idea as different from Sumner's as one could well imagine. To base population on voters was, in the eyes of industry, to keep down the representation of the South, to be sure, but also to transfer the balance of political power from the East to the West, and in the West industry was not so sure of its dictatorship. Consequently, the Committee of Fifteen was compelled to take steps in another direction. On January 12, Bingham introduced a proposal to the Committee for a constitutional amendment guaranteeing civil rights. It said, The Congress shall have the power to make all laws necessary and proper to secure to all persons in every state within this union, equal protection in their rights of life, liberty, and property. 47 This proposition, destined to become part of Section 1 of the 14th Amendment, had been introduced early in December in the House of Representatives. The Committee of 15 referred the Bingham proposal to a subcommittee, consisting wholly of Republicans. At the same time, the committee insisted that the basis of representation provided for in the Constitution should be changed. Johnson of Maryland adhered to the Stevens proposal of making voters the basis. New England and New York objected, and this matter was left to the consideration of the same subcommittee. Meantime, three other propositions were submitted. Representation should be based on population, but if colored people were disfranchised, they should not be counted in the apportionment. Moral. Representatives should be apportioned according to population, except that Negroes, Indians, Chinese and other colored persons, if they were not allowed to vote, should not be counted in the apportionment. Williams. Representatives were to be apportioned among the states according to the whole number of citizens of the United States, provided that whenever in any state, civil or political rights or privileges should be denied or abridged, on account of race or color, all persons of such race or color should be excluded from the basis of representation or taxation. Conkling. On January 16, a proposed 14th Amendment was considered in two parts, the first part had alternative propositions. A. Apportioning representation according to the number of citizens and making inoperative and void any laws whereby any distinction is made in political or civil rights or privileges on account of race, creed, or color. B. The alternative proposition was the Conkling proposal. The second part of the amendment was Bingham's proposal that, Congress shall have power to make all laws necessary and proper to secure to all citizens of the United States the same equal protection in the enjoyment of life, liberty, and property. These propositions went to subcommittees and were reported back January 20. The civil rights section of Bingham appeared in the strongest and most specific form which it ever took. Congress shall have power to make all laws necessary and proper to secure to all citizens of the United States, in every state, the same political rights and privileges, and to all persons in every state equal protection in the enjoyment of life, liberty, and property. It was voted 10 to 4 to consider this proposition of Bingham separately, and by a vote of 11 to 3, the second resolution on apportionment was chosen as a proposed 14th Amendment. This excluded from representation Negroes who were denied the right to vote. 
Stevens wished to amend this by declaring who were citizens. Conkling, however, moved to strike out the phrase citizens of the United States, and insert persons in every state, excluding Indians not taxed. This was a move to ensure the counting of the foreign-born as a part of the basis of apportionment, and was in accordance with the New England idea. Stevens, Fessenden, and Bingham were against it, but it passed 11 to 3. On January 22, this section on apportionment was reported to Congress as a 14th Amendment, and was the first effort of the Committee of 15 to prepare for reconstruction by constitutional amendment. This was before the Freedmen's Bureau Bill or the Civil Rights Bill had passed Congress, and the bill for suffrage in the District of Columbia, while it had passed the House, had not been considered in the Senate, and was not destined to be for several months. This fact is a sufficient answer to the accusation that the Committee of 15 purposely delayed action on the problems of Reconstruction. Within less than a month after it began work, it laid its first proposition before Congress. Stevens reported this first form of the 14th Amendment to the House and asked rather peremptorily that it pass before sundown. His reason was that there were numbers of state legislatures in session and that they could consider it immediately. But he was disappointed. There was too much opposition in his own group. Conkling elaborated and made specific the argument which Stevens had first brought forward. The four million people who had suddenly been released from slavery, while falling within the category of free persons, were not yet political persons. This emancipated multitude has no political status. Emancipation vitalizes only natural rights, not political rights. Enfranchisement alone carries with it political rights, and these emancipated millions are no more enfranchised now than when they were slaves. They never had political power. Their masters had a fraction of power as masters. But since the relationship of master and slave was destroyed, this fraction of power could no longer survive in the masters. There was only one place where it could logically go, and that was to the Negroes, but since it was said that they are unfit to have it, it is a power astray, without a rightful owner. It should be resumed by the whole nation at once. If a black man counts at all now, he counts as five-fifths of a man, not as three-fifths. Four millions, therefore, and not three-fifths of four millions, are to be reckoned in here now, and in eleven states most of these four millions were presumed to be unfit for political existence. Since the framers of the Constitution did not foresee such contingency, and expected that emancipation would come gradually and be accompanied by education and enfranchisement, they provided for no situation whereby eleven states might claim twenty-eight, or twenty-nine, representatives besides their just proportion. Twenty-eight votes to be cast here and in the electoral college for those held not fit to sit as jurors, not fit to testify in the court, not fit to be plaintiff in a suit, not fit to approach the ballot box. Twenty-eight votes to be more or less controlled by those who once betrayed the government, and for those so destitute, we are assured, of intelligent instinct as not to be fit for free agency. Shall this be? Shall four million beings count four million, in managing the affairs of the nation, who are pronounced by their fellow beings unfit to participate in administering government in the states where they live, who are pronounced unworthy of the least and most paltry part in the political affairs? Shall 127,000 white people in New York cast but one vote in this house and have but one voice here, while the same number of white people in Mississippi have three votes and three voices? Shall the death of slavery add two-fifths to the entire power which slavery had when slavery was living? Shall one white man have as much share in the government as three other white men merely because he lives where blacks outnumber whites two to one? Shall this inequality exist? and exist only in favor of those, who did the foulest and guiltiest act which crimsons the annals of recorded time. No, sir, not if I can help it. This proposition, he continued, rests upon a principle already embedded in the Constitution, and as old as free government itself, a principle. That representation does not belong to those who have no political existence, but to those who have. The object of the amendment is to enforce this truth. Every state will be left free to extend or withhold the elective franchise on such terms as it pleases, and this without losing anything in representation if the terms are impartial as to all. 
If, however, there is found a race so vile or worthless that to belong to it is alone cause of exclusion from political action, the race is not to be counted here in the Congress 48. Thus spoke New York in cold contrast to Thaddeus Stevens but with quite as merciless logic. This argument made it clear that the basis of representation must be changed in some way, unless the South was coming back with increased political power. What change should be made? The West wanted Stevens' original proposition which had early been introduced in Congress by Stevens himself and also separately by two Ohio representatives, and which based representation on voters, but this proposition would have increased the power of the Middle and Western states at the expense of New England, and New England had had her warning from Voorhees. While, then, a majority of Republicans undoubtedly favored this, the proposition could not pass Congress without the support of New England, and the West yielded. Elliot of Massachusetts submitted an amendment, which was practically the 15th Amendment, but it was agreed that this could not pass Congress. And so, finally, the report was sent back to the Committee of 15. Meantime, on January 22, the Bingham Amendment on Civil Rights was considered in the Committee of 15 and referred to a subcommittee, after Boutwell had tried to make its wording milder, by saying that Congress shall have power to abolish any distinction in the exercise of the elective franchise. On January 27, this section was reported from the subcommittee with modifications, and appeared now in the following words. Congress shall have power to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper to secure to all persons in every state full protection in the enjoyment of life, liberty, and property and to all citizens of the United States the same immunities and also equal political rights and privileges. It was postponed, Bingham explained in 1871 that, after postponement, he had introduced this section of the amendment in the Committee of Fifteen in the words in which it now stands in the Constitution. He had changed the form in the hope that the amendment might be so framed that in all the hereafter it might be accepted by the historian of the American Constitution like Magna Carta as the keystone of American legislation. The decision of Marshall v. the City Council of Baltimore, a celebrated case, had induced him to take counsel with Marshall. Thus, curiously enough, constitutional restraints designated to protect persons were changed into a form which eventually made the federal government the protector of property against state enactments. The Congress shall have power to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper to secure to the citizens of every state all privileges and immunities of citizens in the several states. Point 49. This substitute, which Bingham reported to the committee February 3rd, was adopted in the Committee of 15 and on February 10th, by a vote of 9 to 5, it was referred to Congress. It came up before the House of Representatives, February 13, as a proposed constitutional amendment and was debated at length February 27 to 28, when the House refused to table it, but postponed it until April. When the Committee of 15 received the amendment on apportionment back from the House, it made the minor change of taking out the reference to direct taxes which was irrelevant and of little importance. So that, again, January 31, the proposition came back to the House of Representatives. Stevens was unequivocal. I do not want them the southern states to have representation I say it plainly I do not want them to have the right of suffrage before this Congress has done the great work of regenerating the Constitution and laws of this country according to the principles of the Declaration of Independence.50 again. Skenk of Ohio tried to base representation on voters, but this was defeated. Stevens said that he favored it, but that it could not pass Congress. The House passed this form of the 14th Amendment, January 3, 1866, and sent it to the Senate. In the meantime, the whole aspect of the political situation changed. The Freedmen's Bureau Bill had passed Congress, and, to the astonishment of the country, had been vetoed. The Civil Rights Bill had passed the Senate, and Johnson had made his speech of February 22, definitely aligning himself now with the South and their Northern Democratic allies, and against his own party. Black codes had been passed in Mississippi, Alabama, South Carolina, Florida, Virginia, and Louisiana. On the other hand, Northern business was afraid. Viewed as a practical matter, asked the nation. 
what would be the effect upon government securities of the immediate admission to Congress of 58 Southern representatives and 22 senators, nearly all of whom could be counted on as determined repudiationists. It would hardly be a safe thing for the national credit to have such a body of men in Congress, reinforced as they would probably be, by a considerable number of northern men ready to go for at least qualified repudiation. Point 51. Seward, himself, it is said, was greatly disappointed and embarrassed by the black codes of the South. He found that the South was getting stronger in Johnson's confidence. Nemesis again dogged Seward's steps, as when before he was defeated for the presidential nomination by the anti-slavery men to whom he had given a slogan. It was then that Toombs had sneered, Actian had been devoured by his dogs. The dogs were at it again. Blaine says that, when Congress reassembled after the holidays, there was a great change in its attitude. Many feared that the President and the Democrats together would win. The leading commercial men, who had become weary of war, contemplated with positive dread the reopening of a controversy which might prove as disturbing to the business of the country as the struggle of arms had been, and without the quickening impulses to trade which active war always imparts. The bankers of the great cities, whose capital and whose deposits all rested upon the credit of the country and were invested in its paper, believed that the speedy settlement of all dissension, and the harmonious cooperation of all departments of the government, were needed to maintain the financial honor of the nation and to reinstate confidence among the people. Against obstacles so menacing, against resistance so ominous, against an array of power so imposing, it seemed to be an act of boundless temerity to challenge the president to a contest, to array public opinion against him, to denounce him, to deride him, to defy him. Point 52. The committee of 15 paused to get its bearings. In the first place, what was the attitude of the country toward Negro suffrage? In 1865, Wisconsin had rejected a proposal to let Negroes vote. Minnesota, the same year, had defeated a constitutional amendment giving Negroes the suffrage. Connecticut, also, in 1865 gave a majority of 6,272 against Negro suffrage. Later, in 1867, Ohio defeated Negro suffrage by 50,629. In Michigan, 1868, a new constitution, omitting the word white, was defeated by a majority of 38,849. In the Nebraska Constitution of 1,866, only whites were allowed the suffrage. In New York and some other states, there was special legislation on the voting of Negroes, which was not changed. Evidently, the country was not ready for Negro suffrage. Moreover, the pinch of economic difficulties following the war, was beginning to be felt. The price of gold which was at 170 in 1864, rose to 284 in 1865. The income tax had been increased in 1865. The United States was paying out vast sums of interest on its annual debt. Cotton was high, selling at 43 cents a pound in 1865, it dropped to 30 cents only in 1,866, with a crop of 1,900,000 bales, as compared with that marvelous crop that precipitated the Civil War, 5,740,000 bales in 1,861. The price of agricultural products had increased, but not nearly as much as the prices of manufactured goods, and the farmers were feeling the difference. Gambling and speculation were widespread. The United States Treasury was trying to reduce the circulation of the depreciated greenbacks, and under the Act of 1866, retired some $75 million, but early in 1868, the contraction of the currency was prohibited and the West began to cry for inflation. A Western editor wrote Senator Trumbull of Illinois. You all in Washington must remember that the excitement of the great contest is dying out and that commercial and industrial enterprises and pursuits are engaging a large part of public attention. The times are hard, money is close, taxes are heavy, all forms of industry here in the West are heavily burdened, and in the struggle to pay debts and live, 
people are more mindful of themselves than of any of the fine philanthropic schemes that look to making Sambo a voter, juror, and office holder. Point 53. Johnson knew nothing of finance, and left the Treasury entirely to McCulloch, who was struggling, October 31, 1865, with a national debt that stood at $2,800,000,000. There was still doubt of the legal tender constitutionality of the greenbacks. Taxation was enormous and applied to almost every available subject. There faced the country a tremendous problem of reorganizing the debt, re-establishing the currency and reducing the revenue. Stevens had rushed the Committee of Fifteen as fast as or faster than his majority wished. The first draft of the Fourteenth Amendment reached the Senate and was attacked by Charles Sumner. There was no greater proof of his courage, and his learning and keenness of mind were unquestioned. From the day of his great speech on Kansas to his unswerving advocacy of civil rights for Negroes and their political enfranchisement, he towered above his contemporaries. He was unwilling to compromise like Stevens, and for that reason was not made head of the Great Committee of Fifteen. But there was no question about his integrity and his idealism. Sumner had no sympathy with an amendment which made the disfranchisement of Negroes possible and regarded it as another compromise with human rights and a discrimination on account of race and color which hitherto had been kept out of the Constitution. Thus the first proposition which Northern Industry made, met the direct opposition of abolition democracy. Charles Sumner, in a tremendous speech February 6, 1865, laid down the thesis that under no circumstances should it be possible to disfranchise a man simply on account of race or color, that here for the first time we had a chance to realize the democracy which the fathers of the republic foresaw, and he spoke prophetic words on future disfranchisement. I am not insensible to the responsibility which I assume in setting myself against a proposition already adopted in the other house, and having the recommendation of a committee to which the country looks with such just expectations and to which, let me say, I look with so much trust. But after careful reflection, I do not feel that I can do otherwise. There are among us, four millions of citizens now robbed of all share in the government of their country, while at the same time they are taxed according to their means, directly and indirectly, for the support of the government. Nobody can question this statement. And this barefaced tyranny of taxation without representation it is now proposed to recognize as not inconsistent with fundamental right and the guarantee of a republican government. Instead of blasting it you go forward to embrace it as an element of political power. If, by this, you expect to induce the recent slave master to confer the right of suffrage without distinction of color, you will find the proposition a delusion and a snare. He will do no such thing. Even the bribe you offer will not tempt him. If, on the other hand, you expect to accomplish a reduction of his political power, it is more than doubtful if you will succeed, while the means you employ are unworthy of our country. There are tricks and evasions possible, and the cunning slave master will drive his coach and six through your amendment stuffed with all his representatives. Should he cheat you in this matter? it will only be a proper return for the endeavor on your part to circumvent him at the expense of fellow citizens to whom you are bound by every obligation of public faith. Point 54. Seldom has a great political prophecy been so strikingly fulfilled. Stevens in the House had, by his diplomacy, ranged back of his policy the industrial leaders of the North who feared that a return of the South would mean attack upon the tariff, the national banks, the debt and the whole new post-war economic structure. Summer in the Senate, on the other hand, took little account of the political game. He set his strategy on the high ground of democracy, and democracy for all men, and it was his opposition that killed the first draft of the Fourteenth Amendment which permitted the disfranchisement of Negroes on penalty of reduced representation. Stevens with infinite pains had gotten this much through the Committee of Fifteen and the House of Representatives. Sumner spoke his convictions despite the desertion of friends and party. Senator Williams of Oregon expressed admiration, but could not follow him. The echoes of his lofty and majestic periods will linger and repeat themselves among the corridors of history. There was wide discussion throughout the country. Garrison was converted, and to him Sumner's speech seemed unanswerable. To Whittier, it was irresistible, Philip's voice was filled with enthusiasm, 
while Henry Ward Beecher said that the speech rose far above the occasion, covering a ground which will abide after all contemporary questions of special legislation have passed away. The proposed amendment went down to defeat on March 9, receiving only 25 votes against 22, instead of the necessary two-thirds majority. Sumner's wide influence, while it did not command the full sympathy of Republicans or Democrats, nevertheless, was enough to block compromise between northern industry and the abolition democracy. Fessenden was bitter and Stevens furious. No man demanded more for Negroes than Stevens, or was more thoroughly an advocate of complete democracy. But, as he said, the control of republics depends on the number, not the quality, of the voters. This is not a government of saints. It has a large sprinkling of sinners. As the head of the Committee of Fifteen, he was trying to get a proposition for which a two-thirds majority of Congress would vote, and start the country as far on the road towards democracy and abolition of caste as was possible under the circumstances. He complained that his proposition had been slaughtered by a puerile and pedantic criticism. Andrew Johnson was deeply incensed by some nurse speech and sneered at it next day. I am free to say to you that I do not like to be arraigned by someone who can get up handsomely rounded periods and deal in rhetoric, and talk about abstract ideas of liberty, who never periled life, liberty, or property. This kind of theoretical, hollow, unpractical friendship amounts to but very little. He was receiving a group of Negroes who were trying by direct appeal either to get his sympathy or to probe his animus against the race. The Freedmen's Bureau bill had passed but Johnson had not yet indicated what action he would take. The Civil Rights Bill and the first draft of the 14th Amendment were before the Senate. Perhaps the delegation hoped to influence him. Douglas had seen Johnson on Inauguration Day in 1865 when President Lincoln had pointed Douglas out to him. The first expression which came to his face, and which I think was the true index of his heart, was one of bitter contempt and aversion. Seeing that I observed him, he tried to assume a more friendly appearance, but it was too late. 55. In the interview with President Johnson, February 7, 1866, there were present George T. Downing of Rhode Island, William E. Matthews of New York, John Jones of Philadelphia, John F. Cook of Washington, Joseph E. Otis, A. W. Ross, William Whipper, John M. Brown, Alexander Dunlap, Frederick Douglass, and his son Louis. What was said on the occasion brought the whole question virtually before the American people. Until that interview the country was not fully aware of the intentions and policy of President Johnson on the subject of Reconstruction, especially in respect to the newly emancipated class of the South. After having heard the brief addresses made by him to Mr. Downing and myself, he occupied at least three quarters of an hour in what seemed a set speech, and refused to listen to any reply on our part, although solicited to grant a few moments for that purpose. Point 56. The President shook hands with the colored men and then George T. Downing, a leading Negro from Newport, Rhode Island, opened the discussion. He said to the President, We desire for you to know that we come feeling that we are friends meeting a friend. He said that they represented colored people from the states of Illinois, Wisconsin, Alabama, Mississippi, Florida, South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, Maryland, Pennsylvania, New York, the New England states, and the District of Columbia. They were not satisfied with an amendment prohibiting slavery but wanted it enforced by appropriate legislation. We are Americans, native-born Americans we are citizens. We see no recognition of color or race in the organic law of the land. It has been shown in the present war that the government may justly reach its strong arm into the states and demand from those who owe it allegiance, their assistance, and support. May it not reach out a like arm to secure and protect its subjects upon whom it has a claim? Then Frederick Douglass came forward and said, Your noble and humane predecessor placed in our hands the sword to assist in saving the nation, and we do hope that you, his able successor, will favorably regard the placing in our hands, the ballot with which to save ourselves. The president was evidently embarrassed and floundered. He was not going to make a speech, he had jeopardized life, liberty, and property, not only for the colored people, but for the great mass of people. 
he was a friend of the colored man, but I do not want to adopt a policy that I believe will end in a contest between races, which if persisted in will result in the extermination of one or the other. He remembered his speech to Nashville Negroes before the election and repeated his willingness to be a Moses to lead him from bondage to freedom, but not into a war of races. He said that one can talk about the ballot box and justice and declaration of independence, but suppose by some magic touch you can say to everyone, you shall vote tomorrow. How much would that ameliorate their condition at this time? Then the president approached Douglas and said, now let us get closer up to this subject. He said he opposed slavery because it was a monopoly and gave profit and power to an aristocracy. By getting clear of the monopoly, they had abolished slavery. Douglas started to interrupt, but the president was not through. He went on to show the position of the poor white in relation to the slave owners, and how the slaves despised the poor whites. Douglas denied this personally, but the president insisted that anyway, most colored people did and this made the poor white man opposed both to the slave and his master, and that, therefore, there was enmity between the colored man and the poor white. Already the colored man had gained his freedom during the war, and if he and the poor white came into competition at the ballot box, a war of races would result. Moreover, was it proper to put on a people, without their consent, Negro suffrage? Do you deny that first great principle of the right of the people to govern themselves? Here Downing interrupted. Apply what you have said, Mr. President, to South Carolina, for instance, where a majority of the inhabitants are colored. The president twisted uncomfortably and said that the matter to which he referred comes up when a government is undergoing a fundamental change and he preferred to instance Ohio rather than South Carolina. Was it right to force Ohio to make a change in the elective franchise against its will? He could not touch the question as to whether it was right to prevent a majority in South Carolina from ruling because, to his mind, no number of Negroes could outweigh the will of whites. He stumbled on without mentioning this suppressed minor premise and said, It is a fundamental tenet of my creed that the will of the people must be obeyed. Is there anything wrong or unfair in that? Douglas smiled, still thinking of South Carolina, a great deal that is wrong, Mr. President with all respect. But the president insisted, it is the people of the states that must for themselves determine this thing. I do not want to be engaged in a work that will commence a war of races. Then he indicated that the interview was at an end, he was glad to have met them, and thanked them for the compliment paid him. Douglas returned the thanks, and said that they had not come to argue but if the president would grant permission, we would endeavor to controvert some of the positions you have assumed. Mr. Downing, too, suggested persuasively that the President, by his kind explanation, must have contemplated some reply to the views which he has advanced. Douglas continued. I would like to say one or two words in reply, you enfranchise your enemies and disfranchise your friends. My own impression is that the very thing that Your Excellency would avoid in the southern states can only be avoided by the very measure that we proposed. I would like to say a word or so in regard to that matter of the enfranchisement of the blacks as a means of preventing the very thing which Your Excellency seems to apprehend that is a conflict of races. The President naturally did not want to give publicity to views of Negroes antagonistic to his own, and said shortly that there were other places besides the South for the Negro to live. But, said Douglas, the masters have the making of the laws and we cannot get away from the plantation. What prevents you? asked Johnson. Douglas replied that, his master then decides for him where he shall go, where he shall work, how much he shall work. He is absolutely in the hands of those men. The president replied, if the master now controls him or his actions, would he not control him in his vote? Douglas answered, let the Negro once understand that he has an organic right to vote, and he will raise up a party in the southern states among the poor, who will rally with him. There is this conflict that you speak of between the wealthy slave owner and the poor man. The president replied eagerly, you touch right upon the point there. There is this conflict, and hence, I suggest emigration. The president then bowed his dark visitors out, saying they were all desirous of accomplishing the same ends but proposed to do so by following different roads. Douglas, turning to leave, 
said. The President sends us to the people and we go to the people. Yes, sir, answered the President, I have great faith in the people. I believe they will do what is right. 57. Afterwards the colored delegation published a reply to various points brought up by the President, and especially stressed the matter of enmity between the Negroes and the poor whites. The first point to which we feel especially bound to take exception is your attempt to found a policy opposed to our enfranchisement, upon the alleged ground of an existing hostility on the part of the former slaves towards the poor white people of the South. We admit the existence of this hostility, and hold that it is entirely reciprocal, but you obviously commit an error by drawing an argument from an incident of slavery, and making it a basis for a policy adapted to a state of freedom. The hostility between the white and blacks of the South is easily explained. It has its root and sap in the relation of slavery, and was incited on both sides by the cunning of the slave masters. Those masters secured their ascendancy over both the poor whites and blacks by putting enmity between them. They divided both to conquer each. There was no earthly reason why the blacks should not hate and dread the poor whites when in a state of slavery, for it was from this class that their masters received their slave catchers, slave drivers, and overseers. They were the men called in upon all occasions by the masters whenever any fiendish outrage was to be committed upon the slave. Now, sir, you cannot but perceive, that the cause of this hatred removed, the effect must be removed also. Slavery is abolished. The cause of this antagonism is removed, and you must see that it is altogether illogical, and putting new wine into old bottles, to legislate from slave-holding premises for a people whom you have repeatedly declared it your purpose to maintain in freedom. Besides, even if it were true, as you allege, that the hostility of the blacks towards the poor whites must necessarily project itself into a state of freedom, and that this enmity between the two races is even more intense in a state of freedom than in a state of slavery, in the name of heaven, we reverently ask, how can you? in view of your professed desire to promote the welfare of the black man, deprive him of all means of defense and clothe him whom you regard as his enemy in the panoply of political power? Can it be that you recommend a policy which would arm the strong and cast down the defenseless? Can you, by any possibility of reasoning, regard this as just, fair, or wise? Experience proves that those are most abused who can be abused with the greatest impunity. On the colonization theory you were pleased to broach, very much could be said. It is impossible to suppose, in view of the usefulness of the black man in times of peace as a laborer in the South, and in time of war as a soldier in the North, and the growing respect for his rights among the people and his increasing adaptation to a high state of civilization in his native land, that there can ever come a time when he can be removed from this country without a terrible shock to its prosperity and peace. Point 58. The Committee of Fifteen began its work again. The indomitable Stevens never gave up, never despaired, if he could not get all he wanted, he stood fast and took what he could. He said sadly June 13, 1866, in the House of Representatives, referring to the proposed Fourteenth Amendment with its permission to disfranchise the Negro. In my youth, in my manhood, in my old age, I had fondly dreamed that when any fortunate chance should have broken up for a while the foundation of our institutions, and released us from obligations the most tyrannical that ever man imposed in the name of freedom, that the intelligent, pure, and just men of this republic, true to their professions and their consciences, would have so remodeled all our institutions as to have freed them from every vestige of human oppression, of inequality of rights, of the recognized degradation of the poor and the superior caste of the rich. In short, that no distinction would be tolerated in this purified republic but what arose from merit and conduct. This bright dream has vanished like the baseless fabric of a vision. I find that we shall be obliged to be content with patching up the worst portions of the ancient edifice, and leaving it, in many of its parts, to be swept through by the tempests, frosts and the storms of despotism. Do you inquire why? holding these views and possessing some will of my own, I accept so imperfect a proposition? I answer, because I live among men and not among angels, among men as intelligent, as determined and as independent as myself, who, not agreeing with me, 
do not choose to yield up their opinions to mine. Mutual concessions is our only resort, or mutual hostilities.59. The committee of 15 now tried to find out by actual inquiry just what the situation in the South was with regard to the Negro. It did this, not so much because anyone was in doubt, as because the situation of the Negro was the most appealing thing that could be used to bring a majority to vote for the industrial North. It would increase the tremendous moral afflatus which made the war more and more symbolic in the minds of the people of the United States of a great triumph of human freedom. Subcommittees of the main committee took testimony for months all over the South and eventually issued an unanswerable array of evidence. April 20, Robert Dale Owen brought a proposal for a 14th Amendment to Stevens in the Committee of 15. Stevens picked up my manuscript, looked it carefully over, and then, in his impulsive way, said, I'll be plain with you, Owen. We've had nothing before us that comes anywhere near being as good as this, or as complete. It would be likely to pass, too, that's the best of it. We haven't a majority, either in our committee or in Congress, for immediate suffrage, and I don't believe the states have yet advanced so far that they would be willing to ratify it. I'll lay that amendment of yours before our committee tomorrow, if you say so, and I'll do my best to put it through. 60. Previous to this time, the thought was to bring in several separate amendments, but now the attitude was to unite the whole matter in one comprehensive amendment, so that the proposition of April 21st was presented as follows. Section 1. No discrimination shall be made by any state, nor by the United States, as to the civil rights of persons because of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Section 2. From and after the fourth day of July, in the year 1876, no discrimination shall be made by any state, nor by the United States, as to the enjoyment of classes of persons of the right of suffrage, because of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Section 3. Until the fourth day of July, 1876, no class of persons, as to the right of any of whom to suffrage discrimination shall be made by any state, because of race, color, or previous condition of servitude shall be included in the basis of representation. Section 4. Debts incurred in aid of insurrection or of war against the Union, and claims of compensation for loss of involuntary service or labor, shall not be paid by any state nor by the United States. Bingham moved a fifth section to the amendment, along the lines of his previous efforts. Section 5. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. The Bingham proposal was first adopted and then struck out by the committee. It was voted 7 to 6 to report the first three sections to Congress. Bingham tried in vain to bring in his proposal as a separate amendment. Thus Owen's proposition was ordered sent to Congress and had a good chance of being adopted, but Fessenden, the chairman, was sick with very alloyed and it was decided to delay final report until he was better. Stevens told Owens the sequel. Our action on your amendment said Stevens had, it seems, gotten noised abroad. In the course of last week the members from New York, from Illinois and from your state too, Owen from Indiana held, each separately, a caucus to consider whether equality of suffrage, present or prospective, ought to form a part of the Republican program for the coming canvas. They were afraid, so some of them told us, that if there was a nigger in the woodpile at all, that was the phrase, it would be used against them as an electioneering handle, and some of them hang their cowardice might lose their elections. By inconsiderable majorities each of these caucuses decided that Negro suffrage in any shape, ought to be excluded from the platform, and they communicated these decisions to us. Our committee hadn't backbone enough to maintain its ground. Yesterday, the vote on your plan was reconsidered, your amendment was laid on the table, and in the course of the next three hours we contrived to patch together well, what you've read this morning. 61. The sections were changed so as simply to exclude disfranchised Negroes from being made the basis of apportionment. 
Williams then presented a new section which allowed the Negroes gradually to be enfranchised, and thus gradually to become a basis of representation. Representatives shall be apportioned among several states which may be included within this union according to their respective numbers, counting the whole number of persons in each state excluding Indians not taxed. But whenever in any state the elective franchise shall be denied to any portion of its male citizens, not less than 21 years of age, or in any way abridged, except for participation in rebellion or other crime, the basis of representation in such state shall be reduced in the proportion which the number of such male citizens shall bear to the whole number of male citizens not less than 21 years of age. This was adopted as Section 2 of the Final Amendment. Finally, on this same date, the committee reinserted, by a vote of 10 to 3, Bingham's proposition on civil rights as Section I afterward, Conkling, before the Supreme Court, explained this action. At the time the Fourteenth Amendment was ratified, individuals and joint stock companies were appealing for congressional and administrative protection against the invidious and discriminating state and local taxes. One instance was that of an express company, whose stock was owned largely by citizens of the state of New York, who came with petitions and bills seeking acts of Congress to aid them in resisting what they deemed oppressive taxation in two states, and oppressive and ruinous rules of damages applied under state laws. That complaints of oppression in respect of property and other rights, made by citizens of northern states who took up residence in the South, were rife, in and out of Congress. The committee then considered Section 3. Mr. Harris moved to insert the following. Until the fourth day of July, in the year 1870, all persons who voluntarily adhered to the late insurrection, giving it aid and comfort, shall be excluded from the right to vote for representatives in Congress and for electors for President and Vice President of the United States. Point 62. This was finally adopted by a vote of 8 to 7. The committee then discussed the readmission of the Southern states with the 14th Amendment as a condition. Finally, the joint resolution and the bill concerning the readmission of the Southern states were adopted by a vote of 12 to 3. This proposed amendment and bill were reported to the House April 30th debated May 8, 9, and 10, and passed May 10. Stevens defended it May 8 and May 10. Our fathers had been compelled to postpone the principles of their great declaration, and wait for their full establishment until a more propitious time. That time ought to be present now. But the public mind has been educated in error for a century. How difficult in a day to unlearn it. In rebuilding, it is necessary to clear away the rotten and defective portions of the old foundations, and to sink deep and found the unrepaired edifice upon the firm foundation of eternal justice. If, perchance, the accumulated quicksands render it impossible to reach in every part so firm a basis, then it becomes our duty to drive deep and solid the substituted piles on which to build. It would not be wise to prevent the raising of the structure because some corner of it might be founded upon materials subject to the inevitable laws of mortal decay. It were better to shelter the household and trust to the advancing progress of a higher morality and a purer and more intelligent principle to underpin the defective corner. This proposition is not all that the committee desired. It falls far short of my wishes, but it fulfills my hopes. I believe it is all that can be obtained in the present state of public opinion. Not only Congress but several states are to be consulted. Upon a careful survey of the whole ground, we did not believe that 19 of the loyal states could be induced to ratify any proposition more stringent than this. I say 19, for I utterly repudiate and scorn the idea that any state not acting in the Union is to be counted on the question of ratification. It is absurd to suppose that any more than three-fourths of the states that propose the amendment are required to make it valid, that states not here are to be counted as present. Believing then that this is the best proposition that can be made effectual, I accept it. I shall not be driven by clamor or denunciation to throw away a great cause because it is not perfect. I will take all I can get in the cause of humanity and leave it to be perfected by better men in better times. It may be that that time will not come while I am here to enjoy the glorious triumph, but that it will come is as certain as that there is a just God. Stevens then referred to the previous draft of the amendment. After having received the careful examination and approbation of the committee, 
and having received the United Republican vote of 120 representatives of the people, it was denounced as utterly reprehensible, and unpardonable, to be encountered as a public enemy, positively endangering the peace of the country, and covering its name with dishonor. A wickedness on a larger scale than the crime against Kansas or the fugitive slave law, gross, foul, outrageous, an incredible injustice against the whole African race, with every other vulgar epithet which polished cultivation could command. I confess my mortification at its defeat. I grieved especially because it almost closed the door of hope for the amelioration of the condition of the freedmen. But men in pursuit of justice must never despair. Let us again try and see whether we cannot devise some way to overcome the united forces of self-righteous Republicans and unrighteous Copperheads. It will not do for those who for thirty years have fought the beasts at Ephesus to be frightened by the fangs of modern catamounts. Point 63. Thaddeus Stevens continued his speech, May 10. Let not these friends of secession sing to me their siren song of peace and goodwill until they can stop my ears to the screams and groans of the dying victims at Memphis. I hold in my hand an elaborate account from a man whom I know to be of the highest respectability in the country, every word of which I believe. This account of that foul transaction only reached me last night. It is more horrible in its atrocity, although not to the same extent, than the massacre at Jamaica. Tell me Tennessee or any other state is loyal of whom such things are proved. Ah, sir, it was but six years ago when they were here, just before they went out to join the armies of Catiline, just before they left this hall. Those of you who were here then will remember the scene in which every southern member, encouraged by their allies, came forth in one yelling body, because a speech for freedom was being made here, when weapons were drawn, and Barksdale's bowie knife gleamed before our eyes. Would you have these men back again so soon to reenact those scenes? Wait until I am gone, I pray you. I want not to go through it again. It will be but a short time for my colleagues to wait. Now, sir, if the gentleman had remembered the scenes twenty years ago, when no man dared to speak without risking his life, when but a few men did do it for there were cowards in those days, as there are in these you would not have found them asking to bring these men in, and I only wonder that my friend from Ohio Mr. Bingham should intimate a desire to bring them here. The announcement of the vote, May 10, was 128 to 37, 19 not voting. It was received with applause on the floor and in the galleries. Mr. Elridge of Wisconsin rose angrily to a question of order. I want to know if it is understood that the proceedings of this house are to be interrupted by those who come here and occupy the galleries. The gentleman from Wisconsin, replied the speaker, makes the point of order that expressions of approbation or disapprobation from persons occupying the galleries are not in order. The chair sustains the point of order. But Mr. Elridge was still angry. I do not want our proceedings to be interrupted by the niggerheads in the galleries. The galleries hissed and Stevens asked, is it in order for members on the floor to disturb those in the galleries? Members upon the floor should not insult the spectators in the galleries, said the Speaker. Point 64. The Fourteenth Amendment came up in the Senate April 30th, but Fessenden was still ill and no action was taken for two weeks. Finally, May 23rd, Howard of Michigan began the debate. He declared that the object of the Fourteenth Amendment was primarily to give Congress the power to enforce the guarantees of freedom in the first eight amendments to the Constitution. The West, led by Sherman, Doolittle, and others, tried to reintroduce voters as the basis of representation. New England, through Senator Wilson of Massachusetts, was opposed to striking from the basis of representation 2,100,000 unnaturalized foreigners who gave the North 17 representatives. Sherman did not agree. If it is right to exclude four millions of blacks in the southern states who are denied representation, is it not also right to exclude all other classes in every other state who are denied political power? 65. The question of Negro citizenship was discussed and Julian of Indiana opposed the conservative stand, to follow conservatism we would recognize the revolting states as still in the Union, it opposes the protection of the millions of loyal colored people of the South through the agency of the Freedmen's Bureau, it opposes the Civil Rights Bill, it opposes, with all bitterness, 
the policy of giving the freedmen the ballot. On the other hand, radicalism would hold treason a crime, it would base representation on the actual voters, it favors the protection of the colored people of the South through the Freedmen's Bureau and the Civil Rights Bill, it demands the ballot as the right of every colored citizen. Evidently the breach between the East and West was growing, and coupled with some nurse attitude, it looked as though the 14th Amendment was again doomed. The Republican Party fell back upon the caucus. From May 24 to May 28, the Senate was in session but a few hours, which gave the Republicans time to discuss the whole matter in party caucus. The party at that time showed clear division into conservative, industrial elements, like Fessenden, Trumbull and Morgan, and the abolition democracy, led by Sumner, Wade and Yates. The opposition of Sumner and the abolition democracy was finally overcome by the plain facts of the case, this was the utmost that could be got from Congress in defense of democracy. Was it not worth taking? What could be hoped for in further delay? As a result of the caucuses, certain amendments were made. The second section was amended to strike out the word citizen and insert inhabitants being citizens of the United States. A new first section was inserted, that all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof, are citizens of the United States and of states wherein they reside. The Senate's changes thus consisted in defining who were citizens, and in substituting for disfranchisement of all participants in secession until 1870, the ineligibility of certain high officials, it opened the elective franchise to such persons as the states may choose to admit, and adopted the third section in its present form. We have thus followed, as well as records let us, the inner history of the reconstruction measures of Congress in the Committee of Fifteen and other sources. Now let us look at the proceedings of Congress, as negotiations on these matters rose among the leaders, here and there and now and then, in a sea of struggling unorganized action. In the matter of civil rights, the final draft of the Fourteenth Amendment said, All persons born or naturalized in the United States, and subject to the jurisdiction thereof, are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property, without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. The first proposition on civil rights was introduced into the House by Mr. Stevens, December 5, 1865. On December 6, Bingham of Ohio offered an amendment. Both these resolutions went to the Committee on the Judiciary. Two other propositions were introduced December 11. February 1, 1866, a motion was passed directing the Committee of Fifteen to inquire into this matter. Williams suggested an amendment, February 5, empowering Congress to enforce all obligations, prohibitions, or disabilities imposed by the Constitution on the several states. 66 February 13, 1866, the Committee of Fifteen, as we have noted, reported to both houses a proposed amendment by Mr. Bingham in the House and by Mr. Fessenden in the Senate. Both motions were indefinitely postponed, and there was a strong desire to get the whole final report of the Committee of Fifteen. On March 9, 1866, while the Senate was discussing the apportionment of representatives, Senator Yates of Illinois moved an amendment for civil and political rights, but it secured only seven votes. Two other and similar propositions were made in the Senate but received small support. The first section of the resolution reported to the House April 30, 1866, became eventually the civil rights section of the Fourteenth Amendment passed by the House, but the Senate, as we have seen, did not adopt it. Several attempts were made to amend it in the Senate, Mr. Wade offered a substitute for the entire resolution, but the whole proposition failed. When the second proposition came before the Senate, May 30, Howard of Michigan, in behalf of Senate members of the Joint Committee, presented a series of resolutions which had been adopted by the Republican caucus as a substitute for the House amendment. The substitute was accepted. The first change was to prefix these words to the first clause of the amendment, all persons born in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof, 
are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. Later, Fessenden of Maine secured the inclusion of naturalized persons. Senator Johnson of Maryland tried unsuccessfully to strike out the guarantee that states should not make or enforce any law to abridge the privileges of immunity of citizens. Disability for participation in secession was covered by Section 3. No person shall be a senator or representative in Congress, or elector of president and vice president, or hold any office, civil or military, under the United States, or under any state, who, having previously taken an oath, as a member of Congress, or as an officer of the United States, or as a member of any state legislature, or as an executive or judicial officer of any state, to support the Constitution of the United States, shall have engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the same, or given aid or comfort to the enemies thereof. But Congress may, by a vote of two-thirds of each House, remove such disability. Four amendments on disabilities for participation in the rebellion were introduced in 1866. In the report of the Committee of 15 April 30, 1866, there was included a third section by which all persons who voluntarily adhered to the late insurrection were excluded from the right to vote until July 4, 1870. Attempts were made to amend this in the House. When the resolution reached the Senate there were 15 attempts to alter this section. On May 30, Senator Howard of Michigan in behalf of the Senate members of the Joint Committee on Reconstruction presented a new draft in which he proposed in place of the third section, the provision which now appears in the Fourteenth Amendment. Many efforts were made to amend it. The Democratic senators seemed to prefer the Howard substitute to the House Amendment. This section passed. The question of suffrage for Negroes was covered by Section 2. Representatives shall be apportioned among the several states according to their respective numbers, counting the whole number of persons in each state, excluding Indians not taxed. But when the right to vote at any election for the choice of electors for President and Vice President of the United States, representatives in Congress, the executive or judicial officers of a state, or the members of the legislature thereof, is denied to any of the male inhabitants of such state, being 21 years of age and citizens of the United States, or in any way abridged except for participation in rebellion or other crime, the basis of representation therein shall be reduced in the proportion which the number of such male citizens shall bear to the whole number of male citizens 21 years of age in such state. This question of Negro suffrage gave rise to five proposed amendments just before the Civil War. All these excluded persons of Negro descent from the right to vote and most of them excluded from them the right to hold office. In the opening days of the 39th Congress, there were six propositions to guarantee the right to vote to Negroes. Two proposed an educational standard in voting for federal officials. Boutwell proposed an amendment making unlawful any distinction in the elective franchise on account of race or color. Another amendment proposed to give Congress power to define the qualifications of voters, and members of Congress and of presidential electors. Henderson, January 23, 1866, proposed an amendment denying the state the right to discriminate against voters on account of race or color. January 22, 1866, the proposal on the apportionment of representatives and abridgment of representatives was presented by the Committee of 15 to the House. It was recommitted January 29, and reported again January 31. It passed January 31st. In the Senate, there were five attempts to amend this resolution. Sumner presented a resolution making color discrimination impossible in the courtroom or ballot box. This was rejected, 39 to 8. Howard proposed to admit to the franchise Negroes in the Army and Navy, or those able to read and write, or those who had property to the value of $250. This was not acted on. Sumner again attempted to amend the resolution by making illegal discrimination on account of race and color. It was lost, 39 to 8. A similar proposal by Yates of Illinois was rejected. Three other propositions to amend the Constitution, relative to the suffrage, were introduced before the close of this Congress. One was a proposition by Stewart of Nevada on March 16, this foreshadowed the subsequent Grandfather Clause. 
it admitted the southern states on several conditions, one of which was the extension of the elective franchise to all persons upon the same terms and conditions, making no discrimination on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude, provided that those who were qualified to vote in the year 1860 by the laws of their respective states shall not be disfranchised by reason of any new tests or conditions which have been or may be prescribed since that year. That when the aforementioned condition shall have been complied with and ratified by a majority of the present voting population, a general amnesty shall be proclaimed. That all the loyal states be respectfully requested to incorporate in their constitutions an amendment corresponding to the one above described. That it is not intended to assert a coercive power on the part of Congress, in regard to the regulation of the suffrage in the different states, but only to make an appeal to their own good sense and love of country, with a view to the prevention of serious evils now threatened. Seward said in 1870. When the Reconstruction question arose about the Fourteenth Amendment, I proposed that all persons born in the United States after the date of Mr. Lincoln's proclamation abolishing slavery should be entitled to vote on arriving at the age of 21 years, and this should enter into Reconstruction. Point 67. The resolution for the new Fourteenth Amendment passed the Senate June 8, 1866, by a vote of 33 to 11, five members not voting. The amended resolution was brought before the House and was called up June 13. After a limited debate, the amendments made by the Senate were concurred in by a vote of 120 to 32, 32 not voting. Thus the 14th Amendment was sent to the states for approval. After the President's veto of the Freedmen's Bureau Bill, many members wanted the question immediately reconsidered, and the day after the President's speech of February 22, Senator Wilson introduced a bill which was not reported. The legislatures of several states approved of a bill, by petitions which urged maintaining the Bureau. The President tried to counteract this by sending two agents, General Steedman and Fullerton, to investigate the Bureau. They were both in sympathy with his policy and made a tour of four months. They commended Howard and believed that the Bureau had done much to preserve order and organize free labor but that it had sometimes been dishonestly and injudiciously administered, and that it was time for it to come to an end. This report was widely circulated and discussed. The charges were investigated and public confidence in the Bureau was shaken. Nevertheless, May 22, a bill to continue the Bureau was introduced. It differed from the bill of February 9, in limiting the Bureau to two years. Land held under Sherman's orders was to be restored to former owners and other land furnished the dispossessed freedmen. Army officers were retained in the service of the Bureau, and commissioners were authorized to cooperate with agents of benevolent associations, property was to be appropriated for the education of the freedmen, and military protection of their civil rights guaranteed. After discussion, the bill passed the House May 29, by vote of 96 to 32. In the Senate, the bill was amended and a conference was held. The conference agreed that the questions arising out of Sherman's orders should be left entirely with the President for settlement. On June 16, the President vetoed the bill and called the Freedmen's Bureau a proposition to transfer four million slaves from their original owners to a new set of taskmasters. By a severe exercise of party discipline, according to Blaine, the necessary two-thirds vote was procured in each house and the bill passed over the President's veto on the same day that it was received. Thus government guardianship of freedmen was given a temporary extension under a grudging and partly inimical administration. The disposition of Congress to yield in part to the President was manifest. On June 6, the Committee of Fifteen was reappointed. Subcommittees had been taking testimony all over the South. The final report of the Committee of Fifteen was made June 18. It made an 800-page book and 100,000 copies were distributed. Its majority and minority sections summed up the strongest arguments available for and against the proposed methods of reconstruction. The part of the majority report that touched the Negro said. Slavery had been abolished by constitutional amendment. A large proportion of the population had become, instead of mere chattels, free men and citizens. Through all the past struggle these had remained true and loyal, and had, in large numbers, fought on the side of the Union. 
it was impossible to abandon them without securing them their rights as free men and citizens. The whole civilized world would have cried out against such base ingratitude, and the bare idea is offensive to all right-thinking men. Hence, it became important to inquire what could be done to secure their rights, civil and political. It was evident to your committee that adequate security could only be found in appropriate constitutional provisions. The increase of representation necessarily resulting from the abolition of slavery was considered the most important element in the questions arising out of the changed condition of affairs, and the necessity for some fundamental action in this regard seemed imperative. It appeared to your committee that the rights of these persons by whom the basis of representation had been thus increased should be recognized by the general government. While slaves, they were not considered as having any rights, civil or political. It did not seem just or proper that all the political advantages derived from their becoming free should be confined to their former masters, who had fought against the Union, and withheld from themselves, who had always been loyal. Doubts were entertained whether Congress had power, even under the amended Constitution, to prescribe the qualifications of voters in a state, or could act directly on the subject. It was doubtful, in the opinion of your committee, whether the states would consent to surrender a power they had always exercised, and to which they were attached. As the best, if not the only, method of surmounting the difficulty, and as eminently just and proper in itself, your committee came to the conclusion that political power should be possessed in all the states exactly in proportion as the right of suffrage should be granted, without distinction of color or race. It appears quite clear that the anti-slavery amendments, both to the state and federal constitutions, were adopted in the South with reluctancy by the bodies which did adopt them, while in some states they have been either passed by in silence or rejected. The language of all the provisions and ordinances of these states on the subject amounts to nothing more than an unwilling admission of an unwelcome truth. Looking still further at the evidence taken by your committee, it is found to be clearly shown, by witnesses of the highest character, and having the best means of observation, that the Freedmen's Bureau, instituted for the relief and protection of freedmen and refugees, is almost universally opposed by the mass of the population, and exists in an efficient condition only under military protection, while the Union men of the South are earnest in its defense, declaring with one voice that, without its protection the colored people would not be permitted to labor at fair prices, and could hardly live in safety. They also testify that without the protection of United States troops Union men, whether of northern or southern origin, would be obliged to abandon their homes. The feeling in many portions of the country towards the emancipated slaves, especially among the uneducated and ignorant, is one of vindictive and malicious hatred. This deep-seated prejudice against color is assiduously cultivated by the public journals, and leads to acts of cruelty, oppression, and murder, which the local authorities are at no pains to prevent or punish. There is no general disposition to place the colored race, constituting at least two-fifths of the population, upon terms even of civil equality. While many instances may be found where large planters and men of the better class accept the situation, and honestly strive to bring about a better order of things by employing the freedmen at fair wages and treating them kindly, the general feeling and disposition among all classes are yet totally averse to the toleration of any class of people friendly to the Union, be they white or black, and this aversion is not infrequently manifested in an insulting and offensive manner. Point 68. This part of the report was signed by 12 members of the committee. The other three members submitted a minority report. It was in the main, the old metaphysical argument, signed by Johnson, the constitutional lawyer from Maryland, Rogers, the extreme advocate of Southern rights from New Jersey, and Grider. They are asked to disfranchise a numerous class of their citizens, and also to agree to diminish their representation in Congress and of course in the Electoral College, or to admit to the right of suffrage their colored males of 21 years of age and upwards, a class now in a condition of almost utter ignorance, thus placing them on the same political footing with white citizens of that age. For reasons so obvious that the dullest may discover them, the right is not directly asserted of granting suffrage to the Negro. That would be obnoxious to most of the northern and western states, so much so that their consent was not to be anticipated but as the plan adopted, because of the limited number of Negroes in such states, 
will have no effect on their representation, it is thought it may be adopted, while in the southern states it will materially lessen their number. That these latter states will assent to the measure can hardly be expected. The effect, then, if not the purpose, of the measure is forever to deny representatives to such states, or, if they consent to the condition, to weaken their representative power, and thus, probably, secure a continuance of such a party in power as now controls the legislation of the government. The measure, in its terms and its effect, whether designed or not, is to degrade the southern states. To consent to it will be to consent to their own dishonor. Neither Sumner nor Stevens was satisfied with the Fourteenth Amendment. On the last day of the session, July 28, 1866, Thaddeus Stevens made his last defense of Negro suffrage. He was at the time worn out, his health was precarious, he was 73 years of age, and he hardly expected to return to his seat in the House. With deep solemnity, he sought to make one more perhaps an expiring effort to do something which shall be useful to my fellow men, something to elevate and enlighten the poor, the oppressed, and the ignorant in this great crisis of human affairs. The black man, he declared, must have the ballot or he would continue to be a slave. There was some alleviation to the lot of a bondman, but a freeman deprived of every human right, is the most degraded of human beings. Without the protection of the ballot box the freedmen were the mere serfs, and would become the victims of their former masters. He declared that what he had done he had done for humanity. I know it is easy, he said, to protect the interests of the rich and powerful, but it is a great labor to guard the rights of the poor and downtrodden it is the eternal labor of Sisyphus, forever to be renewed. In this, perhaps my final action on this great question, I can see nothing in my political course, especially in regard to human freedom, which I could wish to have expunged or changed. I believe that we must all account hereafter for deeds done in the body, and that political deeds will be among those accounts. I desire to take to the bar of that final settlement the record which I shall this day make on the great question of human rights. While I am sure it will not make atonement for half my errors, I hope it will be some palliation. Are there any who will venture to take the list with their negative seal upon it, and who will dare to unroll it before that stern judge who is the father of the immortal beings whom they have been trampling underfoot, and whose souls they have been crushing out? 69. This was not, in fact, his last speech, but it had the tone of a final message. Congress adjourned before a congressional plan of reconstruction reached its final form, but its general outline was clear, and no further compromise between the congressional majority and Johnson was possible. Already, the President's attitude on the Fourteenth Amendment and Reconstruction had led to two suicides, the resignation of three members of the Cabinet, and although Stanton remained, his retention caused the impeachment of Andrew Johnson. Sumner, much against his will, had remained silent when the Senate, by party caucus, had decided upon the Fourteenth Amendment. On the last day of Congress, he wrote the Duchess of Argyle. The suffering at the South is great, through the misconduct of the President. His course has kept the rebel spirit alive, and depressed the loyal, white and black. It makes me very sad to see this. Considering the difficulties of their position, the blacks have done wonderfully well. They should have had a Moses as a president, but they had found a Pharaoh.70. Particularly had the situation in Louisiana become tense. The New Orleans riot of July 30, 1866, confirmed the abolitionists in their opinion that the reconstructed states were in the power of the rebels, and that they were using their power to put the Negro back into slavery, and that no man, white or black, who was friendly to the Union, was safe in the South. There were reported a thousand murders in the South, with few of the criminals brought to justice. And the country was convinced that the President had disrupted the Union Party, and was conspiring with Democrats, North and South, to drive out the Republicans. In the election of 1866, there was on the side of Congress, a Union Party with a center block of Republicans a left wing of radical abolitionists, and a right wing of reactionary war Democrats. Andrew Johnson tried to unite the Western radicals and the war Democrats into a new third party, 
to be reinforced eventually by the returned secessionists. But between extreme democracy and reaction there was no common ground. He only succeeded in getting the support of a few of the war Democrats, and the Copperheads, who were either Southerners living North, or Northern men with Southern principles. State and national conventions met. Johnson and his friends started out August 14 to form a Johnson party. The National Union Convention met in Philadelphia with states North and South represented. A special wigwam, two stories high, was erected on Girard Avenue, seating 10,000 people. The interior was decorated with flags. Horace Greeley called it a bread-and-butter convention, composed of 99% of rebels and copperheads. Thomas Nast ridiculed the convention in his cartoons in Harper's Weekly. Their Declaration of Principles, accepted unanimously, declared the war had maintained the Constitution and the Union unaltered, and that neither Congress nor the general government had any authority to deny the constitutional right of congressional representation to any state. They urged the election of congressmen who would admit all loyal representatives from the South. They affirmed the inability of a state either to secede or exclude any other state from the Union, and the constitutional right of each state to decide for itself the qualifications for voting, within its borders. They insisted that the Constitution could not be legally amended, except with all the states voting in Congress, and action by all the legislatures. They denied any desire in the southern states to restore slavery. They proclaimed the invalidity of the rebel debts, the inviolability of the federal debt, and the right of freedmen to the same protection of persons and property as afforded to whites. They urged government aid for federal soldiers and their families. Finally, they expressed wholehearted endorsement of Andrew Johnson. The weakness of this meeting was that, first, it contained in fact few Republicans, most of the delegates being well-known Democrats who had opposed Lincoln. It was dubbed the Conference of Copperheads, and among the delegates were Volandigam and Fernando Wood. Secondly, the meeting was not followed up with careful organization. No sooner had this convention adjourned than Southern Loyalists met in Philadelphia on September 3, to confer with Northern Republicans, including Horace Greeley, John Jacob Astor, Carl Schurz, Frederick Douglass, Brownlow, Thomas E. Benton, Morton, Cameron, and Gary. This conference met in two parts, one Northern and one Southern. Frederick Douglass was elected delegate from Rochester to attend the convention. It was a great honor for a black man in a white city. On the train, he met Southern and Western delegates, including Governor Oliver P. Morton of Indiana. After consultation, a committee waited on him, and through a Louisiana spokesman, insisted on their high respect for him, but also on their fear that it was inexpedient for him to attend the convention, on account of the cry of social and political equality which would be raised against the Republican Party. Douglas replied, Gentlemen, with all respect, you might as well ask me to put a loaded pistol to my head and blow my brains out, as to ask me to keep out of this convention, to which I have been duly elected 71. He pointed out that the fact of his election was widely known, and his failure to attend would be inexplicable. Later, he was warned against walking in the procession, and for a while it looked as if he would have to walk alone, until Theodore Tilton of New York offered to walk with him. In that parade, he met a daughter of his former owner. During the convention, Speed, who had just resigned from the cabinet, called the president a tyrant, and the Southern loyalists attacked Johnson, but split on Negro suffrage. A part of the convention finally adopted this declaration. The government by national and appropriate legislation, enforced by national authority, shall confer on every citizen in the states we represent, the American birthright of impartial suffrage and equality before the law. This is the one all-sufficient remedy. This is our great and pressing necessity. Point 72. Governor Brownlow of Tennessee in discussing Negro suffrage at this same convention on September 3, 1866, said. Some gentlemen, from a mistaken view of my character, said they were afraid of Negro suffrage, and wanted to dodge it. I have never dodged any subject, nor have I ever been found on both sides of any subject. While I am satisfied with everything done here, I would go further. I am an advocate of Negro suffrage 
and impartial suffrage. I would rather associate with loyal Negroes than with disloyal white men. I would rather be buried in a Negro graveyard than in a rebel graveyard, and after death I would sooner go to a Negro heaven than a white rebel's hell. Point 73. There followed in September two military conventions, one in Cleveland, September 18, by Friends of Johnson, which did not mention Negro suffrage. It denounced the abolitionists and said that they were trying to force another war. It contained many Democrats and a few conservative Republicans. Confederate officers at Memphis, including General Forrest of Fort Pillow fame, sent sympathy by telegram, which was unfortunate publicity. In answer to this a national convention of citizens, soldiers and sailors was held at Pittsburgh, September 25th and 26. There were many volunteer officers of high rank and Johnson was denounced and the 14th Amendment advocated. This convention had great influence on public opinion and popularized the 14th Amendment. The issue in the election of the fall of 1866, turned on whether Congress should recognize southern states as reconstructed by Johnson. It was not a presidential year, but congressmen and state legislatures were to be elected. The real campaign began in August, with the 14th of August convention in Philadelphia. This convention greatly encouraged Johnson, and he wrote it, attacking Congress for preventing the restoration of peace and union, and denying that it was really a legal Congress. If I had wanted authority, or if I had wished to perpetuate my own power, how easily could I have held and wielded that which was placed in my hands by the measure called Freedmen's Bureau Bill 74. On July 4, he had issued another proclamation of general amnesty, and on August 20, he declared the civil war at an end. Already, in the spring, he had promised to lay the cornerstone of a monument to Stephen A. Douglas in Chicago, and he left Washington, August 28, on a great campaign tour, which was to sweep the country. He took General Grant with him and members of his cabinet, and Seward joined him in New York. Johnson stopped at Philadelphia, New York, Albany and then went west by way of Cleveland, Chicago and St. Louis. It was an extraordinary and increasingly painful effort, by which Johnson definitely defeated himself and his own political policies. He showed genius for saying the wrong thing. In New York, for instance, he asked, are we prepared, after the cost of war, to continue the disrupted condition of the country? Why are we afraid of the representatives of the South? Some have grown fat, some have grown rich by the aggression and destruction of others. In Philadelphia, he declared that God was a tailor, like himself. At Cleveland his audience became a mob while the president himself increased the hubbub. The city authorities had made preparations for a polite reception, but as he proceeded with his harangue, the mob took complete possession of the crowd. Someone cried, why not hang Thad Stevens and Wendell Phillips? Yes, yelled Johnson, why not hang them, 75. Some towns hung out blacks flags and banners, no welcome to traitors. Bands played the death march, Johnson shouted in defiance. His egotism was ridiculed. He was charged with being drunk, a traitor, and a demagogue. On he reeled. As Burgess said, the trip degraded the presidential office. The New York Tribune watched it with a feeling of national shame, and called it the stumbling tour of an inebriated demagogue. The New York World excused him by asking, who of all presidents had been lower than Lincoln in personal bearing. The Herald put the blame on Seward's shoulders, the Mephistopheles of the administration. Lowell called the journey an indecent orgy, Rhodes says he was intoxicated at Cleveland, while Scoeuler declares he was sober. The culmination came in St. Louis, where Johnson declared that the blood of the New Orleans riot was on Congress, and decried the diabolical and nefarious policies of Stevens, Phillips, and Sumner. The most charitable thing that the defenders of Andrew Johnson can say of him is that occasionally he got drunk, for too much liquor alone would excuse such extraordinary conduct and performances as his vice presidential inauguration, his speech of February 22, 1866 his exhibition at Cleveland, and his St. Louis debauch. If he was not an occasional drunkard, he was God's own fool. He returned to Washington, as Schurz says, 
an utterly discomfited and disgraced man, having gone out to win popular support, and having earned only public disgust. The role of Seward during this episode was pathetic. One of the wits of the time spoke of Seward's new office of bear leader. Unfortunately he was very unsuccessful even in this task, for he could do little more than apologize for Johnson, and in a few commonplace sentences call upon the audience to support the president in opposition to Congress. At Niagara, he told the crowd that Lincoln had been traduced when alive, but after his assassination all hearts inclined to the deepest sorrow, and it would be the same if Johnson should be taken off. To the citizens of Buffalo he stated the issue as follows, the question is between the president and the Congress. Of all that has been done to bring us so near the consummation of Reconstruction you see that nothing has been done that was not done through the direction, agency, activity, perseverance and patriotism of Andrew Johnson, President of the United States. Will you stand by Congress? Or will you stand by the President? The Republicans took every advantage of the situation. They saw in Johnson the instinct of the poor white cropping out. He cannot shake off the boot-licking proclivity born and bred in him, towards the aristocracy of the South. Miserable fool! Stevens made but one speech in the campaign of 1866. He said that he had been directed by his physician neither to think, speak, nor read until the next session of Congress, that he had followed the orders not to read almost literally. It is true, I have amused myself with a little light, frivolous reading. For instance, there was a serial account from day to day of a very remarkable circus that traveled through the country, from Washington to Chicago and St. Louis, and from Louisville back to Washington. I read that with some interest, expecting to see in so celebrated an establishment one which from its heralding was to beat Dan Rice and all the old circuses that ever went forth I expected great wit from the celebrated character of its clowns.76. As the campaign of 1866 progressed, the agitation in favor of granting suffrage to the Negro as a necessary protection of his freedom became marked. First of all, industry and trade were convinced that they could not trust the white South. Therefore, the more extreme ideas which Stevens had advocated, were allowed to be broadcast. Their logic was strong and their methods popular. People had faith in laws and wanted some great enactment in keeping with the greatness of the war. It was a ripe time for amending the Constitution and inaugurating final reforms. These reforms might be in advance at the time, but they were worth trying, and there appeared to be no middle path. Thus, as the campaign went on, Negro suffrage occupied a more and more important position. Stevens, Wade, Sumner, Chase, Schurz, and Chandler were in favor of it. To many Northerners it had been at first unthinkable, but more and more they became convinced. The nation urged full Negro suffrage and Negro civil rights, but opposed the exclusion of white leaders from office. The doctrine that this is a white man's government and intended for white men only, is, as the Perrys profess it, as monstrous a doctrine as was ever concocted. To allow the states to reorganize on this basis, the nation added, will make the very name of American democracy a hissing and a byword among the nations of the earth. To have this theory of the nature of our government boldly thrust in our faces now, after the events of the last four years, by men who have come red-handed from the battlefield, and to whose garments the blood of our brothers and sons still clings, and to know that the President, who owes in part at least his ability to be President to the valor and blood of colored troops, concurs with them in this scandalous repudiation of democratic principles, are things which the country, we trust, will. Find it hard to bear point 77. For a brief period for the seven mystic years that stretched between Johnson's swing round the circle to the panic of 1873, the majority of thinking Americans of the North believed in the equal manhood of Negroes. They acted accordingly with a thoroughness and clean-cut decision that no age which does not share that faith can in the slightest comprehend. They did not free draft animals, nor enfranchise gorillas nor welcome morons to Congress. They simply recognized black folk as men. The South called for war, said James Russell Lowell, and we have given it to her. We will fix the terms of peace ourselves and we will teach the South that Christ is disguised in a dusky race. 78. 
then came in 1873 to 76 sudden and complete disillusion not at Negroes but at the world at business, at work, at religion, at art. A bitter protest of southern property reinforced northern reaction, and while after long years the American world recovered in most matters, it has never yet quite understood why it could ever have thought that black men were altogether human. There were men in the South and former slaveholders who knew the truth and spoke it. They knew that there could be no salvation for the South in time or eternity, until the former slave went forth as a man. But the entrenched intolerance of the South, coupled with the awful grief at the death of the flower of Southern manhood, let such prophets speak but few words. They spoke here and there in nearly every Southern state, but they were soon threatened into silence, and there prevailed a bitter hatred and cry for vengeance from people who could not brook defeat because they had been used to victory, and had the slave-born habit of arrogance. For their grief, none had greater sympathy than the bulk of their former slaves. They served and even succored their former masters, and yet, upon these and their fellows, was eventually placed the whole wrath of the South which it could not turn toward the North. And especially it fell upon those freedmen who felt their freedom, who were uplifted by new ambition, who showed the gathered resentment of two hundred years of whipping, kicks and cuffs, in fine, on them who had rolling in their ears God's great, deposuit potentes. He hath put down the mighty from their seats, and hath exalted them of low degree. After the final elections of 1866, the Republicans had 143 members in the House, and the Democrats 49. All states gave strong majorities to the Republican Party, except the border states of Maryland, Delaware, and Kentucky. In the South, Democratic candidates were universally successful. Not counting the South, the Republicans in the Senate had a two-thirds majority, and nearly a three-fourths majority in the House. Through the winter of 1866-1867, notwithstanding the results of the elections of 1866, the South rejected the 14th Amendment. Virginia gave one vote in favor, North Carolina, 11 out of 148, South Carolina, one vote, Georgia, 2 out of 169, Alabama, 10 out of 106, Texas, 5, and Arkansas, 3, Florida, Mississippi, and Louisiana were unanimously against it. Thus the South defied Congress, and demanded that the disfranchised Negro should be counted as basis of representation. The South was encouraged in this stand by the President. The Governor of Alabama telegraphed him that the rejection of the 14th Amendment could be reconsidered by his state, but Johnson discouraged him. This increased the strength of the Republicans in the North. The President's message of December 4, 1866, with all the earmarks of Seward, was calm and skillful. He said that the war was ended, and that the nation should now proceed as a free, prosperous, and united nation. He had already informed Congress of his efforts for the gradual restoration of the states. All that remained now was the admission to Congress of loyal senators and representatives. While Congress had been considering this, the President had appointed various public officials, and the Thirteenth Amendment had been passed. Yet Congress hesitated to admit the southern states to representation, and after eight months, only Tennessee had been admitted. He wished to leave the whole matter of suffrage to the states and he was significantly silent on the Black Codes. The second session of the Thirty-Ninth Congress began December 3rd. The Senate asked for a report on the condition of the southern states, since the President had said practically nothing about it. The President replied, December 19, 1866. As a result of the measures instituted by the Executive, with the view of inducing a resumption of the functions of the states comprehended in the inquiry of the Senate, the people of North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, Arkansas, and Tennessee, have reorganized their respective state governments, and are yielding obedience to the laws and government of the United States with more willingness and greater promptitude than under the circumstances could reasonably have been anticipated. The proposed amendment to the Constitution, providing for the abolition of slavery forever within the limits of the country, has been ratified by each one of those states, with the exception of Mississippi, 
from which no official information has yet been received, and in nearly all of them measures have been adopted or are now pending, to confer upon freedmen rights and privileges which are essential to their comfort, protection, and security. In Florida and Texas, the people are making commendable progress in restoring their state governments, and no doubt it is entertained that they will, at an early period be in a condition to resume all of their practical relations to the federal government. It is true that in some of the states the demoralizing effects of the war are to be seen in occasional disorders, but these are local in character, not frequent in occurrence, and are rapidly disappearing as the authority of civil law is extended and sustained. Perplexing questions were naturally to be expected from the great and sudden change in the relations between the two races, but systems are gradually developing themselves under which the freedman will receive the protection to which he is justly entitled, and by means of his labor make himself a useful and independent member of the community in which he has his home. The transubstantiation of Andrew Johnson was complete. He had begun as the champion of the poor laborer, demanding that the land monopoly of the southern oligarchy be broken up, so as to give access to the soil, south and west, to the free laborer. He had demanded the punishment of those southerners who by slavery and war had made such an economic program impossible. Suddenly thrust into the presidency, he had retreated from this attitude. He had not only given up extravagant ideas of punishment, but he dropped his demand for dividing up plantations when he realized that Negroes would largely be beneficiaries. Because he could not conceive of Negroes as men, he refused to advocate universal democracy, of which, in his young manhood, he had been the fiercest advocate, and made strong alliance with those who would restore slavery under another name. This change did not come by deliberate thought or conscious desire to hurt it was rather the tragedy of American prejudice made flesh, so that the man born to narrow circumstances, a rebel against economic privilege, died with the conventional ambition of a poor white to be the associate and benefactor of monopolists, planters and slave drivers. In some respects, Andrew Johnson is the most pitiful figure of American history. A man who, despite great power and great ideas, became a puppet, played upon by mighty fingers and selfish, subtle minds, groping, self-made, unlettered and alone, drunk, not so much with liquor, as with the heady wine of sudden and accidental success. My wild soul waited on as falcons hover. I beat the reedy fence as I trampled past. I heard the mournful loon. In the marsh beneath the moon. And then, with feathery thunder, the bird of my desire broke from the cover. Flashing silver fire. High up among the stars I saw his pinions spire. The pale clouds gazed aghast. As my falcon dropped upon him, and gripped and held him fast. William Rose Bennett. 9. The Price of Disaster. The price of the disaster of slavery and civil war was the necessity of quickly assimilating into American democracy a mass of ignorant laborers in whose hands alone for the moment lay the power of preserving the ideals of popular government, of overthrowing a slave economy and establishing upon it an industry primarily for the profit of the workers. It was this price which in the end America refused to pay and today suffers for that refusal. The year 1867 comes. The election of 1866 has sent to the 40th Congress a Republican majority of 42 against 11 in the Senate and 143 against 49 in the House. The decisive battle of Reconstruction looms. Abolition democracy demands for Negroes physical freedom, civil rights, economic opportunity and education and the right to vote, as a matter of sheer human justice and right. Industry demands profits and is willing to use for this end Negro freedom or Negro slavery, votes for Negroes or black codes. The South, beaten in war, and socially and economically disorganized, was knocking at the doors of Congress with increased political power and with a determination to restore land monopoly, and to reorganize its agrarian industry, and to attempt to restore its capital by reducing public taxation to the lowest point. Moreover, it had not given up the idea that the capital which it had lost through the legal abolition of slavery, should and might be reimbursed from the federal treasury. Especially it was determined to use for its own ends the increased political power based on voteless Negroes. Finally, there was the West, beginning to fear the grip of land and transportation monopoly, 
rebelling against the power of Eastern industry, and staggering under the weight of public debt and public taxation. In the midst of these elements stood Andrew Johnson, with the tremendous power which lay in his hands as Commander-in-Chief of the Army, with the large patronage which arose through the expansion of governmental functions during the war, and with a stubborn will and a resourceful and astute Secretary of State. Logically, Andrew Johnson as an early leader of land reform, and of democracy and industry for the peasant farmer and the laboring class, was in position to lead the democracy of the West. But perversely, he had been induced by flattery, by his southern birth, and his dislike of New England Puritanism, to place himself at the head of the Southerners. Between the program of the South and that of the West, then, there was absolutely no point of alliance. The South represented the extreme of reactionary capitalism based upon land and on the ownership of labor. It showed no sign of any more sympathy with the labor movement in the North or the extension of democratic methods than it had before the war. There was not a single labor voice raised in the Southern post-war clamor. Yet Johnson could not see this. He continued to flirt with Western liberalism at the very time he was surrendering completely to Southern reaction and ultra-conservatism. In his advice to the South, he no longer contemplated Negro suffrage in any form, and he said nothing of poor whites. In 1867, Negro votes were refused in the municipal elections in Virginia. Judge Moore asked President Johnson concerning the right of freedmen to participate in these elections, but Johnson gave no answer. On the other hand, in an interview with Charles Halpine, March 5, he sought again to make alliance with the Western unrest. He said, To the people the national debt is a thing of debt to be paid, but to the aristocracy of bonds and national securities it is a property of more than $2,500,000 billion, from which a revenue of $180 million a year is to be received into their pockets. So we now find that an aristocracy of the South, based on $3 billion in Negroes, who were a productive class, has disappeared, and their place in political control of the country is assumed by an aristocracy based on nearly $3 billion of national debt a thing which is not producing anything, but which goes on steadily every year and must go on for all time until the debt is paid, absorbing and taxing at the rate of 6 or 7 percent a year for every $100 bond that is represented in its aggregation. The war of finance is the next war we have to fight, and every blow struck against my efforts to uphold a strict construction of the laws and the Constitution is in reality a blow in favor of repudiating the national debt. The manufacturers and men of capital in the eastern states and the states along the Atlantic seaboard a mere strip or fringe on the broad mantle of our country, if you will examine the map these are in favor of high protective, and, in fact, prohibitory tariffs, and also favor a contraction of the currency. But against both measures the interests and votes of the great producing and non-manufacturing states of the West stand irrevocably arrayed and a glance at the map and the census statistics of the last 20 years will tell everyone who is open to conviction how that war must end. Point one. This was a maladroit argument. It placed the national debt against the loss of slave property as equally sinister phenomena. It suggested partial repudiation and thus frightened and antagonized investors. It rightly protested against the extravagance of wartime finance, but this protest came from a man who was now the acknowledged leader of property and reaction in the South. What basis of alliance could there be between those determined to control and exploit freed labor in the South and those who wished to fight exploitation and monopoly in the West? Moreover, in his effort to conciliate and lead the West, Johnson attacked the most powerful enemy before him. That enemy was not abolition democracy, as he falsely conceived. It was a tremendous, new, and rising power of organized wealth and capitalist industry in the North. Monopoly profits from investments were increasing, and destined to increase, and their increase depended upon a high protective tariff, the validity of the public debt, and the control of the national banks and currency. All of these things were threatened by the South and by Andrew Johnson as leader of the South. On the other hand, humanitarian radicalism, so far as the Negro was concerned, was not only completely harnessed to capital and property in the North, but its program for votes for Negroes more and more became manifestly the only protection upon which Northern industry could depend. 
the abolitionists were not enemies of capital. The American abolitionists were typical bourgeois democratic revolutionists under specific American conditions. They felt their movement linked up with the great humanitarian causes of the day, the labor question, the peace question, the emancipation of women, temperance, philanthropy and with the bourgeois revolutionary movement in Europe. He hailed the revolution, of 1848, in France, more field story tells of Sumner, and similar outbreaks in other countries as parts of the great movement for freedom, of which the anti-slavery agitation in America was another part too. But the former abolitionists were gradually developing. Under the leadership of Stevens and Sumner, they were beginning to realize the economic foundation of the revolution necessary in the South. They saw that the Negro needed land and education and that his vote would only be valuable to him as it opened the doors to a firm economic foundation and real intelligence. If now they could get the industrial North, not simply to give the Negro the vote, but to give him land and give him schools, the battle would be won. Here, however, they were only partially successful. Stevens could not get them to listen to his plan of land distribution, and Sumner failed in his effort to provide for a national system of Negro schools. But they could and did get the aid of industry, commerce and labor for Negro suffrage, and this vast step forward they gladly took. Public opinion followed philanthropy, but it was guided by big business. In the meantime, the nation was in the midst of the transition period. Nothing could be settled until the fate of the 14th Amendment was known, and during this time of waiting, from July 16, 1866, until July 20, 1868, the status of the South and its relation to the Union was unsettled. Slowly, the nation voted on the 14th Amendment, destined to curb the political power of the South. Most of New England and two western states ratified it in the summer and fall of 1866. Before January, seven southern states rejected it almost unanimously, and in the first three months of 1867, the whole South and the border states had pronounced against it. They said, in effect, no Negro citizens nor voters, no guarantee of civil rights to Negroes, and all political power based on the counting of the full Negro population. The North, by 1868, had ratified the 14th Amendment unanimously, although New Jersey, Ohio and Oregon made attempts to reverse their decision, when Democrats gained power in those states. There was not only the vast final problem of economics and government there was an immediate transition problem. In the interval during which the nation was awaiting the fate of the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, what was to be the status of the South? The South was in the midst of industrial, civil and political anarchy. Crime, force and murder, disorganized and wandering laborers, unorganized industry, were widely in evidence. The United States as a sovereign nation could declare the southern states, where rebellion had occurred, unorganized territory and could rule them by civil government, backed by federal police. By those who regarded the Constitution as a fetish, this might be pronounced sacrilegious, but to ordinary human beings it was by far the best and sanest thing that the nation could have done, and it would have saved the United States and the whole world untold injury, retrogression and world war. This was the plan of both Stevens and Sumner, and constitutional lawyers have pronounced it reasonable. With some reluctance, the nation refused to do this while the South and its friends howled in opposition. It was, one would have thought, an unhallowed attempt to rock the foundations of the universe and overthrow the kingdom of Almighty God. The refusal of the nation was chiefly because the new industry, the money-making financiers and organizers of a vast economic empire, hesitated at a government guardianship of labor and control of industry on a scale that might embarrass future freedom of exploitation, and certainly would increase present taxation. Many advocates of abolition democracy were also doubtful. They were still under the freedom cry of the 18th century and obsessed by the American assumption of the 19th. They were still, on the whole, afraid of the full logic of democracy and the ability of the state to secure servants as honest and efficient as private industry. Only their most courageous leaders dared all. The easiest way out, then, was to prolong the military rule already established as a necessity of the war. This was cheapest and easiest, 
but also it was of necessity temporary. It must be a step toward civil rule and it must inaugurate civil rule. The law of March 2, 1867, was enacted. It provided for Negro suffrage. What else could it have provided for? If it had confined the vote to whites, not only would the anti-Negro legislation be confirmed, but the gift of additional political power to the South to be used against Northern industry and against democracy would be outright and irrevocable. Johnson vetoed the bill, and when it was passed over his veto, had recourse to executive action which would nullify it. Eventually it was this that led to the attempt to impeach him. Let us now, more in detail, study the facts of this development. The second session of the 39th Congress assembled in December, 1866, with a distinct mandate from the people. This mandate called for the reorganization of the southern states on the basis of the 14th Amendment, and for the definiteness of this mandate the South had only itself and Andrew Johnson to blame. From 1864 to 1868, by a succession of elections, with wide publicity on both sides, and unusually full discussion, national public opinion had come to these decisions by a large majority. The emancipated slave must be protected because he had helped save the union which slavery had disrupted. The first protection for the slave was a legal status of freedom. This the South opposed in the 15 former slave states, including the border states. Four flatly refused to accept the 13th Amendment. Three others accepted but only on condition that freedom should not imply full civil and political rights. Eight states accepted the 13th Amendment, but five of these and the three which accepted on condition, acted under pressure from Johnson, and their action expressed the opinion of a minority of the former voting population, and for this reason these states feared to refer their action to popular approval. A legal status of freedom without actual civil rights would mean almost nothing. The answer of the South to a proposal of civil rights was the Black Codes, which established a new status of slavery with a modified slave trade. The Freedmen's Bureau and the Civil Rights Bill represented an attempt at federal intervention to enforce freedom by federal law. The South bitterly opposed these attempts on the part of the national government and declared with Johnson that such attempts were unconstitutional. To set this point at rest, the 14th Amendment was proposed which made Negroes citizens, guaranteed them civil rights by national law, and political rights, if they were counted as a basis of representation in Congress. The South promptly rejected this overture unanimously, except in Tennessee, and there the majority of white voters had to be disfranchised before the acceptance was carried through. But behind all this, and explaining this interest in the Negro on the part of most Northerners, was a growing conviction that an arrogant South was returning to Congress with increased political power, that its leaders were essentially the same men who had disrupted the Union and precipitated a costly and bloody war, that there was no reason to suppose that these men had changed their convictions in the slightest or surrendered for a moment their determination to dominate the country, and fight. Monopoly in industry with monopoly in agriculture. In the face of their fatal failure, Southerners were demanding increased political power, and that political power could and in all probability would be used for everything disadvantageous to the majority of the nation, it would be used against the spread of democratic ideals, it would be used for further increasing the political power of the South, it would be used against industry, property and capital as buttressed by the tariff, the national banks, and the public debt. It was in vain that before, during and since the war, the North had offered to compromise with this unyielding bloc. There was only one defense against the power of the South and while that was revolutionary and hitherto undreamed of, it was the only way, and it could not be stopped by the stubbornness of one narrow-minded man. That was Negro suffrage. Senator Sherman of Ohio said March 11, 1867, a year ago I was not in favor of extending enforced Negro suffrage upon the southern states three but the rejection of the 14th Amendment led him to give his support. There was evidently an understanding among the Republican senators and representatives that if the legislatures of the southern states organized under Johnson's scheme of reconstruction accepted the 14th Amendment and thus would say that either they would allow the Negro to vote or, in case they did not allow him, would forego representation based upon his numbers, then these states would be recognized and admitted to Congress. This was more than fair to the South. 
Charles Sumner to be sure would not consent to it and Stevens did not like it, but the industrial North was willing to throw the Negro over on these terms. Point four. However, with the exception of Tennessee, the southern states rejected the Fourteenth Amendment almost unanimously and insisted upon the Black Codes, and accompanied their demand by widespread violence. Meantime in minor measures the sentiment for Negro suffrage was seen to be crystallizing. Colorado had sought admission in 1866 and had less than 100 Negroes. Sumner opposed the application because of the small population and chiefly because the suffrage was confined to white males. He spoke March 12 and 13, April 17, 19, and 24 on the subject. The bill passed the Senate despite Sumner. In the House, the attempt to strike out the word white as a qualification for voters was defeated. The president vetoed the bill on account of insufficient population. Next session, Sumner's amendment prevailed, but the president again vetoed the bill. Sumner made at the close of the session an unsuccessful attempt to make the same condition in the bill to admit Nebraska but failed, the president did not sign that bill. At the next session, the bill with Negro suffrage was passed over the president's veto. Sumner opposed the admission of Tennessee because Negroes were denied the right to vote. He failed to influence public sentiment but made his opponents apologetic. Point five. Sumner wrote to F. W. Byrd, January 10, 1867. I think you will be satisfied with the result on Nebraska and Colorado. The declaration that there shall be no exclusion from the elective franchise on account of color is not in the form which I preferred, but you have the declaration, which to my mind is a great gain. Is it not? And thus ends a long contest, where at first I was alone. Mr. Stewart of Nevada who is sitting near me, says that it cannot be said now that the Republican Party is not committed to Negro suffrage. You have, 1, the District Bill, 2, the Nebraska Bill, 3, the Colorado Bill, and, 4, the Territorial Bill passed today, declaring that in the territories there shall be no exclusion from the suffrage on account of color. In February, 1867, from the Committee of Fifteen, Stevens presented the leading Reconstruction measure. This measure declared that life and property were not safe in the former Confederate states, and that good order had to be enforced until loyal governments could be legally established. It divided the Confederate states into five military divisions, 1, Virginia, 2, North and South Carolina, 3, Georgia, Alabama and Florida, 4, Mississippi and Arkansas, 5, Louisiana and Texas. A general with sufficient forces was to be assigned to each of these districts. These generals might use the United States civil courts to enforce the laws, but if these were not effective, they might govern through military commissions. The sentences of commissions must be approved by the commanding officers. United States courts should issue no writs of habeas corpus against the acts of these commissions. This bill established martial law after the president had declared the war was ended. It put the appointing of the district military masters in the hands of the general of the army instead of the president, and suspended the writ of habeas corpus. Congress hesitated at these thoroughgoing terms. Blaine suggested an amendment which would provide a way of escape from martial rule by promising admission when a state adopted the 14th Amendment and provided for Negro suffrage. Stevens refused to accept this and the bill was passed February 13. The Senate began to consider the bill February 15, and stayed in session until 3 o'clock in the morning. Resort was had to a party caucus, the Republican senators meeting at 11 a.m., February 16. Sherman, Sumner, Fessenden and four others were put on a subcommittee to revise the House bill, and remained in session a greater part of the afternoon. The bill was changed so as to restore the appointment of heads of the military districts, and adopt the Blaine Amendment. The House had already passed Elliott's bill admitting Louisiana with Negro suffrage and Sumner wished that taken as a model. Sumner asked for Negro suffrage but only one of his committee supported him. At 5 p.m. the caucus met and Sumner renewed his proposition, excluding discrimination as to race and color for the basis of suffrage. It was carried in the caucus. 15 to 13 or 14. 
This action committed the Republicans to the requirement of suffrage irrespective of race or color in the election of delegates to the Reconstruction Conventions, and as the basis of suffrage for the constitutions of the rebel states. Senator Wilson of Massachusetts said that then and there in that small room, in that caucus, was decided the greatest pending question of the North American continent six it was accepted by the caucus, although Fessenden was greatly displeased. He left the caucus and sought to defeat it by personal appeals. This led to an acrimonious debate in Congress, February 19, but the bill passed after a night's session at 6.22 Sunday morning, February 17. Congress had a difficult time passing this Reconstruction bill. The House rejected the Senate bill and time was flying. Finally agreement was reached February 20 and Congress expired by limitation on March 4. The essential parts of the bill on Negro suffrage remained. The president by taking the full time allowed by law in returning his veto would leave only two days for Congress to pass the bill over his veto. Johnson and Seward immediately saw this and the veto was held up to the last moment, reaching the House on the afternoon of March 2. The president said that the bill placed the people of ten states under the complete domination of military rulers, these states had made provisions for the preservation of order yet it was proposed to put them under military law, the Negroes have not asked for the privilege of voting, and the vast majority of them have no idea of what it means, we carried on a four years war to punish the crime of defying a constitution, if we now ourselves defy the constitution we prove that they were in. Fact Fighting for Negro Liberty Stevens demanded immediate consideration of the veto but allowed short statements from Democratic members who declared this bill a death knell of Republican liberty. One opponent declared that the bill should not pass unless he was overpowered from physical exhaustion, or restrained by the rules of the House. Stevens, in closing the debate, said that he had listened to the gentlemen, because he appreciated the melancholy feelings with which they are approaching this funeral of the nation, but as he desired the passage of the bill he asked Mr. Blaine to move a suspension of the rules. Mr. Blaine accordingly made the motion, and after an ineffectual attempt at filibustering, the bill was passed over the veto by a vote of 135 yeas to 48 nays. The Senate speedily took similar action, and the Reconstruction Bill became a law. As finally passed, the bill set up the five districts, declaring that no adequate protection for life and property existed there. The President instead of the General of the Army was to assign an army officer to each of these districts. These commanders might rule by martial law, but sentence of death had to be approved by the president. To escape from this regime, there must be universal suffrage without regard to race or color, and the framing of a state constitution with a convention composed of delegates not disqualified by participation in rebellion. The constitution so adopted must provide for universal suffrage, and this constitution must be ratified by a majority of the voters. The constitution must also be approved by Congress. The state could not be admitted until the 14th Amendment had been approved by three-fourths of the states of the United States. Thus Congress avoided making the admission of the states conditional upon their individual acceptance of the 14th Amendment. Still Andrew Johnson was not beaten, as Commander-in-Chief of the Army he could execute the Reconstruction legislation and he could throw its interpretation into the courts with a good chance of favorable decision just as the faltering attempt of Congress to give the Negroes land was at last utterly nullified by Johnson's Edicts of Restoration, so there was equal chance to frustrate Congress in restoring states' functions. Congress tried to tie Johnson's hands with the Tenure of Office Bill. It was introduced in December, 1866. The Constitution gave the President no express power to dismiss persons from office. But custom and logic had allowed it. The Republicans feared that by dismissal from office Johnson would gain control of the entire executive division of the government at a time of crisis. The bill proposed that all officers appointed with the consent of the Senate could be removed only with the consent of the Senate, except in the case of cabinet officers. The House insisted on including cabinet officers and finally the bill was passed providing that cabinet officers should hold their offices during the term of the president by whom they were appointed and one month thereafter during that time they could be removed only with the consent of the Senate. This measure went to the President on 20 February, together with the Reconstruction Bill, 
and was vetoed March 2. The veto argued, from statutes and uniform practice, that Congress had no power to force the President to retain in office against his judgment subordinates whom he had appointed. Johnson said with curious logic, whenever administration fails, or seems to fail, in securing any of the great ends for which Republican government is established, the proper course seems to be to renew the original spirit and forms of the Constitution itself. Who was to be the judge of the original spirit Andrew Johnson or the Congress? Which was to yield? Congress must yield to one stubborn, narrow-minded man or it was forced by the necessity of controlling the executive, to adopt this revolutionary measure. Sumner said in December, 1866. It is possible that the president may be impeached. If we go forward and supersede the sham governments set up in the rebel states, we encounter the appointing power of the president, who would put in office men who sympathize with him. It is this consideration which makes ardent representatives say that he must be removed. Should this be attempted, a new question will be presented. Point seven. Through fear of Johnson's actions, the 40th Congress assembled in special session immediately after adjournment of the 39th, so that Congress was practically in continuous session and there was no interregnum during which Johnson could exercise his uncurbed power. The new Congress immediately passed a supplementary reconstruction bill to implement the main measure. This bill laid down a plan of registration for all male citizens, 21 years of age and over, who could take the oath of loyalty and made it the duty of the commanding generals to order elections and choose delegates for constitutional conventions. If the voters favored such conventions, constitutions were to be formed and if adopted transmitted to Congress. The whole machinery of election was placed in the hands of the commanding generals. The veto of this supplemental bill came immediately. The president in effect declared that the rise of the masses of black labor to political power was an untried experiment which threatened the whites with even worse wrongs than disfranchisement for attempted rebellion, and made their condition the most deplorable to which any people can be reduced. And this from the lifelong man of the people and champion of the rights of the poor. It was bad enough when Johnson confined himself to speeches, as at Antietam, but when he came to action, Congress was further aroused. First, June 20, he issued liberal instructions concerning the loyal oath and the duty of commanding generals. He decided on advice of his attorney general, Stanbury, that those taking the oath of loyalty were judges of their own honesty and could not be questioned by the Board of Registration, that actual disfranchisement for rebellion could only be made valid by law or court decision. Disloyal sentiments alone did not involve disfranchisement. Moreover, in appointing generals, Johnson evidently proposed to appoint, as far as possible, generals who were sympathetic with the South. In July he removed Sheridan from Louisiana and Texas and appointed first General Thomas, a Virginia Democrat, in his place, and finally General Hancock, a loyal follower of Johnson. The removal of Sheridan caused great excitement. The Loyal Legion held a great meeting asking for the immediate summoning of Congress and the deposition of the President. He replaced General Sickles in the Carolinas with General Canby. Sheridan and Sickles were given posts in the North. These instructions were published June 20 and Congress replied by the Act of July 19, 1867. This act specifically included Virginia, North Carolina, Louisiana and Arkansas in the states to be reconstructed. It provided that all the so-called governments in the South should be subject to the orders of the district commanders and the general of the army and not of the president. The bill made the boards of registration judges of fact in regard to persons seeking to take the oath of loyalty and it extended the time limit for registration of voters. The bill passed the Houses July 13, and was vetoed July 19. Johnson protested against the attempt of the federal government to carry on state governments, and especially against the invasion of the constitutional powers of the president. His words were bitter. Whilst I hold the chief executive authority of the United States, whilst the obligation rests upon me to see that all the laws are faithfully executed, I can never willingly surrender that trust or the powers given for its execution. I can never give my assent to be made responsible for the faithful execution of laws, and at the same time surrender that trust and the powers which accompany it to any other executive officer, high or low, 
or to any number of executive officers. The bill was passed over the veto by both houses by overwhelming majorities, and talk of impeachment started anew. The discussion which has raged round the Reconstruction legislation is of the same metaphysical stripe characterizing all fetish worship of the Constitution. If one means by constitutional something provided for in that instrument or foreseen by its authors or reasonably implicit in its words, then the Reconstruction Acts were undoubtedly unconstitutional, and so, for that matter, was the Civil War. In fact, the main measures of government during 1861-1870 were unconstitutional. The only action possibly contemplated by the authors of the Constitution was secession, that action, the Constitutional Fathers feared and deprecated, but their instrument did not forbid it and distinctly implied the legality of a state withdrawing from the more perfect union. Certainly no one could argue that the Founders contemplated civil war to preserve the Union or that the Constitution was a pro-slavery document. Yet, unconstitutionally, the South made it a pro-slavery document and unconstitutionally the North prevented the destruction of the Union on account of slavery, and after the war revolutionary measures rebuilt what revolution had disrupted, and formed a new United States on a basis broader than the old Constitution and different from its original conception. And why not? No more idiotic program could be laid down than to require a people to follow a written rule of government 90 years old, if that rule had been definitely broken in order to preserve the unity of the government and to destroy an economic anachronism. In such a crisis legalists may insist that consistency with precedent is more important than firm and far-sighted rebuilding. But manifestly, it is not. Rule following, legal precedence, and political consistency are not more important than right, justice and plain common sense. Through the cobwebs of such political subtlety, Stevens crashed and said that military rule must continue in the South until order was restored, democracy established, and the political power built on slavery smashed. Further than this, both he and Sumner knew that land and education for black and white labor was necessary. On the first day of the second session of the 39th Congress, Sumner was on hand with his bill for establishing universal suffrage in the District of Columbia. He had accepted a place on the Committee of the District of Columbia, in addition to his other duties, to secure Negro suffrage. The committee reported a bill in December, 1866. Reading and writing as a qualification was moved as an amendment but was rejected by a vote of 15 to 19. Sumner voted no the bill did not reach a final vote but came up again December 10, 1867, when it passed after four days debate by a vote of 32 to 13. The next day it passed the House and went to the President. Johnson and Seward, in the veto, kept hammering at the old thesis. Northern states will not allow Negro suffrage to be forced upon them against their will. The Negro population of the district has recently been greatly increased by migration. Their rights can be protected in the district without the right of suffrage, just as much as in Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Indiana, which refuse Negroes the right to vote. Because of slavery, the Negro is not as well fitted to vote as the intelligent foreigner. And yet five years' residence and a knowledge of our government are required of the latter. The bill was repassed over the President's veto, January 7, and after it came the first proposal to impeach the President. A great step along the path to universal suffrage without color distinctions has just been taken in the House of Representatives, in its session of the 18th. The bill giving the right to vote to the blacks in the District of Columbia passed with a majority of 114 to 54. An anxious crowd, of whites and blacks mixed, filled the galleries of the House and all the approaches to the Capitol, and the passage of the bill was hailed with a great outburst of frenzied applause. Point eight. Three days after the 40th Congress opened, Sumner offered a series of resolutions to provide homes and schools for freedmen. This supplemented the Freedmen's Bureau law and provided a permanent policy of national aid to education and economic redress of the robbery of slavery. The resolutions did not come to a vote, Sumner then tried to amend the Reconstruction Acts of March 22 and July 19 by provisions for free schools in the South without discrimination as to race. A tie vote defeated this effort, although a majority of the Republicans stood by him. He tried again and failed July 11 and July 13. 
his disappointment at his failure in 1867 to secure schools and homes for the freedmen was so keen that he left the Senate chamber, and when he reached his house, his grief found vent in tears. 9. Charles Sumner, frustrated in these demands, continued to direct the line of attack which he had initiated during the Civil War. He had in mind relief for free Negroes in the North as well as freedmen in the South, and he was determined that petty race prejudice in the North should not escape attention because of the fight against slavery and its aftermath in the South. Early in the spring of 1867, March 11, Stevens introduced a set of resolutions for the enforcement of the Confiscation Act of July 17, 1862, with preamble as follows. Whereas it is due to justice, as an example to future times, that some proper pain should be inflicted on the people who constituted the Confederate States of America, both because they declared an unjust war against the United States for the purpose of destroying Republican liberty and permanently establishing slavery, as well as for the cruel and barbarous manner in which they conducted said war, in violation of all rules of civilized warfare, and also to compel them to make compensation. For the damage and expense caused by said war, Therefore, be it enacted that all public lands belonging to the ten states that formed the so-called Confederate States of America, shall be forfeited by said states and become vested forthwith in the United States. The measure further provided as follows. Section 2, that the President should proceed at once to condemn the property forfeited under the aforesaid Act of July 17, 1862, Section 3, that a commission of appraisers be appointed to appraise said property, Section 4, that the land so seized and condemned should be distributed among the slaves who had been made free by the war and constitutional amendments, and who were residing on said land on the 4th of March, 1861, or since, to each head of a family 40 acres, to each adult male whether head of a family or not, 40 acres, to each widow, head of a family, 40 acres, to be held by them in fee simple but to be inalienable for ten years after they should become so seized thereof. Section 5 provided for the raising of the sum of $50 for each homesteader, to be used for the erection of a building on his homestead, and that the further sum of $500 million be raised for the purpose of pensioning the veterans of the Union Army. The bill contained several other sections dealing with the subject in connection with the main features as above set forth. Stevens called up this measure for consideration by the House on March 19, when he made one of his characteristic speeches, brilliant and pungent, age seems never to have had any effect upon his mental vigor nor any tendency to modify his sharp invectives. Said he. I am about to discuss the question of pain of belligerent traitors. The pain of traitors has been wholly ignored by a treacherous executive and a sluggish Congress. I wish to make an issue before the American people and see whether they will sanction the perfect impunity of a murderous belligerent and consent that loyal men of this nation who have been despoiled of their property shall remain without remuneration, either by rebel property or the property of the nation. To this issue, I desire to devote the small remainder of my life. No committee or party is responsible for this bill. Whatever merit it possesses is due to Andrew Johnson and myself. Andrew Johnson did not falter and began to pin his faith on the fall elections of 1867. On September 7, 1867, Johnson extended full pardon to Confederates. His former proclamation, according to the Tribune, had left about 100,000 citizens outside the amnesty, but this one leaves out one or two thousand. Undoubtedly at this time Johnson was being urged toward stronger counter-revolutionary measures. He entertained the idea of ordering the military governors of the five southern districts to enroll as voters the former Confederates whom he had included in his last proclamation of amnesty. Clemenceau said that when some of his southern friends called on him, he admitted frankly that only the fear of being deposed prevented him from acting and he advised them to take the matter into court. To court the South flew. Johnson's provisional governor of Mississippi tried in the name of his state to enjoin the president from executing the Reconstruction laws. The Supreme Court found in April, 1867, that its interference would be improper. Thereupon Governor Jackson of Georgia sought to enjoin the Secretary of War, the General of the Army, and the District Commander in Georgia, 
but the court decided it had no jurisdiction. A second time Georgia went to the Supreme Court and failed. Finally, late in 1867, W.H. McCardle of Mississippi, arrested by military authority under the Reconstruction Acts, appealed from the circuit to the Supreme Court, but Congress over the President's veto repealed the statute which allowed such an appeal, and by this revolutionary procedure made good its supreme power in Reconstruction over court and President. Radical newspapers published in October a statement that the President had told certain friends in Tennessee that he would resist by force if Congress attempted to impeach him. Johnson denied that he had said anything of the sort, but Republicans made much of the fact that Johnson had ordered cannon furnished to Swan, governor of Maryland, who like Johnson had been elected by the Republicans and had gone over to the Democrats. Swan asked the government to furnish him with cannon. Johnson gave Stanton the order to deliver the weapons needed. Stanton flatly refused. When General Grant took his place as Secretary of War, the Governor of Maryland renewed his request, which was again granted by Johnson and again refused by Grant. Finally, Swan made up his mind to buy the cannon. Most of the officers serving in Swan's militia were former Confederates. During the fall campaign of 1867, there was fear of panic in the air on account of the vast circulation of greenbacks and banknotes to the extent of a billion dollars. With money fluctuating in value, trade became a lottery. Higher protection was put on steel and woolen goods. But curiously enough, the Democrats in general avoided the tariff issue. They did not follow Johnson's attack on finance because they saw its inconsistency with the reaction of property in the South. Leaving the economic argument, they embraced with avidity race prejudice and concentrated their campaign on this. Clemenceau said, The best point of attack for the Democrats is the Negroes. Any Democrat who did not manage to hint in his speech that the Negro is a degenerate gorilla, would be considered lacking in enthusiasm. The idea of giving political power to a lot of wild men, incapable of civilization, whose intelligence is no higher than that of the animal. That is the theme of all democratic speeches. Point 10. With this, of course, went fetish worship of the Constitution. Johnson looked forward with hope. October elections took place in Ohio and Pennsylvania and showed reaction toward the Democrats. In Ohio, R.B. Hayes, afterward president, ran against Alan G. Thurman, and Negro suffrage played a large part. Hayes denied the assertion that the government was a white man's government. It is not the government of any class or sect or nationality or race. It is not the government of the native-born or of the foreign-born, of the rich man or of the poor man, of the white man or of the colored man it is the government of the freeman. The monstrous inconsistency and injustice of excluding one-seventh of our population from all participation in a government founded on the consent of the governed was held to be impossible. There was no necessary antagonism between the two races which could not be broken down by justice and equality. Point 11. Hayes won by less than 3,000 votes, as compared with a Republican majority of 42,000 in 1,866. Also, at the same time, the voters rejected the Negro suffrage amendment by 38,000 votes, and elected a Democratic legislature. There were, however, certain other elements. The Republicans had sought to disfranchise deserters from the army, and Ben Wade had aroused the bitter hostility of southern elements in southern Ohio. Ohio expressed itself against the high tariff to fill the pockets of eastern monopolists, and in favor of agricultural labor, showing the peculiar contradiction in the minds of the voters. Johnson telegraphed Ohio, Ohio has done its duty and done it in time. God bless Ohio. Pennsylvania lost nearly the whole of its Republican majority of 30,000. In New York cannon were kept firing for two days. Most of the state elections came in November, and showed some reaction toward the Democrats but not so great as in October. The Republicans won in Massachusetts, Michigan, Wisconsin, Kansas, Minnesota, Missouri, and Illinois, but were completely defeated in New York, New Jersey, and Maryland. New Jersey refused to strike out the word white from the requirements for suffrage. In New York, the Republicans did not dare to submit to popular vote the proposal to drop the property discrimination against Negro voters. 
Maryland adopted a new registry law which gave the vote to whites only. On the other hand, during 1867, Iowa and Dakota admitted Negroes to the ballot, and Minnesota in 1868. In this latter year Negroes were voting in all the New England states except Connecticut, in Iowa, Minnesota, and Dakota a total of eight northern states. The South and its friends had a right to charge that eight other northern states refused to enfranchise a class to which they were forcing the South to give the vote. In the third annual message of Andrew Johnson, December 3, 1867, all masking of the Negro problem is removed. He is no longer evasive as to the relation of the black worker to the white worker and his whole economic argument is drowned in race hate. There is no suggestion that Negro soldiers or Negro property owners or Negroes who can read and write should have any political rights. He bases his whole argument flatly on the inferiority of the Negro race. It is the glory of white men, he proclaims magniloquently. To know that they have had these qualities in sufficient measure to build upon this continent a great political fabric and to preserve its stability for more than 90 years, while in every other part of the world all similar experiments have failed. But if anything can be proved by known facts, if all reasoning upon evidence is not abandoned, it must be acknowledged that in the progress of nations, Negroes have shown less capacity for government than any other race of people. No independent government of any form has ever been successful in their hands. On the contrary, wherever they have been left to their own devices they have shown a constant tendency to relapse into barbarism. In the southern states, however, Congress has undertaken to confer upon them the privilege of the ballot. Just released from slavery, it may be doubted whether as a class they know more than their ancestors how to organize and regulate civil society. Indeed, it is admitted that the blacks of the South are not only regardless of the rights of property, but so utterly ignorant of public affairs that their voting can consist in nothing more than carrying a ballot to the place where they are directed to deposit it. The great difference between the two races in physical, mental, and moral characteristics will prevent an amalgamation or fusion of them together in one homogeneous mass. If the inferior obtains the ascendancy over the other, it will govern with reference only to its own interests for it will recognize no common interest and create such a tyranny as this continent has never yet witnessed. Already the Negroes are influenced by promises of confiscation and plunder. They are taught to regard as an enemy every white man who has any respect for the rights of his own race. If this continues it must become worse and worse, until all order will be subverted, all industry cease, and the fertile fields of the South grow up into a wilderness. Of all the dangers which our nation has yet encountered, none are equal to those which must result from the success of the effort now making to Africanize the half of our country. It is easy to believe now that the idea that Andrew Johnson and the South planned a coup d'état was fanciful. The point is that sane and thoughtful men at the time widely believed it. No matter how incredible it may seem to us, we must remember that this was a generation to which it had seemed incredible that the South should secede. They had seen the incredible happen at fearful cost. It might happen again. The Republicans, therefore, refused to be frightened by the elections of 1867. Carl Schurz said that, I think that I do not exaggerate that an overwhelming majority of the loyal Union men, North and South, saw in President Johnson a traitor bent upon turning over the national government to the rebels again, and ardently wishing to see him utterly stripped of power, not so much for what he had done, but for what, as they thought, he was capable of doing and likely to do. Impeachment proceedings now hurried forward. They had begun in December, 1866. On February 28, 1867, the Committee on Judiciary had refused to recommend impeachment of the President but asked for further investigation. March 2, the Reconstruction Act passed, and March 7, impeachment was moved for the second time in the House. Johnson had notified the Senate of the suspension of Secretary Stanton in December, 1867. Early the next year, the Senate refused to concur, Grant gave up the office, and Stanton resumed his duties. Stanton was dismissed again in February, 1868, and the impeachment of Johnson was determined upon in March. The beginning of the attempt to impeach President Johnson was a memorable scene. 
Thaddeus Stevens made his speech February 16, 1868. He was hopelessly broken in health, and a hushed and expectant audience listened to every word. He spoke with force and solemnity. I doubt, said Charles Sumner, if words were ever delivered to more effect. 12 He was a dying man and this was his last word. Who in 1867 represented the considered will of the people of the United States? Certainly not Andrew Johnson, backed by Northern Copperheads and the supporters of a feudal attempt at secession. Just as certainly two-thirds of the members of Congress, with the South excluded as it had been excluded for six terrible years, had a clear right to express the repeatedly registered popular will. The problem was a difficult one. When can a ruler rule in the United States? The nation by overwhelming majority had declared for union, for emancipation to preserve the Union, for no increase in the political power of the White South, and for Negro suffrage to prevent this increased political power and reward Negro loyalty. This clear will of the majority of the people, represented in Congress, was frustrated by a president who repeatedly refused to obey the plain mandate of the party which elected him. Johnson virtually declared Congress illegal because the South was unrepresented. Congress denied that a criminal could be his own judge. Who could settle this dispute? By the whole theory of party government, a president must be at least in general accord with his party. His utmost power should not go beyond a suspensory veto compelling a plebiscite. Yet no president in the history of the United States up to this time had used the veto power like Andrew Johnson to oppose the expressed will of the nation. In 23 cases, he opposed his will to the will of Congress while Andrew Jackson, his closest competitor, made only 11 vetoes and pocket vetoes. Party responsibility in government was absolutely blocked at a time of crisis. Under any, even partial, theory of such responsibility, Johnson would have been compelled to resign, but the antiquated constitutional requirements of a system of laws built for another age and for entirely different circumstances were now being applied to unforeseen conditions. The Constitution made the removal of the President contingent upon his committing high crimes and misdemeanors. Here then came a plain question of definition, was it a crime, in the judgment of the people of the United States in 1867, for a President to block the overwhelming will of a successful majority of voters during a period of nearly three years? Stevens and those who followed him said that it was. They did not all pretend that Johnson was personally a criminal with treasonable designs, although some believed even that, on the other hand it was clear even to many of Johnson's friends that he was an unfit person to be President of the United States. 13 They all did assert that he had broken the rules by which responsible government could be carried on. The trial started March 30, 1868, and ended May 6. Over two-thirds of the members of the United States House of Representatives, 35 out of 54 senators, and the great majority of the voters of the nation, outside the former slave states, agreed that Johnson should be removed from office. Whether they were right or wrong, the failure legally to convict Johnson has remained to frustrate responsible government in the United States ever since. But no president since Johnson has attempted indefinitely to rule in defiance of Congress. The leaders of abolition democracy still pressed on. Sumner was especially active and destined for several more years of active work. Thaddeus Stevens was near death, but to the very end he fought on. He wished to ask Congress to declare by law that no state had the right to forbid citizens of the United States from taking part in the national elections. Thaddeus Stevens died August 11, 1868, three weeks after the ratification of the Fourteenth Amendment was announced, and in his last breath and even after death, stood true to his principles. Two colored clergymen called, and asked leave to see Stevens and pray with him. He ordered them to be admitted, and when they had come to his bedside, he turned and held out his hand to one of them. They sang a hymn and prayed. It was then within ten minutes of midnight, and the end was to come before the beginning of the new day. He lay motionless for a few minutes, then opened his eyes, took one look, placidly closed them, and, Without a struggle, the great commoner had ceased to breathe. Point 14. Thaddeus Stevens was buried in a colored graveyard. Upon the monument there is the following inscription, prepared by himself. 
I repose in this quiet and secluded spot, not from any natural preference for solitude, but finding other cemeteries limited as to race by charter rules, I have chosen this, that I might illustrate in my death the principles which I advocated through a long life, the equality of man before his creator. As Charles Sumner said, Already he takes his place among illustrious names, which are the common property of mankind. I see him now, as I have so often seen him during life. His venerable form moves slowly and with uncertain steps, but the gathered strength of years is in his countenance and the light of victory on his path. Politician, calculator, time server, stand aside. A hero statesman passes to his reward, 15. As a result of the legislation of the 39th and 40th Congresses, the United States in 1867 took a portentous forward step in democracy. For the mass of the nation, it was a step taken under compulsion of fear, without deep forethought and with a rather didactic following out of certain conventional principles which made universal suffrage seem natural and inevitable. To the South, it was the price of that disaster of slavery and war which spelled its history from 1830 to 1865, and it was the only price adequate to that fatal mistake. To those men who were guiding American industry toward a new and fateful path, the Southern experiment was simply a political move by which they silenced and held in check the tremendous political power built on slavery, which in many ways and for a generation had threatened the nation and checked its economic development. To a few far-seeing leaders of democracy this experiment appeared in its truer light. It was a test of the whole theory of American government. It was a dictatorship backed by the military arm of the United States by which the governments of the southern states were to be coerced into accepting a new form of administration, in which the freedmen and the poor whites were to hold the overwhelming balance of political power. As soon as political power was successfully delivered into the hands of these elements, the federal government was to withdraw and full democracy ensue. The difficulty with this theory was the failure to realize that such dictatorship must last long enough really to put the mass of workers in power, that this would be in fact a dictatorship of the proletariat which must endure until the proletariat or at least a leading united group, with clear objects and effective method, had education and experience and had taken firm control of the economic organization of the South. Unfortunately, the power set to begin this dictatorship was the military arm of a government which more and more was falling into the hands of organized wealth, and of wealth organized on a scale never before seen in modern civilization. The new organization of northern wealth was not comparable to the petty bourgeoisie which seized power after the overthrow of European feudalism. It was a new rule of associated and federated monarchs of industry and finance wielding a vaster and more despotic power than European kings and nobles ever held. It was destined to subdue not simply southern agrarianism but even individual wealth and brains in the north which were creating a new petty bourgeoisie of small merchants and skilled artisans. It was inconceivable, therefore, that the masters of northern industry through their growing control of American government, were going to allow the laborers of the south any more real control of wealth and industry than was necessary to curb the political power of the planters and their successors. As soon as the southern landholders and merchants yielded to the northern demands of a plutocracy, at that moment the military dictatorship should be withdrawn and a dictatorship of capital allowed unhampered sway. We see this more clearly today than the nation of 1868, or any of its leaders, could possibly envisage it, but even then, northern industry knew that universal suffrage in the south, in the hands of Negroes just freed from slavery, and of white people still enslaved by poverty, could not stand against organized industry. They promptly calculated that the same method of controlling the labor vote would come in vogue in the South as they were already using in the North, and that the industry which used these methods must in the meantime cooperate with Northern industry, that it could not move the foundation stones upon which Northern industry was consolidating its power, that is, the tariff the money system, the debt, and national in place of state control of industry. This would seem to be what the masters of exploitation were counting upon and it certainly came true in the bargain of 1876. Thus by singular coincidence and for a moment, for the few years of an eternal second in a cycle of a thousand years, 
the orbits of two widely and utterly dissimilar economic systems coincided and the result was a revolution so vast and portentous that few minds ever fully conceived it, for the systems were these, first, that of a democracy which should by universal suffrage establish a dictatorship of the proletariat ending in industrial democracy, and the other, a system by which a little not of masterful men would so organize capitalism as to bring under their control the natural resources, wealth and industry of a vast and rich country and through that, of the world. For a second, for a pulse of time, these orbits crossed and coincided, but their central suns were a thousand light years apart, even though the blind and ignorant fury of the South and the complacent Philistinism of the North saw them as one. Reconstruction was an economic revolution on a mighty scale and with worldwide reverberation. Reconstruction was not simply a fight between the white and black races in the South or between master and ex-slave. It was much more subtle, it involved more than this. There have been repeated and continued attempts to paint this era as an interlude of petty politics or nightmare of race hate instead of viewing it slowly and broadly as a tremendous series of efforts to earn a living in new and untried ways to achieve economic security and to restore fatal losses of capital and investment. It was a vast labor movement of ignorant, earnest and bewildered black men whose faces had been ground in the mud by their three awful centuries of degradation and who now staggered forward blindly in blood and tears amid petty division, hate and hurt, and surrounded by every disaster of war and industrial upheaval. Reconstruction was a vast labor movement of ignorant, muddled and bewildered white men who had been disinherited of land and labor and fought a long battle with sheer subsistence, hanging on the edge of poverty, eating clay and chasing slaves and now lurching up to manhood. Reconstruction was the turn of white northern migration southward to new and sudden economic opportunity which followed the disaster and dislocation of war, and an attempt to organize capital and labor on a new pattern and build a new economy. Finally Reconstruction was a desperate effort of a dislodged, maimed, impoverished, and ruined oligarchy and monopoly to restore an anachronism in economic organization by force, fraud and slander, in defiance of law and order, and in the face of a great labor movement of white and black, and in bitter strife with a new capitalism and a new political framework. All these contending and antagonistic groups spoke different and unknown tongues, to the Negro freedom was God to the poor white freedom was nothing he had more than he had use for, to the planter freedom for the poor was laziness and for the rich, control of the poor worker, for the northern businessman freedom was opportunity to get rich. Yet, with interpretation, agreement was possible here, North and South agreed that laborers must produce profit, the poor white and the negro wanted to get the profit arising from the laborers' toil and not to divide it with the employers and landowners. When northern and southern employers agreed that profit was most important and the method of getting it second, the path to understanding was clear. When white laborers were convinced that the degradation of Negro labor was more fundamental than the uplift of white labor, the end was in sight. Not only did all those factors becloud this extraordinary series of movements so that the truth of the matter in itself was baffling to observers and interpreters but overall has spread, to this day a cloud of lying and slander which leaves historians and philosophers aghast and has resulted in a current theory of interpretation which pictures all participants as scoundrels, idiots and heroes a combination humanly improbable and demonstrably untrue. One cannot study reconstruction without first frankly facing the facts of universal lying, of deliberate and unbounded attempts to prove a case and win a dispute and preserve economic mastery and political domination by besmirching the character, motives and common sense of every single person who dared disagree with the dominant philosophy of the white South. The campaign of slander against carpetbaggers rose to a climax which included every northern person who defended the Negro, and every northern person in the South who was connected with the Army or Freedmen's Bureau or with the institutions of learning, or who admitted the right of the Negro to vote or defended him in any way. It was the general, almost universal, belief that practically without exception these people were liars, jailbirds, criminals, and thieves, and the hatred of them rose to a crescendo of curses and filth. Later, this universal attack upon the carpetbaggers was modified considerably, and it was admitted that there were among them some decent and high-minded men, although most of them still were regarded as selfish stealers of public funds. On the other hand, so far as the Negro was concerned, almost no exceptions were admitted. 
it was easier to traduce him because everyone was ready to believe the worst and no reply was, for the moment, listened to. There was not a single great black leader of Reconstruction against whom almost unprintable allegations were not repeatedly and definitely made without any attempt to investigate the reliability of sources of information. For the first time in national history interstate migration became a crime. Hundreds of thousands of Southerners had gone north and west and had been welcomed and integrated into the various states despite their divergent ideas and alien heredity. But when there came a comparatively small number of Northerners into the South, they were reviled unless they conformed absolutely in thought and action with a dead past. The Northern Whites were of many classes, former soldiers and officers, lingering in the South in connection with the Army or the Freedmen's Bureau, or as investors and farmers. They were reinforced by an army of men who came south with small capital and in many cases succeeded in making their fortune. Most of these had no especial love for the Negroes. They had come into a white man's war, and now that the Negro was free, they were perfectly free to use him and to organize his industrial and political power for their own advantage. Many of these were agents for capital and went down from the north with something of the psychology of modern investment in conquered or colonial territory, that is, they brought the capital, they invested it, they remained in charge to oversee the profits, and they acquired political power in order to protect these profits. On the other hand, there were teachers who came down from the north, army chaplains, social workers, and others, who wholeheartedly went into the new democracy to the limit. Extraordinary persons stood forth in this role, like General Fisk and Erastus Kravath at Nashville, Edmund Ware at Atlanta. General Armstrong at Hampton, and dozens of others. They were crusaders in a great cause and meticulously honest. Naturally, their numbers were comparatively small. They reached primarily students, teachers, and preachers among the Negroes and only incidentally the class of field hands. It was a battle between oligarchy whose wealth and power had been based on land and slaves on the one hand, and on the other, oligarchy built on machines and hired labor. The newly organized industry of the North was not only triumphant in the North but began pressing in upon the South, its advance guard was represented by those small northern capitalists and office holders who sought to make quick money in raising cotton and taking advantage of the low-priced labor and high cotton prices due to the war famine. The labor on the market, instead of being owned like the slaves or excluded from competition like the poor whites, suddenly found itself bid for and offered not only money wages but political power and social status. The bidders had no realization at first how high their labor bids were in southern custom, they were offering something below the current price of labor in all civilized lands, the northern United States, England, France, most of Germany and parts of Italy were giving labor some voice in governing and a money wage contract. To the plantation planters such a wage contract was economic heresy and social revolution. It was blasphemy and eternal damnation to them, and they fought by every conceivable weapon political power, social influence, murder, assassination, and systematic lying. The mass of poor whites were in an anomalous position. Those of them who were intelligent or had during slavery accumulated any capital or achieved any position, had always attached themselves in sympathy and interest to the planter class. This meant that the mass of ignorant poor white labor had practically no intelligent leadership. Only here and there were their men, like Hinton Helper, who were actual leaders of the poor whites against the planters. The poor white was in a quandary with regard to emancipation. He had viewed slavery as the cause of his own degradation, but he now viewed the free Negro as a threat to his very existence. Suppose that freedom for the Negro meant that Negroes might rise to be landholders, planters, and employers? The poor whites thus might lose the last shred of respectability. They had been used to seeing certain classes of the black slaves above them in economic prosperity and social power. But after all, they were still Negroes and slaves. Now that freedom had come, poor whites were faced by the dilemma of recognizing the Negroes as equals or of bending every effort to still keep them beneath the white mass in income and social power. Here and there certain leaders appeared among the planters, among the more intelligent of the poor whites, and even among the masses who looked toward political combination and economic alliance with the Negro. Such persons, the Southerners called scalawags, 
but they were in fact that part of the white South who saw a vision of democracy across racial lines, and who were willing to build up a Labour Party in opposition to capitalists and landholders. They were, therefore, especially to be feared and were endlessly reviled. They were forced into certain extreme positions as compared with the carpetbagger and the planter. Men like Honeycutt of Virginia asked not only political rights, but full social equality for the Negroes, and taunted planters and the carpetbaggers when they did not dare advocate this. When Andrew Johnson said in his veto of the Reconstruction Bill, March 2, 1867, the Negroes have not asked for the privilege of voting, the vast majority of them have no idea what it means, he was exaggerating. Negroes had certainly voted, not only in the North but in South Carolina in the 18th century and in North Carolina, Louisiana and Tennessee in the 19th. They had asked to vote in the South repeatedly since emancipation. The difference that now came was that an indefinitely larger number of Negroes than ever before was enfranchised suddenly, and 99% of them belonged to the laboring class, whereas by law the Negroes who voted in the early history of the country were for the most part property holders, and prospective if not actual constituents of a petty bourgeoisie. When freedom came, this mass of Negro labor was not without intelligent leadership, and a leadership which because of former race prejudice and the present color line, could not be divorced from the laboring mass, as had been the case with the poor whites. The group of intelligent, free Negroes in Washington, Richmond, Charleston and especially New Orleans, had accumulated some wealth and some knowledge of group cooperation and initiative. Almost without exception, they accepted the new responsibility of leading the emancipated slaves, unselfishly and effectively. Free Negroes from the North, most of whom had been born in the South and new conditions, came back in considerable numbers during Reconstruction, and took their place as leaders. The result was that the Negroes were not, as they are sometimes painted, simply a mass of densely ignorant toilers. The rank and file of black labor had a notable leadership of intelligence during Reconstruction times. It was, however, a leadership which was not at all clear in its economic thought. On the whole, it believed in the accumulation of wealth and the exploitation of labor as the normal method of economic development. But it also believed in the right to vote as the basis and defense of economic life, and gradually but surely it was forced by the demand of the mass of Negro laborers to face the problem of land. Thus the Negro leaders gradually but certainly turned toward emphasis on economic emancipation. They wanted the Negro to have the right to work at a decent rate of wages, and they expected that the right to vote would come when he had sufficient education and perhaps a certain minimum of property to deserve it. It was this among other things that was the cause of the tremendous push toward education which the Negroes exhibited. On the other hand, their desire for economic enfranchisement, for real abolition of slavery, had been affronted by the black codes. They were scared and hampered in the very beginning of their freedom by these enactments and by the way in which these and other laws were executed. The government replied before the death of Abraham Lincoln with government guardianship in the shape of the Freedmen's Bureau. This bureau never had a real chance to organize and function properly. It was hastily organized. It had to use the persons at hand and on the ground largely for its personnel. It had at first no government appropriations and in the end only limited appropriations and it was always faced by the probability of quick dissolution. It was surrounded from the beginning by the spirit which enacted the black codes. Southerners were desperately opposed to it because it stood between them and the exploitation of labor toward which they were impelled by their losses and the high price of cotton. If they had been allowed to exploit and drive black labor after the war, many Southerners despite their losses could have partially recouped their fortunes. But here came an organization which demanded money wages of employers who had no money and demanded the modern treatment of labor from former slave drivers. Beside the Freedmen's Bureau and before it, there was the chance for the Negroes to seek the advice of their former masters and in many cases this was willingly and wisely given, particularly in the case of masters ready to assist a new economic regime, but it was hindered by several considerations. First, any new union between former masters and Negroes was rekindling the old enmity and jealousy of the poor whites against any combination of the white employer and the black laborer which would again exclude the poor white. The planter, therefore, 
had to be careful of any open sympathy or cooperation with the black laborer. Already his ranks had been decimated by war and his social status threatened by poverty. Then, too, insofar as the black laborer was guided by the Freedmen's Bureau, by northern philanthropy and by northern capital, he brought upon himself the bitter enmity of the former master, so that on the whole, while there was considerable advice and help from the former master, in the long run it did not and could not amount to much. Then, too, we must remember that these former slaveholders did not believe that Negroes could advance in freedom. They knew, of course, that some could, but even if these could, how could white men and masters cooperate with them? The whole trend of teaching had been that this was utterly impossible. If Negroes succeeded and insofar as they did, it would lead straight to social equality and amalgamation, and if they did not succeed it would lead to deterioration in culture and civilization. The real economic battle, then, lay finally in a series of attempted compromises between planters, carpetbaggers, scalawags, poor white laborers and Negroes. First, the planters moved toward the political control of Negroes to fix their economic control. This the poor whites had of course feared and their fears were voiced repeatedly by Andrew Johnson. Many people in the North looked upon this as a possible and threatening answer to the enfranchisement of the blacks. The combination was frustrated because the carpetbaggers offered the Negroes better terms, offered them the right to vote and to hold office and some economic freedom. When this economic freedom looked toward land holding and higher wages, it could be accomplished only at the expense of the employing class, and so far as Negro labor accepted, as it had to accept the offer of the carpetbaggers and scalawags, it alienated the planters, and not only that, but it frightened the poor whites. Here again, as in the case of slavery, there was a combination in which the poor whites seemed excluded, unless they made common cause with the blacks. This union of black and white labor never got a real start. First, because black leadership still tended toward the ideals of the petty bourgeois, and white leadership tended distinctly toward strengthening capitalism. The final move which rearranged all these combinations and led to the catastrophe of 1876, was a combination of planters and poor whites in defiance of their economic interests, and with the use of lawless murder and open intimidation. It was a combination that could only have been stopped by government force, and the army which was the agent of the federal government was sustained in the South by the organized capital of the North. All that was necessary, then, was to satisfy Northern industry that the new combination in the South was essentially a combination which aimed at capitalistic exploitation on conventional terms. The result was the withdrawal of military support and the revolutionary suppression not only of Negro suffrage but of the economic development of Negro and white labor. It was not until after the period which this book treats that white labor in the South began to realize that they had lost a great opportunity, that when they united to disfranchise the black laborer they had cut the voting power of the laboring class in two. White labor in the populist movement of the 80s tried to realign the economic warfare in the South and bring workers of all colors into united opposition to the employer. But they found that the power which they had put in the hands of the employers in 1876 so dominated political life that free and honest expression of public will at the ballot box was impossible in the South, even for white men. They realized that it was not simply the Negro who had been disfranchised in 1876, it was the white laborer as well. The South had since become one of the greatest centers for exploitation of labor in the world, and labor suffered not only in the South but throughout the country and the world over. Curious and contradictory has been the criticism and comment accompanying this great controversy and revolution of 1866 to 1876. Floods of tears and sentiment have been expended on the suffering and disillusionment of the slave baron, while the equally great losses of northern and southern labor have been forgotten. And above all, the plight of the most helpless victims of the situation, the black freedmen, has been treated with callous and hardened judgments, cemented with hate. The northern businessman has justly been accused of being motivated, during this period, chiefly by greed and profit. But the profit and greed of the slaveholder which caused the whole catastrophe, and of the planter who forced an unjust and still dangerous solution, has been sicklied o'er with sentiment. In all this, 
one sees the old snobbery of class judgment in new form tears and sentiment for Marie Antoinette on the scaffold, but no sign of grief for the gutters of Paris and the fields of France, where the victims of exploitation and ignorance lay rotting in piles. The South, after the war, presented the greatest opportunity for a real national labor movement which the nation ever saw or is likely to see for many decades. Yet the labor movement, with but few exceptions, never realized the situation. It never had the intelligence or knowledge, as a whole, to see in black slavery and reconstruction the kernel and meaning of the labor movement in the United States. After Lincoln's assassination, the General Council of the International Workingmen's Association, under Karl Marx, sent an address to Andrew Johnson. After a gigantic civil war, which if we consider its colossal extension and its vast scenes of action, seems in comparison with the Hundred Years' War and the Thirty Years' War and the Twenty-Three Years' War of the Old World scarcely to have lasted ninety days, the task, sir, devolves upon you to uproot by law what the sword has felt, and to preside over the more difficult work of political reconstruction and social regeneration. The profound consciousness of your great mission will preserve you from all weakness in the execution of your stern duties. You will never forget that the American people at the inauguration of the new era of the emancipation of labor placed the burden of leadership on the shoulders of two men of labor Abraham Lincoln, the one, and the other, Andrew Johnson.16. In 1865, September, another address over the signature of Marx declared boldly, Injustice against a fraction of your people having been followed by such dire consequences, put an end to it. Declare your fellow citizens from this day forth free and equal, without any reserve. If you refuse them citizens' rights while you exact from them citizens' duties, you will sooner or later face a new struggle which will once more drench your country in blood. The National Labor Union of Workers was organized at Baltimore, Maryland, August 20, 1866. There were 60 delegates and on their banner was inscribed Welcome to the Sons of Toil from the North, East, South and West. An address was issued on cooperation, trade unions, apprenticeship, strikes, labor of women, public land and political action. As to the Negroes, the union admitted that it was unable to express an opinion which would satisfy all, but the question must not be allowed to pass unnoticed. The Negro worker had been neglected. Cooperation of the African race and systematic organization must be secured. Otherwise, Negroes must act as scabs, as in the case of the colored cockers, imported from Virginia to Boston, during the strike on the eight-hour question. There should be no distinction of race or nationality, but only separation into two great classes, laborers and those who live by others' labor. Negroes were soon to be admitted to citizenship and the ballot. Their ballot strength would be of great value to union labor. If labor did not accept them, capital would use the Negro to split white and black labor, just as the Austrian government had used race dissension. Such a lamentable situation should not be allowed to develop in America. Trade unions, eight-hour leagues and other groups should be organized among Negroes. Here was a first halting note. Negroes were welcome to the labor movement, not because they were laborers but because they might be competitors in the market, and the logical conclusion was either to organize them or guard against their actual competition by other methods. It was to this latter alternative that white American labor almost unanimously turned. This was manifest at the second annual meeting in Chicago in 1867, where the Negro problem was debated more frankly and less successfully. The president called attention to Negroes whose emancipation had given them a new position in the labor world. They would now come in competition with white labor. He suggested that the best way to meet this situation was to form trade unions among Negroes. A committee of three on Negro labor was selected. The Committee on Negro Labor reported that having had the subject under consideration, and after having heard the suggestions and opinions of several members of this convention pro and con they had arrived at the following conclusions. That, while we feel the importance of the subject, and realize the danger in the future of competition in mechanical Negro labor, yet we find the subject involved in so much mystery, and upon it so wide diversity of opinion amongst our members, 
we believe that it is inexpedient to take action on the subject in this National Labor Congress. Resolved, that the subject of Negro labor be laid over till the next session of the National Labor Congress. The report of this committee brought a whirlwind of discussion which lasted throughout the whole day. The Negro will bear to be taught his duty, and has already stood his ground nobly when a member of a trades union did not like to confess to the world that there was a subject with which they were afraid to cope. This very question was at the root of the rebellion, which was the war of the poor white men of the South, who were forced by the slaveholders into the war. In New Haven, there were a number of respectable colored mechanics, but they had not been able to induce the trades unions to admit them. Was there any union in the states which would admit colored men? The colored man was industrious, and susceptible of improvement and advancement. There was no need of entering on any discussion of the matter. There was no necessity for the foisting of the subject of colored labor, or the appointment of a committee to report thereon. The blacks would combine together of themselves and by themselves, without the assistance of whites. God speed them, but let not the whites try to carry them on their shoulders. Time enough to talk about admitting colored men to trades unions and to the Congress when they applied for admission. Whites striking against the blacks, and creating an antagonism which will kill off the trades unions, unless the two be consolidated. There is no concealing the fact that the time will come when the Negro will take possession of the shops if we have not taken possession of the Negro. If the workingmen of the white race do not conciliate the blacks, the black vote will be cast against them. The capitalists of New England now employ foreign boys and girls in their mills, to the almost entire exclusion of the native-born population. They would seek to supplant these by colored workers. Little danger of black men wanting to enter trades unions any more than Germans would try to join the English societies in America. Point 17. The whole question was finally dodged by taking refuge in the fact that the Constitution invited all labor. Silvis, president of the International Labor Movement, spoke out in 1868 on slavery. Whatever our opinions may be as to immediate causes of the war, we can all agree that human slavery, property in man, was the first great cause, and from the day that the first gun was fired, it was my earnest hope that the war might not end until slavery ended it. No man in America rejoiced more than I at the downfall of Negro slavery. But when the shackles fell from the limbs of those four millions of blacks, it did not make them free men, it simply transferred them from one condition of slavery to another, it placed them upon the platform of the white working men, and made all slaves together. I do not mean that freeing the Negro enslaved the white, I mean that we were slaves before, always have been, and that the abolition of the right of property in man added four millions of black slaves to the white slaves of the country. We are now all one family of slaves together, and the labor reform movement is a second emancipation proclamation. Point 18. In the meeting of the National Labor Union in New York in 1868, there was no mention of Negroes, but in 1869 at Philadelphia among 142 representatives, there appeared nine Negroes representing various separate Negro unions and organizations. This pointed a way out which labor eagerly seized. Contrary to all labor philosophy, they would divide labor by racial and social lines and yet continue to talk of one labor movement. Through this separate union, Negro labor would be restrained from competition and yet kept out of the white race unions where power and discussion lay. A resolution was adopted saying that the National Labor Union would recognize neither color nor sex in the question of the rise of all labor, and the colored laborers were urged to form their own organizations and send delegates to the next conference. The Negroes responded and declared that all Negroes wanted was a fair chance and no one would be the worse off for giving it. Isaac Myers, their leader, said, The white laboring men of the country have nothing to fear from the colored laboring men. We desire to see labor elevated and made respectable, we desire to have the highest rate of wages that our labor is worth, we desire to have the hours of labor regulated as well to the interest of the laborer as to the capitalist. Mr. President, American citizenship for the black man is a complete failure if he is proscribed from the workshops of the country. 19. In 1869, 
the General Council of the National Working Men's Association sent a letter signed by Karl Marx to the President of the National Labor Union. The immediate tangible result of the Civil War was of course a deterioration of the condition of American workingmen. Both in the United States and in Europe the colossal burden of a public debt was shifted from hand to hand in order to settle it upon the shoulders of the working class. The prices of necessaries, remarks one of your statesmen, have risen 78 per center since 1860, while the wages of simple manual labor have risen 50 and those of skilled labor 60 per center. Pauperism, he complains, is increasing in America more rapidly than population. Moreover the sufferings of the working class are in glaring contrast to the newfangled luxury of financial aristocrats, shoddy aristocrats, and other vermin bred by the war. Still the Civil War offered a compensation in the liberation of the slaves and the impulse which it thereby gave your own class movement. Another war, not sanctified by a sublime aim or a social necessity, but like the wars of the old world, would forge chains for the free workingmen instead of sundering those of the slaves. Point twenty. Silvis, president of the International Labor Movement, acknowledged this letter but said nothing about slavery, confining himself to attacking the moneyed aristocracy. Thus American labor leaders tried to emphasize the fact that here was a new element, new not in the sense that it had not been there it had been there all the time but new in the sense that the Negro worker must now be taken account of, both in his own interest and particularly in their interest. He was a competitor and a prospective underbidder. Then difficulties appeared, the white worker did not want the Negro in his unions, did not believe in him as a man, dodged the question, and when he appeared at conventions, asked him to organize separately, that is, outside the real labor movement, in spite of the fact that this was a contradiction of all sound labor policy. As the Negro laborers organized separately, there came slowly to realization the fact that here was not only separate organization but a separation in leading ideas, because among Negroes, and particularly in the South, there was being put into force one of the most extraordinary experiments of Marxism that the world, before the Russian Revolution, had seen. That is, backed by the military power of the United States, a dictatorship of labor was to be attempted and those who were leading the Negro race in this vast experiment were emphasizing the necessity of the political power and organization backed by protective military power. On the other hand, the trade union movement of the white labor in the North was moving away from that idea and moving away from politics. They seemed to see a more purely economic solution in their demand for higher wages and shorter hours. IRA Stewart spoke for men who labor excessively, robbed of all ambition to ask for anything more than will satisfy their bodily necessities, while those who labor moderately have time to cultivate tastes and create wants in addition to mere physical comforts 21 but Stewart was not thinking of Negroes and only once barely mentioned them. That we rejoice that the rebel aristocracy of the South has been crushed, that we rejoice that beneath the glorious shadow of our victorious flag men of every clime, lineage, and color are recognized as free. But while we will bear with patient endurance the burden of the public debt, we yet want it to be known that the workingmen of America will in future claim a more equal share in the wealth their industry creates in peace and a more equal participation in the privileges and blessings of those free institutions, defended by their manhood on many a bloody field of battle. Not a word was said of Negro suffrage and the need of the labor vote, black and white, if the demands of labor were to be realized. Indeed, at the very time that Southern labor was about to be enfranchised, Northern labor realized that the right to vote meant little under the growing dictatorship of wealth and corporate control. It made little difference what laws were made as long as their interpretation by the courts and administration was dictated by capital. Some proposed, therefore, to fight their battle out directly with the employer, on the one battleground of economic bargaining, with strikes, violence, and secret organization as the methods. The National Labor Union veered from consumers and producers' cooperation into a fight to control credits and capital and afterward through the Greenback Party into an attempt to gain these ends by manipulating money. With falling prices and unemployment directly after the war, and rising prices and normal employment in 1868 to 1873, labor leaders became increasingly petty bourgeois and turned their backs on black labor. Farmers organized the Grange but not for black farm tenants and laborers, 
not for the struggling peasant proprietors among the freedmen. The Knights of Labor did not turn their attention to Negroes until after 1876. There was, too, no rapprochement between the liberal revolt against big industry and northern labor. Horace Greeley, a pioneer of the labor leaders, drew little labor support. The labor leaders went into the labor war of 1877 having literally disarmed themselves of the power of universal suffrage. And thus in 1876, when northern industry withdrew military support in the south and refused to support longer the dictatorship of labor, they did this without any opposition or any intelligent comprehension of what was happening on the part of the northern white worker. Labor and Negro history illustrate these paradoxes. For instance in 1869, there came up the celebrated case of Louis H. Douglas, the son of Frederick Douglas, who worked in the government printing office and was not allowed to join the printer's union. Rather than face the question, the matter was postponed for three years and all sorts of excuses given. This and other cases led and practically compelled the Negroes to form not only separate local trade unions but to work toward a separate national organization. White labor was organizing to fight against the new industrial oligarchy, which was growing in the North, but it was this same oligarchy which in its own self-defense had forced the South to accept Negro suffrage, allying itself temporarily with the abolition democratic movement in the North. This placed the white and black labor movement in a singularly contradictory position. The alliance of the black labor movement with the Republican Party was simply the political side of an economic fact. The Republican Party had given the black man the right to vote. This right to vote he was going to use to better his economic and social position. To oppose the Republican Party, then, was to oppose his own economic enfranchisement. On the other hand, the White Labor Party had allied themselves with the Democrats, chiefly because the Democratic Party had opposed the Know Nothing Party. The anti-foreign immigration movement was now the only organized political opposition to the great industrial forces represented by the Republicans in the North. It represented in some degree and voiced the radical demands of the West for low tariff and cheap money, but it was at the same time violently opposed to the new enfranchisement of black labor in the South. These two sets of facts alone put white and black labor in direct opposition, and because their leaders did not altogether understand the basis of this opposition, it made the attempt to achieve a common platform for white and black workers exceedingly difficult, especially when the anomalous position of the northern Negro worker was taken into account. Negro leaders, naturally, resented the attack made by white labor organizations on the Republican Party. Nor did they understand how far this new southern labor government was dependent on northern industrial reaction and capitalistic oligarchy. Northern labor was equally ignorant and did not dream that in the South the Republican Party was par excellence the party of labor. This matter came to a crisis at the meeting of the National Labor Union in Cincinnati in 1870. A number of Negroes were present, including Isaac Myers, Josiah Weirs, and Peter H. Clark. John M. Langston wanted to speak, but the labor leaders opposed him because he was a Republican politician. The motion to grant him the privilege to speak was lost by a vote of 29 to 23. There was excitement. Weirs remarked that a Democrat had been allowed to speak and that he regarded the Republican Party as a friend of the working man. Myers lauded the Republicans amid cries of approval and disapproval. Senator Pinchback, colored leader of Louisiana, was also denied the privilege of the floor. Nevertheless, in the resolutions adopted after much debate, it was said, the highest interest of our colored fellow citizens is with the workingmen, who, like themselves, are the slaves of capital and politicians. The Negroes, especially the northern artisans, tried to keep in touch with the white labor movement. In September, 1870, Sela Martin, a colored man, went as delegate of the colored workers to the World Labor Congress in Paris. In 1871, the International Workingmen's Association, with its headquarters in London, and under the influence of Karl Marx, began to organize labor in the United States on a large scale, and in a parade held in New York in 1871, Negro organizations appeared. The international movement, however, 
took no real root in America. Even the White National Labor Union began losing ground and ceased to be active after 1872. The main activity of the International was in the North, they seemed to have no dream that the place for its most successful rooting was in the new political power of the Southern worker. Negroes, however, increased their attempts to organize and to think in groups. In 1865, an Equal Rights League met in Pennsylvania and tried to influence Negroes to secure real estate and give their sons business education. In the District of Columbia, in 1867, a meeting of colored workers took place. They asked Congress to secure equal apportionment of employment to white and colored labor. Their petition was printed and a committee of 15 was appointed to circulate it. In 1868 a similar petition was sent to Congress asking for equal share in work on public improvements authorized by law. There was a state colored convention in Indiana in 1865, another one in Pennsylvania in 1866, and in July, 1869, a Negro convention was held in Louisville, Kentucky, as a result of the agitation for immigrant workers. At this last convention there were 250 delegates who discussed political, economic and educational matters. They asked for the final abolition of slavery, equal education, rights in the courts, equality of taxation, the ratification of the 15th Amendment. They recommended the purchase of land and the learning of trades. A national convention of Negroes met in Washington in January, 1869. This convention was more really national than most Negro conventions hitherto. It was not simply a convention of Southern Negroes as that at Louisville, nor of Northern Negroes like the various conventions at Philadelphia and New York. In 1869, Negroes, representing a number of trades, met in Baltimore in July to form a state organization. Later, Colored representatives in the same city urged Negroes to enter the movement for the formation of labor unions. In the Washington Convention, there were a number of colored delegates from the South, including Henry M. Turner, a black political leader of Georgia, and in all, 130 delegates, including many men of intelligence and ability, came together. Frederick Douglass was elected permanent president and resolutions were passed in favor of the Freedmen's Bureau a national tax for Negro schools, universal suffrage, and the opening of public land especially in the South for Negroes. The Reconstruction policy of Congress was commended and there was opposition to colonization. This was not primarily a labor convention, but it illustrated the connection in the Negroes' minds between politics and labor. They were beginning, more and more clearly, to see that their vote must be used for their economic betterment, and that their right to work and their income depended upon their use of the ballot. They were consequently groping for leadership in industry and voting, both within and without the race. In their conception of the ballot as the means to industrial emancipation, they were ahead of the northern labor movement. But in their knowledge of the lurking dangers of the power of capital, they were far behind. This January convention was followed the same year by a National Negro Labor Convention sponsored by the Baltimore meeting which assembled in Washington in December. This had been called by Negro artisans of the North, and was again national in its membership. This National Labor Convention assembled in Union League Hall, Washington, December, 1869. There were 159 delegates present, and Isaac Myers called the meeting to order. While the committees were at work, James H. Harris addressed the convention. He was an astute and courageous Reconstruction leader of North Carolina and saw politics and labor in clear alliance. He stated that several millions of colored men were looking to the convention with much interest, and that the South, having passed through a political reconstruction, needed another reconstruction in the affairs of the laboring classes. John M. Langston spoke of the treatment of Negroes in public places and at their work. He especially scored the Printers' Union for its action toward Louis H. Douglas. Remarks were made also by Richard Trevelick, the president of the White National Labor Convention, and A. M. Powell, the editor of the Anti-Slavery Standard. The convention was permanently organized with James M. Harris of North Carolina as president. 
committees were appointed on education, finance, business, platform and address, female labor, homesteads, travel, temperance, cooperative labor, bank savings, and agriculture. The platform of the convention covered the following subjects. The dignity of labor. A plea that harmony should prevail between labor and capital. The desirability of an interchange of views between employers and employees. Temperance in liquor consumption. Education, for educated labor is more productive and commands higher wages. Political liberty for all Americans. The encouragement of industry. The exclusion from the trades and workshops regarded as an insult to God, injury to us. Immigrant labor should be welcomed, but coolie labor was an injury to all working classes. The establishment of cooperative workshops, building and loan associations. Gratitude to the agencies interested in Negro education. Protection of the law for all. The organization of workingmen's associations which should cooperate with the National Labor Union. Capital must not be regarded as the natural enemy of labor. At the third day's session, a special committee of five was appointed to draft a plan for the organization of mechanics and artisans, in order to secure recognition for them in the workships of the country. Langston addressed the meeting concerning his observations in the South. There he had found skilled workers among the Negroes in gold, silver, brass, iron, wood, brick, mortar, and the arts. He stated that all these workmen were asking for themselves and their children was that the trades should be open to them and that no avenue of industry should be closed, whether in workshops, printing offices, factories, foundries, railroads, steamboats, warehouses, or stores. On the fifth day, a resolution was passed which urged the delegates to call and organize state labor associations so that they might work in full cooperation with a committee which was to conduct its work as a labor bureau. This bureau was planned to serve as a clearinghouse for all questions of Negro labor and it was to aid in opening new labor opportunities. Isaac Myers was selected permanent president of the organization, and in his acceptance he stated that he expected to rely upon the labor bureau in reaching the Negro workingmen of the United States. It is interesting to note that this convention was more representative of the large groups than the first general convention, and it deserves for this reason, as well as for its work to be called the first organized national group of Negro laborers. Many political and religious leaders were not present at its sessions. These absentees included Douglas, Garnett, William Wells Brown, Purvis, and Whipper. The definite results of this meeting included the organization of a permanent national labor union and a bureau of labor. Before the sessions were ended it was stated that there were 23 states represented and 203 accredited delegates in attendance during the period of five days. The American working man of Boston called attention to the fact that this separate Negro organization had been formed and the writer said, the convention of colored men at Washington last week was in some respects the most remarkable one we ever attended. We had always had full faith in the capacity of the Negro for self-improvement, but were not prepared to see fresh from slavery, a body of 200 men, so thoroughly conversant with public affairs, so independent in spirit, and so anxious apparently to improve their social condition, as the men who represented the South, in that convention. There were some white fraternal delegates present and Langston attacked them as emissaries of the Democratic Party, but Sella Martin replied and told the convention plainly that they could not afford to repel the sympathy of white friends of the labor cause, and that the interests of the laboring classes, white and black, on this continent, were identical. Of the presiding officer, the writer in The American Working Man says. And here we feel impelled to say that in all our experience in tumultuous public assemblies, we have never seen a presiding officer show more executive ability than Mr. Harris, and certainly he does not owe it to white blood, as he is evidently a full-blooded Negro so far as color and features are any evidence of being so. His success was largely owing, we think, to the fact that he possessed the entire confidence of the convention, as well as superior ability for the position. He is sorry that a separate union has been formed. But we are convinced that for the present at least, they could not do better. It is useless to attempt to cover up the fact that there is still a wide gulf between the two races in this country, and for a time at least they must each in their own way work out a solution of this labor problem. 
At no very distant day they will become united, and work in harmony together, and we who have never felt the iron as they have must be slow to condemn them because they do not see as we do on this labor movement. For ourselves, we should have felt better satisfied had they decided to join the great national movement now in progress, but fresh as they are from slavery, looking as they naturally do on the Republican Party as their deliverers from bondage, it is not strange that they should hesitate joining any other movement. Although they did not distinctly recognize any party in their platform, yet the sentiment was clearly Republican, if their speeches were any indication. Still, strange as it may seem, parties were ignored in their platform, and this course was taken mainly through the influence and votes of the Southern delegates. The resolutions of this body stressed education as one of the strongest safeguards of the Republic, advocated industrious habits, and the learning of trades and professions, and declared that the exclusion of colored men and apprentices from the right to labor in any department of industry or workshops, in any of the states and territories of the United States, by what is known as trades unions, is an insult to God, injury to us, and disgrace to humanity, while we extend a free and welcome hand to the free immigration of labor of all nationalities, we emphatically deem imported, contract, coolie labor to be a positive injury to the working people of the United States is but the system of slavery in a new form, and we appeal to the Congress of the United States to rigidly enforce the Act of 1862 prohibiting coolie importations, and to enact such laws as will best protect free American labor against this or any similar form of slavery. They recommended the establishment of cooperative workshops, building and loan associations, the purchase of land. As a remedy against their exclusion from other workshops on account of color, as a means of furnishing employment, as well as a protection against the aggression of capital, and as the easiest and shortest method of enabling every man to procure a homestead for his family, and to accomplish this end we would particularly impress the greatest importance of the observance of diligence in business, and the practice of rigid economy in our social and domestic arrangements. Resolved, that we regard education as one of the greatest blessings that the human family enjoys, and that we earnestly appeal to our fellow citizens to allow no opportunity, no matter how limited and remote to pass unimproved, that the thanks of the colored people of this country is due to the Congress of the United States for the establishment and maintenance of the Freedmen's Bureau, and to Major General Howard, Commissioner, Rev. J. W. Alvord, and John M. Langston, E.S.Q., General. Inspectors, for their cooperative labors in the establishment and good government of hundreds of schools in the southern states, whereby thousands of men, women, and children, have been and are now being taught the rudiments of an English education, and we appeal to the friends of progress and to our citizens of the several states to continue their efforts to the various legislatures until every state can boast of having a free school system. With no distinction in dissemination of knowledge to its inhabitants on account of race, color, sex, creed, or previous condition. The low wages of labor in the South were cited, and according to the New York Tribune, December 11, 1869, it was said. To remedy this, labor must be made more scarce, and the best way to do that was to make laborers landowners. Congress is to be asked, therefore, to subdivide the public lands in the South into twenty acre farms, to make one year's residence entitle a settler to a patent, and also to place in the hands of a commission a sum of money, not exceeding two million dollars, to aid their settlement, and also to purchase lands in states where no public lands are found the money to be loaned for five years, without interest. Congress will also be asked not to restore to Southern Railroads the lapsed land grants of 1,856, and to require that Texas, prior to readmission to representation, shall put her public lands under the operations of provisions similar to the United States Homestead Law of 1866. Mr. Downing from the Committee on Capital and Labor, submitted the following. Your committee would simply refer to the unkind, estranging policy of the labor organizations of white men, who, while they make loud proclaims as to the injustice, as they allege, to which they are subjected, justify injustice, so far as giving an example to do so may, by excluding from their benches and their workshops worthy craftsmen and apprentices only because of their color, for no just cause. 
we say to such, so long as you persist therein, we cannot fellowship with you in your struggle, and look for failure and mortification on your part, not even the sacred name of Wendell Phillips can save you, however much we revere him and cherish toward him not only profound respect but confidence and gratitude. In February, 1870, the Bureau of Labor issued an address to the colored people which stressed the need of organizing Negro labor, and said that the lack of organization was the cause of low wages. It stated the following purposes of the Colored National Labor Union and the Bureau of Labor. To encourage and superintend the organization of labor. To bring about legislation which would secure equality before the law for all and enforce the contracts for labor. To secure funds from bankers and capitalists for aid in establishing cooperative associations. To overcome the opposition of white mechanics who excluded workers from their unions and shops. To organize state labor conventions. To organize, where there were seven or more mechanics, artisans and laborers of any particular branch of industry, separate labor associations and to advertise their labor in the daily papers. To encourage independent effort in creating capital, buying tools, building houses, forging iron, making brick. To own a homestead. The address was signed by Isaac Myers, President, and G.T. Downing, Vice President. Point 22. Local organizations were formed, meetings held, and a weekly paper, The New Era, was made the national organ. On February 21, a plan was adopted to send an agent south to organize Negro labor. Isaac Myers, President of the Union, was selected. He held a meeting in Norfolk, Virginia, urging the union of white and colored workmen in the same trade. Other labor meetings took place in 1870 in New York and the District of Columbia. The second annual meeting of the National Labor Union took place January 9, 1871, with delegates from North and South, including Alabama, Virginia, Texas, and North Carolina. Congress was petitioned for a national system of education with technical training. The convention desired to see industries and factories because the South was confined to a few staples, which created ignorance and poverty among both white and colored laborers and among the owning classes fear that industry would help elevate the status of the laborer. The next annual meeting of the National Labor Union was called at Columbia, South Carolina, coincidental with the Southern Convention which was a political gathering. Here there began to appear rivalry between the economic and political objects of the Negro. The New Era, national organ of the National Labor Union, inquired into the real objects of this meeting. It wanted to know if this union was another name for communism, or if it was a colored offshoot of the international, which intended eventually to impose a mobocracy on America. The convention at Columbia was presided over by H. M. Turner of Georgia. Committees were appointed on education and labor, on printing, finance, civil rights, organization, immigration, and on southern outrages. The Committee on the Address made a report which called for political rights, justice, protection of the courts, and advancement in the industrial arts. In 1872, in April, a Southern States Convention assembled at New Orleans with Frederick Douglass presiding. Evidently, the National Labor Union was steadily becoming political in its influences and leadership. Efforts were made to show that Negro labor could only achieve its end by political organization. Frederick Douglass wrote an editorial to this effect, and concluded with the words, The Republican Party is the true workingmen's party of the country. This sounded strange for the North but it was at the time true of the South. The National Labor Union issued an address to its state unions, saying that while it was not a political organization, it regarded it as the duty of every colored man to be interested in the Republican Party and stand by it. By its success, we stand, by its defeat, we fall. To that party we are indebted for the 13th, 14th and 15th Amendments, the Homestead Law, the Eight-Hour Law and an improved educational system. The presidents of the state labor unions were directed to read this address before their organizations. As the Negroes moved from unionism toward political action, white labor in the North not only moved in the opposite direction from political action to union organization, but also evolved the American blind spot for the Negro and his problems. 
it lost interest and vital touch with southern labor and acted as though the millions of laborers in the south did not exist. Thus labor went into the Great War of 1877 against northern capitalists unsupported by the black man, and the black man went his way in the south to strengthen and consolidate his power, unsupported by northern labor. Suppose for a moment that northern labor had stopped the bargain of 1876 and maintained the power of the labor vote in the south, and suppose that the Negro with new and dawning consciousness of the demands of labor as differentiated from the demands of capitalists, had used his vote more specifically for the benefit of white labor, south and north? If the basic problem of reconstruction in the south was economic, then the kernel of the economic situation was the land. This was clear to the sophisticated leadership of Stevens and to the philanthropy of Sumner and Oliver Howard, but it was equally clear to the ignorant and inexperienced of the freed slaves. The northern labor leaders and the mass of the north were slow in realizing that the center of the south's labor problem was the land, and not as yet industry. Here in the south, after the war, was a chance to keep the economic balance between farm and factory. And if it had been done, the result would have been fateful for the nation and for the world. The Negro unerringly and insistently led the way. The main question to which the Negroes returned again and again was the problem of owning land. It was ridiculed as unreasonable and unjust to the impoverished landholders of the South, and as a part of the desire for revenge which the North had. But in essence it was nothing of the sort. Again and again, crudely but logically, the Negroes expressed their right to the land and the deep importance of this right. And as usual here the government played fast and loose because it had two irreconcilable ideas in mind. Thaddeus Stevens and Charles Sumner were perfectly clear, the Negroes must have land furnished them either for a nominal sum or as a gift, and this land should be furnished by the government and paid for either out of taxation, or as Stevens repeatedly insisted, as an indemnity placed on the South for civil war. Moreover, for 250 years the Negroes had worked on this land, and by every analogy in history, when they were emancipated the land ought to have belonged in large part to the workers. On the other hand, to the organized industry of the North, capital and machines or land was sacred, they did not wish to appear to punish the South by taking any more of its already partly confiscated capital. They did not want to set an example of confiscation before a nation victimized by monopoly, and they were bitterly opposed to giving capital to workers or redistributing wealth by public taxation. The result was that the nation moved backward and forward according as to one or the other idea gained the upper hand. Sir George Campbell said, All that is now wanted to make the Negro a fixed and conservative element in American society is to give him encouragement to, and facilities for, making himself, by his own exertions, a small landowner, to do, in fact, for him what we have sought to do for the Irish farmer. Land in America is so much cheaper and more abundant, that it would be infinitely easier to effect the same object there. I would by no means seek to withdraw the whole population from hired labor, on the contrary, the Negro in many respects is so much at his best in that function, that I should look to a large class of laborers remaining, but I am at the same time confident that it would be a very great benefit and stability to the country if a large number should acquire thrift and independent position as landowning American citizens. Point 23. Most writers and speakers thought of the land problem so far as the Negro was concerned as an incidental thing, it was something that would come. On the other hand, the former slaveholders knew that land was the key to the situation and they tried desperately to center thought on labor rather than on land ownership. One universal opinion is that they shall not be allowed to acquire or hold land. I have heard that expressed from the first. They say that unless Negroes work for them they shall not work at all. 24. The freed slaves were desperately poor, the poor whites had always been poor except in so far as they were pensioners of the planters. How could industry be set going again and what was the relation of free Negro labor to this industry? Of course, the full realization of freedom could not be accomplished in a minute. Unless crops were raised and the wheels of industry started, emancipation would have been an experiment so costly that no nation could have supported it. And we must remember that in the end and as a logical matter of dollars and cents, emancipation paid. 
This is so much a matter of common knowledge today that we forget how bitterly and with what absolute certainty the South and even many in the North declared that free Negro labor was economically impossible. What they insisted on during Reconstruction was labor, continuous, steady labor to continue production of high-priced crops. What they slurred over or refused to discuss was the object of this labor and the distribution of its product. Of labor for the economic benefit of the laborer except to the extent of the lowest possible wage that would sustain him they had no conception, and to any transfer of capital and land to the laborer as a basis of his right to demand a fairer share of the products, they were bitterly opposed. The White South believed that it was being deliberately insulted in a petty spirit of vengeance by the North. But this was a childish way of attributing human emotions to an economic situation. The North as a whole harbored no thoughts of vengeance. Sumner wrecked his career on a deed of forgiveness, and Stevens punished the slave system and its promoters only insofar as they still interfered with freedom, or kept the ill-gotten capital accumulated by exploiting slaves. The party of Northern industry watched the beginnings of democratic government in the South with distrust. They did not expect Negro suffrage to succeed, but they did expect that it would soon compel the Southern oligarchy to capitulate to the dictatorship of industry. Their hopes were fulfilled in 1876. The abolition democracy faced the Southern conventions of 1867 with fear. It was the greatest test of democracy that the nation had known. Even after the Great Reform Bill of 1832, England had less than one million voters. It was not until 1867 that a million or more skilled laborers in England got the vote. Here, at the stroke of the pen, more than one million Negroes were given the right to vote, of whom probably three-fourths could not read or write, and at the same time more than one million whites were given the same right, and at least one-third of them were equally illiterate. This was a desperate venture forced by a slave-minded regime, it had refused to grant complete physical freedom to black workers, it refused them education and access to the land and insisted on dominant political power based on the number of these same serfs. Under these circumstances the experiment had to be made. For to surrender now was to have sacrificed blood and billions of dollars in vain. But, it was the American blind spot that made the experiment all the more difficult, and to the South incomprehensible. For several generations the South had been taught to look upon the Negro as a thing apart. He was different from other human beings. The system of slave labor, under which he was employed, was radically different from all other systems of labor. There could be no comparison between labor problems in the South and in the North, between the Negro and white laborer. It must be confessed that the representatives of the white oligarchy are having a hard time, being forced to consider their own former slaves no longer as Negroes, niggers, that is to say, members of a category unrecognized in any natural history, somewhere between men and monkeys in the animal scale, but as men, who have, as Jefferson phrased it, equal rights with them in the free development of their talents and in the pursuit of happiness, or, in other words, as citizens on an equal footing with themselves. Point 25. The Northern Democrats encouraged resistance on the part of the South, and yet some of them saw the situation clearly. The intrinsic difficulties of the situation are not to be denied. The ruling classes of the Southern people had attempted to disrupt the Union in order to establish their own independence. The overthrow of their armies had not changed their opinions nor their feelings. Necessity compelled their submission, but necessity could not make them love a Union with the victorious North nor make them cordially recognize and support the rights of the freedmen. Point 26. During the winter and spring of 1867-1868 in accordance with the legislation of Congress, Southern conventions met and adopted new constitutions. These constitutions provided for equal civil rights, established universal suffrage and disfranchised disloyal whites. After the framing of these constitutions, they were voted on by the people. Also, State officers and members of the legislature were chosen at the same election and by the same voters. The army commanders did their best to bring out the vote and to counteract various devices for keeping Negroes away from the polls. The polls were kept open two and three days and in Georgia even five days. Officials of the Freedmen's Bureau helped in the enforcement of the Reconstruction Acts. 
The Act of March 23 provided that registration and elections should be conducted by boards of three loyal officers or persons appointed by the district commander. They were required to take the ironclad oath. Bureau officials were often appointed as members of these boards and Negroes were often used. The Bureau officials advised Negroes about registration and voting and disabused their mind of fears of taxation or military service or re-enslavement. They promised to protect them in case of a boycott of employers against those that voted. Thus in 1867, there took place in the South a series of elections in which a new electorate registered and expressed its desire as to constitutional conventions to reconstruct the states. 1,363,640 persons voted, of whom 660,181 were whites, and 703,459 were Negroes, as compared with a total vote of 721,191 whites voting in 1,860.27. At first, the planters thought to defeat Reconstruction by refusing to vote and thus making the whole experiment a failure at the very start. Many leading whites, small in total number but large in influence and in former wealth and power, were disfranchised perhaps 200,000 in all. On the other hand, the poor whites must have voted widely, especially when we note the large white vote in most of the states despite war, mortality, abstentions, and disabilities. It is probable that in 1868 not only did Negroes vote freely, but more poor whites than ever before exercised the franchise. Democracy for the first time in at least a century succeeded oligarchy in the South. The voting of nearly three-fourths of a million Negroes was especially significant and represented a very large proportion of, perhaps, a million eligible black voters. The elections which reconstructed the South under the Congressional plan were fair and honest elections, and probably never before were such democratic elections held in the South and never since such fair elections. Indeed, as a special champion of the South says, it would be hard to deny that so far as the ordinary civil administration was concerned, the rule of the generals was as just and efficient as it was far-reaching. Criticism and denunciation of their acts were bitter and continuous, but no very profound research is necessary in order to discover that the animus of these attacks was chiefly political. 28. As a result of the elections, Constitutional conventions were decided on in all the southern states and the following number of members of the conventions elected. As these conventions were being voted on, the presidential election approached. The campaign began in May, 1868. The Republican National Platform did not dare to stand squarely for Negro suffrage but evolved this illogical compromise. The guarantee by Congress of equal suffrage to all loyal men at the South was demanded by every consideration of public safety, of gratitude, and of justice, and must be maintained while the question of suffrage in all the loyal states properly belongs to the people of these states. Point 29. Grant and Colfax were nominated. Colfax declared that peace had been prevented by executive opposition, and by refusals to accept any plan of reconstruction proffered by Congress. Justice and public safety at last combined to teach us that only by an enlargement of suffrage in those states could the desired end be attained and that it was even more safe to give the ballot to those who loved the Union than to those who had sought ineffectually to destroy it. In 1865-1868, the Democratic Party controlled from 44 percenter to 50 percenter of the voters Indiana the North, so that if the white people of the South had been included, undoubtedly the Democratic Party would have been in the majority. By the exclusion of the South, the Democratic Party had been beaten in 1866, and in 1867 had carried only Maryland and Kentucky, Connecticut, New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and California, nevertheless, on the whole, the Democratic vote increased, as compared with the Republican. The elections of 1867 made it clear that if the Democrats won in 1868, the entire system of Reconstruction would be changed. The business elements of the North, therefore, while not willing to follow abolition democracy to the extreme, were even less willing to put Reconstruction entirely in the hands of Southerners. Congress, therefore, prepared to clinch its political hold on the South, 
and reconstruct southern states on a basis of Negro suffrage. While, then, the conservative and commercial elements in the North went into the Republican Party, on the other hand, former Democrats began to return to the Democratic Party, where they were received with more or less suspicion. Meetings began to be held by Democratic leaders to determine candidates and procedure. On Jackson Day, January 8, 1868, a meeting was held in Washington, at which President Johnson spoke and many Democratic leaders. This meeting was dominated by the War Democrats, rather than by Copperheads, and emphasis was laid upon cooperation between the War Democrats and the Johnson administration, on the one hand, and the Democratic organization on the other. New measures and new men were sought. August Belmont, the banker, was chairman of the National Committee. New York was chosen as the seat of the convention, and a general invitation was issued to former Democrats. The New York Herald enumerated the elements of the new democracy, merchants who opposed the protective tariff, the unemployed, the foreign-born, the Catholics, the women opposed to Negro suffrage, the opponents of military control in the South. Many papers warned the pro-Southern elements in the Democratic Party not to oppose the loyal sentiment in the nation. The Springfield Republican, July 1, mentioned the mere stupid, causeless, aimless hatred of the Negro in the Democratic Party. The opposition of the Democrats to Negro suffrage was not clearly expressed. Evidently, the tide in favor of democracy had risen so high in the country that as a party the Democrats did not dare oppose it. The party, therefore, would not come out flatly in opposition to Negro suffrage but simply declared that suffrage was a question to be settled by the states. Twenty-two state Democratic conventions were held in 1868. Eleven of these opposed Negro suffrage anywhere. Only the Convention of South Carolina in April approved it. Ten other conventions either were silent on the subject or announced their belief that this was a matter of state control. The various state platforms illustrated local northern thought. California Democrats declared that they now and always confide in the intelligence, patriotism and discriminating justice of the white people of the country to administer and control their government, without the aid of either Negroes or Chinese 30. The Democrats of Washington Territory agreed with California in opposing the extension of the elective franchise to Negroes, Indians and Chinese. The Ohio Democrats declared that the attempt to regulate suffrage in Ohio was subversive of the federal constitution. The Democrats of Pennsylvania were opposed to conferring upon the Negro the right to vote. Most of the Republican conventions approved the 15th Amendment. A minority report of the Virginia Conservatives called for white control and said, We call upon white men, whether native or adopted citizens, to vote down the constitution, and thereby save themselves and their posterity from Negro suffrage, Negro office holding, and its legitimate consequence Negro social equality. This was a time of changing of political allegiance. The Johnson movement collapsed. Conservative Republicans, like Fessenden and Trumbull, united with the Republicans. Seward, McCulloch and Wells, former supporters of Lincoln, stood staunchly by President Johnson. Other Republicans, like the Blairs, Doolittle, and Chase, drifted toward the Democrats. But the Democratic Party, by its action during the campaign, repelled many of the conservatives on account of its attitude on money, and its radical attitude on Reconstruction. State and local elections in the spring of 1868 encouraged the Democrats. The Republican vote was reduced in New Hampshire. In Michigan Negro suffrage was defeated by a vote of 110,000 to 71,000, and the Democrats triumphed in Connecticut. Before the war, Salmon P. Chase was a prominent abolitionist, and after the war, a radical Republican. He advocated Negro suffrage, and in May, 1865, made a trip to the South to investigate the position of the Negro. In Charleston, he spoke to the Negroes and urged them to deserve the suffrage, even if they did not get it. On the other hand, Chase did not like the military governments of the South, and favored state rights as against the increased power of the federal government. He said once, while we freed the Negro, we enslaved ourselves. Becoming Chief Justice, 
he presided at Johnson's impeachment and favored Johnson possibly on account of his dislike of Benjamin F. Wade of Ohio. Wade would have become president if Johnson had been impeached. Chase's daughter Kate was said to have made some fiery declarations at the idea of that horrid Ben Wade being put over my father. For his stand in this trial, he was practically read out of the Republican Party, and became a formidable candidate for the Democratic nomination. The Chase supporters had headquarters in New York, and his daughter was there in person. It was suggested that Chase should declare Reconstruction Acts unconstitutional as the Supreme Court would probably decide. This statement, of course, Chase could not make, and he had to warn his daughter against too great activity. A small group of some 20 Negroes assisted the Chase movement, and argued that Chase would carry many Southern Negro votes. After a long deadlock, Seymour of New York, the former Copperhead governor of draft riot fame, was nominated chiefly because he failed to swing his followers to Chase, as he had promised. The platform of the convention recognized slavery and secession as closed questions. It demanded the immediate restoration of all states, amnesty for all political offenses, and the regulation of suffrage in the states by their citizens. It asked for the abolition of the Freedmen's Bureau and all agencies for Negro supremacy. It said that the Republicans, instead of restoring the Union, had dissolved it, subjecting ten states to military despotism and Negro supremacy, and that the corruption of the Radical Party had been unprecedented. The New York Herald called Seymour the embodiment of Copperheadism. Greeley declared that Seymour had proposed resisting secession by force, had declared that if the Union could only be maintained by abolishing slavery, then the Union should be given up, had given grudging support to the government while war governor, and had opposed the draft. The New York Sun said that he represented fairly the average sentiment of his party. Seymour accepted the platform but did not discuss it in detail. He attacked Congressional Reconstruction, but pointed out that no violent change could take place since the Republicans would continue to control the Senate. Frederick Douglass, writing in The Independent, August 20, 1868, said that Seymour's letter of acceptance was smooth as oil and as fair-seeming as hypocrisy itself, containing every disposition to deceive but without the ability. It was cunning and cowardly. Seymour made no reference to finance or suffrage. Blair, the Democratic candidate for vice president, was a wild Missourian given to drink who openly advocated that the new president disperse the carpetbag governments by force as soon as his party triumphed. President Johnson was disgusted and chagrined at not receiving the nomination and said that Seymour had not lifted a finger to sustain his administration. In the campaign, he was finally induced to give some support to the Democratic ticket. Seymour, on the other hand, practically offered Johnson an appointment if he should be elected. Seward took little part in the campaign although he spoke once for the Republican ticket, and included praise for President Johnson. Thus the campaign started with contradictions inside the Democratic Party. Seymour opposed the Greenback idea before the National Convention, and then ran on a platform that advocated it. Blair advocated revolution, Hampton opposed Negro suffrage, and appealed to Negro voters. Chase asked universal suffrage, and remanded the question to the states. There were charges that the Democrats proposed to repudiate the national debt and pay for emancipated slaves and property lost during the war. Southern Democrats were prominent. Toombs, Cobb, and Forrest took part. The New York Nation said that these Southerners were of more service to the Republicans than all of their orators and literature. Many of them were accused of incendiary speeches. Vance of North Carolina was accused of saying that Seymour and Blair would win what the Confederates fought for. Hill of Georgia declared that the South was going to regulate its own internal democratic affairs in its own way. Toombs declared that if the Democrats were victorious, the Reconstruction governor and legislators would be made to vacate at once. Howell Cobb said that those in control of the southern states would be ousted, while Albert Pike of Arkansas wrote in the Memphis Appeal, the day will come when the South will be independent. 31. Violence and intimidation were widespread in the South during this election, and bribery and fraud were prevalent in the North. In Philadelphia, a Supreme Court justice issued over 5,000 naturalization papers within two weeks. The nation, 
November 12, charged that Georgia and Louisiana were carried by organized assassination, and New Jersey and New York by fraud. The Democratic majority of 165 in Oregon was due, it was said, to voters brought in from neighboring states. Late in October, there was a movement to get Seymour to withdraw and substitute Chase or Johnson. The New York world led the movement, but nothing came of it. Grant was elected by 214 electoral votes to 80 for Seymour, and 3,012,833 to 2,703,249 popular votes. Thus Grant received 52.71%. Seymour carried Delaware, Georgia, Kentucky, Louisiana, Maryland, New Jersey, New York, and Oregon. Virginia, Mississippi, and Texas did not vote. During this campaign, Negro suffrage was defeated in Missouri by 74,053 to 55,236. In Minnesota, it was carried. In Nevada, it was carried by the Republican legislature. At Christmas, 1868, President Johnson proclaimed general amnesty, pardoning every person engaged directly or indirectly in the rebellion. His last presidential message was an interesting and rather curious argument. He declared, in effect, that the dictatorship of labor, attempted in the South under the Reconstruction Acts, had led to corruption and bloodshed and, therefore, prevented the rise of industry in the South which was the real solution of the race problem. He believed that the bondholders had already received an amount larger than the principal which they owed and that, hereafter, the interest paid should be applied to the reduction of that principal. Johnson thus illustrated again the way in which the color problem became the blind spot of American political and social development and made logical argument almost impossible. The only power to curtail the rising empire of finance in the United States was industrial democracy votes and intelligence in the hands of the laboring class, black and white, north and south. The chief act of the third session of the 40th Congress was the 15th Amendment. Early in 1867, two amendments on the suffrage were introduced, one which prohibited any color distinction and the other requiring $250 property qualification or an additional tax. The victory of the Republican Party in 1868 made the passage of the 15th Amendment paramount. In 1868, 11 amendments were introduced to extend the right of suffrage to the freedmen. Of these amendments, seven were presented in the House and four in the Senate. All except one were referred to the Committee on Judiciary in each House. The House Committee on the Judiciary reported June 11, 1869, a proposed 15th Amendment. This caused long debate in the House and many proposed modifications. Among the propositions was that no educational attainment or possession of property should be made the test of any citizen's right to vote. The resolution proposed by the committee with a minor change was passed by the House by a vote of 150 to 42, January 30, 1869. Meantime, the Senate had been discussing a similar proposition and many modifications had been proposed. January 30, on reception of the House Amendment, the Senate discussed it. Eight other amendments were offered, and some 15 substitute propositions. Finally, a substitute suggested by Wilson was adopted by a vote of 31 to 27. It read. No discrimination shall be made in any state among the citizens of the United States in the exercise of the elective franchise or in the right to hold office in any state, on account of race, color, nativity, property, education, or religious creed. 32. This was amended so as to ensure Congress power to direct the manner in which the election should be conducted, and thus the Senate agreed to the House proposition with amendments. The House refused to concur. The Senate declined to recede and the measure failed. Thereupon, February 17, 1869, the Senate resumed consideration of its own resolution and eleven amendments were proposed and rejected. Finally, the 15th Amendment was passed 35 to 11, in its present form, except that the words to hold office were added after the right to vote. February 20, the House considered this proposal and there were five attempts to amend it of which one was successful and added nativity, property, and creed, to the other qualifications. 
It then passed the House 140 to 37. The Senate rejected the House amendment and asked for conference. Finally, the present 15th Amendment was agreed upon, and it passed the House 145 to 44, and the Senate 39 to 13. It was thus recommended to the states February 26, 1869. Some Americans think and say that the nation freed the black slave and gave him a vote and that, unable to use it intelligently, he lost it. That is not so. To win the war America freed the slave and armed him, and the threat to arm the mass of the black workers of the Confederacy stopped the war. Nor does this fact for a moment deny that some prophets and martyrs demanded first and last the abolition of slavery as the sole object of the war and at any cost of life and wealth. So, too, some Americans demanded not simply physical freedom but votes, land, and education for blacks, not only in order to compass the economic emancipation of labor, but also as the only fulfillment of American democratic ideals, but most Americans used the Negro to defend their own economic interests and, refusing him adequate land and real education and even common justice, deserted him shamelessly as soon as their selfish interests were safe. Nor does this for a moment deny that unselfish and far-seeing Americans, poor as well as rich, by supplying public schools when the Negroes demanded them and establishing higher schools to train teachers, saved the Negro from being entirely re-enslaved or exterminated in an unequal and cowardly renewal of war. We are the hewers and delvers who toil for another's gain. The common clods and the rabble, stunted of brow and brain. What do we want, the gleaners, of the harvest we have reaped? What do we want, the neuters, of the honey we have heaped? What matter if king or consul or president holds the rein? If crime and poverty ever be links in the bondman's chain? What careth the burden-bearer that liberty packed his load? If hunger press seth behind him with a sharp and ready goad? James Jeffrey Roche The Black Proletariat in South Carolina How in the years from 1868 to 1876, in a state where blacks outnumbered whites, the will of the mass of black labor, modified by their own and other leaders and dimmed by ignorance, inexperience, and uncertainty, dictated the form and methods of government. Point 1. A great political scientist in one of the oldest and largest of American universities wrote and taught thousands of youths and readers that There is no question, now, that Congress did a monstrous thing, and committed a great political error, if not a sin, in the creation of this new electorate. It was a great wrong to civilization to put the white race of the South under the domination of the Negro race. The claim that there is nothing in the color of the skin from the point of view of political ethics is a great sophism. A black skin means membership in a race of men which has never of itself succeeded in subjecting passion to reason, has never, therefore, created any civilization of any kind. Point two. Here is the crux of all national discussion and study of Reconstruction. The problem is incontinently put beyond investigation and historic proof by the dictum of Judge Taney, Andrew Johnson, John Burgess, and their confreres, that Negroes are not men and cannot be regarded and treated as such. The student who would test this dictum by facts is faced by this set barrier. The whole history of Reconstruction has with few exceptions been written by passionate believers in the inferiority of the Negro. The whole body of facts concerning what the Negro actually said and did, how he worked, what he wanted, for whom he voted, is masked in such a cloud of charges, exaggeration, and biased testimony, that most students have given up all attempt at new material or new evaluation of the old, and simply repeated perfunctorily all the current legends of black buffoons in legislature, golden spittoons for field hands, bribery and extravagance on an unheard of scale, and the collapse of civilization until... An outraged nation rose in wrath and ended the ridiculous travesty. And yet there are certain quite well-known facts that are irreconcilable with this theory of history. Civilization did not collapse in the South in 1868-1876. The charge of industrial anarchy is faced by the fact that the cotton crop had recovered by 1870, five years after the war and by 1876 the agricultural and even commercial and industrial rebirth of the South was in sight. The public debt was large, but measured in depreciated currency and estimated with regard to war losses, 
and the enlarged functions of a new society, it was not excessive. The legislation of this period was not bad, as is proven by the fact that it was retained for long periods after 1876, and much of it still stands. One must admit that generalizations of this sort are liable to wide error, but surely they can justifiably be balanced against the extreme charges of a history written for purposes of propaganda. And above all, no history is accurate and no political science scientific that starts with the gratuitous assumption that the Negro race has been proven incapable of modern civilization. Such a dogma is simply the modern and American residue of a universal belief that most men are subnormal and that civilization is the gift of the chosen few. Since the beginning of time, most thinkers have believed that the vast majority of human beings are incorrigibly stupid and evil. The proportion of thinkers who believed this has naturally changed with historical evolution. In earliest times all men but the chosen few were impossible. Before the middle class of France revolted, only the aristocracy of birth and knowledge could know and do. After the American experiment a considerable number of thinkers conceived that possibly most men had capabilities, except, of course, Negroes. Possibly never in human history before or since have so many men believed in the manhood of so many men as after the Battle of Port Hudson, when Negroes fought for freedom. All men know that by sheer weight of physical force, the mass of men must in the last resort become the arbiters of human action. But reason, skill, wealth, machines, and power may for long periods enable the few to control the many. But to what end? The current theory of democracy is that dictatorship is a stopgap pending the work of universal education, equitable income, and strong character. But always the temptation is to use the stopgap for narrower ends, because intelligence, thrift, and goodness seem so impossibly distant for most men. We rule by junta, we turn fascist, because we do not believe in men, yet the basis of fact in this disbelief is incredibly narrow. We know perfectly well that most human beings have never had a decent human chance to be full men. Most of us may be convinced that even with opportunity the number of utter human failures would be vast, and yet remember that this assumption kept the ancestors of present white America long in slavery and degradation. It is then one's moral duty to see that every human being, to the extent of his capacity, escapes ignorance, poverty, and crime. With this high ideal held unswervingly in view, monarchy, oligarchy, dictatorships may rule, but the end will be the rule of all, if mayhap all or most qualify. The only unforgivable sin is dictatorship for the benefit of fools, voluptuaries, gilded satraps, prostitutes and idiots. The rule of the famished, unlettered, stinking mob is better than this and the only inevitable, logical, and justifiable return. To escape from ultimate democracy is as impossible as it is for ignorant poverty and crime to rule forever. The opportunity to study a great human experiment was present in Reconstruction, and its careful scientific investigation would have thrown a world of light on human development and democratic government. The material today, however, is unfortunately difficult to find. Little effort has been made to preserve the records of Negro effort and speeches, actions, work, and wages homes and families. Nearly all this has gone down beneath a mass of ridicule and caricature, deliberate omission and misstatement. No institution of learning has made any effort to explore or probe reconstruction from the point of view of the laborer and most men have written to explain and excuse the former slaveholder, the planter, the landholder, and the capitalist. The loss today is irreparable, and this present study limps and gropes in darkness, lacking most essentials to a complete picture and yet the writer is convinced that this is the story of a normal working-class movement, successful to an unusual degree, despite all disappointment and failure. South Carolina has always been pointed to as the typical Reconstruction state. It had, in 1860, 412,320 Negroes and 291,300 whites. Even at the beginning of the 19th century, the 200,000 whites were matched by 150,000 Negroes, and the influx from the border and the direct African slave trade brought a mass of black slaves to support the new cotton kingdom. There had always been small numbers of free Negroes, a little over 3,000 at the beginning of the century, and nearly 10,000 in 1860. 
Slavery was the driving force of the state's industrial and social life, it was the institution which made South Carolina different from the states of the North, it was the principal reason why the white manhood of the state had fought so desperately. Point three. The economic loss which came through war was great, but not nearly as influential as the psychological change, the change in habit and thought. Imagine the 54th Massachusetts Colored Regiment, heading the Union troops which entered Charleston, and singing John Brown's body. A nun writes from that city concerning the changes which have come, and which seem to her unspeakable. Could you but see these delicate ladies in houses void of furniture, reduced to the wash tub and the cook pot, your heart would bleed. There were other Carolina women not, to be sure, ladies to whom the chance to wash and cook for themselves spelled heaven in these days. The hatred of the Yankee was increased. The defeated Southern leaders were popular heroes. Numbers of Southerners planned to leave the country, and go to South America or Mexico. And yet, the slaveholders had not lost all by any means. There were 638 persons in South Carolina who were later pardoned by President Johnson because they had taxable property worth more than $20,000. They had their land, their tools, and while certain cities had been wrecked and pillaged, the great mass of the plantations had not been touched. The railroads had been injured but not destroyed. Most of the 18 cotton factories were not touched. The labor situation, the prospect of free Negroes, caused great apprehension. It was accepted as absolutely true by most planters that the Negro could not and would not work without a white master. The nigger, sir, is a savage whom the Almighty Maker appointed to be a slave. A savage. With him free, the South is ruined, sir, ruined. On the other hand, these apprehensions were not fulfilled. William Henry Trescott said. When Negroes heard that freedom was coming, there was no impatience, no insubordination, no violence. They have received their freedom quietly and soberly. They remained pretty steadily on the farms of their masters, a very general disposition being manifest to adjust the terms of compensation on a reasonable basis. One great and real loss which the state suffered was the 12,922 men killed in battle, and dead of wounds. Perhaps it can be concluded that the lack of distinctive achievements by South Carolinians since the war is in no small measure due to this loss. It was estimated by the census that land values declined 60% between 1860 to 1867, and that all farm property, between 1860 to 1870, decreased from $169,738,630 to $47,628,175. In May, 1865, a meeting was held in Charleston, and a committee was sent to talk with President Johnson. He asked them to submit a list of names from which he might select a provisional governor, and he finally selected Benjamin F. Perry. This was on the whole, an unfortunate selection. Perry was a devoted follower of Johnson, and believed that Johnson had the power and backing to put his policies through. He immediately succeeded in having all Negro troops withdrawn, and he was certain that the North was with him and Johnson in standing for a purely white man's government. One the Johnson Convention met and took some advanced steps. By a small majority, they did away with property qualifications for members of the legislature, but refused to count Negroes as basis of apportionment. This was a blow at the former slaveholders, and a step toward democracy so far as the whites were concerned, but it was coupled with absolute refusal to recognize the Negroes. Perry insisted on letting property retain its right of representation in the legislature, despite the opposition of President Johnson. The convention wanted to abolish slavery only on condition that Negroes be confined to manual labor and that slave owners be compensated. They were given to understand, however, that Johnson would not accept this, and they finally declared that since the slaves had been emancipated by the United States, slavery should not be re-established. In the elections for this convention, there was little interest. Only about one-third of the normal vote was cast on the coast, and inland, there were, in many cases, no elections at all. In the election which followed again only 19,000 votes were cast. 
ex-governor or received a small majority and would have been beaten by Wade Hampton, if Hampton had not refused the use of his name. Orr was a man of striking personality, and had once been Speaker of the United States House of Representatives. The legislature which met after this election passed one of the most vicious of the Black Codes. It provided for corporal punishment, vagrancy and apprenticeship laws, openly made the Negro an inferior caste, and provided special laws for his governing. Neither humanity nor expediency demanded such sharp distinctions between the races in imposing punishments. The restriction of Negro testimony to cases in which the race was involved was not common sense. The free admission of such testimony in all cases would not have involved the surrender of power by the whites since they were to be the judges and jury. The occupational restrictions, instead of tending to restore order, created the impression that the dominant race desired to exclude the blacks from useful employment. It was impractical for a poverty-stricken commonwealth to have projected such elaborate schemes of judicial and military reorganization. Point four. There was increased difficulty in the economic situation. The war had ended late in the spring of 1865, so that the crops of that year were short, and there were crop failures for the next two years. All this complicated matters. In addition to this, the splendid start which the Negroes had on the lands of Port Royal, and on the Sea Islands, was interrupted. Johnson's proclamation and orders of 1865 provided for the early restoration of all property except property in slaves and such of the Port Royal lands as had been sold for taxes. The landlords hurried to get their pardons and to take back their lands. The Negroes resisted sometimes with physical force. When some of the landlords visited Edisto Island, the Negroes told them, you had better go back to Charleston, and go to work there and if you can do nothing else, you can pick oysters and earn your living. But these white men were not used to earning their own living. They were used to having Negroes do that for them, and now they had the federal government back of their claims. General Howard came down to facilitate the transfer and explain the condition to the Negroes. Still the black folk were dissatisfied. They drew up a petition to President Johnson, asking for at least an acre and a half of land. The planters became overbearing and the Negroes angry. Saxton, who had placed them on the land, was dismissed, and Howard deprived of his power. So that finally, by federal force, Negroes were compelled to leave most of the lands and to make contracts as common laborers. The Third Freedmen's Bureau bill gave this the force of law. Thousands of Negroes migrated to Florida during 1866 to 1867, because of the land difficulties the labor contracts, and the crop failures. 2,500 migrated to Liberia. Landholders used force, fraud and boycott against farm labor. It was declared in 1,868 that in South Carolina, the whites do not think it wrong to shoot, stab or knock down Negroes on slight provocation. It is actually thought a great point among certain classes to be able to boast that one has killed or beaten a Negro. Point five. The following resolutions were passed at public meetings of planters in South Carolina. Resolved, that if inconsistent with views of the authorities to remove the military, we express the opinion that the plan of the military to compel the freedman to contract with his former owner, when desired by the latter, is wise, prudent and absolutely necessary. Resolved, that we, the planters of the district, pledge ourselves not to contract with any freedman unless he can produce a certificate of regular discharge from his former owner. Resolved, that under no circumstances whatsoever will we rent land to any freedman, nor will we permit them to live on our premises as employees. Point six. In the Abbeville district of South Carolina it was said. Here a planter worked nearly 100, 100, hands near Cokesburg, 10, 10 of them on the South Carolina Railroad for six, six, months, the planter receiving their wages, and the remainder on his plantation, raising a crop of corn, wheat, rice, cotton, etc. After the crop was harvested the laborers were brought to Charleston, where, being destitute, they had to be rationed by the government. After their arrival in this city the planter distributed $50, $50, among them. 
The largest amount anyone received was $1.25, $1.25, and from that down to 50 cents, 50 cents, some receiving nothing. One peck of dry corn a week was the only ration furnished the farm hands. Point seven. Meantime, the growth of sentiment in favor of Negro suffrage was quickened because of the action of South Carolina and other states. Chief Justice Chase visited the state and spoke to the Negroes. He said, I believe there is not a member of the government who would not be pleased to see universal suffrage. The Negroes were already bestirring themselves. In May, 1864, at Port Royal, they held a meeting which elected delegates to the National Union Convention, which was to be held in Baltimore in June. In November, 1865, the colored people met at Zion Church, Charleston, and protested against the work of the convention and of the legislature. The legislature refused to receive this petition, and determined to ignore the matter of Negro suffrage entirely. Or attended the National Union Convention in Philadelphia in 1866, and advised the legislature to reject the 14th Amendment. This the legislature did with only one negative vote in both houses. The military commanders, under the Reconstruction legislation, did much to abolish discrimination. One captain of a vessel was fined who refused to allow a colored woman to ride as a first class passenger, and General Canby, a Kentuckian, whom Johnson appointed in March, 1867, ordered that Negroes serve on juries. This led to excitement and protests. Northern capitalists began to appear in the state. They were, at first, welcomed. Men of capital are coming from the north by every steamer in view of investing in cotton and rice. We are glad to see such a lively trade in South Carolina, it benefits everyone. Later and especially when they began to take part in politics, they were loaded with every accusation. Some of them were army officers, others, employees of the Freedmen's Bureau, some were farmers, and some religious and educational leaders. The Negroes, naturally, turned to them for leadership and received it. They helped organize the Negroes in union leagues in order to teach them citizenship and united action. Northern visitors continued to come. Senator Henry Wilson of Massachusetts spoke at Charleston. After four bloody years, liberty triumphed and slavery has died to rise no more. The creed of equal rights, equal privileges, and equal immunities for all men in America is hereafter to be the practical policy of the Republic. Never vote unless you vote for the country which made you free. Register your names. Vote for a united country. Vote for the old flag. Vote for a change in the constitution of the state that your liberties may be consummated. Under the Reconstruction Law of 1867, 46,882 whites and 80,550 blacks voted, the planter class refrained from participation in hope that the scheme would fail. In 10 of the 31 counties there were white majorities, and in the remaining 21 counties, black majorities. Party conventions began to meet. The first one was that of the Union Republican Party, which met in Charleston with nine county representatives. It adjourned to Columbia, where 19 counties were represented. It was attended by colored and white men, including some southern men like Thomas J. Robertson, a wealthy native. The reaction among the whites led to three parties. Governor Orr and his party accepted the Reconstruction Acts, and planned to work with the Negroes. Wade Hampton proposed to accept the acts, but only with the idea of finally dominating the Negro vote and having Negroes follow the lead of their former masters. Hampton owned large plantations in South Carolina and Mississippi. The New York Herald summarized his views as follows, he appeals to the blacks, lately his slaves, as his political superiors, to try the political experiment of harmonizing with their late white masters before going into the political service of strangers. The broad fact that the two races in the South must henceforth harmonize on a political basis to avoid a bloody conflict is the ground covered by Wade Hampton. A third party was led by former Governor Perry and Thomas W. Woodward. Strange to say, wrote Perry, there are many persons in the southern states whose high sense of honor would not let them adopt the Fourteenth Amendment, 
who are now urging the people to swallow voluntarily the military bill, regardless of honor, principle, or consistency. If the state were forced to acquiesce in the tyranny of Congress, he added, she need not embrace the hideous thing. If we are to wear manacles, let them be put on by our tyrants, not ourselves. He argued the folly of attempting to control the Negro vote. General Hampton and his friends, he asserted, had just as well try to control a herd of wild buffaloes as the Negro vote. Woodward was violent in denouncing the compromisers. Why, oh, why, my southern nigger worshippers, he cried, will you grope your way through this worse than Egyptian darkness? Why not cease this crawling on your bellies and assume the upright form of men? Stop, I pray you, your efforts at harmony, your advice about conventions, your pusillanimous insinuations about confiscations, etc., or you will goad these people by flattery to destruction, before they have a chance to pick out the cotton crop. 8. Perry proposed to appeal to the courts, and advised the whites to register and vote against the Constitutional Convention. The Convention of Whites was held a week before the Constitutional Convention, with 21 of the 31 districts represented. This convention made cooperation on the part of Negroes of any intelligence utterly impossible. It declared, The fact is patent to all, that the Negro is utterly unfitted to exercise the highest function of a citizen. We protest against this subversion of the social order, whereby an ignorant and depraved race is placed in power and influence above the virtuous, the educated, and the refined. The nation was informed that the white people of South Carolina would never acquiesce in Negro equality or supremacy. The president of the convention complained that the declarations were filled with adjectives and epithets, which put a weapon in the hands of the enemies of the movement. The state convention, when it met, had Negro members for the first time in the history of the state. Seventy-six of the 124 delegates were colored. As in Mississippi and elsewhere, a number of the planter class had early contemplated an effort to control the Negro vote, and thus quickly to get rid of military rule. On the other hand, the Negroes, because of the educated free Negro element, some considerable talent among the slaves, and the influx of Negroes from the North, showed unusual foresight and modesty. The convention was earnest, and on the whole, well conducted. Of the 76 colored men, it is said, 57 had been slaves. The native whites felt, said the correspondent of the New York Times, that the destinies of the state were safer in the hands of the unlettered Ethiopians than in those of the whites of the body. Beyond all question, was the effusive comment of the Charleston Daily News. The best men in the convention are the colored members. Considering the influences under which they were called together, and their imperfect acquaintance with parliamentary law, they have displayed, for the most part, remarkable moderation and dignity. They have assembled neither to pull wires like some, nor to make money like others, but to legislate for the welfare of the race to which they belong. There were 27 Southern white members of the convention, some of them honest and earnest, and some of them with questionable antecedents. One of them had made up a purse to buy a cane for Brooks, after he had assaulted Sumner, another had assisted in hauling down the Union flag from Fort Sumter, a third had been a slave trader. Among the Northerners were colored and white men of education and character, as well as some adventurers. To the chagrin of many white onlookers, the convention was not a disorderly group. The delegates did not create the Negro bedlam which tradition has associated with them. President McKee said that he had no unpleasant reminiscences of those acrimonious bickerings which, in all deliberative assemblies, are often incidental to the excitement of debate and the attrition of antagonistic minds. 9. There was no tendency to insult the white South, and even deference was paid to the defeated Confederate soldiers. This was in striking contrast to the wild and unscrupulous attacks made by the press upon this convention. Some called the experiment the maddest, most unscrupulous and infamous revolution in history, and said that it was snatching power from the hands of the race that settled the country and transferring it to its former slaves, an ignorant and feeble race. The representative of one paper was expelled from the floor for sneering at the ringed, striped, and streaked convention. Other papers received all possible courtesies. 
the real basis of opposition to the new regime was economic. Nothing showed this clearer than one fact, and that is that the chief and repeated accusations against the convention and succeeding legislatures was that they were composed of poor men, white and black. The white 47 delegates were said to have paid altogether $761 in annual taxes, of which one conservative paid $508. The total taxes paid by the 74 Negroes were $117, of which a Charleston Negro paid $85. 23 of the whites and 59 of the colored paid no taxes whatever. Point 10. In a day when property was sacred no matter how secured, and in a state where it had been politically supreme, this attitude was understandable. Yet one wonders just what was expected. Since the great majority of the white people of the state had been kept in ignorance and poverty, and practically all of the Negroes were slaves, whose education was a penal offense, one would hardly expect universal suffrage to put rich men in the legislature. It was singularly to the credit of these voters that poverty was so well represented, it showed certain tendencies toward a dictatorship of the proletariat. The Taxpayers' Convention of 1871 frankly proposed to restore the power of property by giving 60,000 taxpayers voting power equal to 90,000 non-taxpayers. What was the black man thinking and saying in these days? There was abundant evidence of clear and logical thought among his leaders. The South Carolina Negroes approached their new responsibilities with a due sense of difficulty and responsibility. Beverly Nash a black ex-slave and member of the Constitutional C.O.N.V. Enton, born in slavery, said. I believe, my friends and fellow citizens, we are not prepared for this suffrage. But we can learn. Give a man tools and let him commence to use them, and in time he will learn a trade. So it is with voting. We may not understand it at the start, but in time we shall learn to do our duty. We recognize the southern white man as the true friend of the black man. You see upon that banner the words, United we stand, divided we fall, and if you could see the scroll of the society that banner represents, you would see the white man and the black man standing with their arms locked together, as the type of friendship and the union which we desire. It is not our desire to be a discordant element in the community, or to unite the poor against the rich. The white man has the land the black man has the labor, and labor is worth nothing without capital. We must help to create that capital by restoring confidence, and we can only secure confidence by electing proper men to fill our public offices. In these public affairs we must unite with our white fellow citizens. They tell us that they have been disfranchised, yet we tell the North that we shall never let the halls of Congress be silent until we remove that disability. Can we afford to lose from the councils of state? Our first men? Can we spare judges from the bench? Can we put fools or strangers in their positions? No, fellow citizens, no. Gloomy, indeed, would be that day. We want in charge of our interest only our best and ablest men. And then with a strong pull, and a long pull and a pull together, up goes South Carolina.11. Both Sumner and Stevens had encouraged the Negroes of South Carolina to seek sympathetic Southern whites as their leaders, but neither they nor others suggested any plans of union with white labor. White Carolina labor was dumb with absolutely no intelligent leadership except the planters and carpetbaggers. 12. When the convention opened, ex-Governor Orr was invited to address them. In his speech he stressed the fact that the freedmen needed education, and that they did not represent the intelligence nor wealth of the state, and he recommended limited suffrage, a homestead law and education. The plight of debtors after the losses and changes of war brought much debate in the Constitutional Convention. A white delegate advocated a three-month moratorium on debt collections, and a colored member supported the proposal. But Cardozo, a colored man, and later the treasurer of the state, said, I am opposed to the passage of this resolution. The convention should be certain of the constitutionality of their acts. The law of the United States does not allow a state to pass a law impairing the obligations of contracts. This, I think, is therefore a proper subject for the judiciary. I am heartily in favor of relief, but I wish the convention to have nothing to do with the matter. R. G. Delarge, a colored delegate, 
afterward Land Commissioner, said. It has been said in opposition to this measure, that the proposed legislation was for a certain class, however, no gentleman can rise and argue that the proposed measure is for the benefit of any specific class. I hold in my hands letters from almost every section of the state addressed to members of the convention, crying out for relief. These letters depict in strong language the impoverished condition of the people, and demand that something should be done to relieve them. I deny in toto that this is a piece of class legislation, and I believe nothing but the zeal of the members who spoke yesterday induced them to speak of it as such. It is simply a request to General Canby to relieve the necessities of a large part of the people of the state. Some members have gone farther, and said it was a shame to keep the freedmen from becoming purchasers and owners of land. It has been argued that the execution of the laws compelling the sale of the lands will benefit the poor man by affording him an opportunity to get possession of the lands. That argument, I am confident, cannot be sustained. If they are sold, they will be sold at public sale, and sold in immense tracts, just as they are at present. They will pass into the hands of the merciless speculators, who will never allow the poor man to get an inch without first drawing his life's blood in payment. The poor freedmen are the poorest of poor and unprepared to purchase lands. The poor whites are not in condition to purchase lands. The facts are, the poor class are clamoring, and their voices have been voiced far beyond the limits of South Carolina, away to the seat of the government, appealing for assistance and relief from actual starvation. The problem of the land came in for early consideration. The landless, it was felt, should be aided in the acquirement of property and the landed aristocracy discriminated against. It was proposed that Congress be petitioned to lend the state $1 million to be used in the purchase of land for the colored people, that the legislature be required to appoint a land commission, and that homesteads up to a certain value be exempt from the levy of processes. One must view this action in light of what had taken place with regard to land in South Carolina. When Northern forces captured Port Royal in November, 1861, the federal authorities took over 195 plantations and employed over 10,000 former slaves in raising cotton. Early in 1862, they imported labor superintendents from the North, and organized the enterprise. In July, 1862, Congress laid a direct tax on the land of the states in rebellion. When the absentee landholders of Port Royal failed to pay, their plantations were sold at public auction to satisfy a part of the debt of $363,570 which had been imposed upon South Carolina. Considerable other property, which was regarded as abandoned, was seized in Charleston. The lands that were auctioned off were bought largely by Northerners, although a few Negroes who had got hold of a little money from their labor bought certain plantations. On January 16, 1868, General Sherman issued his celebrated field order, No. 15. All the sea islands, from Charleston to Port Royal, and adjoining lands to the distance of 30 miles inland, were set aside for the use of the Negroes who had followed his army. General Saxton executed this order, and divided 485,000 acres of land among 40,000 Negroes. They were given, however, only possessory titles, and in the end, the government broke its implied promise and drove them off the land. In the convention, the whole matter of land for the landless came up for considerable debate. Cardozo said that he did not believe in the confiscation of property, but since slavery was gone, the plantation system must go with it. Whipper, another colored man, was more inclined to protect the interests of the planters, and reminded the members that they were representatives of all classes in the community and not simply of a particular class. This debate on the economic situation was prolonged. All contracts and liabilities for the purchase of slaves, where the money had not yet been paid, were annulled. J. J. Wright, colored, and later a state Supreme Court judge, said of this measure, I know it is said by our opponents that we are an unlawful assembly, and that we are an unconstitutional body. I know we are here under the laws of Congress, lawfully called together for the discharge of certain duties, and the repudiation of debts contracted for slaves. It is the duty of the convention to do what? 
it is our duty to destroy all elements of the institution of slavery. If we do not, we recognize the right of property in man. A homestead law to the value of $1,000 in real estate and $500 in personal property was passed. Rainey declared that Congress would probably never pass an act confiscating the land, but the other colored members, including Ransier, wanted to petition Congress for a loan of a million dollars to purchase land. A colored delegate said on this matter, My colleague presented a petition asking the Congress of the United States to appropriate one million dollars for a specific purpose to purchase homesteads for the people of South Carolina, not the colored people, as the gentleman from Barnwell has attempted to prove, but to all, irrespective of color. He has also attempted to prove that the money cannot be obtained, but has failed to carry conviction to the minds of any of the members. There is plenty of land in the state that can be purchased for $2 an acre, and 1 million will buy us 500,000 acres, cut this into small farms of 20 acres and we have 25,000 farms. Averaging 7 persons to a family that 20 acres can sustain, and we have 175,000 persons, men, women, and children, who for a million dollars will be furnished means of support, that is, one-fourth of the entire people of the state. Mr. R. C. Delarge, colored, continued on the same subject. There are over 1,000 freedmen in this state who, within the last year, purchased lands from the native whites on the same terms. We propose that the government should aid us in the purchase of more lands, to be divided into small tracts and given on the above-mentioned credit to homeless families to cultivate for their support. It is well known that in every district the freedmen are roaming from one side to the other, not because they expect to get land, but because the large landholders are not able to employ them, and will not sell their lands unless the freedmen have the cash to pay for them. These are facts that cannot be contradicted by the gentleman from Barnwell. I know one large landholder in Culloden District who had 21 freedmen working for him upon his plantation the entire year. He raised a good crop but the laborers have not succeeded in getting any reimbursement for their labor. They are now roaming to Charleston and back, trying to get remuneration for their services. We propose to give them lands, and to place them in a position by which they will be enabled to sustain themselves. In doing this, we will add to the depleted treasury of the state, and the large plantation system of the country will be broken up. The large plantation will be divided into small farms giving support to more people and yielding more taxes to the state. It will bring out the whole resources of the state. I desire it to be distinctly understood that I do not advocate this measure simply for the benefit of my own race. After much discussion by various white members on the same subject, Mr. F. L. Cardozo, colored, voiced the thought of colored men who demanded that the government furnish land for the freedmen. The poor freedmen were induced, by many congressmen even, to expect confiscation. They held out the hope of confiscation. General Sherman did confiscate, gave the lands to the freedmen, and if it were not for President Johnson, they would have them now. The hopes of the freedmen have not been realized, and I do not think that asking for a loan of one million, to be paid by a mortgage upon the land, will be half as bad as has been supposed. I have been told by the assistant commissioner that he has been doing on a private scale what this petition proposes. I say every opportunity of helping the colored people should be seized upon. I think the adoption of this measure should be seized upon. We should certainly vote for some measure of relief for the colored men, as we have to the white men who mortgaged their property to perpetuate slavery, and whom they have liberated from their bonds. Mr. W. J. Whipper, colored, was more conservative and only wanted protection from immediate monopoly. The present owners will be compelled before long to sell portions of their land, and sell them to freedmen or whoever can pay for them. But if sold now, they will be sold in large bodies, or large tracts, so that nobody but a capitalist will be able to buy. This demand for land was characterized as demagoguery by the property holders, but land was, as many speakers suggested, the economic means of raising the level of the electorate. A petition was passed by a great majority, asking Congress to appropriate funds for buying land. But Senator Wilson replied that this was impractical, and the convention, thereupon, created a state commission for buying lands and selling them to the freedmen. 
the convention attacked race discrimination squarely. A colored man, Dr. B. F. Randolph, offered the following amendment, distinction on account of race or color in any case whatever shall be prohibited, and all classes of citizens, irrespective of race and color, shall enjoy all common, equal, and political privileges. He said. It is, doubtless, the impression of the members of the convention that the Bill of Rights as it stands secures perfect political and legal equality to all the people of South Carolina. It is a fact, however, that nowhere is it laid down in the instrument, emphatically and definitely, that all the people of the state, irrespective of race and color, shall enjoy equal privileges. Our forefathers were no doubt anti-slavery men, and they intended that slavery should die out. Consequently, the word color is not to be found in the Constitution or Declaration of Independence. On the contrary, it stated all men are created free and equal. In our Bill of Rights, I want to settle the question forever by making the meaning so plain that a wayfaring man, though a fool, cannot misunderstand it. The majority of the people of South Carolina, who are rapidly becoming property holders, are colored citizens the descendants of the African race who have been ground down by 300 years of degradation, and now that the opportunity is afforded, let them be protected by their political rights. The words proposed as an amendment were not calculated to create distinction, but to destroy distinction, and since the Bill of Rights did not declare equality, irrespective of race or color, it was important that they should be inserted. Thus, discriminations of race and color were abolished by the Constitution, and practical application was attempted in the case of the public schools, and the militia. The Convention framed the most liberal provisions for the right of suffrage that any of the Southern Constitutions provided. They did not attempt, as in Virginia, Alabama, and Mississippi, to restrict the voting of whites further than was provided by the Reconstruction Acts. Indeed, Whipper, a colored delegate, wished to petition Congress to remove all political disabilities from the white citizens. In this Cardozo and Nash agreed, and the motion was passed. Of course, they made no distinction in race and color. The rights of women were enlarged. The property of married women could not be sold for their husband's debts, and for the first time in its history, the state was given a divorce law. Education was discussed at length, and a free common school system voted for. It is sufficient to say here that for the first time the fundamental law of the state carried the obligation of universal education and demanded the creation of a school system like that of northern states. Point 13. Nothing that the convention did aroused more opposition among property-holding whites. In the first place, as a white woman told a northern teacher, I do assure you that you might as well try to teach your horse or mule to read as to teach these niggers 14. In the second place, the whites calculated that the school system would cost $900,000 a year, and that the new taxation would fall upon them. In the debate on the school system, there was not a moment's hesitation, but there was considerable difference of opinion as to whether education should be made compulsory or not. R. C. Delarge, colored, said in the debate, The schools may be open to all, but to declare that parents shall send their children to them whether they are willing or not is, in my judgment, going a step beyond the bounds of prudence. Is there any logic or reason in inserting in the Constitution a provision which cannot be enforced? Mr. A. J. Rancier, colored, said. I am sorry to differ with my colleague from Charleston on this question. I contend that in proportion to the education of the people so is their progress in civilization. Believing this, I believe that the committee has properly provided for the compulsory education of all children in this state between the ages named in the section. Mr. J. A. Chestnut, colored, spoke on separation in schools. Has not this convention the right to establish a free school system for the poorer classes? Then if there be a hostile disposition among the whites, an unwillingness to send their children to school, the fault is their own, not ours. Look at the idle youth around us. Is the sight not enough to invigorate every man with a desire to do something to remove this vast weight of ignorance that presses the masses down? I have no desire to curtail the privileges of freedmen, but when we look at the opportunities neglected, even by the whites of South Carolina, I must confess that I am more than ever disposed to compel parents, 
especially of my own race, to send their children to school. If the whites object to it, let it be so. Mr. F. L. Cardozo said. It was argued by some yesterday with some considerable weight that we should do everything in our power to incorporate in the Constitution all possible measures that will conciliate those opposed to us. No one would go further in conciliating others than I would. But we should be careful of what we do to conciliate. In the first place, there is an element that is opposed to us no matter what we do, which will never be conciliated. It is not that they are opposed so much to the Constitution we may frame, but they are opposed to us sitting in the Convention. Their objection is of such a radical and fundamental nature, that any attempt to frame a Constitution to please them would be abortive. In the next place, there are those who are doubtful, and gentlemen here say if we frame a Constitution to suit these parties, they will come over to our side. They are only waiting to see whether or not it will be successful. Then there is the third class who honestly question our capacity to frame a Constitution. I respect that class, and believe if we do justice to them, laying our cornerstone on a sure foundation of Republican government and liberal principles, the intelligence of that class will be conciliated, and they are worthy of conciliation. Before I proceed to discuss the question, I want to divest it of all false issue of the imaginary consequences that some gentlemen have illogically thought will result from the adoption of this section with the word compulsory. They affirm that it compels the attendance of both white and colored children in the same schools. There is nothing of the kind in the section. It simply says that all the children shall be educated, but how, it is left with the parents to decide. It is left to the parent to say whether the child should be sent to a public or private school. There can be separate schools for white and colored. It is left so that if any colored child wishes to go to a white school, it shall have the privilege of doing so. I have no doubt, in most localities colored people will prefer separate schools, particularly until some of the present prejudice against their race is removed. The committee proposed that persons coming of age after 1875 must be able to read and write before voting, but Cardozo opposed it because he said it would take more than 10 years and a great deal of money to complete the system, and he wanted to extend the time to 1890. Three other colored members spoke against any qualification, and it was, therefore, stricken out. To bridge over the interval before the state school system could be installed, Mr. B. F. Randolph, colored, presented the following petition, which was referred to the Committee on Miscellaneous Provisions of the Constitution We, the undersigned, people of South Carolina, in convention assembled, do hereby recommend that the Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen and Abandoned Lands be continued until the restoration of civil authority, that then a Bureau of Education be established, in order that an efficient system of schools be established. Perhaps the convention's achievement of greatest permanent importance was the reform of local and judicial administration. Point 15. Judicial circuits were to be called counties, and some new counties were arranged. A court of probate was established in each county, and justices of the peace were given wider jurisdiction. Judges were to be elected, instead of appointed, and in spite of much criticism, the new system worked well. From 1870 to 1877, the Supreme Court was composed of a Negro, a native Southerner, and a Northerner. Its administration was fair and its decisions just. Most of the circuit judges were native whites and honest men. Mixed juries were the rule, and no fault was found with them. They did not hesitate to convict colored prisoners. The trial judges came in for the greatest criticism. Among them were numbers of ignorant and unqualified persons, and there were a good deal of misappropriation of fees and costs. On the other hand, it was difficult to get proper trial judges, because so many qualified whites refused to serve. Right, the Negro who was on the Supreme Court, was the first colored man admitted to the bar in Pennsylvania. He had been connected with the Freedmen's Bureau, then became a member of the Constitutional Convention, and a state senator. He was elected to the bench in February, 1870, to fill out an unexpired term, and was re-elected in December, 1870, for the full term. He resigned under Hampton in August, 1877. 
Although he lisped, Wright was a good speaker, decidedly intelligent, and generally said to be the best fitted colored man in the state for the position. Some reforms were made in the county government. Most of the officers were to be elected by popular vote, and boards of commissioners were appointed for the highways, and for collection and disbursement of taxes. Some of the delegates wanted to legislate concerning wages, which caused great indignation among the planters. It was suggested, for instance, that planters be required to pay back wages from the time of the issue of the Emancipation Proclamation, and that the division of one half of the crop for tenant farmers be made compulsory. Such legislation was inherently just and reasonable but fifty years too early for public opinion in any modern country. Among other things, the Constitution abolished imprisonment for debt, and dueling, and did away with property qualifications for voting or holding office. The colored members, despite their inexperience, gave evidence, here and there, of care and thrift. For instance, when the question of the pay of members of the convention came up, a discussion arose. Mr. L. S. Langley moved that the pay per diem of $12 in bills receivable be laid on the table. J. J. Wright moved that $10 be inserted. N. G. Parker, White, moved to fix the pay at $11. C. P. Leslie, Colored, demurred. I desire to say a word before that resolution be passed, and be put right on record. I am perfectly willing to receive $3 per day in greenbacks for my services. I think that some all they are worth, and further, if I got any more, it would be so much more than I have been in the habit of receiving, I might possibly go on a spree and lose the whole of it. Now I ask any of the delegates in this body if they were called upon to pay a similar body of men out of their pockets, how much they would be willing to pay each member. I will stake my existence on it they would not pay more than $1.50 per day to each member. I want to be recorded as always being opposed to a high tariff, but not against any reasonable compensation. But this $8 or $9 a day, when we consider all the surroundings and conditions of the people, looks too much like a fraud. The new Constitution for South Carolina was adopted by the Convention in April, 1868. It was eventually adopted by the people 70,000 voting for it, 27,000 against it, and 35,000 abstaining. The Constitution was written in good English and was an excellent document, embodying some of the best legal principles of the age. In letter it was as good as any other Constitution the state has ever had, or as most American states had at that time. This assertion is supported by the practical endorsement which a subsequent generation of South Carolinians gave it, the conservative whites were content to live under it for 18 years after they recovered control of the state government, and when in 1895 they met to make a new constitution, the document they produced had many of the features of the constitution of 1868.16. It was not, of course, an original document, either in form or wording but copied largely from northern state models. But colored men discussed it, amended it, and voted for its adoption. They shared in the capacity and thought that made it. A convention of whites held in Columbia April 2, condemned the Constitution, as the work of sixty-odd Negroes, many of them ignorant and depraved, together with fifty white men, outcasts of northern society, and southern renegades, betrayers of their race and country. Its franchise provisions were declared to be designed to further the ambitions of mean whites, its judicial system repugnant to our customs and habits of thought, the homestead provision a snare and deceit, and the stupendous school arrangement a fruitful source of peculent corruption. Here spoke capital, land, and privilege against white and black labor. In the spring of 1868, the Fairfield Herald declared the revolution the maddest, most unscrupulous and infamous revolution in history, which has snatched the power from the hands of the race which settled the country, and transferred it to its former slaves, an ignorant and feeble race 17. Indeed, the criticism here was just as boundless and intemperate as that directed later toward the expenditures of the legislature, only in this case we have the evidence of the Constitution itself to show how excellent a document it was. The economic revolution which Reconstruction involved overshadowed and guided all thought and action. 
usury laws had been repealed by the planters in 1866, and rates of interest rose to 25 and 30 per center. Banks commonly charged from 18 to 24 per center. The owners of land and property, the persons of intelligence and social prestige, despite their partial impoverishment of the war, were strong and well organized. They put the whole blame on abolition of slavery, enfranchisement of labor, and refusal of black men to work under essentially the same conditions as formerly. But colored Congressman Rainey of South Carolina well said in the 42nd Congress, If the country there is impoverished, it has certainly not been caused by the fault of those who love the Union, but it is simply the result of a disastrous war madly waged against the best government known to the world. The murder of unarmed men and the maltreating of helpless women can never make restitution for the losses which are the simple inevitable consequence of the rebellion. The faithfulness of my race during the entire war, in supporting and protecting the families of their masters, speaks volumes in their behalf as to the real kindliness of their feelings toward the white people of the South. Point 18. South Carolina property had been valued in 1860 at $489,319,218. All the capital in slaves was lost, but the remainder was $278,116,128. This shrank to $90,888,436 in 1866. In 1870, the property of South Carolina was assessed at $183,913,337. Besides this, millions were lost in bank stocks, endowments, and investments. One newspaper estimated that the gross property values shrank from $400 million in 1860 to $50 million in 1865. Of course, much of this was guesswork. The values of 1860 were inflated, the values of 1865 to 1870, perhaps unduly depressed. The builders of the new state wanted to make taxes uniform and, therefore, provided for a revaluation of lands and improvements. A committee was appointed to investigate the financial status, and the new school system, which was expected to be the largest item of expense, a splendid commentary upon the new spirit which had arisen in the state, was guaranteed an annual levy on all property and a poll tax. The property holders wanted to limit state indebtedness and prevent the legislature from extending credit to private corporations, but these suggestions were not approved of. The convention had a vision of prosperity, and they wanted railroads, schools and poorhouses, and a distribution of land. In a progressive age, said Judge Wright, the legislature must do its part, and the responsibility of that body to the people was sufficient check against extravagance 19. A committee of property holders was alarmed, and estimated that it would cost $2,230,950 annually to run the state, instead of $350,000, which had sufficed before the war. This was true, but when later the expenditure of the state reached this sum, these same people complained that the expenditure must on its face be fraudulent. Singularly enough, it is conveniently forgotten that a good proportion of the white officials of South Carolina during Reconstruction were not Northerners, but Southerners, and several of them had served in the Confederate Army. Moses, who became Governor, Robertson, United States Senator, and Neagle, Controller, and former Confederate officer, were Southern white men. Bowen, a congressman, while born in the North, had lived in Georgia before the war, and served as captain in the Confederate Army. Of the white Northerners, Chamberlain, shrewd and able, but not overscrupulous, was the leader. Among the others were Scott, well-meaning but not a strong governor, the pliable Parker, inefficient state treasurer, and Patterson, who bribed his way to defeat a Negro for the United States Senate. The first governor, under the new regime, was Robert K. Scott, born in Pennsylvania, a colonel of Union troops during the war, and assistant commissioner of the Freedmen's Bureau. Scott faced great difficulties, and is generally conceded to have been a well-meaning man. A well-born native Southern white was Franklin J. Moses, J.R. His father had been a prominent South Carolinian, 
senator before the war, and was respected by all people. Moses married the daughter of a distinguished southerner, was private secretary to one of the former governors, and became a lawyer and an editor in favor of Johnson's Reconstruction. When the Reconstruction Acts were passed he went over to the side of the carpetbaggers and Negroes, he took a prominent part in the Constitutional Convention, and afterward became Speaker of the House, and in 1872, Governor. He was denounced as unscrupulous and dishonest, and extravagant in his manner of living. The colored leaders formed a very interesting group. Francis L. Cardozo was free-born of Negro, Jewish and Indian descent. He was educated at the University of Glasgow, and in London, and went to New Haven, where he served as a Presbyterian minister. After the war, he came to Charleston and was principal of Avery Institute. He was Secretary of State during 1868-1872, and Treasurer of the State during 1872-1876. He was a handsome, well-groomed man, with cultivated manners, and honest in official life. He was accused in several instances, but no dishonest act was ever proven against him. Joseph H. Rainey was the first Negro to represent South Carolina in the House of Representatives. Robert Brown Elliott, born in Massachusetts, was educated at Eden College, in England. He was a first-rate lawyer, served in the legislature, and was twice elected to Congress. He had a commanding presence, and a fine gift of oratory. Richard A. Cain was a leader, and afterward bishop in the AME Church. His paper, The Missionary Record, was the most influential Negro paper in South Carolina. He served in the Senate and two terms in Congress. Robert C. Delarge was a tailor from Charleston, and had been an agent in the Freedmen's Bureau. He served in the legislature, and while his education was limited, he had large influence. Beverly Nash had been a slave before the war, and afterward a waiter. When grown he learned to read and write, and became an earnest and hard-working leader. Alonzo J. Ransier was elected lieutenant governor in 1870. He was a free Negro, and became a member of the Constitutional Convention of the Legislature, and auditor of Charleston County. In 1872, he went to Congress. He made a good presiding officer of the State Senate, being dignified and alert. Richard H. Gleaves was lieutenant governor in 1872-1876. He was from Pennsylvania, and had acted as probate judge. He was intelligent and knew parliamentary law. Samuel J. Lee was a Negro Speaker of the House, in 1872-1874. He was born in the state, worked as a farmer and laborer in lumber mills, and was self-educated. He was polished and a good lawyer. Stephen A. Swales, a colored man of Pennsylvania, was a Union soldier, and school teacher. He became a senator, and was known for his integrity and ability as a speaker. Robert Smalls was the one who stole the Confederate ship planter and delivered it to the Union authorities. He was self-educated and popular. He was a member of Congress until after Reconstruction. These men were all poor and doubtless some of them accepted bribes and shared in graft but very few of them were thoroughly venal or purchasable against their convictions. When it came to personal favors or sharing in gifts and gains which followed legislation of which they honestly approved, some of them were certainly approachable. Negroes were conspicuous members of the legislatures. There was a large proportion of former slaves, and at first perhaps two-thirds of them could not write, but by 1871, most of them had learned at least to read and write. Many of them were speakers of force and eloquence, while others were silent or crude. In the Senate, it was said that some of the colored members spoke exceedingly well, with great ease and grace of manners. Others, were awkward and coarse. Point twenty. One observer recorded that the President of the Senate and the Speaker of the House, both colored, were elegant and accomplished men, highly educated who would have creditably presided over any Commonwealth's legislative assembly. The majority of the voters of the state were Negroes, and in every session but one that race had a majority in the legislature. They outnumbered, and in many cases outshone, their carpetbag and scalawag contemporaries. Point 21. 
In the first legislature there were 127 members, of whom 87 were colored, and 40 white. According to the available figures, the composition of Reconstruction legislatures in South Carolina seems to have been as follows 22. It will be seen from these figures that the white members of the legislature, from their control of the Senate, were always able to block Negro legislators, and that Negro control of the legislature was only possible because most of the white senators voted with the Negroes. In the legislature of 1874, the whites had a majority in both houses. It can hardly be said, therefore, that the Negroes of South Carolina had absolute control of the state at any time. The economic status of the legislature of 1870-1871 is shown by their given occupations, 10 lawyers, 31 farmers, 9 physicians, 17 clergymen, 12 teachers, 16 planters, 13 merchants, 3 merchant tailors, 3 clerks, 2 masons, 8 builders, 1 engineer, 1 marble dealer, 8 carpenters, 2 hotel keepers, 1 druggist, 1 bookkeeper, 1 wheelwright, 4 coachmakers, 1 tanner, 2 mechanics, 1 chemist, 1 auditor, 1 hatter, 1 blacksmith, 1 tailor. The state sent 7 Negroes to Congress, made 2 of them lieutenant governors, and for 4 years, 2 of them were speakers of the House. One was Secretary of State and Treasurer of the State. Another was Adjutant and Inspector General. These men were of various colors and mixtures of blood, and there was a good deal of difference of opinion, as to whether the mulattoes or the full-blooded blacks were superior. But one observer asserted that the colored men generally were superior in decency and ability to the majority of the native white radical legislators 23 and another said that the quadroons and octoroons of the Senate are infinitely superior in personal appearance to their white Yankee and native compeers 24. Most of these men had been slaves, although a few of them were well educated. They had ability, and in some cases, more than ordinary ability. But above all, they were in the midst of a mighty social and economic change, and were swayed by the social and political revolution around them. The bottom rail was on the top, and the former ruling oligarchy was now displaced by those who represented neither the wealth nor the traditions of the state. The bitterness of this campaign against the Reconstruction governments was almost inconceivable. One unfamiliar with the situation would think the editors and their correspondents had gone crazy with anger or were obsessed with some fearful mania. So great was the ridicule, contempt and obloquy showered upon the representatives of the state. With the deepest scorn for a scalawag, with all the southern hatred for an adventuring Yankee, and with either sympathy or shame for the ignorant, misled Negro, the press, the aristocracy, the poor whites, the upcountry, the low country all with one voice protested against the unlawful assembly in Columbia maintained in power, they said, by the federal bayonet. The Fairfield Herald battled against the hell-born policy which has trampled the fairest and noblest states of our great sisterhood beneath the unholy hoofs of African savages and shoulder-strapped brigands the policy which has given up millions of our free-born, high-souled brethren and sisters, countrymen and countrywomen of Washington, Rutledge, Marion, and Lee, to the rule of gibbering, Laocedon, devil-worshipping barbarians, from the jungles of Dahomey, and peripatetic buccaneers from Cape Cod, Memphremagog, Hell, and Boston. Point 25. A new system of taxation came in with the Reconstruction government. It provided for a uniform rate of assessment on all property at its full value. This was a departure from the system previous to the war, which put a low valuation on land and slaves and heavy taxation on merchants, professions, and banking. The merchant before the war paid five or six times as great a rate of taxation as the planter. In 1859, the total tax value of lands in the state was $10,257,000, while lots and buildings in Charleston were valued at $22,274,000. The tax on all the land of the state averaged less than 5 cents an acre in 1860. When the new system came in, it was difficult to find persons to administer it and every landholder objected to it. The new system met all sorts of opposition from unsympathetic administrators and the newspapers of the state. 
Governor Scott expected $300 million worth of property as a basis of taxation, but less than $115 million were returned. This the Board of Equalization raised to $180 million. As the assessments decreased, the rate of taxation increased. The total assessment in 1869 was $181 million, and in 1877, under Hampton, $101 million. As the average rate of taxes rose, the property holders said that the Negro government wanted to raise taxes so as to confiscate the land. The new government could not collect the tax levied. It met an organized and bitter boycott of property. In 1868, $175,688 of assessed tax was uncollected, in 1869, $248,165, and in 1870, $524,026 a total of nearly a million dollars in three years. Part of this delinquency was due to real poverty, but part was due to deliberate obstruction on the part of property holders. Taxation had to be increased to cover delinquency and to meet new expenses. In 1860, Taxation on a half billion of property was $1,280,383, in 1870, $2,767,675 was assessed on $183 million. The increase of taxation was partly accounted for by gradually increased expenditures for education, construction, and charitable institutions. At the same time, the inflation of the currency makes comparison with conditions previous to the war difficult. More money was certainly raised by the state during Reconstruction. But, on the other hand, a much larger proportion of the expenditures was designed to aid the laboring poor, and did aid them largely. Indeed, it might have changed the whole economic position of the proletariat if it had been efficiently and honestly expended. In the legislature in 1868, the free common school system was organized temporarily, and permanently in 1870. Relief was extended to various classes of citizens, especially poor laborers. In 1868 and 1869, an act was passed providing for a land commissioner, who was to act under a board. Land was to be purchased in various parts of the state and was to be sold in plots of not less than 25 and not more than 100 acres to actual settlers. $200,000 worth of bonds were provided to finance this proposal, and later this was increased to $500,000. The land commissioner was to hold office at the pleasure of an advisory board, consisting of chief state officers. One of the chief sources of corruption in nearly all the reconstructed states was railroad building. And the reasons for this are easily misconceived because of the changed economic status of railroads today. It must be remembered that at the beginning throughout the country and the world, the railroad was a public highway, and for this reason a public enterprise toward whose building and maintenance the public rightly contributed. It was only after the railroad was built and established by public funds, that private interests monopolized it and sequestered its income to make individual millionaires. In the South, the railroads had lagged. The planters would not submit to public taxation, and they would not divert funds from their private luxury consumption, in order to furnish capital. South Carolina was particularly a case in point. Charleston, by all rules of commerce, should have been one of the great ports of the United States. It was a gateway to the West, it should have at least connected its own uplands with the coast, and it might have tapped the West through Cincinnati and the Great Cotton Belt through the southern south. But efforts toward this end before the war had but small success. It was perfectly natural that the first thought of those who were reconstructing the state should turn toward railroad building as a means of economic rehabilitation. The usual method was the old one of loaning credit of the state. It meant, not that the state invested money, but simply that the state permitted the issue of bonds and guaranteed the payment of interest and principal. On a sound economic proposition, conducted by honest men, this was simply a way of securing private capital for a semi-public enterprise, which would greatly increase the prosperity of the state. 
Railway mileage in South Carolina had increased from 289 to 973, between 1850 to 1860. By 1865, there were 1,007 miles. Then construction practically stopped, an effort was turned toward rebuilding the railroads and giving them new equipment. The difficulty was that a flock of cormorants whose business was cheating and manipulation in the issue and sale of bonds and other certificates of enterprise, moved first west and then south, and took charge of railroad promotion. They were largely northern financiers, in some cases already discredited in the centers of finance and driven out of the overworked investment fields north and west. They came south with an address and a technique which only trained, experienced, and honest administrators could have withstood. They flaunted the chances of quick and easy money before the faces of ruined planters, small northern investors, and the few Negroes who had some little capital. The result was widespread graft, debt, and corruption in South Carolina and North Carolina, in Florida and Georgia, in Louisiana, and in other states. There was, however, in the reorganization, for instance, of the Greenville and Columbia Railroad, nothing worse than the ordinary stock jobbing enterprise common all over the nation, and prominent Southerners, like ex-Governor Orr and J.P. Reed, were concerned in it. Instead of concentrating efforts on the rebuilding of the railroad and its equipment, most of the time and energy was spent in seeking to market stock in New York. This failed and the road was bankrupt by the end of the Reconstruction era just as it was at the beginning. In the same way, the Blue Ridge Road, backed not only by carpetbaggers but by leading white Southerners, was prostrate after the war and sued for state aid. The legislature authorized aid in 1868, but the contract for rebuilding demanded much more money than the bonds provided for. Eventually the road was sold to a private company composed as usual not only of carpetbaggers but of planters. Matters were so manipulated that a state contingent liability of $4 million of bonds was transmuted into an actual state indebtedness of $1,800,000. Again little was done actually to restore the road, and the company went into bankruptcy. Thus in most cases, bankrupt corporations bequeathed to the reconstruction regime by antebellum organizers, came before the legislature to secure capital for rebuilding and then fell into the hands of speculators who tried to make money out of the stock, rather than out of the rebuilding of the road, and these speculators were largely men trained in shady finance in Wall Street, and helped by much of the best element of the Southerners in South Carolina, as well as by the new carpet bag. Capitalists This was a difficult situation, calling for blame and criticism, but to place the blame of it mainly upon the Negro voter and the Negro laborer is a fantastic distortion of the truth. The money misused went primarily to northern promoters and southern white administrators. And while, of course, a poverty-stricken electorate was gripped and bribed by such organized thieves, the remedy for this was not the disfranchisement of labor but its education, and such an increased share of the product of industry as to make life livable, without theft or sale of soul. The appropriations to meet the new expenses had to grow. The fact is that South Carolina had been a state absolutely dominated by landed property. It is said that the antebellum state was ruled by 180 great landlords. They had made the functions of the state just as few as possible, and did by private law and on private plantations most of the things which in other states were carried on by the local and state governments. The economic revolution, therefore, which universal suffrage envisaged for this state, was perhaps greater than in any other southern state. It was for this reason that the right of the masses to vote was so bitterly assailed, and expenditures for the new functions of the state denounced as waste and extravagance. The result of all this had to be increased taxation. The rate of taxation in 1868 to 1872 was 9 mills, in 1872 to 1876 over 11 mills. Yet this was excessive only by comparison with the past and because of recent severe losses. In northern states, like Illinois, Massachusetts, New York, and Pennsylvania, the average was 21 one half mills on the dollar. The grip of poverty was on the South and poverty always is felt most poignantly by those to whom poverty has been unknown. The planters, used to ease and a certain degree of luxury, were the ones that felt the new poverty as a terrible, heaven-shattering thing. 
they looked upon any action as justifiable if it restored to them the income which they had lost. On the other hand, both the poor whites and the Negroes were not only poverty-stricken, but, for that reason, peculiarly susceptible to petty graft and bribery. Economically, they had always been stripped bare, a little cash was a curiosity, and a few dollars a fortune. The sale of their votes and political influence was therefore, from the first, simply a matter of their knowledge and conception of what the vote was for and what it could procure. With experience, their conception of its value rose until some of them conceived the idea of making the ballot a power by which they could change their social and economic status, and live like human beings. But before most of them rose to this conception, there were thousands to whom their vote and petty office holding were simply a means of adding to their small incomes. And when one considers that this was a day when the line between using political power for personal advantage and using it for social uplift was dim and difficult to follow throughout the whole nation, the wonder is that the labor vote of South Carolina so easily ranged itself behind the new school system, the orphanages, the land distribution, and the movements toward reform in public efficiency. The ascendancy of property over labor and the suffrage was in this day openly maintained by bribery, and if this had been uncommon in the pre-war South, it was simply because universal suffrage had not been established and capital ruled by social sanction rather than by money. In the new situation, property began systematically to attack labor in two ways, first, it deliberately encouraged extravagance, graft and bribery, so as to hasten the downfall of the labor regime. And secondly, it utterly upset the credit of the state, so as to prevent the new state from importing capital. The failure of taxation to raise the required revenue compelled the state to borrow, and here it fell into the hands of northern money sharks and southern repudiators. The state debt October 1, 1867, was $8,378,255. The Constitutional Convention of 1868 repudiated $3 million of this as a Confederate debt, and made the total debt $5,407,306. From this beginning, the state debt increased to $10,665,908 in 1871, while committees claimed that there was evidence of total liabilities outstanding to the amount of 15 or even 30 millions. The exact amount of the debt was not known, the figures from the reports of the treasurer, controller general, and financial agent did not agree, and it was claimed by the opposition press and even by some of the state officials that there were large issues of fraudulent bonds on the market, and that certain of the state officials had profited thereby. While the conservative press continually reviled the radical government, on no topic was it so prolific or bitter as that of finances and taxation. Point 26. The total debt, bonded and contingent, seems to have been 1,860 $12,027,090 1,865 15,892,940 1,868 14,896,040 1,871 22,480,914. In this case, the total indebtedness in 1,871 is not clear. The governor's report makes it a little less than 12 million, but the investigation committee insists that because the state government had printed and issued certain bonds, the amount of which was not definitely known, it was possible that the state might eventually be liable for $30 million. This did not mean, as many assume, that the state officials received or squandered any such sums. The methods by which small amounts of actual cash received became a paper debt of huge amounts is explained in the governor's special message of January 9, 1865. In the fall of 1868, I visited New York City for the purpose of borrowing money on the credit of the state on coupon bonds, under the provisions of the Acts of August 26, 1868. I had the assistance of Mr. H. H. Kimpton, United States Senator F. A. Sawyer, and Mr. George S. Cameron. I called at several of the most prominent banking houses to effect the negotiation of the required loan, and they refused to advance any money upon our state securities, 
before those securities had been already branded with the threat of a speedy repudiation by the political opponents of the administration, who have ever since howled the same cry against the state credit. As the persons who made this threat controlled the press of the state, they were enabled to impress capitalists abroad with the false idea of a speedy reaction that would soon place them again in authority. As the capitalists well knew that these persons when in power in 1862 did repudiate their debts due northern creditors, their distrust of our bonds was very natural and apparently well founded. It soon became evident to every man familiar with our financial standing in New York that to negotiate the loan authorized, the question was not what we would take for the bonds, but what we could get for them. After much effort, and the most judicious management, I succeeded in borrowing money through Mr. Cameron, at the rate of $4 in bonds for $1 in currency, the bonds being rated at 75 per cent or below their PAR value Oregon at 25 cents on the dollar. This loan, however, was only effected at the extravagant rate of 1 one half per cent per month, or 18 per cent or a year a rate only demanded on the most doubtful paper, to cover what is deemed a great risk for the money loaned. Subsequent loans were effected at a higher valuation of the bonds, but at the rates of interest varying from 15 to 20 per cent or in addition to commissions necessarily to be paid the financial agent. If, then, $3,200,000 in money has cost the state $9,514,000 in bonds, it does not, therefore, follow that the financial board has criminally conspired against the credit of the state, and still less that any one member of the board can justly be held up to public execration or stigmatized by an accusation of high crimes and misdemeanors for the assumed results of its action. It is proper that I should add that the armed violence which has prevailed in this state for the past three years has had upon our bonds the same effect as actual war in lessening their purchasing value, as money is dearer in war than in peace. Ku Kluxism made capitalists shrink from touching the bonds of this state as a man would shrink from touching a pestilential body. Point 27. If there were outstanding in 1874 20 or even 30 millions of evidences of debt, it is unlikely that this represented more than 10 millions in actual cash delivered, and all monies collected and paid beyond that were not the stealing necessarily of South Carolinians, white or black, but the financial graft of Wall Street and its agents, made possible by the slander and reaction of the planters. The rise of a group of a people is not a simultaneous shift of the whole mass, it is a continuous differentiation of individuals with inner strife and differences of opinion, so that individuals, groups and classes begin to appear seeking higher levels, groping for better ways, uniting with other like-minded bodies and movements. Every indication of this was present among Negroes during Reconstruction times. There was not a single reform movement, a single step toward protest, a single experiment for betterment in which Negroes were not found in varying numbers. The protest against corruption and inefficiency in South Carolina had in every case Negro adherents and in many cases Negro leaders. The responsibility of Negroes for the government of South Carolina in Reconstruction was necessarily limited. They helped choose the elected officials and furnished a large number of the members of the legislature. But most of the administrative power was in the hands of the whites and these were either northerners, who had come south as officers or officials or to invest money, or native southerners, both aristocrats and poor whites, who had undertaken to guide the Negro vote. As a majority of the electorate, Negroes were responsible for the officials elected, but their choice was limited. They had among themselves a few notable leaders, some educated in the north, a few educated southern Negroes, and other southern Negroes with little formal education but much hard sense. Three groups gradually formed themselves among the whites, those like General Orr, who represented the planters and who were willing to accept Negro suffrage as a fact, others, like Wade Hampton, proposed to control the Negro vote, but to control it in the interest of the planters, and eventually to limit it in various ways. Then, there was a third party led by men like B. F. Perry, who wanted to exclude the Negro entirely from the ballot and do this as soon as possible, frankly on lines of race and color. Perry feared a union of poor whites and Negroes, and saw in this a menace of proletarian revolution and an attack on property. 
I greatly fear there are many white persons in South Carolina who will vote for a convention under the hope of its repudiating the indebtedness of the state. This class may influence the Negro vote to unite with them, and then, in return, they can unite with the Negro in parceling out the lands of the state. One step leads to another, stay law first repudiation next, and then follows a division of lands and an equal appropriation of property amongst all persons. And last of all, the honest, hard-working, industrious, and prudent class must support the idle, dissipated, extravagant and roguish class. Point 28. It was this last group that eventually dominated and transported to South Carolina the Mississippi plan of overthrowing the Negro vote by brute force. The path of black leaders under these circumstances was exceedingly difficult. Many Negroes of importance, such as Rainey, Lomax, and King, openly attacked the course of Republican administration. R. H. King formed a Negro reform movement and said, we would favor to send to the legislature honest mechanics and farmers whose minds are not biased by chicanery, at any rate, have honest men who are identified with prosperity and the people's interest. But on the other hand, most Negroes were afraid of combination with the white planters, who clearly would disfranchise them if they had the chance. As the state debt increased, a taxpayers convention met in Columbia in May, 1871, with 30 counties represented and a few Negro delegates. It protested against the increase in the public debt and the high taxation, and attacked the financial legislation. It warned persons not to buy bonds or obligations issued by the present state government because the property holders were not adequately represented in the legislature. Several Negroes were members of this convention, and the same year leading Negroes, including DeLarge, Nash, and Robert Smalls, tried to form a new political party. It was admitted that there were abuses which needed reformation, but, on the whole, the Republican Party was gratified at the result of the Taxpayers' Convention. A joint committee of the legislature made an examination of the financial condition of the state in 1871. This extended over several months. It declared that the total bonded debt of the state was $15,767,908. This joint committee denounced the state officials, the land commission and the financial agent. An attempt was made to impeach Scott and Parker, the treasurer, and it was charged that they bribed members of the legislature to stop the proceedings. In this way, doubt was spread upon the validity of much of the bonded debt, and the credit of the state was almost entirely destroyed. There was no money in the treasury and no way of meeting expenses. Northern capitalists were warned repeatedly about taking the bonds. With all this went undoubted efforts to improve the state, an orphan asylum was authorized in 1869, the poor of the state were provided for in 1870, and this system was kept after the whites came into power. An institution for the deaf, dumb, and blind was started in 1871. It lasted until 1873, and then the faculty resigned because they were ordered to accept colored students. A lunatic asylum was provided and colored patients admitted. Casting aside all questions of race and forgetting temporarily its setting among a severely defeated and hostile people, but bearing in mind the uniqueness of this new experiment, an experiment of universal education among persons unaccustomed to such, this free public school system, and this relief for unfortunates, transformed the role of the poor whites in the educational and political history of South Carolina, and inculcated in the hearts of the blacks a vision which the citizenry of the world must admire. Point 29. In 1872, the Republican Party split, Moses ran for governor, while the Reform Republicans nominated Chamberlain. Negroes were on both tickets. Moses, a white Southerner with aristocratic connections, one in his administration was the most corrupt of the Reconstruction period. Negroes were alarmed and despite the risk to their status, turned toward reform. They saw that it was not enough to vote, they must exercise greater control over administration of affairs. Moses was eventually criminally indicted while in office, but he escaped conviction on a technical point. Since his retirement from executive cares, 
ex-Governor Moses' adventures and financial exploits in northern cities have furnished the local reporters of police courts with not a few disgraceful items. Had it not been for the southern men of this and the Swepson type men of high social standing, and they were in every reconstructed state, the northern adventurers would have been far less successful in their spoliations. Point 30. A second taxpayers' convention met in February, 1874. The legislature replied to its charges, that the cost of government had increased only 38 cents per capita. It said that appropriations for schools, lunatic asylums, penitentiaries and orphan asylums had been increased, while the public debt had been increased only about $5 million, and that the taxpayers' convention was composed of the former ruling class which wanted to regain power. The effort of Negroes at reform was severely and definitely handicapped by the attitude of the whites. If they joined with the whites in reform, they joined a party which was more and more determined to disfranchise them and eliminate them from public life, and impoverish them in economic life. It was this consideration that kept leaders like Elliot and Cardozo fighting within their own party, because they saw only in the Republican Party any protection for their rights, and they believed that the matter of Negro suffrage and economic progress was more important than even the driving out of the grafters and inefficient politicians. It was a difficult and desperate alternative, but they saw no way out. Even when reform movements under Chamberlain began, Negroes were apprehensive. Reform was in sight. In 1874, progressive and intelligent leaders of the party, including many of the colored leaders, elected D. H. Chamberlain as governor, and the reforms which he inaugurated and carried through were attested by the white people of the state. The Charleston News and Courier said, he stands like a wall of granite between an obstinate people and those who seek by a foul move to rob them. The Charlotte Observer called him a model governor. The Grange, 1875, declares, he was fulfilling the pledges made alike to conservative and Republican. The Barnwell Sentinel said that the governor will support no measure or policy that does not tend to advance the interest of South Carolina. A public meeting in Charleston gave him thanks for the bold and statesmanlike struggle he has made in the cause of reform and the economic administration of the government. The News and Courier in June says, by supporting Mr. Chamberlain, the whole country will secure without revolution a government in every way satisfactory. 31. The Chamberlain reforms consisted in retrenchment of the annual expenses of the state by nearly $2 million, and in an attempt to drive out the grafters who had been robbing the state. Many leading Negroes supported him, but others did not. Those who would not, like Elliot, had no confidence in the white Southerners behind him. Here was a chance for white Carolina to unite with the progressive Northerners and Negroes, and usher in honest and efficient government, without disturbing the right of black men to vote, and the right of labor to strive through universal suffrage for its interests. When some Negro leaders refused to follow Chamberlain, this was from no opposition to reform. It was because they saw Chamberlain surrendering in many respects to those white elements in the state who were pledged to degrade Negroes, and who were using reform as a stepping stone and an excuse for disfranchisement. It was a cruel dilemma, but their fears and suspicions proved true. The colored speaker of the House in 1874 said of the colored voters, We, as a people, are blameless of misgovernment. It is owing to bad men, adventurers, persons who, after having reaped millions almost from our party, turn traitors and stab us in the dark. Ingratitude is the worst of crimes, and yet the men we have fostered, the men we have elevated and made rich, now speak of our corruption and venality, and charge us with every conceivable crime. 32. Independent radicals met October 2, 1874 and nominated John T. Green and Martin R. Delaney as governor and lieutenant governor. They said, We cordially invite the whole people of the state to support the nominees of the convention as the only means of preserving their common interests especially requesting the conservatives that have persistently declared that their desire was only for good government without regard to partisan politics, to support the independence. 33. Colored Congressman Ransier of South Carolina said in his speech at Charleston, March 9, 1871. I am no apologist for thieves, for if I were, 
I do not think I would have occupied for so long a time a place in your confidence. On the contrary, I am in favor of a most thorough investigation of the official conduct of any and every public officer in connection with the discharge of whose duties there is anything like well-grounded suspicion, and to this effect have I spoken time and again. Nor am I lukewarm on the subject of better government in South Carolina than that which seems to be bearing heavily on all classes and conditions of society today. Still, recognizing that which I believe to be true, that such is the determined opposition to the Republican Party and its doctrines by our opponents that no administration of our affairs, however honest, just and economical, would satisfy any considerable portion of the democratic masses in the state of South Carolina and satisfied that the principles and policy of the great Republican Party to which I belong are best adapted for the promotion of good government to all classes of men, are. Party leaders should be judicious in dealing with the situation. And, again, when you are called upon in your primary meetings in your county and state nominating conventions, let each man act as if, by his individual vote, he could wipe out the odium resting upon our party and help to remove the evils that afflict us at present. Let him feel, black or white, that the country holds him responsible for the shortcomings of his party, and that it demands of him the elevation to public positions of men who are above suspicion. Let each man feel that upon him individually rests the work of reform, let each man feel that he is responsible for every dollar of the public money fraudulently used, for every schoolhouse closed against his children for every dollar of taxation in excess of the reasonable and legitimate expenses of the state, in short, let every man feel that society at large will hold him and the party accountable for every misdeed in the administration of government, and will credit him with every honest effort in the interest of the people, and in the interest of good government, whereby the community as a whole is best protected and the equal rights of all guaranteed and made safe. Point 3.4 the curious charge is often made that Negroes devoted all their energies to politics. Had this been true their labor could never have restored the cotton crop, the naval stores industry and the whole economic fabric in the state. In their fight they sought to use not only political but other economic weapons. The pressure for land and the taxation of landholders gradually yielded results. By 1880 the 33,000 plantations of 1860 were divided among 93,000 small farmers.35. In 1866, the Charleston branch of the Freedmen's Bank had deposits of $18,000, in 1870, $165,000, and in 1873, 300 and $50,000 belonged to 5,500 depositors, showing that this was the savings of the poor and not the capital of the petty bourgeois. Only about 200 of the depositors were white. The colored people had accounts ranging from $0.05 cents to $1,000. When the bank failed in 1874, the Charleston branch showed 5,296 depositors a total of $253,168. The Beaufort branch showed 1,200 depositors $77,216. A Negro labor movement began. In November, 1869, a state labor convention met in Columbia, with Robert B. Elliott as president. They asked for one half share of the crop for farm laborers, or a stated wage of 70 cents to one dollar a day. They demanded a commissioner to supervise labor contracts, reduce rates, and stop the postponement of suits to recover portions of crops due for services. They tried to secure laws to prevent the discharge of laborers before they were paid, or the removal of crops before satisfactory settlement. They objected to the working of plantations by gangs, and wished to lease farms. There were serious labor difficulties in 1876, through a strike of farm laborers in Culloden County, they threatened to destroy the crops of the planters. Another strike occurred in the rice fields of Buford County, where 200 Negroes at harvest time demanded an advance of 50 per center in wages. They imprisoned scabs in the outhouses, and overpowered a sheriff and his posse, but the governor sent the colored leader, Robert Smalls, with a company of militia, and the mob was dispersed. 
I inquired whether the black laborers have shown any disposition to violent outbreaks such as have occurred in several West Indies islands, but I could only hear of one such case, when the hired laborers in some of the rice plantations of South Carolina struck for wages, and used much violence toward non-strikers, hunting them about with whips. The whites attempting to apprehend the rioters were mobbed, and the affair at one time looked very serious, but, by the aid of influential black politicians, the matter was accommodated, and the laborers have since worked well and quietly. I am told that though in their immediate demands the blacks were in the wrong, they had much ground of complaint, owing to the practice of some of the employers, who not being able to pay the wages earned and due, put the laborers off with checks upon stores kept on the truck principle.36. One of the best Negro unions was the Longshoremen's Protective Association of Charleston. In 1875 it was described as the most powerful organization of the colored laboring class in South Carolina. 500 of its 800 members held an exceedingly creditable parade, with members well-dressed and good-looking. It had successfully conducted a number of strikes, and it was the most successful labor union among Negroes. Under exceedingly difficult circumstances, and handicapped by their necessary ignorance and lack of experience, often deliberately misled, both by Northerners and Southerners, planters and poor whites, the Negroes, in legislation and in self-control, had made an excellent record. The group control exercised by the South Carolina Negroes was remarkable. Their leadership distinctly showed more ability and character than that of either the carpetbaggers or the scalawags. It is interesting to remember that the Negro officials repeatedly were commended by various papers and persons in South Carolina. Charles M. Wilder, postmaster of Columbia, was commended in the Daily News, April 13, 1869, as a man well-known and universally respected. The Courier said January 25, 1869, that R. C. Delarge spoke ably and logically, and that Elliot spoke ably. December 2, 1869, the Courier gave prominence to the opinion of Judge Woodland of Pennsylvania, a member of Congress who received a very favorable impression of Robert Brown Elliott, and regarded him as the ablest man in the legislature. The Daily News, November 30, 1869, called Whipper an intelligent man and very popular in the party. The Chesterfield Democrat, 1870, called Henry L. Shrewsbury an opponent of corruption, and declared that he sustained a good reputation which he has kept intact under great temptations and that he has exerted himself zealously and courageously to guard his people from compulsion and vengeance, and establish their claim to decency and respectability. The Courier, in 1870, spoke of W. H. Jones, and said that he speaks well and to the point. It said also that Jameson had sound, practical sense. Later. It called Dr. Boseman an intelligent educated man. The Abbeville Press commended Cardozo for trying to prevent waste of money and said, The treasurer is an able officer of undoubted integrity. The News and Courier, September 4, 1874, called Samuel Lee tolerably well educated, and said that he spoke fearlessly and forcibly. Some visitors, like F. Barham Zinkle, found Negro members of the Assembly superior to white members. James S. Pike, a violent hater of Negroes, said that all of the best speakers in the House are quite black and added that Senator Beverly Nash has more native ability than half the white men in the Senate 37. It is asserted beyond all question that the best men of the legislature were colored men. They knew more about parliamentary law and carried themselves with moderation. On the other hand, among the white members, were some strange bedfellows. Rutland was the one who gave a cane to Brooks after he had beaten Sumner. Moses helped pull down the flag at Fort Sumter. There were, of course, illiterate and ignorant men among the Negro speakers, but, on the other hand, there were some of poise and eloquence, who spoke with ease and grace. These were the men and this the effort which have been endlessly blamed and reviled. There is that celebrated tirade by Pike. The members of the assembly issued forth from the state house. About three quarters of the crowd belonged to the African race. They were such a looking body of men as might pour out of a market house or a courthouse at random in any southern state. 
Every negro type and physiognomy was here to be seen, from the genteel serving man, to the rough hewn customer from the rice or cotton field. Their dress was as varied as their countenances. There was the second hand, black frock coat of infirm gentility, glossy and threadbare. There was the stovepipe hat of many ironings and departed styles. There was also to be seen a total disregard of the proprieties of costume in the coarse and dirty garments of the field. This is, of course, the jibe of property and gentility at poverty and ignorance. Most men always have been poor and unkempt. Then comes the real attack. The speaker is black, the clerk is black, the doorkeepers are black, the little pages are black, the chairman of the ways and means is black, and the chaplain is coal black. At some of the desks sit colored men whose types it would be hard to find outside of the Congo. Then comes this acknowledgement. It is not all sham, nor all burlesque. They have a genuine interest and a genuine earnestness in the business of the assembly which we are bound to recognize and respect. They have an earnest purpose, born of conviction that their conditions are not fully assured, which lends a sort of dignity to their proceedings. 38. It is surely not all sham and burlesque indeed was any of it sham and burlesque, save in minds like Pike's. Take out the accusation of being black, which is still a crime in the United States, and there remains in such tirades as this only a protest against ignorance and poverty presuming to rule intelligence and wealth, and yet, under the circumstances, how else was the necessary economic and social revolution to be effected? The charge against the Negro legislators manifestly could not be simply the charge of being black. The question was, how did they govern? Sir George Campbell, a member of Parliament, says that whatever violence and disturbance there was, was not on the part of the black majority, but on the side of the white minority, who instead of trying constitutional methods to gain power, preferred Ku Klux organizations and such violent methods. He continues. Before I went south, I certainly expected to find that the southern states had been for a time a sort of pandemonium in which a white man could hardly live, yet it was certainly not so. Well, then, I had gone on to ask, did the black legislatures make bad laws? My informants could not say that they did. What, then, is the practical evil of which complaint is made? The answer is summed up in the one word, corruption. I believe that there can be no doubt at all that a great deal of corruption did prevail much more than the ordinary measure of American corruption. It was inevitable that it should be so under the circumstances, but to what degree it was so, it was very difficult to tell. 39. His conclusion is that the carpetbag rule did no permanent injury to the state, that the black men used their victory with moderation. This brings us to the center of the corruption charge which was in fact that poor men were ruling and taxing rich men. And this was the chief reason that ridicule and scorn and crazy anger were poured upon the government. There was after the war a severe economic strain upon the former wealthy ruling class, and if South Carolina had been ruled by angels during 1868-1876, the protest of wealth and property would have been shrill and angry, and it would have had all the justification that the war-ridden always have. On the other hand, Great as was the stress upon the former owners of wealth, the condition of the Negroes was infinitely worse. The Negro was desperately poor. Outside of the three or four thousand free Negroes, he inherited no property, no tools, no land. His chance to make a decent labor contract was about as small as could be imagined. A number worked for the army and bought land, some earned a living on land furnished them. But the vast majority remained poor landless laborers. The people best qualified to help and advise in the reconstruction of the state refused even when there was no legal barrier. The attitude of most of the whites was childish. They complained then and afterward that they were not asked to lead the Negroes, that they were not chosen to be leaders, when it was their clear duty to place themselves at the head of Negro groups and white groups and lead them aright. In fact, they wanted labor government to fail. Nothing would have disgusted most of them more than to have a government, in which Negro slaves and northern interlopers and poor whites participated, succeed. They had there, therefore, every motive for making progress difficult, and for using charges of failure for propaganda in the North. 
The Wilder charges have all the stigmata of propaganda and are in some respects intrinsically unbelievable. It is impossible to be convinced that the people who gave South Carolina so excellent a constitution, who founded good social legislation, a new system of public schools, and who were orderly and earnest in their general demeanor, could at the same time in all cases be stealing, carousing, and breaking every law of decency. Yet the accusers in the case of South Carolina Reconstruction attacked everybody, and when one Reynolds runs out of accusations in attacking the character of a leading Negro statesman, he turns around and without adducing a single line of proof, calls his wife a strumpet. Scarcely a single person, white or black, northern or southern, connected with the government of South Carolina during 1868 to 1876 has escaped being called a scoundrel, a rascal, and a thief. This does not sound reasonable. As two of the younger and later and more honest students of the situation frankly admit, the accusations do not sound true. However, many believe that the main charges were substantiated. This report was made by the investigating committee appointed in 1877 by the Democratic Legislature, and it was an attempt to justify everything that had been done in South Carolina to overthrow the rule of labor and its allies. If this report is to be believed in its entirety, then the people of South Carolina were the most extraordinary set of thieves in the United States, and this applied mainly to the native white South Carolinians, belonging both to the old aristocracy and the poor whites, next to the carpet beggars, necessarily limited in numbers, but large in influence, and least to the Negroes to the Negroes in small measure as actual recipients of money, but in larger responsibility as dupes and victims of their white leaders. The interpretation that has grown out of this report has tended to identify the scalawags with the carpet beggars, to say comparatively little concerning the part which white native Carolinians played, and to transfer the main guilt of dishonesty almost entirely to the Negroes. This is not only a falsification of history, it is not even a fair interpretation of the fraud report. But the fraud report, moreover, in itself is not convincing. Sir George Campbell said, in South Carolina I was given the report of the Committee of Investigation disclosing terrible things, and said to be most impartial and conclusive. The general result was to leave on one's mind the belief that undoubtedly a very great deal of pilfering and corruption had gone on, but the tone of the report was far too much that of an indictment, rather than of a judgment, to satisfy me that it could be safely accepted in Block.40. The report was made by a committee of the Democratic Legislature of South Carolina just after their party, by force and fraud, had driven the Negroes and the Republicans out of power. It was the bounden duty of this legislature to prove that their action was justified. No considerations of human life, character, or desert, had deterred them from this bloody revolution, and it is not conceivable that any considerations of exact truth or fidelity to fact would deter them from defending it to such an extent that the federal government should not interfere. The men who made the report had in their hands all of the governmental records and documents to use or suppress as they wished. They gave accused persons no real or safe opportunity to reply. They could call as witnesses persons upon whom they were able to put the severest pressure. The unsupported testimony of these witnesses, so long as it was against the overturned government, was received as final authority. Some of these witnesses were acknowledged thieves. Yet their testimony was given full credence, with the curious assumption that such thieves would not lie, when it was to their distinct advantage to deceive. Why, for instance, should A.O. Jones, the colored clerk of the House, acknowledge systematic bribery, unless it was made distinctly to his interest to do so? And if it was to his interest to give this testimony, how can we know that the testimony was absolutely true? The report piled charge upon charge it grouped together sworn testimony, gossip, and suspicion. It put down as facts the statements of men who were incriminated by the facts. It accepted as proof of articles and supplies furnished, the lists and statements of those who sold them, and who profited by the sale and bribed the purchasers. This committee, as a matter of fact, constituted itself judge and jury in an indictment which nobody since has had opportunity to scrutinize and criticize carefully. No court in Christendom would, without further data, receive the fraud report of South Carolina as the exact truth. 
there was nothing in their general conduct during this time to leave any doubt that men would go to any limit of deception in order to prove that Negroes were not fit to vote and that all northern men in the state were thieves. The whole story of this era has not been revealed nor studied with impartial and scientific accuracy. Perhaps at this late day it never can be. In South Carolina, the charges of stealing were primarily $60,000 in bribery to pass the phosphate bill, $40,000 to elect John J. Patterson to the United States Senate, $200,000 in four years for furnishing the capital, $200,000 as appropriations for state printing, large sums for supplies, the issue of fraudulent and excessive pay certificates to members of the legislature, the increase of needless clerks, a saloon in the state house and fraud in the sale of land to the state. In none of these charges do colored men appear as principals accused except, possibly, in the case of Jones, a member of the printing ring, upon whose own testimony some of the charges are based. In the case of the phosphate bill, there was, doubtless, general bribery of both colored and white members of the legislature, but it was to establish an industry which the state sorely needed, and which it seemed able to get only by granting a monopoly to southern white men. In the case of the Patterson election, the graft was dispensed by a white man in order to defeat his colored opponent, Elliot, who refused a $10,000 bribe to withdraw. White Northerners who owned the two leading dailies got contracts for the public printing, but, later, clerks of the two houses, one of whom was colored, got in on this graft and shared at least a part of it. In the case of the Land Commission, an excellent and needed movement to furnish small farmers' land at reasonable prices was turned into a theft by which white landholders were the chief gainers. Whatever stealing of land funds was done cannot be charged to Robert D. Delarge, the colored land commissioner. He says in his first report, It will be seen that I have never been in possession of the bonds as contemplated in the Act, and that I am consequently in no wise responsible for any disposition that may have been made of them. The lands I have purchased have been paid for, through orders of the state treasurer, approved by the chairman of the advisory board. Point 41. He reported February 23, 1871, that nearly 2,000 small farms were occupied or ready to be settled, and that settlers would have eight years to make payments. The greater portion of the farms bought were already occupied, and numbers of thrifty and industrious farmers, white and black, were eagerly securing homes. Over 300 certificates of purchase had been issued. It was said that the legislative sessions were unduly prolonged, that unnecessary clerks were employed, that a liquor saloon was maintained, and that under the head of supplies, all sorts of personal things were furnished individual members of the legislature, and charged to the state. But it is not usually added that merchants got the contracts for these furnishings, some northern, some southern. They furnished the money to bribe committees and members of the legislature in order to secure for themselves the right to charge taxpayers outrageous prices for shoddy materials. They were doing no more in this case than businessmen of New York and Philadelphia, but, also, it is perfectly clear, they were doing no less. The state got a capital decked out in the flamboyant taste of the day, but we must not forget that for the first time in their drab life, representatives of black and white labor, toiling in the fields and swamps and living in the unpaved slums of the towns, saw something that meant to them beauty and luxury saw it and touched it, and owned it. And somehow, I have more respect for the golden spittoons of freed Negro lawmakers in 1872, than for the chaste elegance of the colonial mansions of slave drivers in 1860. Graft and bribery spread in the state, but they Worst feature of corruption in South Carolina is that members of both parties and men of all classes are involved in it, and that public abhorrence of corruption, which is the safeguard of popular government, seems wanting or dormant. Even the old aristocratic class, to whom we had been taught to attribute sentiments of chivalric honor, have not scrupled to bribe officials. Dr. R. M. Smith of Spartanburg County, an old citizen and Democratic member of the legislature, testified that he could see no wrong in bribing a public officer, and compared the transaction to the purchase of a mule. In the Taxpayers' Convention, held at Columbia, South Carolina, Mr. F. F. Worley of Darlington County, an old citizen of high standing, spoke as follows. 
As I said on yesterday, public frauds would not exist were it not for private individuals who act the part of corruptors. Were none of these engaged in bribing members of the legislature, we would hear nothing of such frauds, as the one I have endeavored to expose. Mr. President, one prominent feature in this transaction is the part which native Carolinians have played in it, and it is to this feature that I ask to be allowed to address myself in closing. I say, sir, and I say it in sorrow, that some of our own household, men whom the state in the past has delighted to honor, but whose honors have been withered by the atmosphere of corruption that they breathe, are involved in this swindle. A legislature, composed chiefly of our former slaves, has been bribed by these men to do what? To give them the privilege, by law, of plundering the property holders of the state, now almost bankrupt by reason of the burden of taxation under which they labor. It is difficult for citizens of other states to realize such prevalent corruption, affecting all classes of society, bringing to the same level, patriot and rebel, white and black, the old citizens and the new. Probably one cause contributing to produce this result is the condition of civil war which has prevailed in the state, in which the power has been almost exclusively in the hands of one class, and the property in the hands of the other. While open hostilities have not generally and continually existed, there has been mutual enmity more bitter than usually accompanies flagrant warfare. Hence, some of the men in office may have regarded what was taken from the treasury as taken from the property holders, enemies of the government, and therefore spoils of war, and, on the other hand, some property holders have come to consider what they procure by bribery and corruption as a right of which they are wrongfully deprived and which they are justified in recovering by any means. Another cause seems to be the contempt which the old property-holding class manifest and feel for freedmen and all who cooperate with them politically. This gives to bribery of such persons, in the eyes of the old native class, the semblance of the purchase of a slave. Point 42. Many other southern white speakers of the day were clear and frank in assessing blame. C. W. Dudley said in 1871. The colored population must give us their assistance in any reforms which are contemplated. This they will do just as soon as they discover that their former owners are completely reconciled to their new condition. If they have turned from us heretofore, from a suspicion that their newly acquired rights had been grudgingly granted, and were not safe in the hands of those who had never recognized them as equals, this was but natural, and we are compelled to admit that under similar circumstances we would have done so ourselves. They have looked for protection to others, because they were afraid to trust their all to those who might have a motive to betray that trust. Point 43. Major F. F. Worley said the same year. I scorn the idea that the rich man in his glory, and the mighty man in his power, may indulge in crime with impunity and be passed by the world with a smile of recognition, while the poor tool he uses is consigned to prison and made the associate of felons. If I have displayed zeal and ardor in this exposure of fraud and vice, it is because I would save the state, not from ignorant and corrupt legislators so much as from rich, aspiring, and unprincipled men, some of them imported, it is true, but many of them degenerate and unworthy sons of that noble, though now impoverished, mother whom they rob. Point 44. There was, then, without doubt, theft and incompetence in the government of South Carolina during Reconstruction times. But there is good ground for saying that this was no more due to northern white men than to native southerners, and least of all was it the guilt of Negroes. Moreover, in method and amount, it was no worse than the same kind of stealing in northern states, and even in the United States government itself. If we allow for depreciated currency, and for the monies which the state did not actually receive and did not spend, but for which it may have been legally responsible, South Carolina doubled its debt between 1865 and 1871. But it more than doubled its social responsibilities. That the proceeds of debt thus accumulated were not spent wholly to meet these social demands, is undoubtedly true, but it is also true that every cent which South Carolina raised in Reconstruction times, and much more, was needed for the uplift of its laboring classes. It is interesting to note that $17,500,000 of the South Carolina debt, or almost the exact amount of its probable increase over 1865, was eventually repudiated by the state, 
and the property of the state thus put itself on record as refusing to recognize its obligation to pay the expense even of necessary reconstruction, and at the same time, it had the satisfaction of spoiling the Egyptians in the northern money market. Two sorts of reform faced the state, first the elimination of theft and waste in the handling of the public funds, and secondly the continuation of the efforts for social uplift in land distribution, institutions for social reform, educational equipment and modern labor legislation. With the last category the reformers would have nothing to do. What they meant by reform was lower taxes, and this, Chamberlain gave them. It is easy to prove that this part of the effort to reform the situation in South Carolina had the earnest effort of both white men and black men, and resulted in distinct advance. It was overthrown at just the time when there was every reason to think that reform would be triumphant, not simply in honest government but in more efficient social uplift. No one has expressed this more convincingly than a Negro who was himself a member of the Reconstruction Legislature of South Carolina and who spoke at the convention which disfranchised him in 1895, against one of the onslaughts of Tillman. The gentleman from Edgefield Mr. Tillman speaks of the piling up of the state debt, of jobbery and peculation during the period between 1869 and 1873 in South Carolina but he has not found voice eloquent enough, nor pen exact enough to mention those imperishable gifts bestowed upon South Carolina between 1873 and 1876 by Negro legislators the laws relative to finance, the building of penal and charitable institutions, and, greatest of all, the establishment of the public school system. Starting as infants in legislation in 1869, Many wise measures were not thought of, many injudicious acts were passed. But in the administration of affairs for the next four years, having learned by experience the result of bad acts, we immediately passed reformatory laws touching every department of state, county, municipal, and town governments. These enactments are today upon the statute books of South Carolina. They stand as living witnesses of the Negro's fitness to vote and legislate upon the rights of mankind. When we came into power, town governments could lend the credit of their respective towns to secure funds at any rate of interest that the council saw fit to pay. Some of the towns paid as high as 20%. We passed an act prohibiting town governments from pledging the credit of their hamlets for money bearing a greater rate of interest than 5%. Up to 1,874, inclusive, the state treasurer had the power to pay out state funds as he pleased. He could elect whether he would pay out the funds on appropriations that would place the money in the hands of the speculators, or would apply them to appropriations that were honest and necessary. We saw the evil of this, and passed an act making specific levies and collections of taxes for specific appropriations. Another source of profligacy in the expenditure of funds was the law that provided for and empowered the levying and collecting of special taxes by school districts, in the name of the schools. We saw its evil and by a constitutional amendment provided that there should only be levied and collected annually a tax of two mills for school purposes, and took away from the school districts the power to levy and to collect taxes of any kind. By this act we cured the evils that had been inflicted upon us in the name of the schools, settled the public school question for all time to come, and established the system upon an honest, financial basis. Next we learned during the period from 1869 to 1874, inclusive, that what was denominated the floating indebtedness, covering the printing schemes and other indefinite expenditures, amounted to nearly $2 million. A conference was called of the leading Negro representatives in the two houses together with the state treasurer, also a Negro. After this conference, we passed an act for the purpose of ascertaining the bona fide floating debt and found that it did not amount to more than $250,000 for the four years, we created a commission to sift that indebtedness and to scale it. Hence when the Democratic Party came into power they found the floating debt covering the legislative and all other expenditures fixed at the certain sum of $250,000. This same class of Negro legislators, led by the state treasurer, Mr. F. L. Cardozo, knowing that there were millions of fraudulent bonds charged against the credit of the state, passed another act to ascertain the true bonded indebtedness, and to provide for its settlement. 
Under this law, at one sweep, those entrusted with the power to do so, through Negro legislators, stamped six millions of bonds, denominated as conversion bonds, fraudulent. The Commission did not finish its work. There were still to be examined into and settled under the terms of the Act passed by us providing for the legitimate bonded indebtedness of the state, a little over two and a half million dollars worth of bonds and coupons which had not been passed upon. Governor Hampton, General Haygood, Judge Simonton, Judge Wallace, and in fact, all of the conservative thinking Democrats, all aligned themselves under the provision enacted by us for the certain and final settlement of the bonded indebtedness and appealed to their Democratic legislators to stand by the Republican legislation on the subject and to conform to it. A faction in the Democratic Party obtained a majority of the Democrats in the legislature against settling the question, and they endeavored to open up anew the whole subject of the state debt. We had a little over 30 members in the House, and enough Republican senators to sustain the Hampton Conservative faction, and to stand up for honest finance, or by our votes, place the debt question of the old state into the hands of the plunderers and speculators. We were appealed to by General Haygood, through me, and my answer to him was in these words, General, our people have learned the difference between profligate and honest legislation. We have passed acts of financial reform, and with the assistance of God when the vote shall have been taken, you will be able to record for the thirty-odd Negroes, slandered though they have been through the press, that they voted solidly with you all for the honest legislation and the preservation of the credit of the state. The thirty-odd Negroes in the legislature and their senators by their votes did settle the debt question and saved the state thirteen million dollars. We were eight years in power. We had built schoolhouses, established charitable institutions, built and maintained the penitentiary system, provid. It seemed fairly clear that what South Carolina wanted was not reform even in its narrower sense, that what it was attacking was not even stealing and corruption. If there was one thing that South Carolina feared more than bad Negro government, it was good Negro government. In fine, dishonesty in South Carolina was not racial. It was not even a matter of the lower economic classes, white or black. It was the child of an age of extravagance and characteristic of a state where the mass of the voters were poverty-stricken, and the property holders angry and ruthless in their methods. The fact that the best men of the South, unlike the abolitionists of John Brown's time, were unwilling to strike hope for the education of the deaf and dumb, rebuilt the jails and courthouses, rebuilt the bridges and re-established the ferries. In short, we had reconstructed the state and placed it upon the road to prosperity and, at the same time, by our acts of financial reform, transmitted to the Hampton government an indebtedness not greater by more than $2,500,000 than was the bonded debt of the state in 1868, before the Republican Negroes and their white allies came into power. Point 45. NLY and trust that the end and the future would justify the means is very good evidence that the methods by which Negro rule was overthrown had not as yet been proved to be necessary, and, therefore, were unjustifiable. Goldwyn Smith has said that statesmanship is the art of avoiding revolution. Of the Democrats of Mississippi and South Carolina in 1875 and 1876, one might well say, their revolution was the art of avoiding statesmanship. 46. Beneath the race issue, and unconsciously of more fundamental weight, was the economic issue. Men were seeking again to re-establish the domination of property in Southern politics. By getting rid of the black labor vote, they would take their first and substantial step. By raising the race issue, they would secure domination over the white labor vote, and thus the oligarchy that ruled the South before the war would be in part restored to power. It would, of course, lack capital. But the North stood ready to furnish capital if profit could be obtained, and it was being made more and more clear that this furnishing of capital, far from being contingent upon universal suffrage in the South, could be made more available even if the black labor vote was disfranchised completely, and white labor directed in the South by the same methods that were dominating it in the North. Tis not in the high stars alone. Nor in the cups of budding flowers. Nor in the red breast's mellow tone nor in the bow that smiles in showers, but in the mud and scum of things. There always, always something sings. Ralph Waldo Emerson
11. The Black Proletariat in Mississippi and Louisiana. How in two other states with black majorities enfranchised labor led by educated men and groups of their own blood sought so to guide the state as to raise the worker to comfort and safety, and failed before land monopoly, the new power of imported capital and organized force and fraud. Mississippi has been called a peculiarly typical state in which to study Reconstruction. But this should be modified. In direct contrast to South Carolina, Mississippi was the place where first and last Negroes were largely deprived of any opportunity for land ownership. The great black belt plantations on the Mississippi had hardly been disturbed by war. The barons ruling there, who had dictated the policy of the state, were to the last degree reactionary because they entirely misconceived the results of the war. They were determined not to recognize even the abolition of slavery, and as for establishing peasant proprietors on their land or granting even civil rights, they were adamant. To the proposition of political rights for Negroes, they simply would not listen for a moment. Mississippi was in all respects a curious state. It was the center of a commercialized cotton kingdom. The graciousness and ease of the plantation system had scarcely taken root there. Mississippi plantations were designed to raise a profitable cotton crop and not to entertain visitors. Here and there the more pretentious slave manner flourished, but, on the whole, the level of the state in civilization and culture was distinctly below that of Virginia and South Carolina, and smacked more of the undisciplined frontier. In this state there were, in 1860, 353,899 white people and 437,404 Negroes, of whom less than 1,000 were free. The population had only been a few thousand at the beginning of the century and small in 1820. Then from 1840 on, the Cotton Kingdom spread over Mississippi, greatly increasing its population. The result was that after the war, there was in this state a group of planters whose great plantations dominated the rich Black Belt. From Memphis to the Gulf were a succession of counties with 60% or more of black population, while on the poor lands of the northeast and southeast were the poor whites. The planters had always dominated the state in its political and economic aspects, and it was suddenly required after the war that this state should not only assimilate a voting population of nearly 450,000 former slaves, but also that the mass of poor whites should have a political significance which they had never had before. It was a project at which Mississippi quailed. Sterling Price prayed to God that my fears for the future of the South may never be realized, but when the right is given to the Negro to bring suit, testify before the courts and vote in elections, you all had better be in Mexico. Mississippi had a bad financial reputation long before the Civil War, Reconstruction actually improved this. In 1839, Less than one-tenth of the money collected from fines and forfeitures by the sheriffs and clerks throughout the state ever reached the Treasury. In 1840, the Senate Journal had the names of 26 tax collectors who were defaulters to an average amount of $1,000 each. In 1858, the auditor of the state was a defaulter for $54,000. The Endowment of Jefferson College valued at $248,748, disappeared without record, and the college had to be closed. The money realized from the 16th section fund donated to schools by the Congress of the United States was lost or embezzled to the amount of $1,500,000. The Mississippi Union Bank sold bonds to the amount of $5 million, and later repudiated the debt. The effect of war on property in the state was marked. The assessed valuation of Mississippi property in 1860 was over $500 million. Subtracting $218 million as the value of the slaves, we have $291,472,912. This was reduced in 1870 to $177,278,890. The whole industrial system was upset, and the cotton crop, which was 1,200,000 bales in 1860, was in 1870 only 565,000 bales. Naturally, 
these planter capitalists proposed to protect themselves from further loss by dominating the labor of their former slaves and getting their work as cheaply as possible, with the least outlay of capital, and selling their crops at prevailing high prices. William L. Sharkey, former Chief Justice of the state, was appointed Provisional Governor, June 15, 1865, and the state held a constitutional convention the same year, the first to be held in the South under the Johnson Plan. The governor complained that there was an unprecedented amount of lawlessness in the state. The convention consisted of 100 delegates, most of them representing former Whigs, largely opposed to the secession of 1861. This convention recognized slavery as abolished, but did not wish to assume responsibility for whatever honor there may be in abolishing it. An ordinance, therefore, was passed declaring that slavery had been abolished by the United States, and that hereafter it should not exist in the state. Further concessions to the Negro were fought. The Negroes of the state met October 7 and protested to Congress, expressing fear lest they be re-enslaved. President Johnson wrote to Governor Sharkey suggesting that Negroes of education and property be given the right to vote so as to forestall the radicals in the North. Johnson pointed out that such a grant would completely disarm the adversary, the radical Republicans in Congress. The suggestion did not receive any attention whatever from the convention. It is highly probable that the unanimous sentiment of the convention was against the idea of political rights for the Negro in any form. But a whole arsenal of reasons against enfranchisement was already prepared. Most of them started from the assumption of a general Negro franchise, and consequent Negro domination, the intelligent freedman was considered but a drop in the bucket. It was argued that this is a white man's government, and that in the sight of God and the light of reason a Negro suffrage was impossible one. The real fight in the convention was on the subsidiary question as to whether Negro testimony would be allowed in court, and it was on this question that the campaign for electing a governor and legislature turned. It was remarkable that throughout the South, Far from envisaging Negro suffrage for a moment, the states fought first to see how few civil rights must be granted Negroes, and this gradually boiled down to the momentous question as to whether a Negro could be allowed to testify against a white man in court. The election took place October 2, 1865, and Humphreys, a general in the Confederate Army, was elected governor by the party opposed to letting Negroes testify in court which also secured a majority of the members of the legislature. This defeated Sharkey's candidacy for the United States Senate. Humphreys had received no pardon from the president when elected but received one afterward. Sharkey notified the president that a governor and legislature had been elected, but the president made him retain his powers, and warned him that the legislature must accept the 13th Amendment and a code for the protection of Negroes. There was continued friction between the military and civil authorities, and the president allowed the writ of habeas corpus to remain suspended. Anarchy must in any case be prevented. The presence of Negro troops in the state caused bitter complaint. On January 5, 1866, there were 8,784 Negro troops and 338 Negro officers. The president promised to remove them as soon as possible. Sharkey declared that they encouraged the belief among Negroes that lands were going to be distributed among them. By the 20th of May, 1866, all black troops had been mustered out and removed from Mississippi. The legislature then proceeded to adopt the celebrated Black Code of 1865, and completed the set of laws by reenacting all the penal and criminal laws applying to slaves except so far as the mode and manner and trial of punishment has been ordained by law. The North was incensed, and the Chicago Tribune said that the North would convert Mississippi into a frog pond before they will allow any such laws to touch one foot of soil in which the bones of our soldiers sleep. Back of this sentiment was the conviction that Mississippi, whose political population for congressional apportionment was 616,040 in 1860, would now be increased to 900,000, and this new power was going to be arrayed against northern industry, thrift, and power. The whole reactionary course of Mississippi helped the abolition democracy in the North. General Ord assumed command in Mississippi in March, 1867, and on April 15, 
he began to register the new electorate, colored and white. Among Ord's appointees was Isaiah T. Montgomery, formerly a slave of Jefferson Davis. He was made a justice of the peace and was perhaps the first Negro in the state to hold public office. Ord appointed a number of civil officials, and was compelled practically to nullify the Black Code by military order. The result of the registration showed the white people that contrary to their firm and happy belief, the Negro was not becoming extinct, 46,636 white voters registered, and 60,137 Negroes. This showed the political situation plainly. In 1867, the cotton crop was almost a total failure on account of weather conditions and other reasons. Ord issued an order requiring investigation of charges against landholders of driving off freedmen in order to prevent paying back wages. There was a great deal of theft of cotton and horses. Later, the abundant crop of 1868 induced Mississippi to begin to believe in free labor. At Christmas, 1867, there had been widespread rumor of a Negro insurrection due to the idea that land was going to be distributed among them. Humphreys, then governor, issued a proclamation reciting the apprehensions of combinations or conspiracies formed among the blacks to seize the lands, unless Congress should arrange to plan a distribution by January 1st. Ord told General Gillum, commander in the sub-district of Mississippi, that Congress was not going to seize the lands of planters, but that the governor had already plenty of land in Mississippi for freedmen and that they could settle on it when they chose to do so. The election was set for the first Tuesday in November, 1867. Negroes were given representation among the election officials, this brought bitter protest. We hoped this shameful humiliation would be spared our people, at least until the freedmen of Mississippi decide whether they will submit to Negro equality at the ballot box or elsewhere. General Ord has heretofore exhibited a wisdom in his administration which has been highly approved by the people, but we doubt not the lovers of peace throughout the country will condemn the order as injudicious, if not insulting, to that race whom God has created superior to the black man, and whom no monarch can make his equal. The general commanding cannot surely have forgotten that the Negro has no political rights conferred on him by the state of Mississippi although he is given the privilege by a corrupt and fragmentary Congress to cast a ballot in the coming farce dignified by the name of election.2. White Mississippi fought Reconstruction tenaciously at every step. The legislature stubbornly refused to adopt the Thirteenth Amendment, declaring that they had already abolished slavery and that they would not consent to the second section, which gave Congress the right to enforce freedom. Shall Mississippi ratify the Thirteenth Amendment? asked the Vicksburg Herald on November 9. We answer, no, 10,000 times, no three. Then came the question as to who might register and who was to decide on the eligibility of a former Confederate. The commanding general, in accordance with Johnson's instructions, declared that the Board of Registrars had no power, he was overruled by General Grant and by the Act of Congress of July 19. Immediately, Mississippi tried to bring the matter before the Supreme Court by seeking to enjoin President Johnson from enforcing the Reconstruction Acts. The Supreme Court refused to entertain the case on the ground that it would interfere with a coordinate branch of the government in the performance of its duties. Thereupon, another action was brought by the state of Georgia, which tried to enjoin the Secretary of War, but the court held that it was without jurisdiction. Finally, the celebrated case ex part McCardle was started on appeal from a military decision at Vicksburg, but Congress forestalled the case by depriving the court of jurisdiction in this particular case and others of similar character. There had been a plan for the white people to refrain from voting in 1867, a plan widespread through the other southern states. The idea was that by refraining from taking any part in this convention, the whole thing might go by default and Reconstruction fail. But that seemed to many too much of a risk, and in its place there came a movement on the part of some of the planters to acquiesce in the situation, and to organize and plan the control of the Negro vote. In other words, certain leaders, like the editor of the Jackson Clarion, General Alcorn, and Judge Campbell, were in favor of recognizing the right of the Negroes to vote in 1868, 
and said that the policy of the Democrats would drive the Negroes into the Republican Party ex-Senator Brown agreed, and many other white leaders. The most advanced Reconstructionist was General Alcorn, who asked if it would not be wise to yield something to black suffrage, and then to control the votes in the interests of such an organization of industry and society as they thought best. This was no wild scheme. The Negroes were used to subordination to the great planters. If the planters did not form an alliance with the Negroes, the planters would be threatened by the pretensions of the poor whites and possible leadership from northern white men, ex-soldiers and investors, who were largely represented in the state. It was a matter to consider carefully, in the end Mississippi went further along this line than any other southern state, and found it easier to do this because of the compulsion and intimidation that could be exercised over the Negro vote on the great plantations of the Black Belt. The so-called Black and Tan Convention met at Jackson, January 9, 1868. It was the first political organization in Mississippi with colored representatives. There were in all 100 delegates, of whom 17 were colored, although 32 counties had Negro majorities. There were 29 native white Republicans, and 20 or more northern Republicans. This was interesting and characteristic. It showed in the first place that the Negroes were not even trying, much less succeeding in any effort to use their numerical preponderance in order to put themselves in political power. Under strong economic pressure, the Negro voter designated white men to represent him. The large majority of the members of this convention were elected by black voters. Seven or eight of the colored delegates were ministers. Four of the Northern Republicans had lived in the South before the war and two had served in the Confederate Army. It characterizes the times to know that five of the members afterward met violent deaths. Members were paid $10 a day in depreciated scrip worth 65 cents 70 cent on a dollar, making their pay about equal to the convention of 1865. During the organization of the convention, it was moved that the word colored be added to the name of each Negro delegate. Thereupon, the Reverend James Lynch, a colored man, afterward Secretary of State, moved to amend it so that the color of each delegate's hair should be added also. There was here as in South Carolina the same charge against this convention and against succeeding legislatures, that they did not sufficiently represent wealth, they represented poverty, and the majority of the members, white and black, were not taxpayers. They represented labor and were voting and working as far as they intelligently could to improve their condition and not to increase the profits of the hirers of labor. In the convention, the colored people clung to the idea that the government intended to divide the land among them. One of the first acts of the convention was to appoint a committee of five to report what legislation was needed to afford relief and protection to the state and its citizens. This committee reported early in February, and found an alarming amount of destitution among the laboring class. They thought that the number of the destitute was at least 30,000, and perhaps was 40,000. There was distress and suffering, which in some cases bordered on actual starvation. The commanding general, who was at the time Gillum of Tennessee, sided with the planting interests, refused to cooperate with the convention in this matter, and declared that the demand for labor exceeded the supply. In other words, labor must work for food or starve. It was reported that the Negroes were still expecting the distribution of land. Suspension of taxes imposed upon freedmen prior to January 1, 1868, was demanded, and the repudiation of all debts, contracts and judgments incurred or made prior to April 28, 1865. The commanding general was requested to issue an order directing the restoration of property alleged to have been unlawfully taken from colored persons on the grounds that property accumulated by them in a state of slavery belonged to their masters. This the general declined to do. The commanding general was again requested, in a report signed by three colored members, to furnish from the public funds means to return slaves sold into Mississippi to their former homes, and Congress was asked to set aside through the Freedmen's Bureau, one half of the cotton tax collected in the state. They asked the governor of the state to let Negroes share in the donations sent him for the relief of the destitute, but the governor refused, saying that it was a private gift. After this preliminary discussion, which was afterward criticized as beside the point, when in fact it was the main point, 
the convention turned toward making a new constitution, as they had refused to adopt the old. They framed a constitution under which Mississippi lived for 22 years. It did away with property qualifications for office or for suffrage, it forbade slavery, it provided for a mixed public school system, it forbade race distinctions in the possession and inheritance of property, it prohibited the abridgment of civil rights in travel, and in general, it was a modern instrument based on universal suffrage. A minority tried to disfranchise the mass of ignorant Negroes, and there was considerable quarreling and some fighting. Universal suffrage was adopted by a large majority, and on account of that, twelve of the white delegates resigned. Other ordinances forbade property qualification for office, or educational qualification for suffrage. The civil government under Reconstruction increased the powers of the governor and made a more elaborate governmental organization and function for the state. It provided for a lieutenant governor, a state superintendent of education, and numerous other officials. Some of the counties were consolidated to form larger legislative districts. Evidently, the success of the planters in controlling the Negro vote alarmed the carpetbaggers and the poor whites, and they determined to suppress the ring leaders of the rebellion far more drastically than was required by the Reconstruction Acts. The convention consequently determined to deny the right to vote and hold office to practically all whites who had anything to do with the rebellion, and thus the proposed constitution disfranchised perhaps 20,000 or more of the leading white citizens of the state. This has been represented as petty jealousy and desire for vengeance on the part of the carpetbaggers. It was more than this. It was an attempt to end the oligarchy of landlords who still advocated slavery and the rule of wealth. After sitting 115 days, the convention adjourned and submitted the constitution to the people. The proceedings in this convention had undoubtedly been dominated by the wishes of the northern men and the poor whites, with the support of the Negroes. But instead of cementing the alliance, the Negroes were ignored, and when preparations were made for the campaign, were given little recognition. The chief evidence of this was failure to nominate Negroes for office, the real policy beneath this was ignoring the plight of Negro labor, and making the Republican Party chiefly the mouthpiece of the new northern capital. The opposition organized as the Democratic White Men's Party of Mississippi and declared that the Republicans were trying to degrade the Caucasian race. The provision for a mixed school system particularly came in for widespread criticism. Meantime, Humphreys was removed as governor on account of opposition to the Reconstruction Acts, and General Adelbert Ames appointed acting governor. Humphreys refused to give up, and was removed by the soldiers. But reaction was not beaten. The vote of the Black Belt was cast largely under the dictation of the landholders and hirers of black labor. The result of the election was a surprise. 56,231 votes were cast for the Constitution, 63,860 were cast against it, and Humphreys had been re-elected governor. A committee of five from the convention announced that the election had been carried by fraud and intimidation, accompanied by social proscription and threats to discharge laborers from employment. The Republicans held meetings in various counties, declaring that the late election had been the work of terrorism and fraud. On the other hand, the result of the election was to show all parties that a more sincere attempt to recognize the Negro and enable him to vote had to be made. Negroes could not be ignored. Their right to vote meant something. If they were intimidated and coerced by force and economic means, the planters would soon be back in power. Moreover, even in this election, certain leading Negroes, like John R. Lynch, had deliberately voted with the planters, and an alliance of planters and Negroes was not impossible. It would have been an alliance based partly on labor control and partly on understandings consummated between black labor leaders and white landholders. Working out from the old slavery, it might have gradually negotiated an industrial emancipation for the intelligent blacks, while using the solid black vote to keep white labor and northern capital subordinate. One group of Negroes recommended, therefore, another constitutional convention. They said they wished to cultivate kindly relations with their white friends, and declared that they would support capable and honorable men, even if they were former Confederates. The 40th Congress adjourned with the question of Mississippi unsettled. Finally, in April, 1869, 
a bill was agreed upon which directed that Mississippi was to be admitted when she adopted the 15th Amendment, and that the President was authorized to submit the Constitution as a whole and also the same Constitution with its provisions disfranchising the bulk of Confederates left out. Gillum was removed, and General Ames, who had been acting civil governor, was made provisional governor of the state. He reported that certain men, backed by public opinion, were committing murders and outrages. Under direction of Congress, Ames removed a large number of officers, and made appointments of state and local officers, including several Negroes. Among other things, he declared freedmen to be competent jurors. He said of his work at this time, I found when I was military governor of Mississippi, that a black code existed there, that Negroes had no rights, and that they were not permitted to exercise the rights of citizenship. I had given them the protection they were entitled to under the laws, and I believed I could render them great service. I felt that I had a mission to perform in their interest, and I hesitatingly consented to represent them and unite my fortune with theirs. Point four. Ames thus made a counter bid for Negro support, reversing the indifferent stand of the Mississippi Republicans. In July, President Grant issued a proclamation ordering the Constitution to be submitted for ratification November 30. The Radical Republicans held their convention July 2 and attempted a platform of several resolutions. These resolutions declared, in favor of an impartial and economic administration of the government, the unrestricted right of speech to all men at all times and places, unrestrained freedom of the ballot, a system of free schools, a reform of the iniquitous and unequal system of taxation and assessments which discriminated against labor, declared that all men without regard to race, color or previous condition of servitude were equal before the law, recommended removal of political disabilities as soon as the spirit of toleration now dawning upon the state should be so firmly established as to justify Congress in taking such action, declared in favor of universal amnesty, universal suffrage and encouragement of immigration. Point five. Ex-Governor Brown and the Conservatives were in favor of ratifying the Constitution without the proscriptive provisions and of accepting the 15th Amendment. They secured Judge Dent, a brother-in-law of Grant, as their candidate, thinking in that way to secure the goodwill of Grant, but Grant repudiated the party that nominated Dent. The Dent party nominated Thomas Sinclair, a colored man, for Secretary of State. The Republicans nominated General J. L. Alcorn for governor, and the Reverend James Lynch, a mulatto preacher, for Secretary of State. The whole election showed the increasing political importance of the Negroes, and this undoubtedly explains the increased activity of the Ku Klux Klan in 1869. There were some riots in three or four counties. The Constitution was ratified almost unanimously but the proscriptive sections disfranchising members of the Secession Convention and other active Confederates were defeated. The provision forbidding the loan of state funds was ratified. The first Reconstruction Legislature met at Jackson, January 11, 1870. The legislature elected in 1868 had never been convened because of the defeat of the Constitution. Negro membership in the new legislature was larger than in the Convention. There were 40 colored members, some of whom had been slaves before the war, but among them were some very intelligent men. Particularly, there was considerable representation of ministers. In the Senate, there were five colored members. Many of the wealthiest counties were represented by ex-slaves. Yet as Lynch shows, Negroes never controlled Mississippi. No colored man in that state ever occupied a judicial position above that of Justice of the Peace, and very few aspired to that position. Of seven state officers, only one, that of Secretary of State, was filled by a colored man, until 1873, when colored men were elected to three of the seven offices, Lieutenant Governor, Secretary of State, and State Superintendent of Education. Of the two United States Senators, and the seven members of the lower House of Congress, not more than one colored man occupied a seat in each house at the same time. Of the 35 members of the state senate, and of the 115 members of the house which composed the total membership of the state legislature prior to 1874 there were never more than about seven colored men in the senate and 40 in the lower house. 
Of the 97 members that composed the Constitutional Convention of 1868, but 17 were colored men. The composition of the lower house of the state legislature that was elected in 1871 was as follows. Total membership, 115, Republicans, 66, Democrats, 49, colored members, 38, white members, 77, white majority, 39. Of the 66 Republicans, 38 were colored men and 28, white. There was a slight increase in the colored membership as a result of the election of 1873, but the colored men never at any time had control of the state government, nor of any branch or department thereof, nor even that of any county or municipality. Out of 72 counties in the state at that time, electing on an average 28 officers to a county, it is safe to assert that not over 5 out of 100 of such officers were colored men. The state, district, county and municipal governments were not only in control of white men, but white men who were to the manor born, or who were known as old citizens of the state, those who had lived in the state many years before the War of the Rebellion. There was, therefore, never a time when that class of white men, known as carpetbaggers, had absolute control of state government, or that of any district, county or municipality, or any branch or department thereof. There was never, therefore, any ground for the alleged apprehension of Negro domination as a result of a free, fair and honest election in any one of the southern or reconstructed states. Point six. At the same time, the Negroes were laborers, and if at any time the white and black labor vote united, property and privilege in Mississippi were bound to suffer. And on the other hand, if property controlled black labor, white labor would be as helpless as before the war. These two fears explain Reconstruction in Mississippi. The legislature ratified the 14th and 15th Amendments and elected three United States Senators, one for the full term, and two for unexpired terms. For the full term, Alcorn was chosen, and for one unexpired term, General Ames, while Hiram R. Revels, a colored minister, was chosen to fill the unexpired term of Jefferson Davis. Revels came from North Carolina and was educated in Indiana, he was a minister in Baltimore at the opening of the war, and there helped to organize two colored regiments. He came south with the Freedmen's Bureau, and was surprised when selected to represent the state in the Senate. He was a man of intelligence, but the Republican United States debated three days on his credentials. Finally, after one of Sumner's ablest speeches, he was admitted. Even after that, Philadelphia refused the use of her Academy of Music for a meeting at which he was to speak. Ames now turned over the government to Alcorn and went to the Senate. Alcorn took a firm and advanced stand. In his inaugural speech, he spoke of his attachment for Mississippi. He declared that it was the duty of the government to protect all its citizens, white and black, before the ballot box, the jury box and public office, and to give industrial opportunity to the honest and competent without discrimination of color. He said, In the face of memories that might have separated them from me, as the wronged from the wronger, they offered me their confidence, offered me the guardianship of their new and precious hopes with a trustfulness whose very mention stirs my nerves with emotion. In response to that touching radiance, the most profound anxiety with which I enter my office as governor of this state is that of making the colored man the equal before the law of every other man the equal, not in dead letter, but in living fact. He had a word to say for the poor whites. Thousands of our worthy white friends have ever remained to a great extent strangers to the helping hand of the state. 7. Unfortunately. Alcorn instead of staying and finishing this job thus well outlined, had the universal southern ambition of the day to go to the United States Senate. He was, therefore, in office only a little over a year, when he went to Washington to succeed Revels. The legislature, meantime, went to work to set up the government. The part which the Negro played in this reconstruction was as extraordinary as it was unexpected. There were far fewer Negroes of education and ability in Mississippi than in South Carolina or Louisiana. But there were a few, perhaps a bare half-dozen, who gave universal and epic-making service. One of these leaders, and perhaps the best, 
tells of the task before them. The new administration had an important and difficult task before it. A state government had to be organized from top to bottom, a new judiciary had to be inaugurated consisting of three justices of the state Supreme Court, 15 judges of the circuit court, and 20 chancery court judges who had all to be appointed by the governor, with the consent of the Senate, and, in addition, a new public school system had to be established. There was not a public school building anywhere in the state, except in a few of the larger towns, and they, with possibly a few exceptions, were greatly in need of repairs. To erect the necessary schoolhouses and to reconstruct and repair those already in existence so as to afford educational facilities for both races was by no means an easy task. It necessitated a very large outlay of cash in the beginning, which resulted in a material increase in the rate of taxation for the time being, but the constitution called for the establishment of the system, and of course the work had to be done. It was not only done, but it was done creditably and as economically as possible, considering the conditions at that time. That system, though slightly changed, still stands a creditable monument to the first Republican state administration that was organized in the state of Mississippi under the Reconstruction Acts of Congress. It was also necessary to reorganize, reconstruct and, in many instances, rebuild some of the penal and charitable institutions of the state. A new code of laws also had to be adopted to take the place of the old code and thus wipe out the black laws that had been passed by what was known as the Johnson Legislature, and in addition, bring about other changes so as to make the laws and statutes of the state conform with the new order of things. This was no easy task, in view of the fact that a heavy increase in the rate of taxation was thus made necessary for the time being at least. That this important task was splendidly, creditably, and economically done no fair-minded person who is familiar with the facts will question or dispute. That the state never had before, and has never since had, a finer judiciary than that which was organized under the administration of Governor Alcorn and which continued under the administration of Governor Ames is an indisputable and incontrovertible fact. Point eight. When the Alcorn administration took charge of the state government, the war had just come to a close. Everything was in a prostrate condition. There had been great depreciation in the value of real and personal property. The credit of the state was not very good. The rate of interest for borrowed money was high. To materially increase the bonded debt of the state was not deemed wise, yet some had to be raised in that way. To raise the balance a higher rate of taxation had to be imposed, since the assessed valuation of the taxable property was so low. Point nine. The legislature of 1871 was in session about six months, and passed 325 acts and resolutions. The increase of citizenship, and the revolution through which the state had passed, called without doubt for more laws. The expenses of the legislative department were large and the session long. Yet it can hardly be said, considering the work done and the depreciated value of currency, that it was an extravagant assembly. Point ten. The legislature of 1872 had John R. Lynch, a Negro, as Speaker of the House. There were 28 white and 38 colored Republicans and 49 Democrats, and it took a trip of Senator Alcorn from Washington to induce enough white Republicans to support Lynch in order to elect him. At the close of the session, however, Lynch was presented with a gold watch and chain. On motion of a prominent white Democrat, a resolution was adopted thanking him for his dignity, impartiality, and courtesy as a presiding officer. The clarion declared. His bearing in office had been so proper, and his rulings in such marked contrast to the former conduct of the ignoble whites of his party, who had been aspiring to be leaders of the blacks, that the conservatives cheerfully joined in the testimonial. Point 11. Civil rights measures constituted a considerable part of the legislation between 1868 and 1876. In his inaugural address, Governor Alcorn asserted positively that so long as he was governor, all citizens, without respect to color or nativity, should be shielded by the laws with a panoply 12. In 1870, all laws relative to free Negroes, slaves, and mulattoes, as found in the Code of 1857 and the laws constituting the so-called Black Codes, were declared to be forever repealed. 
it was declared to be the true intent and meaning of the legislature to remove from the records of the state all laws which in any manner recognized any natural difference or distinction between citizens and inhabitants of the state. 13. The legislature elected in 1873 had 37 members of the Senate, of whom nine were colored, and nine white carpet baggers. In the House over 115 members, of whom 55 were colored and 60 white, including 15 carpet baggers. This election went further than any toward a fusion of planters and Negroes, and this was only prevented by the rivalry of Alcorn and Ames. When Alcorn went to the Senate, he was succeeded by a carpet bagger, R. C. Powers. Finally in 1873, Ames, who had been in the United States Senate, was elected governor over Alcorn, who was again candidate. With Ames, three colored men went to office, A. K. Davis, Lieutenant Governor, James Hill, Secretary of State, and T. W. Cardozo, Superintendent of Education. B. K. Bruce had been selected for Lieutenant Governor, but refused, and afterward went to the Senate. This greatly disappointed Alcorn, who wished to remain in the Senate, and who, therefore, refused to escort Bruce to take the oath. Bruce had been county assessor, parish, and tax collector in Bolivar County, one of the wealthiest counties in the state. 14. Davis, the new lieutenant governor, had made a creditable record as member of the legislature, but he was not a strong man. Hill was young, active, and aggressive, and above the average colored man in intelligence. Cardozo was capable but not well known. 15. As to the colored men in the legislature of 1873, Garner says. Relative to the course of the colored members in this legislature, a prominent Democrat writes me as follows, in my opinion, if they had all been native southern Negroes, there would have been little cause of complaint. They often wanted to vote with Democrats on non-political questions, but could not resist the party lash. The majority of whites in both parties exhibit the same weakness. 16. The real meaning of this criticism was that the Negroes wanted to cooperate with the planters, but knew that the planters would disfranchise them at the first opportunity, and only welcomed their alliance now for economic reasons. On the other hand, the Republicans were torn with factions, jealousies, and suspicions, and the Negroes did not know how far they could be trusted. With a few exceptions, the colored members took little part in the work of legislation, although some of the principal chairmanships were held by them. There were few educated men among them, and they watched only for efforts to abridge their privileges as voters and citizens. On the other hand, there were no charges of venality or bribery, and their efforts to learn were intense. They were too willing to take advice and follow leadership, once their confidence had been obtained. The number of prominent planters in Mississippi who entered the Republican Party to lead the Negroes was unusually large as compared with other states. Ames immediately began a program of retrenchment in expenditures, and recommended many reforms. Taxes had been increased from one mill on the dollar in 1869 to 14 in 1874. The credit of the state was still impaired. He recommended a cut of 25% in appropriations and especially curtailing the bill for public printing. The recommendations, says Garner, do credit to the governor who made them. They do not sound like the utterance of a carpetbagger bent on peculation and plunder. There were the usual charges of extravagance against the Reconstruction government. It should, however, be said that if the testimony of Governor Ames may be followed relative to the expenses of the state government during the two years in which he was at its head, his was the most economical administration since 1856, with the exception of two years, 1861 and 1869. It was charged that the public debt of Mississippi increased from almost nothing to $20 million during the Reconstruction regime, but this was easily disproved by ex Governor Ames, who had the figures and the committee of Democratic legislators that sought to impeach him had to acknowledge the truth of what he said. Thus it will be seen that the actual indebtedness of the state is but little over a half million dollars, and that during the two years of Governor Ames' administration, 
the state debt had been reduced from $821,292.82 on January 1, 1874, to $520,138.33 on January 1, 1876, or a reduction of more than $300,000 in two years upwards of one-third of the state debt wiped out in that time. Not only has the debt been reduced as above, but the rate of taxation for general purposes has been reduced from 7 mills in 1873 to 4 mills in 1875.18. It should also be said by way of explanation, that the work of restoration which the government was obliged to undertake, made increased expenses necessary. During the period of the war, and for several years thereafter, public buildings and state institutions were permitted to fall into decay. The state house and grounds, the executive mansion, the penitentiary, the insane asylum, and the buildings for the blind, deaf and dumb, were in a dilapidated condition and had to be extended and repaired. A new building for the blind was purchased and fitted up. The Reconstructionists established a public school system and spent money to maintain and support it, perhaps too freely, in view of the impoverishment of the people. When they took hold, warrants were worth but 60 or 70 cents on the dollar, a fact which made the price of building materials used in the work of construction correspondingly higher. Point 19. Garner admits there were no great railroad swindles and no charge of excessive debt. The only charge which is perhaps true was that the number of offices and agencies was needlessly increased. The one center of undoubted graft under Ames was the public printing contracts, which increased from $8,675 a year, 1867 to 1868, to sums varying from $50,000 to $127,000 in 1870 to 1875. This seems, however, to have been largely due to one white man and it is not clear whether he was northern or southern born. Rhodes declares that few Negroes were competent to perform their duties and that one who was sheriff of DeSoto County for four years could neither read nor write and farmed out his office to a white deputy for a share of the revenue. John R. Lynch proves that this statement is absolutely false. The Rev. J. J. Evans, a colored Baptist minister and a Union soldier, who held that position, gave entire satisfaction, he left office with a spotless record, accounted for every cent of the funds, and he had, as he wrote, a letter from Evans before him, which showed that Evans could read and write. Mr. Lynch goes on to say that of the 72 counties of the state, not more than twelve ever had colored sheriffs, and that he knew ten of these, and that in point of intelligence, capacity, and honesty, the colored sheriffs would have favorably compared with the whites. When one considers that over one half of the electors had been slaves, now for the first time given a voice in government, Reconstruction in Mississippi certainly seems like a success. The Negro leaders who came to the front were in most cases admirable and honest men, and only a few were corrupt. The advance of the masses of the people was shown in the increase of marriage licenses. In 1865, licenses were issued to whites, 2,708, and to blacks, 564, while in 1870, 2,204 were issued to whites, and 3,427 to blacks. In those two years, churches built increased from 105 to 283. A curious feud between the governor and his colored lieutenant governor began in the summer of 1874, when Governor Ames went north on his vacation. The lieutenant governor discharged certain appointees, and appointed several judges. Governor Ames, upon returning, revoked these appointees. Lieutenant Governor Davis also issued a large number of pardons to persons in jail. Singularly enough, while one of the accusations in the attempted impeachment of Ames was his dismissal of Davis' judicial appointees, Davis was also removed from office in 1876. It was alleged that he had accepted a bribe for granting a pardon. On the other hand, the governor's action in revoking Davis appointments was called by this legislature of 1876 willful, corrupt, and unlawful. It was the especial grievance of the whites that officials and voters were not taxpayers, 
and that a comparatively small number of the colored voters owned real estate. The most that was charged was that the number of offices and agencies with high salaries was needlessly multiplied. The break came, however, between labor and capital inside the Democratic Party. Of course a stubborn and bitter fight for control of the democratic organization was now on between the antagonistic and conflicting elements among the whites. It was to be a desperate struggle between former aristocrats, on one side, and what was known as poor whites on the other. While the aristocrats had always been the weaker in point of numbers, they had been the stronger in point of wealth, intelligence, ability, skill, and experience. As a result of their white experience, and able and skillful management, the aristocrats were successful in the preliminary struggles, as illustrated in the persons of Stevens, Gordon, Brown, and Hill, of Georgia, Daniels and Lee, of Virginia, Hampton and Butler of South Carolina, Lamar and Walthall of Mississippi, and Garland, of Arkansas. But in the course of time and in the natural order of things the poor whites were bound to win. All that was needed was a few years' tutelage and a few daring and unscrupulous leaders to prey upon their ignorance and magnify their vanity, in order to bring them to a realization of the fact that their former political masters were now completely at their mercy, and subject to their will. Point 20. After the presidential election of 1872, Southern white men were not only coming into the Republican Party in large numbers, but the liberal and progressive element of the democracy was in the ascendancy in that organization. That element, therefore, shaped the policy and declared the principles for which that organization stood. This meant the acceptance by all political parties of what was regarded as the settled policy of the national government. In proof of this assertion, a quotation from a political editorial which appeared about that time in the Jackson, Mississippi, clarion the organ of the Democratic Party will not be out of place. In speaking of the colored people and their attitude towards the white, that able and influential paper said, While they the colored people have been naturally tenacious of their newly acquired privileges, their general conduct will bear them witness that they have shown consideration for the feelings of the whites. The race line in politics would not have been drawn if opposition had not been made to their enjoyment of equal privileges in the government, and under the laws after they were emancipated. In other words, the colored people had manifested no disposition to rule or dominate the whites, and the only color line which had existed, grew out of the unwise policy which had previously been pursued by the Democratic Party in its efforts to prevent the enjoyment by the newly emancipated race of the rights and privileges to which they were entitled, under the Constitution and laws of the country. But after the state and congressional elections of 1874, the situation was materially changed. The liberal and conservative element of the democracy was relegated to the rear and the radical element came to the front and assumed charge. Point 21. Here is a record which is not bad. There was no violent revolution in Mississippi. There was no attack upon civilization and culture. There was increased expense, partly for legitimate objects, partly, without doubt, by injudicious and careless expenditure, possibly in some cases by corrupt expenditure. In the fall of 1875 just at the time when the whole state rang with assertions of radical misrule, taxation, and robbery, the author traveled through Mississippi, east and west, north and south, traveled quietly and was personally unknown. At every town and village, at every station on the railroads and every rural neighborhood in the country, he heard Governor Ames and the Republican Party denounced for oppressions, robberies, and dishonesty as proved by the fearful rate of taxation. He asked what was the percent of taxes on the dollar, but never got an answer. One citizen replied, Our taxes are enormous. Another said, They are ruinous. Another, They amount to confiscation. Such were the only replies given. Every form of words that could be used to express excessive taxation was employed. Awful, fearful, intolerable, monstrous, unheard of, incredible, but no man answered the question. For the true answer would have been, the average taxation since Reconstruction has been a little less than nine mils on the dollar, for all purposes. Of this average of less than nine mils on the dollar almost one-fifth was for public schools so that the total annual taxation for all other purposes has been a little over seven mils on the dollar. This was the true answer, 
but every white leaguer knew better than to answer the question, for one of the originators of that order wrote confidentially to an associate that they must appeal to the world as a wretched, downtrodden, and impoverished people. 22. On the whole, one cannot escape the impression that what the whites in Mississippi feared was that the experiment of Negro suffrage might succeed. At any rate, they began a revolution known as the Mississippi Plan. Here was no labor dictatorship or dream of one. White labor took up arms to subdue black labor and to make it helpless economically and politically through the power of property. Senator Revels, of Mississippi, said in the 41st Congress, Mr. President, I maintain that the past record of my race is a true index of the feelings which today animate them. They bear toward their former masters no revengeful thoughts, no hatred, no animosities. They aim not to elevate themselves by sacrificing one single interest of their white fellow citizens. They ask but the rights which are theirs by God's universal law, and which are the natural outgrowth, the logical sequence of the condition in which the legislative enactments of this nation have placed them. They appeal to you and to me to see that they receive that protection which alone will enable them to pursue their daily avocations with success and enjoy the liberties of citizenship on the same footing with their white neighbors and friends. Point 23. John R. Lynch said, when he was counted out of his election, You certainly cannot expect them the Negroes to resort to mob law and brute force, or to use what may be milder language, inaugurate a revolution. My opinion is that revolution is not the remedy to be applied in such cases. Our system of government is supposed to be one of law and order, resting upon the consent of the governed, as expressed through the peaceful medium of the ballot. In all localities where the local public sentiment is so dishonest, so corrupt, and so demoralized, as to tolerate the commission of election frauds, and shield the perpetrators from justice, such people must be made to understand that there is patriotism enough in this country and sufficient love of justice and fair play in the hearts of the American people to prevent any party from gaining the ascendancy in the government that relies upon a fraudulent ballot and a false return as the chief source of its support. The impartial historian will record the fact that the colored people of the South have contended for their rights with a bravery and a gallantry that is worthy of the highest commendation. Being, unfortunately, independent circumstances with the preponderance of the wealth and intelligence against them in some localities, yet they have bravely refused to surrender their honest convictions, even upon the altar of their personal necessities. Point 24. With riot, fraud, boycott, and intimidation, Negro rule was overthrown. William L. Hemingway was nominated against Captain George M. Buchanan, an able and well-qualified man. In an honest election, Buchanan would have been given the office, but Hemingway was declared elected. However, he had been in office only a brief time, when the discovery was made that he was a defaulter to the amount of $315,612.19. Thus reform began. Point 25. In the back districts of Mississippi, the world moved on. In May, 1874, at Burley a Southern Lady writes, Last Wednesday, the bishop, assisted by Mr. Douglas and Heber Crabb, ordained a Mr. Jackson, a Negro as black as any on this land, a deacon in the church. The ceremony was very interesting and Mr. Jackson preached in the afternoon to as enlightened an audience as ever goes to our church. His sermon was admirable and admirably delivered. I have heard but few who read so well, and fewer who have so good a manner. He is a well-educated man, having a considerable knowledge of Latin, Greek, and Hebrew. He has been living in one of the rectory houses for two years, and is a hard student under Mr. Douglas, and is without reproach. Point 26. Louisiana came into the possession of the United States because to St. Louverture and the blacks of Haiti so broke the French colonial power and Napoleon's plans for American empire that he practically gave away French America to the United States and turned his whole attention to Europe. At the first census after the admission of the state, 1810, there were 34,000 whites and the same number of black slaves, and in addition to this, 7,585 free Negroes. In 1820, when Louisiana entered the Union, the white and black population were about equal, both being under 80,000. In 1860, 
there were 350,373 Negroes and 357,456 whites. By 1870, the colored population exceeded the whites by nearly 2,000. The great influx came between 1,840 and 1,860. Among the Negro population, 18,647 in 1,860 were free, and represented mainly descendants of the free Negroes in the territory at the time of the annexation. They were many of them rich and educated, and they formed a most interesting element in the population. The migration to Louisiana after 1840 was of a distinctly lower grade than before exploiters of commercial slavery, slave traders and smugglers, gamblers and desperados. They made the situation for free Negroes much more difficult. Rich colored folk, even those who were well known, were often arrested and mistreated. In 1857, Wycliffe informed the legislature that the immigration of free Negroes from other states of the Union into Louisiana had been steadily increasing for years, that it was a source of great evil, and demanded legislative action. Public policy dictates, the interest of the people requires, that immediate steps should be taken at this time to remove all free Negroes who are now in the state, when such removal can be effected without violation of law. Their example and associations have a most pernicious effect upon our slave population. As a result, in 1858, Emile Desjuns acted as agent for emigration to Haiti, then under the rule of Soluk. Desjuns worked energetically to arrange for the deportation of a large number of colored Lusianians. Unfortunately, a revolution in Haiti stopped the project. The Antebellum Society of Louisiana and particularly of New Orleans, was brilliant and lawless, dueling, gambling and murder were widespread, and there were notorious outbreaks in political life, like the Plaquemine Riot of 1844 and the scenes of violence and intimidation at an election for sheriff in 1853. As late as 1855, the city was in the hands of rival political factions which fought behind barricades in the streets. Governor Hebart said in 1856 that the riot of 1855, if repeated, would sink us to the level of the anarchical governments of Spanish America, that before the occurrence of those great public crimes, the hideous enormity of which he could not describe, and which were committed with impunity in mid-daylight and in the presence of hundreds of persons, no one could have admitted even the possibility that a bloodthirsty mob could have contemplated to overawe any portion of the people of this state in the exercise of their most valuable rights, but that which would then have been denied, even as a possibility, is now an historical fact. 27. The following year, Governor Wycliffe added. It is well known that at the last two general elections many of the streets and approaches to the polls were completely in the hands of organized ruffians, who committed acts of violence on multitudes of our naturalized fellow citizens, who dared venture to exercise the rights of suffrage. Thus nearly one-third of the registered voters of New Orleans have been deterred from exercising their highest and most sacred prerogative. The suppression of such elections is an open and palpable fraud on the people, and I recommend you to adopt such measures as shall effectually prevent the true will of the majority from being totally silenced. The New Orleans Delta said, May 6, 1860. For seven years the world knows that this city, in all its departments, judicial, legislative, and executive, has been at the absolute disposal of the most godless, brutal, ignorant, and ruthless ruffianism the world has ever heard of since the days of the great Roman conspirator. By means of a secret organization, emanating from that fecund source of political infamy, New England, and named no nothingism or Samiism from boasted exclusive devotion of the fraternity to the United States, our city, far from being the abode of decency, of liberality, generosity, and justice, is a sanctum for crime. The ministers of the law, nominees of blood-stained, vulgar, ribald caballeros and licensed murderers, shed innocent blood on the most public thoroughfares with impunity, witnesses of the most atrocious crimes are either spirited away, bought off, or intimidated from testifying, perjured associates are retained to prove alibis, 
and ready bail is always procurable for the immediate use of those whom it is not immediately prudent to enlarge otherwise. The electoral system is a farce and fraud, the knife, the slingshot, the brass knuckles determining, while the shame is being enacted, who shall occupy and administer the offices of the municipality and the commonwealth. Governor Wells said in 1866, It is within the knowledge of all citizens resident here before the war, that for years preceding the rebellion, elections in the parish of Orleans were a cruel mockery of free government. Bands of organized desperados, immediately preceding and during an election, committed every species of outrage upon peaceful and unoffending citizens, to intimidate them from the exercise of the inestimable privilege of free men, the elective franchise. A registry of 14,000 names, in the days alluded to, could scarcely furnish one-fourth of that number of legal votes at the polls, although six or seven thousand votes were usually returned as cast.28. Even the system of slavery in Louisiana differed from the Southern South, and many slaveholders frankly made it their policy to work the slaves to death and buy new ones instead of taking care of the old and sick. Intermixture of races was reduced to a recognized system by the regular importation of handsome colored slave girls for sale from the border states, and by a carefully regulated system of colored common law wives. One must add to this, the mulatto free Negro group in most cases descended from white fathers who had taken colored wives and whose children were often educated abroad. The grandchildren became now white, now colored, according to the choice or tint of skin. As a result, to this day it is difficult in Louisiana to draw the line between the races. Not long ago, when a prominent white man of a certain parish was accused of Negro blood, the courthouse, with all its vital records, was burned down that night. Recently, a small group of colored people in New Orleans, all born since 1880, sat down and compared notes as to people whom they knew personally. They made a list of 60 families of Negro descent, who, in their knowledge and in their time, had gone over to the white race and whose children had no knowledge of their Negro descent. The condition of Louisiana after the war was desperate. The federal commander said, The resources of this state are infinitely reduced by the casualties of the war. The commerce, whose innumerable wheels used to vex the turbid current of the Mississippi, has passed away the result of war. Plantations which used to bloom through your entire land, until the coast of Louisiana was a sort of repetition of the Garden of Eden, are now dismantled and broken down. Trade, commerce, everything, crippled. You have to make revenues where the taxable property of the state is reduced almost two-thirds. You have to hold the appliances and surroundings of government, and maintaining and keeping up to a great extent nearly every charity which belongs to the city or state. The levies, on which the life of your country depends, which from local causes cannot be repaired by civil authorities, must be attended to by the United States, and a sum of $160,000 is being laid out now by the United States for the purpose of preventing this delta of the Mississippi from being subject to overflow. Point 29. We have seen in Chapter 7 how Banks and Shepley, under Lincoln, had attempted to reconstruct Louisiana in 1864. At the same time, a rival Confederate government at Shreveport recognized the right of all whites to vote voted $500,000 to pay for slaves lost by death or otherwise, or while impressed for public works of the state, and decreed the death penalty for any slave bearing arms against the Confederate states. When Hahn was elected to the Senate, Wells became governor, March 14, 1865. Wells was a native Lusianian, a large planter, and had been an opponent of secession. His ambition was to restore the planters to power and have them recognize the new dispensation. As a result, he was caught between two fires, Sheridan told Stanton that Wells was a political trickster and a dishonest man, while the planters, once they got hands on power, overrode his advice, until he had to take refuge with the radicals. On April 14, Lincoln was assassinated. President Johnson recognized Wells as provisional governor of Louisiana. The governor at once ordered an election for state and national officers, on the ground that the previous registration of 1864 was fraudulent and that many Negroes were on the list, 
although Wells refrained from mentioning this fact explicitly. There appeared three political parties, the National Republicans, headed by Durant, the Conservative Union, headed by Wells, and the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party held a state convention and adopted a platform which declared that Louisiana is a government of white people, made and to be perpetuated for the exclusive political benefit of the white race, and in accordance with the constant adjudication of the United States Supreme Court, that the people of African descent cannot be considered as citizens of the United States, and that there can in no event nor under any circumstances by any equality between the whites and other races. The Democratic or Conservative candidates were overwhelmingly elected and the new legislature was composed almost entirely of ex-Confederates. The Republican Party put no candidate in the field. At the first session of the legislature, a resolution was adopted declaring that the Constitution of 1864 was a creation of fraud, violence, and corruption, and protested against seating Hahn and Cutler in the United States Senate. The legislature tried to reorganize the city government, the bill was vetoed by Wells, but was promptly passed over the governor's veto and John T. Monroe was elected mayor. He had led the mobs of ruffians in 1854-1856. Two governors had complained about him, and Butler had been obliged to put him in jail. He later engineered the riot of 1866. The government now proceeded to oppress Negroes and Union men. Thousands were insulted and assaulted. Organized violence was common throughout the state. Negroes were whipped and killed, and no one was punished. Rebel sympathizers were rapidly replacing loyal officials, and the public schools were reconstructed. 110 of the northern or loyal teachers were dismissed and their places filled by intolerant southerners. Union men of business began to give up and move out of the state. The principal departure of General Hancock, who succeeded Sheridan, from the policy pursued by his predecessors, related to the organization of juries. General Sheridan had issued an order requiring the state authorities to make no distinction as to race or color in the organization of juries. General Hancock superseded this order by one remanding the subject to the state authorities and the civil courts, and in order to avoid the annoyance of frequent applications to him for his intervention in private suits and controversies, he issued an order declaring that the administration of civil justice appertains to the regular courts. By decision of the state Supreme Court, there could never be any equality between white and other races. Above all, this legislature passed the Black Codes. Ficklin questions whether all this proposed legislation was actually enacted into law. Certainly, it represented the clear wish of the legislature, and was regarded as law. Afterward, the Reconstruction Legislature took especial pains to repeal these enactments. They were among the worst of the Black Codes, and virtually reenacted slavery. They were supplemented by extraordinary local ordinances like that of the town of Franklin.30. All of these acts of the legislature and municipal regulations meant the practical re-establishment of slavery in the state of Louisiana. The acts were passed within the first 15 days of its first session. This legislation and the various instances of widespread wanton violence and ostracism aroused the union men of the state and the nation, and they determined to organize for their own protection, and for the protection of the freedmen and the old free Negroes before the war.31. The Free Negro Group early organized to guide the Negroes. Three colored refugees from San Domingo published and edited an unusually effective organ for the Negroes, called the New Orleans Tribune. One was Dr. J. T. Raudinez, who spent $35,500 to keep this paper going. He was an eminent physician, and his companions were men of intelligence. The paper was published in French and English, from 1864 until sometime in 1869. Most of the time it was published weekly, but it ran as a daily during 1865, and was thus the first Negro daily in America. It attacked the serfdom under banks, planned for Negro economic cooperation, and opposed the Freedmen's Bureau when it was turned over to Southerners under General Fullerton. It carried on a war against the Johnson legislature, sending copies to every member of Congress, and printing all of the iniquitous labor laws. For a long time its editor was Paul Trevine, 
a colored man born in 1825, his father had fought in the War of 1812, and he was well trained, speaking several languages. At great personal peril and with dauntless courage, he battered his way to Negro freedom. On January 8, 1865, the Tribune called attention to a convention of colored men of Louisiana, which will meet tomorrow in this city. It pointed out that three principal points, for some time past, have been kept in view, by our leading men, and will unquestionably be brought before the convention. The first is the permanent organization and centralization of our leagues and societies, the second is the foundation upon a solid basis of a permanent board, entrusted with the interests of our population, and the third is the particular welfare of the freedmen. This convention attacked the economic situation directly and with far-sighted prudence. It organized a Bureau of Industry in New Orleans under a superintendent and assistants. It was for the relief of distress, for establishing a Bureau of Information especially for colored soldiers and their relatives, and for buying and selling produce and other necessaries on a cooperative basis. Direct trade with France was planned. The Tribune, from the first, strongly defended Negro suffrage. January 17, the Tribune said. At the present time, when our state is entering into a new period of her social career, we must spare no means at our command to bring her under a truly democratic system of labor, glancing at the attempt recently made in Europe to organize a plan of credit for the people, which is worthy of our studies and investigations. We, too, need credit for the laborers, we cannot expect complete and perfect freedom for the working men, as long as they remain the tools of capital, and are deprived of the legitimate product of the sweat of their brow. We have denied time and again that the right of suffrage was confined among the whites to those distinguished by a high degree of civilization. But we assert that the sons and grandsons of the colored men who were recognized French citizens, under the French rule, and whose rights were reserved in the Treaty of Cession taken away from them since 1803 are not savages and uncivilized inhabitants of the wild swamps of Louisiana. We contend that the freedmen, who proved intelligent enough to shed their blood in defense of freedom and the national flag, are competent to cast their votes into the ballot box. April 2, the Tribune said. The colored man will have to be called to the ballot box, as he has been called in the ranks. The black man had to fight the battles of union and freedom with his musket, he will have to fight them too with the ballot. Loyalty does not dwell in the white population of the South taken as a mass. But loyalty lives in the hearts of the colored men. Can the United States find friends where they have none or very few? They cannot. But the cause of universal freedom will find friends and defenders in the class of men who are longing for their liberties. Louisiana and all the southern states want an entire renovation of the political element, a renovation of the masses of voters. This superior understanding places the future into the hands of the radical party. The game that the Free State Party has lost by its incompetency, the radicals will win by their understanding of the times. They are still in the background, but one day, and one single act of Congress, or a single change of policy in the military ruling of the conquered territory, will bring them into power. February 22, 1865, the efforts of this group culminated in the formation of a Freedmen's Aid Association. It was an ambitious cooperative effort, thus described by the Tribune, February 24. Several plantations were leased to gangs of laborers working for their own account. Seeds, mules, and agricultural implements were distributed among these freedmen not as a gratuitous gift but in the character of a loan, leaving to the laborer all his dignity and independence. These associations of capital, furnished by small shares to freedmen who possess nothing more than their industry, good faith, and courage, are destined not only to become powerful, but they will also enrich the state. They will inaugurate a new regime, and for the first time give a chance to field laborers to obtain their rightful share in the proceeds of the sweat of their brows. Time will bring up a legislation appropriate to the necessities of the case. But now, at the start, we have to prepare the ground, under all disadvantages, for this important economical and social reform. The Free Negro Group, and the intelligent freedmen, were thus bidding for the economic leadership of the mass of freed slaves, 
and offering them democratic sharing in the profits. For this role, they had many rivals the planters, the military commanders and their agents, and the immigrant northern capitalists. Of the planters, the Tribune said, March 1st. The planters are no longer needed in the character of masters. But they intend still to be needed as capitalists, and through the necessity of moneyed help, to retain their hold on the unfortunate people they have so long oppressed. It is that hold that every friend of justice and liberty is bound to break. As capital is needed to work the plantations, let the people themselves make up this capital. Our basis for labor must now be put on a democratic footing. There is no more room, in the organization of our society, for an oligarchy of slaveholders, or property holders. These efforts of the free colored people to lead the freedmen toward economic emancipation soon ran afoul of the military authorities and their plans for using Negro labor. Banks had inaugurated a system of serfdom with schools and many excellent features, but with other provisions which insulted the free Negroes and hindered real emancipation. Negroes, free and freed, especially objected to the past system established ostensibly to stop the spread of smallpox, but kept at the demand of the planters in order to hold Negroes on the plantations. The Tribune said, April 30th. The smallpox passes will remain as an instructive feature in the history of abolition in Louisiana. It is one of those marks of servitude which are enforced upon us in view of controlling a population that has been declared free that has to be let free. It is a deception practiced upon the emancipated slaves, who receive from one hand their liberty, and are deprived by the other hand of one of their most precious privileges the right of moving at will. It is an outrage upon the old free-colored men, who used that right during the darkest and most gloomy years of the slavery regime, and now are deprived of the exercise of their traditional liberties. It is well for the world at large to know how practical liberty is understood in Louisiana. When in 1865, appeal was made to General Hurlbert for closer cooperation between the Negro leaders and the army, he replied. If instead of assembling in mass meetings and wasting your time in high-sounding resolutions, you would devote yourselves to assisting in the physical and moral improvement of the freedmen, you would do some practical good. He added. There has always been a bitterness of feeling among the slaves and the free-colored people. Junius not a rich creole, answered him, March 31st. I am sure it is a well-known fact, and that too, beyond successful controversy, that the old free-colored people of this city and state have done and are doing all that is in their power to morally and physically improve the condition of the new freedmen. Ever since the occupation of this city by the military forces of the United States in April, 1862, the free-colored people of this city and state have night and day been working for and in the interest of the new freedmen. Even under the administration of Major General B. F. Butler, when slavery was recognized by the authorities of the United States government, free public schools were opened under the auspices of the free-colored people, and no distinction was made in regard to the former status of the pupils and numerous other evidences can be produced showing that no sooner was slavery killed and the black code destroyed in this state all who were formerly afraid to do anything in the direction of moral or physical assistance of the former bondsmen, entered into the work vigorously, and have accomplished great good. The work is still going on increasing from day to day, and more would have been accomplished, but for the poverty of our people, who have been in the midst of war and all its dissolution for over four years more would have been accomplished but for the policy of certain intriguers who have ingratiated themselves into our confidence, and have in the end deceived us. All that is required by the free-colored people of Louisiana is justice, and without it, they are not free. The free people of color own over 20 millions of taxable property acquired honestly under a system of oppression worse than ever existed since the foundation of the world, and but for the free labor system established by banks would now be paying taxes on over double the amount. The Freedmen's Aid Association has now in hand four plantations. They will soon have 20, every one of these plantations is a death blow to this free labor system, and the cultivation of the plantations by freedmen will show their capacity in their new career. When Johnson became president, the colored leaders had firm faith in his economic program. There is, in fact, no true Republican government, unless the land, and wealth in general, 
are distributed among the great mass of the inhabitants. The policy of the new president will be, therefore, of enforcing the laws of confiscation, granting homesteads to northern immigrants, soldiers and southern loyalists, and dividing the property among a great number of freeholders, who will feel interested to support the new order of things, and to defend the federal government. To enforce this faith, the Negroes knew it was necessary to be represented in Washington, and in May they communicated with several southern states on the matter of sending such delegations. The Tribune, May 31, said. Such a delegation at Washington this winter, from each of the southern states, would have a great tendency toward answering any objections that might be adduced against a Reconstruction policy that would admit the justness of the black man's right to equality before the law, and most of all, the moral of such delegations will show that the colored people of the South are really awake to their interests. For Messrs. Editors, if civil authority again assumes sway legitimately here, and is acknowledged by the executive and legislative authorities, we may expect and prepare also for mobs of white against colored laborers, and white mechanics against colored mechanics, like the ironmongers of Cincinnati, the plug uglies of Baltimore, the flatheads of New York, the moyamensing boys of Philadelphia, and the Irish mobs of Detroit, Chicago, and New York City. But more of mobs hereafter. If we desire to prevent these outrages from being our future inheritance, on account of our active and exerted influence and friendship and love of the Union, send a delegation to Washington, and say to Congress, there never will be domestic tranquility in Louisiana so long as the most truly loyal portion of the people of this state are left at the mercy of the men who have for four years been attempting to destroy the Union. When the campaign was on for the election of 1865, the colored leaders criticized the conservative address in the Tribune, August 11. It is signed by ex-judge Louis Davenout and Spencer G. Hamilton. It gives us the astounding news that at the breaking out of the rebellion, Louisiana was governed by wholesome and just laws. Give us your authority for this, gentlemen, point us to the book and page. The fact that you immediately afterward refer us to the abundant harvest with which we used to be blessed, leads us to suppose that in your opinion these wholesome and just laws were found in the infamous Black Code, by virtue of which the life of the poor man was worn out in laboring for the princely planters. The address assures us that before the war, we enjoyed life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. We were plunged into war by ambitious men upon supposed and contemplated wrongs. Why not name the men? It could do no harm to know their names. It labors under great fears from the party, which it admits exists in this state, advocating the pernicious doctrine of universal suffrage, with a view of conferring upon the emancipated Negro the right of suffrage. The address does not, however, say a word in favor of the Negro not emancipated, and who was always free. Why use the word emancipated? Are the men of color who were born free entitled to suffrage in your opinion? If so, why not make the admission? At the same time, the Tribune, September 14, attested the growing unity of the Negro group. We no longer hear of classes of colored men some to claim the electoral franchise because they are rich, some because they are lettered, some because they bore an Uncle Sam's musket. All this was sheer aristocracy, and among those neglected there were men as good, as true, as patriotic and as intelligent, as among the privileged classes. When citizens undertake to claim a right for themselves, they must claim it as a principle, and therefore speak in the name of all who are deprived of the same immunities. As long as they do not consider the question from a high standpoint, as long as they overlook the principle for a mere expediency, they will have no force whatever. It was this year that the new element of carpetbaggers began to be felt in Louisiana. Hitherto, there had been the planter class, the military authorities, and the free colored people, all striving for leadership of the freedmen. Now came the disbanded Union officers, the new small capitalists of the North, or those who represented them, although themselves without capital. Foremost among these was Henry Clay Warmoth. Warmoth took up his residence in Louisiana in 1865. He was a young Union officer, then only 23 years of age, and had an astonishing career. He was an unmoral buccaneer, shrewd, likable, 
and efficient, who for ten years was practical master of the state of Louisiana. He represented those white men, northern and southern, currently called carpetbaggers and scalawags, who were either small capitalists or aspired to become rich, and whose business it was to manipulate the labor vote, white and black. Some of them in many states, we have shown, were men of ability and vision, but most of those in Louisiana who were honest and forthright were early driven out by the turmoil and lawlessness. Types like Warmoth and Carter, who stayed, represented the carpetbagger and scalawag at their worst. A Negro preacher described the types, he said that the carpetbagger came south and stole enough to fill his carpetbag, but that the scalawag, knowing the woods and swamps better, succeeded in stealing the full carpetbag.32. Warmoth was a poor white of southern extraction, whose great-grandfather was born in Virginia, and whose grandfather moved to Illinois. His father was in the Mexican War, and Warmoth was born in Illinois in 1842. He declares in his biography, that he had not a drop of any other than southern blood in my veins. I think I may say at 87 years of age, that I was never a Louisiana carpet beggar, though I might, in common parlance, be termed a scalawag. 33. The Republican Party of Louisiana had been organized in 1863. It was composed of 26 members, of whom 21 were Union white men, and five free Negroes who had never been slaves and who were all nearly white, men of wealth and education. This committee issued a call for a convention which assembled in New Orleans, September 27, 1865. A state committee was formed which proceeded to organize the Union Republican Party of Louisiana. There were 111 delegates, of whom 19 were free Negroes, and one a freedman. Warmoth was corresponding secretary of the state committee, and some of the free colored men were on the committee. Two of the resolutions said, Resolved that the system of slavery heretofore existing in Louisiana, and the laws and ordinances passed from time to time to support it, have ceased to exist, and we protest against any and all attempts to substitute in their place a system of serfdom, or forced labor in any shape. Resolved that the necessities of the nation called the colored men into public service in the most honorable of all duties that of the soldier fighting for the integrity of his country and the security of the constitutional government, this, with his loyalty, patience, and prudence, is sufficient to assure Congress of the justice and safety of giving him a vote to protect his liberty.34. This convention conceived the idea of adopting the congressional theory that Louisiana was a territory, and holding a voluntary election for a delegate to Congress. The colored people, especially, fell in with the idea, and carried it through. The Tribune, September 2, bore testimony to the unity of effort and feeling and the work of two colored men who originated the idea Crane and Dunn. Too much praise cannot be given to the Central Executive Committee for their strenuous efforts toward the organization of such a move, without the force of law and on the basis of voluntary cooperation. It has taken several weeks to complete the preliminary arrangements. All members of the committee have heartily contributed their shares. We must, however, mention in a more particular manner the services of two of these members. When the importance of the move will be fully understood and its consequences developed, their names will remain more particularly connected with that work. It is with Mr. W. R. Crane that the first idea originated. It is the same member who prepared the various resolutions bearing on the subject. He advocated his plan with the conviction of its usefulness, and through industry and perseverance, has succeeded in removing all objections, and in carrying it through. Next to him, Mr. O. J. Dunn has a fair right to our gratitude. With private means only, he organized a machinery covering the whole city of New Orleans, and secured the voluntary and gratuitous concourse of the numerous commissioners and clerks. These two names will ever remain connected with the history of Reconstruction in 1865. It was the first successful effort of the whole Negro group in political cooperation, and the disfranchised citizens expressed their debt of gratitude in the Tribune, November 4, to the commissioners and clerks of registration, who, during two months, attended with a zeal equal only to their disinterestedness, to the tedious business of registering the names of the political pariahs. 
this debt will be paid by the just esteem and well-earned respect of their fellow citizens. On the crest of this wave of unprecedented effort, rose the figure of Warmoth. Thomas J. Durant, a Southern Unionist who had cooperated with Lincoln in restoring Louisiana, was the nominee by acclamation. He declined the doubtful honor, and Warmoth, handsome, charming and of fine military bearing, was finally substituted, since it was political wisdom to send a white man to Washington, and few others were willing to take the risk. Warmoth was more than willing. He was a born gambler, of unflinching courage in causes good and bad. The election was held just before the Johnson Reconstruction State Legislature met, and Warmoth received 19,396 votes in 13 parishes, or nearly twice as many as the number which Lincoln had recognized as sufficient to admit the state. Naturally, most of these votes were cast by Negroes. Warmoth was careful, however, to have the Secretary of State affix his seal to a certificate attesting that the election had been held. He then went to Washington and spent several months getting acquainted with the Reconstruction leaders. He was accorded a seat on the floor of the House, while the senators and representatives elected by Johnson's legislature had to cool their heels in the galleries. This election was a shrewd move on the part of the Negroes, and brought the rivalry of Johnson and Congress conspicuously to the fore in Louisiana. Governor Wells found himself soon in an untenable position. He had opposed secession before the war but as a planter and southerner, when he came into power, he tried to unite the leading white persons of the state back of his administration, on a platform acceptable to President Johnson. Once in power, his followers broke away and were determined to re-establish the antebellum status in all essential particulars. It was this movement that was back of the black codes and the oppression of Union whites and Negroes. Said the Tribune, May 10, 1865. Were the planters willing to bestow the same amount of money upon the laborers as additional wages, as they pay to runners and waste in dishonest means of compulsion, they would have drawn as many voluntary and faithful laborers as they now obtain reluctant ones. But there are harpies, who, most of them, were in the slave trade, and who persuade planters to use them as brokers to supply the plantations with hands, at the same time using all means to deceive the simple and unsophisticated laborer. The planters in the legislature elected in 1865, proposed April 7, 1866, a convention for a new constitution. Wells vetoed the bill. Then a bill passed the House by a two-thirds majority to restore the antebellum constitution by legislative enactment. Two members of the House were sent to Washington to confer with Johnson. Johnson was in the midst of his fight with Congress, and he strongly advised against the move. Governor Wells was desperate. If the planters engineered a new constitutional convention, such a convention would be dominated by reaction and invite the vengeance of Congress. Wells, therefore, determined to reconvene the Constitutional Convention of 1864. He had a more or less shadowy legal right to do this, but the meeting of this convention meant that Negro suffrage would be recognized, at least to some extent. Probably. According to the Lincoln formula, Negroes of intelligence, those who owned a certain amount of property, and former soldiers, would get the right to vote. If such a convention could have met in Louisiana in 1866, it would have been epoch-making, it would have turned the flank of the Johnson phalanx and anticipated and softened the rigor of the Reconstruction Acts. The prospect of such a consummation was too much for the Louisiana Bourbons and they determined to meet it by reopening civil war. Wells was a man of no courage, and instead of placing himself resolutely at the head of this movement, he kept out of the way and induced a member of the Convention of 1864 to issue a call summoning a meeting July 30 in the Mechanics Institute, New Orleans. He followed this by a proclamation ordering special elections in the large number of parishes not represented in 1864. The excitement was intense. A prominent judge harangued the grand jury against the meeting. The mayor told the general in command of the United States Army that he proposed to prevent the assembly. General Baird doubted the mayor's authority, but did nothing. Most of the leaders in this movement stayed away from the opening, and in fact, only a small number of members accepted the call, but Monroe, 
also chief of a secret society known as the Southern Cross, armed his police and the mob, who wore white handkerchiefs on their necks. A signal shot was fired, and the mob deployed across the head of Dryad's Street, moved upon the State House, and shot down the people who were in the hall. The Reverend Dr. Horton waving a white handkerchief, cried to the police, Gentlemen, I beseech you to stop firing, we are non-combatants. If you want to arrest us, make any arrest you please, we are not prepared to defend ourselves. Some of the police, it is claimed, replied, we don't want any prisoners, you have all got to die. Dr. Horton was shot and fell, mortally wounded. Dr. Dosti who was an object of special animosity on account of his inflammatory addresses was a marked victim. Shot through the spine, and with a sword thrust through his stomach, he died a few days later. There were about 150 persons in the hall, mostly Negroes. Seizing chairs, they beat back the police three times, and barred the doors. But the police returned to the attack, firing their revolvers as they came. Some of the Negroes returned the fire, but most of them leaped from the windows in wild panic. In some cases they were shot as they came down or as they scrambled over the fence at the bottom. The only member of the convention, however, that was killed was a certain John Henderson. Some six or seven hundred shots were fired. Negroes were pursued, and in some cases were killed on the streets. One of them, two miles from the scene, was taken from his shop and wounded in the side, hip, and back. The dead and wounded were piled upon drays and carried off.35. Some say that 48 were killed outright, 68 were severely wounded, and 98 slightly wounded in the hall and on the streets. Other reports say that 38 people were killed and 148 wounded, and of the 38, all but four were colored. As Sheridan said, it was no riot. It was an absolute massacre. Too late. General Baird and the federal soldiers arrived and proclaimed martial law. Mayor Monroe's threat to break up the convention succeeded completely and, but for the appearance of United States troops, the killing would undoubtedly have been much greater than it was 36. After this, many Union men left the state permanently, and the new rule of organized anarchy ensued. The New Orleans riot was a characteristic gesture of the time and place. Most of the elected white members of the convention kept in the background to see what trouble was brewing. Negroes assembled, most of them as spectators, to find out what was going to be done for their enfranchisement. It was these black spectators upon whom the brunt of murder and assassination fell. There was an unusual moral aftermath to this inexcusable slaughter, in that it helped turn the national election of 1866 overwhelmingly against Andrew Johnson. It was against this background of lawlessness and murder, this practical reopening of the Civil War, that Congressional Reconstruction began. Under the National Reconstruction Act in Louisiana, 127,639 registered, of whom 82,907 were blacks. When Negro suffrage seemed inevitable, some effort was made on the part of the planters to gain the Negroes' support. They began by cajoling the field hands. In a meeting in Rapides Parish, held by the planters, they said they would hold in high esteem the freedmen among us who range themselves on our side. Duncan F. Kenner, a prominent politician, urged the people to accept Negroes and to try and gain their vote for the South. General P. G. T. Beauregard, who began the fighting at Fort Sumter and wanted to raise the black flag after emancipation, said, if the suffrage of the Negro is properly handled and directed, we shall defeat our adversaries with their own weapons. The Negro is Southern-born. With a little education, and a property qualification, he can be made to take an interest in the affairs of the South and in its prosperity. He will fight with the Whites. 37. On March 18, General Longstreet, a Confederate general, published two open letters advising submission to Congress. It becomes us to insist that suffrage be extended in all the states and fully tested 38 other prominent Confederates agreed. Longstreet's wife afterward declared that this was the noblest act of her husband's life. But these overtures of a few planters were more than neutralized by the bulk of white Southern opinion, which was bitter beyond description. 
All Republicans were bitterly assailed, the shameless, heartless, vile, grasping, deceitful, creeping, crawling, wallowing, slimy, slippery, hideous, loathsome, political pirates who, in the name of God and liberty, robbed the South and put the Southern states under a black government. 39 Everything was said that would disparage or discredit the officials. Nothing was said to explain, or justify their acts or their conduct. 40. On the 25th of April, seven days after the election of officers under the new constitution, the courier of the Techa said. 14 men, having a covering of white skin over their flesh, have voted for the mongrel constitution in the parish of St. Martin. May they be pointed out with the finger of scorn by all honorable men. May they be despised and hated by every living creature. May their wives, if such creatures can have wives, remain barren, that their descendants may not rot in jail or die of exhaustion in houses of ill fame. The banner, the leading paper in its congressional district, said on the 20th of June, as the Republican members of the legislature and state government were assembling in New Orleans, these miserable devils are worse than the itch, smallpox, measles, overflow, drafts and pestilence. On the other hand, Negroes kept hammering at their economic condition. A meeting was held in the First African Church in May, 1867, to colonize colored laborers on colored homesteads. From this time until the new Constitutional Convention met, the Tribune pled for a high class of delegates to the convention. From the president down to the doorkeeper, and from the clerk and the chief reporter down to the printer, the choices should be made so as to convince the people of the state that the supremacy of a privileged class will be no longer fostered, and the time has come when the representatives of the colored race can find favor as well as white men. It is to be demonstrated that long services and unfaltering devotion to the cause of radicalism shall obtain the reward, irrespective of color or race, and to that effect it is important to choose officers from among both populations. But there is something more. It is important to show that the oppressed race will not be overlooked, that from this time forward the rights of the neglected race will be recognized to share in all departments of our state government. The convention will have many things to do to break the spell under which we were laboring. The choice of officers will, therefore, have a political bearing, and cannot be dictated by fitness only. The convention will meet under very peculiar circumstances circumstances of originality and grandeur. It will be the first constitutional assembly, the first official body ever convened in the United States without distinction of race or color. It will be the first mixed assemblage, clothed with a public character. As such this convention has to take a position in immediate contradiction with the old assemblies of the white man's government. They will have to show that a new order will succeed the former order of things, and that the long-neglected race will, at last, effectually share in the government of the state. Point 41. By agreement, the 98 delegates to the Louisiana Convention consisted of 49 Negroes and 49 whites. Among the Negroes were many free-colored men of intelligence, property, and character. But when it was suggested that subordinate officers be equally divided between the races, PBS Pinchback, one of the colored leaders, objected, and declared that was placing race above merit. The Negro members of the Constitutional Convention took a prominent and effective part. They were largely represented on committees, such as the Committee of Thirteen on Rules and Regulations, where they had four members. In several cases, they acted as chairman of committees, as in the case of the Committee on the Militia, and the Committee on the Bill of Rights. Their attitude, however, is best seen in the report of the committee to draft a constitution. The five white members of the committee, and the four colored members, differed in certain essential particulars, and sent in respectively a majority and minority report. The chief points of difference were these, the white men wished to deprive all of the leaders of the Confederacy of the right to vote or hold office, while the colored men would allow them to vote, but restricted their right to hold office. The white men wished to prevent any law being passed regulating labor, or fixing wages. The colored men wished no such restrictions and also demanded that children bound out under the former black laws should be returned to their parents and relatives. The white men made provisions for the education of youth, 
but the coloured men were more specific and demanded at least one free public school in every parish, to be provided for by public taxation, and with no distinction as to race and sex. They also asked for a university with six faculties, and a state lottery for the support of education and charity. While the white men wanted 98 state representatives, the coloured men wanted 102, which probably gave certain coloured sections a larger representation. In the final constitution, a compromise provided that no law should be passed fixing the price of manual labour, that there should be 101 representatives, that Confederate leaders could neither vote nor hold office, and that the coloured men's proposal for education, including no separation in schools and a university, should prevail. The coloured men assented to this constitution, but two of them, Pinchback and Blandon, together with two white men, protested against the disfranchisement of former Confederates, as we are now and ever have been advocates of universal suffrage. 42 It is interesting to note that the coloured men who published the Daily Tribune were the official printers of the Convention Journal. The Convention adopted the Constitution, March 19, 1868. This Constitution made the Negroes equal to the whites and provided equal rights and privileges, public schools were thrown open to both races. All adult male citizens resident in Louisiana for one year could vote, except certain classes of Confederates. The labor laws passed by the Democratic Legislature of 1865 were declared null and void. The planters reviled the Constitution, and called it the work of the lowest and most corrupt body of men ever assembled in the South. It was the work of ignorant Negroes, cooperating with a gang of white adventurers, strangers to our interests and our sentiments. It was originated by carpetbaggers, and was carried through by such arguments as are printed on greenback paper. It was one of the long catalogues of schemes of corruption which make up the whole history of that iniquitous radical conclave. 43. In the face of this, the laws of Louisiana, as codified on the basis of this constitution and subsequent legislation, were finally adopted in three main codes, signed by the black lieutenant governor of the state, Oscar J. Dunn, and remain to this day as the basic law of the state. The free Negroes had since the war increased in numbers, wealth, and intelligence. On the other hand, the mass of the freedmen were ignorant and inexperienced and much lower in status, because of their harsh slavery, than even the Negroes of South Carolina. They had, however, two ever-insistent demands, land to cultivate and public schools. They had almost impoverished themselves under banks to keep their schools going, and while their demand for land never reached the definite expression that it did elsewhere, it was always the great motivating ideal. The colored people produced some notable leaders during Reconstruction. Oscar J. Dunn ran away from slavery and finally bought his freedom, he had laid the foundation for a good education before he became free. Dunn was the only one of the seven colored men who sat in the state senate in 1868 who had been a slave. 44 He was lieutenant governor, 1868-1870, and was a man of courage and firmness. He was admitted by the Democrats to be incorruptible, in the view of the Caucasian chiefs, the taint of honesty, and of a scrupulous regard for the official proprieties is a serious drawback and enervating reproach upon the lieutenant governor 45 his sudden death in November, 1871, was a severe loss. Pinchback, son of a white man, and himself indistinguishable from white in personal appearance, was born in Georgia, educated in Cincinnati, and had been a captain in the army. He was intelligent and capable, but a leader of different caliber from Dunn. He was a practical politician and played the politician's game. Yet there were limits beyond which he would not go. To all intents and purposes, he was an educated, well-to-do, congenial white man, with but a few drops of Negro blood, which he did not stoop to deny, as so many of his fellow whites did. Pinchback succeeded Dunn as lieutenant governor, and when Warmoth was impeached in December, 1872, Pinchback became for a few days governor of the state. C. C. Antoine later was also lieutenant governor. The legislature sent J. H. Menard, a colored man, as one of the representatives of the lower house in Congress, but he was refused his seat. 
Antoine de Buclet was state treasurer during 1868 to 1879. He conducted his office for 18 years without mistake or criticism. Politicians tried to find something wrong with his records, and the Aldiger Committee was appointed to examine the archives of the Treasury. They secured three expert accountants to investigate the Treasury for six months. The honesty and efficiency of the Treasurer was confirmed. There were the following colored officials in Louisiana 46. Charles E. Nash, Congressman, 1874-76, 44th Congress. PBS Pinchback, Governor, 1872, 43 days, Lieutenant Governor, 1871 to 72. Oscar J. Dunn, Lieutenant Governor, 1868 to 71. C. C. Antoine, Lieutenant Governor, 1872 to 76. P. G. Desland, Secretary of State. 1,872 to 76. Antoine de Buclet, State Treasurer, 1,868 to 69. W. G. Brown, Superintendent of Public Education, 1,872 to 76. Augustin G. Jones, once Chancery Clerk of Assumption Parish was a direct descendant of the hero John Paul Jones of Revolutionary War fame who was captain of the Bonhomme Richard. Several of his daughters are now teachers in the New Orleans Public Schools.47. In addition there were, between 1868 and 1896, 32 colored state senators and 95 representatives. These colored leaders had a task of enormous difficulty, much more so than those of South Carolina or Mississippi. They differed in origin and education. Some looked white, some black, some born free and rich, the recipients of good education, some were ex-slaves, with no formal training. They were faced with an intricate social tangle among the whites. Economic and social differences were, in Louisiana, more complicated than in any other American state, and this makes the history of Reconstruction more difficult to follow. First of all, there were the planters, rich before the war, largely officers and leaders in the Confederate Army, and now returned, embittered and widely impoverished. Then there were the host of traders, capitalists and adventurers, who had come down during and just after the war to seek a new field for investment in the conquered country, who were, naturally, regarded more or less as harpies. The number was formidable, for already by the fall of 1866, Ficklin says between 5 and 10,000 Union soldiers had settled in the state. 48. Among these were Warmoth and Kellogg. Add to these, the Scalawags the large number of whites, both planters and others, who became Union men during and after the war. Another factor was the numerous poor whites in the northern part of the state. Living close to the subsistence line on the thin soil of the Pine Hills back of the bottom lands, without schools, with but few churches, given to rude sports and crude methods of farming, their ignorance and prejudice bred in them after the emancipation of the Negro, a dread of sinking to the social level of the blacks. The dread, in turn, bred hatred and it was from this class, instigated very probably by the class above them, that the Colfax and Consjada murders took their unfortunate rise. And still one other element, mischievous in the extreme, must be added to the social complex men who pursued no occupations, but preyed on black and white alike, as gamblers and tenth-rate politicians, drinking and swaggering at the bar, always armed with knife and revolver, shooting Negroes now and then for excitement. This class, recruited largely from the descendants of the old overseer and Negro trader of antebellum days, had just enough education to enable them to dazzle the Negro by a political harangue. They became demagogic leaders of the Negroes, on the one hand, and murderers and fighters for the planters. It was this element that more than anything else kept up the turmoil in the state. According to Nordhoff, the first duty of the Republican leaders in Louisiana was to hang them by the dozen. And it was because they were not crushed out, except so far as the respectable conservative could combat them that Louisiana had to endure such a drawn-out purgatory before she was reconstructed. 49. 
The number of Negroes in the legislature of Louisiana is not exactly known, chiefly on account of the great mixture of blood. In the first legislature, there were said to be 42 Negroes, about half of the House, and seven Negro senators. The election showed the predominant influence of the carpetbaggers over the Negroes, who had good reason to be convinced of the bad faith of the planters. There was never a majority of Negroes in either house of the legislature during my four years of service as governor. The legislature elected in 1868, at the same time I was elected governor, had but six colored men in the Senate out of its 36 members, and though the House of Representatives had more colored men in it than did the Senate, they never constituted more than one-third of the membership. So it was in the general election of 1870. Only six out of the 36 members of the Senate were colored men, and there were fewer Negroes in the House of Representatives than in the House elected in 1868. Whatever legislation may have been worthy of criticism during this administration was the work of white men in which the Negro members played but a modest part. Point fifty. The real fight that developed in Louisiana was between the planters, on the one hand, and the newcomers, northern and southern, on the other. And these two factions fought to dominate both the poor whites and the Negroes, usually by characteristically different methods. The planters resorted to the old method of cajoling the poor whites, giving them some political and social recognition, and using them as thugs and murderers to carry out their ends. The carpetbaggers flattered Negroes, bribed those whom they could and gave them some recognition, but always at some crucial point broke their promises because they knew the Negro had no choice. Especially in Louisiana the question of social equality between whites and mulattoes was an insistent source of bitter feelings. Two factions soon developed among the Republicans, Warmoth tried to appease the planters and avoid too great dependence on the Negro. But the Tribune, leading the pure radicals, said in 1868, The Republican Party in Louisiana is headed by men, who for the most part are devoid of honesty and decency and we think it right that the country should know it. The active portion of the party in Louisiana is composed largely of white adventurers, who strive to be elected to office by black votes. Some of these intend, if elected, to give a share of office to colored men. We admit that, but they will choose only docile tools, not citizens who have manhood. Point 51. When the Republicans came to select their candidate for governor, the pure radicals proposed a wealthy colored man, Major F. E. Dumas. Dumas received 43 votes and Warmoth 45. Dumas refused the position of lieutenant governor and Dunn was nominated. Five white men and two colored men constituted the ticket, the other colored man being Antoine Dubuclet for treasurer. This ticket was elected. The new legislature met June 29, 1868, and the temporary speaker was a Negro. R. H. Isbell. He and Dunn tried to enforce the test oath, as they were legally bound to do, to the great anger of the rebels, who asked if they were to be excluded by a nigger from the seats to which they were elected. The legislature spent some time discussing a civil rights bill. This bill went over until the next session, and caused high feeling and long discussion. The conservatives protested against the colored people forcing themselves in where they were not wanted. Pinchback insisted only on equal accommodation. I consider myself just as far above coming into company that does not want me, as they are above my coming into an elevation with them. I do not believe that any sensible colored man upon this floor would wish to be in a private part of a public place without the consent of the owners of it. It is false, it is wholesale falsehood to say that we wish to force ourselves upon white people. Point 52. The bill passed both houses but the governor was almost afraid to sign it, and the newspapers tried to frighten Negroes. Will any Negro, or gang of Negroes, attempt to exercise the privilege it confers, belligerently asked the commercial bulletin. If they do, it will be at their peril. He may be able to obtain a ticket of admission, but no New Orleans audience will ever permit him to take his seat except in the places allotted for colored persons. It continued. Apparently this state of calm does not suit the radical leaders. Their continual control over the state must depend on the jealousy of the black toward the white people. 
They feel that the colored race have more confidence in the old citizens of Louisiana than in any newcomers. Hence the effort to revive a strife which would readily quiet itself without much stimulus. Point 53. Warmoth in his inaugural address ventured to urge immediate measures for the repression of lawlessness and disorder now rife in many parts of the state. From many parishes we have almost daily accounts of violence and outrage in many cases most brutal and revolting murders without any effort on the part of the people to prevent or punish them. Point 54. In a special address to the colored people, Warmoth said. My friends, this is a great day for the colored men of Louisiana. It is full of good for you if my hopes and expectations in your favor are well founded. If you are honest, industrious, and peaceable, you will have millions of friends who will stand by you, and see that you are protected in all the political rights which they themselves enjoy. You do not wish to intrude yourselves socially upon those who do not want your society, any more than you want other people to obtrude themselves upon you without your consent. The contest from which we are emerging has not been for social equality, but for civil and political equality. This last you now have, and it will be my duty to see that you are protected in it, and if I am not mistaken in my opinion of your race, it will be cheerfully accorded to you very soon by everybody, and remember that the roads that lead to prosperity for every man, whether white or black, are those of virtue and education, of honesty and sobriety, of industry and obedience to law. Point 55. Unfortunately, the state government, inaugurated in July, was almost immediately confronted by a presidential election in November, 1868. Skillfully, and with calculation, the economic problems of Reconstruction were being changed by planters and capitalists to look like problems of politics and social recognition. Beneath this deliberate camouflage, the industrial plans of the Tribune were being slowly submerged, until finally murder and mob law seized the state. The whole South was in a blaze of excitement in the 1868 election. Tremendous and frequent meetings were held in every city and parish in Louisiana. Every Confederate sympathizer was encouraged, and had hopes of what would happen to the South as a result of the election. The Republican Party in Louisiana was paralyzed. Secret semi-military organizations were set up, and riots broke up Republican meetings. Club rooms were raided and destroyed. It was believed that if Seymour and Blair were elected, Reconstruction would be overthrown. A civil war of secret assassination and open intimidation and murder began and did not end until 1876, and not entirely then. Strong as the hatred of the reactionaries was toward Negroes, it was stronger toward carpetbaggers. The Democratic State Central Committee sent out a letter. And we would earnestly declare to our fellow citizens our opinion that even the most implacable and ill-disposed of the Negro population, those who show the worst spirit toward the white people, are not half as much deserving our aversion and non-intercourse with them as the debased whites who encourage and aid them, and who become through their votes the office-holding oppressors of the people. Whatever resentment you have should be felt toward the latter, and not against the colored men, but in no case should you permit this resentment to go further than to withdraw from them all countenance, association, and patronage, and thwart every effort they may make to maintain a business and social foothold among you. Point 56. Secret democratic organizations were formed, and all well armed, the Knights of the White Camellia, the Ku Klux Klan, and an Italian organization called the Innocents. They all paraded nightly. In the election, Seymour and Blair received 88,225 votes, while Grant and Colfax received 34,859. Out of 21,000 Republican voters in New Orleans, only 276 Republican votes were cast. There were in 1,870, 700, and 26,915 persons in the state. A map of the state showing where violence and intimidation occurred leaves less than a third of the state in peace. Point 57. Because of the experiences in the presidential election of 1868, the legislature was asked to change the election and registration laws, and approved the law of March 16, 1870, conferring great power upon the governor. The governor was authorized to appoint a chief election officer who should make a registration of voters in each parish, 
and a board before which the governor should lay all the election returns. This returning board was composed of three state officers and two state senators, and it could throw out fraudulent votes or returns secured by violence. This device made government by the mob impossible, but it substituted a possible dictatorship in the hands of an unscrupulous governor. Governor Warmoth's attitude toward the finances of the state was characteristic and original. There was need of money, and he raised it. His statement of the needs was unexceptional. I found the state and the city of New Orleans bankrupt. Interest on the state and city bonds had been in default for years, the assessed property taxable in the state had fallen in value from $470,164,963 in $1,800 in 1870. Taxes for the years 1860, 1861, 1862, 1863, 1864, 1865, 1866 and 1867 were in arrears. The city and state were flooded with state and city shin plasters, which had been issued to meet current expenses. Among the first acts of the new legislature was one to postpone the collection of all back taxes, and later they were postponed indefinitely. Point 58. The public roads were mud trails. There was not a hard surfaced road in the whole state. There was the one canal, and very limited telegraphic facilities. The mails were usually carried on horseback. New Orleans had but four paved streets. The amount of the state and city debt was unknown and state securities were selling from 22 cents to 25 cents on a dollar. There was no money in either state or city treasury. New Orleans was a dirty, impoverished, and hopeless city, with a mixed, ignorant, corrupt, and bloodthirsty gang in control. It was flooded with lotteries, gambling dens, and licensed brothels. Many of the city officials, as well as the police force, were thugs and murderers. Violence was rampant, and hardly a day passed that someone was not shot, out under the oaks, in defense of his honor. Point 59. There was a demand by businessmen for more railroads. The legislature granted charters and voted aid for construction. In the past, every railroad in the state had been built in this way. Ten years later, the Democratic legislature of 1878 granted $2 million in bonds to aid in the building of a road to Shreveport, and the bill was signed by Governor Nichols. A great deal of state indebtedness was represented by this attempt to promote railroad building, and in this attempt both parties were responsible for making the appropriations. The bill aiding the New Orleans, Mobile, and Texas Railroad passed unanimously in a Senate composed of 21 Republicans and 9 Democrats and in the House were 50 Republicans and 9 Democrats who voted for it, and only 3 members voted against it. Point 60. In the bill incorporating the New Orleans, Baton Rouge and Vicksburg line, where the state assumed a liability of $6 million, the introducer was a Democrat, and it passed unanimously in both houses, the same thing was approximately true in 5 other cases, where the state assumed large financial responsibility. The money which Warmoth raised did not go wholly or even perhaps mostly for public objects. He allowed all elements to feed at the public trough. Public debt and taxes mounted. Warmoth, his friends, and many of his enemies, began to get rich in the midst of the surrounding poverty. When he was approached about this, and bitter complaint made at the mounting costs of government, he had a suave and effective series of answers. First, he said that a great many of the members of the legislature were ignorant Negroes, and easily influenced by lobbyists, and that the men of the community ought to assist him in restraining them. Then he turned around and reminded property holders and capitalists that many of the bills which the legislature was charged with passing corruptly were for the aggrandizement of individuals and corporations representing their very best people. Their bank presidents and the best people of New Orleans were, he said, crowding the lobbies of the legislature, continually whispering into these men's ears, bribes 61 how was the state to be defended, he asked, against the interposition of these people who were potent in their influence in the community? 
It is apparent that Governor Warmoth understood the term best people to be synonymous with the term richest people. He instanced the case of the five million bond bill, to take up the city notes, which he had vetoed, which had been passed in the House over his veto. The bill went to the Senate. I walked into the Senate chamber and saw nearly every prominent broker of the city engaged in lobbying that bill through the Senate, and it was only by exposing the fact that one of their emissaries had come into this very chamber and laid upon the desk of my secretary an order for $50,000, that I was able to defeat it. Mr. Conway, the mayor of your city, came here and offered me any consideration to induce me to sign this bill.62. He also said that another senator of New Orleans had offered him a bribe of $50,000, and a share of profits for his signature to the Nicholson Pavement Bill.63. It was not only the fact that unsuccessful jobbers had tried to bribe him, but that successful jobbers and prominent Southern men without reasonable doubt had bribed him and knew it. And their mouths were closely shut when it came to details and special instances of stealing. Without a doubt many of the colored leaders shared in this graft, but from the very nature of the case it was not a large share. Many members of the legislature, white and black, were regularly paid small sums, but on the other hand, leaders like Dunn and Roundinez were incorruptible and lashed the thieves on all sides. Thomas G. Davidson of Livingston Parish, who had been a Democrat in the state since 1826, said, that there was corruption in the legislature, no one doubts, but it was not confined to the Republicans alone 64. It was a colored man, W. F. Brown, who as state superintendent of education called attention in his report of 1873 to the way in which school funds were being stolen. New Orleans, as a legacy from banks and the Freedmen's Bureau, was one of the few southern states that had a system of public schools. In 1865, there were 141 schools for the freedmen, and 19,000 pupils. A school law had been passed in 1869, providing a system of public education without distinction of race or color. This system was not being carried out. W. F. Brown reported. Stolen in Carroll Parish in 1871, $30,000, in East Baton Rouge, $5,032, in St. Landry, $5,700, in St. Martin, $3,786.80, in Plaquemines, $5,855, besides large amounts in St. Tammany, Concordia, Morehouse, and other parishes.65. The entire permanent school funds of many parishes disappeared during this period. Many colored voters tried to swing their vote so as to stop corruption, save the schools, and improve their economic condition, but if this was difficult in South Carolina and Mississippi, it was almost impossible in Louisiana, because there was so little choice between the parties aspiring to power. Under these circumstances, it was exceedingly difficult for colored voters to know what to do. There is no question but that if the Negroes had been offered a chance to make their leadership effective in alliance with some party of social uplift, they would have followed it in large and increasing numbers. They would have become an honest and teachable electorate, and rapidly expelled most of their venal, careless, and dishonest fellows. But what could one choose between men like Warmoth, McHenry, and Carter a carpetbagger, a planter and a scalawag, a buccaneer, a slave driver, and a plain thief? The expenses of the Warmoth government increased to a total of $26,394,578 in four years and five months. The state debt was $10,099,074 in 1860 and $26,920,499 in 1865. Subtracting the Confederate debt, there was a total debt of $17,347,051 in 1868. This, in 1872, had increased to $29,619,473. Besides this, bonds voted but not yet issued would increase the real and contingent debt to $41,194,473. The tax rate in 1864 was 3.75 mils, 
in 1869, 5.25 mils, in 1871, 14.5 mils, and in 1872, 21.5 mils. This expense was based on property valuation of 435,487,265 in 1860, which, with emancipated slaves, sank to $200 million in 1865, and rose to $251,696,017 in 1870. George W. Carter the typical Louisiana scalawag, was a discovery of Warmoth, who maneuvered him into the legislature. He came to New Orleans soon after Warmoth was inaugurated. He was a Virginian, but had lived in Texas. He was an apostatized preacher and ex-Confederate colonel, who later turned loyal patriot and anti-Warmoth leader. Carter was a man of education and Polish, a good speaker, but an absolutely unscrupulous grafter. He was made Speaker of the House of Representatives in 1871, and became head of a ring proposing to control legislation that offered a chance for blackmail. The History of Louisiana, from 1870 to 1876, reads like a Chinese puzzle to those who forget the great forces below. Beneath the witch's cauldron of political chicanery, it is difficult to remember the great dumb mass of white and black labor the overwhelming majority of the citizens of Louisiana, groping for light, and seldom finding expression. Historians quite unanimously forget and ignore them, and chronicle only the amazing game of politicians. Under the election laws of 1869, Warmoth secured control of Louisiana elections. The governor, through the returning board which he appointed, could at his discretion throw out any votes anywhere in the state on any pretext. It was to no purpose, so far as results were concerned, that voters were intimidated, mobbed, and killed. Consequently, the election of 1870 was unusually quiet. Then, trouble began to brew. The colored men who formed the bulk of Warmoth's following were not willing to be simply his dumb followers. Led by Lt. Gov. Dunn, they began a revolt in the Republican Convention of August, 1870. The convention elected Dunn chairman, passed over Warmoth, and especially opposed a constitutional amendment which would make the governor eligible for re-election. Warmoth took the stump, adroitly flattered the white planters, and eventually carried his amendment. When the new legislature met in January, 1871, he faced a new dilemma. Several hundred colored men joined in a large meeting at the Louisiana Hotel to protest against his despotism. All the best elements of the state were arrayed against him, one wing of his own party and at least a part of the Negro population. In addition, economic conditions were crying for reform. The colored men nominated Pinchback for the term in the United States Senate, after the term of Harris expired March 4, 1871. At the same time, a brother-in-law of President Grant, controller of customs at New Orleans, also wanted to be senator and the president wanted him. Warmoth allowed a white planter to be elected. The result was that the Republican convention split in August, 1871, with Dunn at the head of one faction, and Warmoth at the head of the other. While Warmoth was temporarily out of the state, Lt. Gov. Dunn discharged the duties of governor, although Warmoth resented it. Some of the Democratic papers said that they preferred a nigger governor to a carpetbagger. A state convention was called, and Dunn wrote to the leading colored Republicans. I write to you to ask of you your support and influence in behalf of the colored people. We have a great work before us, and in order to be successful we need the aid and cooperation of every colored man in the state. An effort is being made to sell us out to the Democrats by the governor, and we must nip it in the bud. I ask you to use your influence to elect good honest men that will look out for the interests of the colored man, and not be duped by the money or the promises of Governor Warmoth, and above all do not elect as a delegate any of his office holders, who being under obligations to him for position, will be compelled to support his policy. Point 66. 
Warmoth retaliated by joining with the Democrats in depriving Lt. Gov. Dunn of his right to appoint committees in the Senate. Dunn wrote Horace Greeley in 1871, after Greeley's visit south, and his strictures on carpetbaggers. There are 90,000 voters in this state, 84,000 of whom are colored. In my judgment, a fair and untrammeled vote being cast, 19 twentieths of the Republican Party in the state, including a majority of the elective state officers and all of the federal officers, with a few exceptions, are opposed to the administration of the present state executive. We want for ourselves, and for the people of all parties, better laws on the statute books, and better men to administer the same, and we are persuaded that neither of these wants will ever be met so long as the present executive exercises any material control over the politics of Louisiana. We are engaged in no strife of factions, but the people gravely and earnestly are fighting for their personal and political rights against the encroachments of impudent and unfaithful public servants. Would you be greatly surprised, Mr. Greeley, to be informed that in the judgment of the good people of this state, irrespective of party, the young man who now occupies the executive chair of Louisiana, whose crimes against his party and his people you charitably ignore, and whose championship you so boldly assume, is preeminently the prototype and prince of the tribe of carpetbaggers, who seem to be your pet aversion. Point 67. Just at this point, November 21, 1871, Oscar Dunn died, and the Louisiana Negroes lost an unselfish, incorruptible leader. This was Warmoth's chance, and he secured Pinchback's support, and at the same time avoided the contingency of having Carter, the Scalawag, become governor, by securing Pinchback's election as lieutenant governor. This aroused another factional fight in the Republican Party for office and patronage, with the planters ready to take advantage of every opportunity, and the Negroes deprived of their leaders. Warmoth rode this storm until his following failed when he adroitly leaped to the liberal Republican revolt of the North, headed by Horace Greeley. When Chamberlain of South Carolina joined the Northern Reform wave, he backed his move by excellent reform efforts, despite his dangerous and ultimately fatal alliance with disloyal planters. Warmoth had no program of reform. On the other hand, scalawags like Carter joined the anti-Warmoth Republican faction and urged them to armed revolt. In came the United States troops, and down came a congressional investigating committee and scored Warmoth. The result was that in the campaign of 1872, Warmoth took 125 delegates, one-fifth of whom were colored, to the Cincinnati Convention, this was the largest delegation that any state sent. This again was a shrewd move, because the liberal Republicans were attacking graft and theft, both north and south, when this arch-graft arranged himself on their side. Pinchback, under the advice of Sumner, was disposed to follow Warmoth into the Liberal Republican Party, but he was alienated when he saw that Warmoth, instead of leading a real third-party movement, was about to surrender to the planters. A curious campaign ensued. The reactionary Democrats nominated John McHenry, from one of the worst anti-Negro parishes of the state, where Negroes and white Republicans had been murdered by the dozens. No self-respecting colored man or liberal of any stamp could vote for him. On the other hand, there was a reform party, led by Beauregard, which displayed at its convention a placard, Justice to All Races, Creeds and Political Opinions 68 J. Sella Martin, the colored labor leader from the North, addressed this convention, and also Warmoth, who was working to have this movement and the Democrats unite with the liberal Republicans. The Liberal Republicans nominated Penn for governor, and a colored man, Dumas, for Secretary of State, while the regular Republicans nominated Kellogg and a colored man, Antoine. Warmoth tried to get the reactionary Democrats and the Liberal Republicans to unite with McHenry and Penn as nominees, a colored man, Armistead, as Secretary of State, and Pinchback as Congressman at large. Such a ticket Warmoth was sure would with his power over the returning board, win, as he said, by 30,000 majority. But the reactionary planters refused the coalition, and Warmoth kept the climax by surrendering to them completely, and backing McHenry. There was nothing for Pinchback to do but join the Grant Republicans. He said. It is well known, as far as I am concerned, 
that I have no partiality for the governor of the state, I have not stood at his back as one of the supporters or admirers of that distinguished gentleman. I am not a lover or worshipper of his point 69. If I thought we could secure a Republican government in Louisiana by supporting Mr. Greeley, I would support him, but after a careful observation, I tell you, fellow citizens, if you wish a Republican government and the success of the Republican Party, you can only secure that under the Grant and Wilson ticket. Everybody knows how bitter I am against the Custom House and its party, but I tell you, my friends, if it is necessary to secure the success of the Republican Party, I will swallow it. Point 70. All parties took great pains to assure the colored people that they would sustain and protect them in all their civil and political rights. The Reform Party, headed by General P.G.T. Beauregard, and other distinguished white men, with the written approval of several thousands of the best white citizens, declared that henceforth we dedicate ourselves to the unification of our people. That by our people we mean all men, of whatever race, color, or religion, who are citizens of Louisiana, who are willing to work for her prosperity. That we shall advocate by speech, pen, and deed, the equal and impartial exercise by every citizen of Louisiana of every civil and political right guaranteed by the Constitution and laws of the United States, and by the laws of honor, brotherhood, and fair dealing. That we shall maintain and advocate the right of every citizen of Louisiana and of every citizen of the United States to frequent at will all places of public resort, and to travel at will on all vehicles or public conveyances, upon terms of perfect equality with any and every other citizen, and we pledge ourselves, so far as our influence, counsel, and example may go, to make this right a live and practical right, and that there may be no misunderstanding of our views on this point. We shall further recommend that hereafter no distinction shall exist among citizens of Louisiana in any of our public schools, or state institutions of education, or in any other public institution supported by the state, city, or parish. We shall also recommend that the proprietors of all foundries, factories, and other industrial establishments, in employing mechanics or workmen, make no distinction between the two races. Point 71. When the returns came in, Warmoth sought to count in McHenry, and immediately the opposition set up a rival returning board, and counted in Kellogg. They also got a United States judge to back them. Again, there was practically civil war, with two returning boards and two governments, until President Grant sent down United States soldiers and backed the Kellogg government. The Louisiana elections of 1868-1872, 1874 and 1876, were of one cloth, intimidation, fraud, open violence, and murder, so that there was no real expression of public opinion. Three remedies were evident, first, a dictator working through a returning board, secondly, supervision of elections and repression of mob violence by the federal government, thirdly, arming of the black militia. Carpetbaggers were too corrupt and planters too selfish to be successful dictators. The nation recoiled at federal supervision, not only in the drastic form proposed by Sheridan, but even in the milder form of supervised elections, finally, arms in the hands of the Negro aroused fear both north and south. Not that the Negroes could not and would not fight, for these same blacks, largely under their own officers, had beaten back Louisiana whites at Port Hudson and Millican's Bend. But it was the silent verdict of all America that Negroes must not be allowed to fight for themselves. They were, therefore, dissuaded from every attempt at self-protection or aggression by their friends as well as their enemies. Congress hesitated and refused to take action despite the pleas of President Grant. Under the law, he had no alternative but to use federal troops to enforce the Reconstruction laws. The result was open war. Three times the soldiers restored to power Republican candidates who had been ousted from office by force and fraudulent elections. In retaliation, the planters murdered Negroes and Republicans in cold blood at Colfax, Cushata, and other places, and fought pitched battles in the streets of New Orleans. It was a humiliating and disgraceful situation. Kellogg attempted reforms, and succeeded in reducing the tax rate from 21 to 14 mills. But many parishes refused to pay taxes, 
and while the New Orleans Board of Trade and leading businessmen approved Kellogg's policy, his reforms could not go far. In fact, just as in South Carolina, there was nothing that Louisiana wanted less at that time than reform through Negro voters and Republican office holders. Evidently, the Negro voter, and even the office holder, could not be held to blame for the anarchy and turmoil which are the history of Reconstruction in Louisiana. Practically, so-called Reconstruction in Louisiana was a continuation of the Civil War, with the Negro as pawn between the two forces of Northern and Southern capitalists. The Northerners were determined to use the state for their own interest, but willing to admit universal suffrage under property control, while planters, united in secret organizations with poor whites, were determined to reduce the labor vote by disfranchising the Negro. Between these two forces, the Negro was victim and peon. His intelligent and sacrificing leadership was beaten back, deceived and hamstrung, and finally discredited by charging it with plans to Africanize Louisiana. The shrewd and venal and dishonest Negro elements were characterized as typical and used as an excuse for cheating and lawlessness by elements in the white population just as dishonest and much more influential. Back of this smokescreen lay the real charge, which was the attempt to subject this state so rich in raw materials, and so strategic for trade, to a dictatorship of labor, rather than an oligarchy of capitalists. The Panic of 1873 and the Democratic House elected to Congress in 1874 settled the matter. The Louisiana Democratic State Convention frankly called itself We, the White People of Louisiana and a committee of Congress sent down to investigate revealed the new temper of the nation. One part of the committee was completely in favor of the planters, while the other part declared the White League an unscrupulous engine of fraud and murder. The crucial election of 1876 came and with it came anarchy. As John Sherman and his fellows reported, organized clubs of masked, armed men, formed as recommended by the Central Democratic Committee, rode through the country at night, marking their course by the whipping, shooting, wounding, maiming, mutilation, and murder of women, children, and defenseless men, whose houses were forcibly entered while they slept, and, as their inmates fled, the pistol, the rifle, the knife and the rope were employed to do their horrid work. Crimes like these, testified to by scores of witnesses, were the means employed in Louisiana to elect a President of the United States. The result was two sets of returns for presidential electors and for state offices, two governors, and two legislatures. The whole nation waited on the outcome in Louisiana which would settle the presidential contest. There followed an extraordinary period of negotiation, probably unparalleled in modern government. The white folk of Louisiana with threat of civil war entered into negotiations with the president and president-elect and arranged a filibuster of 116 congressmen to prevent counting the electoral vote. The Hayes party promised to work for the material prosperity of the South and a lay sectional feeling. Nichols and the legislature gave every assurance. They solemnly agreed not to deprive the Negro of any political or civil rights enjoyed by any other class and to educate white and black children with equal advantages. Finally the filibuster was dropped and the electoral count was finished March 2. Hayes became president. An extra-legal commission went to Louisiana in April. By means of money furnished by the Louisiana Lottery Company and large business establishments, the Kellogg government was bribed to disband and the Nichols legislature obtained a nominal quorum. On April 24, the federal troops withdrew to their barracks and Louisiana was free for a new period of unhampered exploitation of the working classes. In South Carolina, Mississippi, and Louisiana, the proportion of Negroes was so large, their leaders of sufficient power, and the federal control so effective that for the years 1868 to 1874 the will of black labor was powerful, and so far as it was intelligently led, and had definite goals, it took perceptible steps toward public education, confiscation of large incomes, betterment of labor conditions, universal suffrage, and in some cases, distribution of land to the peasant. Ignorant and vicious leadership, white and black, hindered and even stopped this progress, and gradually tended toward a duel between northern and southern capitalists to effect control of labor. This succeeded first in Louisiana, then in Mississippi, 
and finally in South Carolina. In each case, labor control passed into the hands of white Southerners, who combined with white la